The place is the Ever City. There stands a massive statue of a woman surrounded by many houses. This massive statue is of a woman named Li Yunzi. Right in front of the statue, there is a food stall handing out free porridge, and is surrounded by many people waiting for their turn. Voices can be heard from the crowd advising the people not to rush, and requesting to be given the porridge first. This food stall is of a woman called Lu Wan Chiao, the daughter of the deputy city lord. A person from the crowd praises Lu Wan Chiao, saying that she is a very kind-hearted Valkyrie for giving them porridge. A man from the crowd looks at the statue in awe, questioning whether the statue is of a Valkyrie. The man continues staring at the statue with a bowl in his hand, saying that this city was ruled by such a beautiful woman that he starts eating the porridge from the bowl. After finishing the porridge, he wipes his mouth and expresses his satisfaction of finally having a full meal. Suddenly, some people from the crowd start falling down with blood pouring out of their mouths. They start shouting that they knew that the Valkyries are not so kind and cry out that their homeland, Wujai City, was destroyed by one of these Valkyries a year ago. They wonder why the Valkyries won't leave them alone. The man stares in horror as he sees people dying in front of him and sweat begins to form on his face that he starts to lose consciousness. The empty bowl falls from his hand and shatters into pieces. He thinks that he's just a silk farmer from the town of Mulberry who was on his way to deliver silk to the city lord when he met a robber and was forced to come here to make a living. He won't dare anymore, he begs for forgiveness. He doesn't want to die just yet. Suddenly, there is a fire. The place is the Ever City Prison. A voice says that it is hot. Suddenly, there was a woman on top of the man, and they are naked. The silk farmer has a surprised look on his face. He wonders if this woman was the beautiful and powerful Valkyrie. He thought that the gods were doing him one last favor, before his death, by showing him a very sexy dream. Their hands were intertwined as they made love and the woman moaned as they finished. The next day, the silk farmer woke up, confused. He was beyond shocked and realized that he made a mistake. He couldn't believe what was happening. He wondered what was going on and why he was in a dungeon, locked up with a naked Valkyrie. He scratched his head with a worrisome look on his face. He could feel everything and realize that he wasn't dead yet. He questioned himself if that wasn't all a dream and wondered if they really did it. The silk farmer looked at a white thing in his hand, confused. Then he realized, it was his silkworm that had awoken that a groan came from the naked woman. He stuttered as he tried to explain that he had been robbed of his money and had consumed a poison porridge, which led to this. The woman said that it doesn't matter, her purpose has been achieved. They heard an evil laugh coming from the window and looked behind. The voice said that the Valkyrie looked very well, claiming that the beggar must have served her well last night. It was Lu Wanqiao. She taunts her, saying that many people's hearts would be broken if they heard that the magnificent sister, Li Yunzi, was sleeping with the beggar. Wanqiao mockingly assures her that she'll make sure that everyone hears about this. It will become the hottest topic at the end of the day, she laughed and walked away. The silk farmer realizes Li Yunzi has been overthrown, and he peeks at her. She punches the man in the eye, warning him not to look. The silk farmer groans in pain, crying that she has also seen him so he's also a victim. In response, Yunzi angrily threatens him that if he wants to die, she'll make that happen. The silk farmer closes his eyes and surrenders, saying that he isn't looking at her, he's just trying to figure a way out. As he said that, his silkworm started munching on the metal rods that were blocking the window. Seeing this, he proudly exclaims that his bug is good at everything. The silk farmer sits in a corner and cries about the look on her face. Yunzi demands that he helps her to get through the window. The silk farmer questions why she needs his help when she's a powerful Valkyrie. She replies that she's been poisoned and now she's weak. The silk farmer says that he can help her because he has been blinded, claiming that he can't see anything. Li Yunzi does not take no for an answer and starts punching him. The silk farmer cries in pain and finally agrees to help her. The silk farmer gets on his knees and thinks that she claimed she was powerless, but she was still so violent. But it was still worth it. She accidentally kicks the man in the face while getting out of the window. The silk farmer groans in pain as he falls down. He waits for her to pull him up, 
but there is no sign of her. He shouts out whether she is there and asks her to pull him up. As she does not appear, he thinks the more beautiful a woman is the more she can't be trusted. The silk farmer groans in pain as an empty potato sack falls on his head. Yunzi came back. She extends her hand towards him and tells him to wear the sack so that she can pull him up. The silk farmer expresses his dissatisfaction as she struggles to pull him up, while she exclaims why he has to be so heavy. She finally gets him out and wipes the sweat off her face. The silk farmer gasps for air and thinks that the toxins haven't been removed from Yunzi's spotty, so she isn't any different from a weak woman. She tells him to follow her without making any noise. The silk farmer follows her sneakily as she tries to move a rock. Below the rock is a secret passage. The silk farmer asks her whether she is sure that she can get out of the city from here. She suggests that he can go by himself too. The silk farmer sighs in exhaustion questioning how much longer will he have to crawl, claiming that he is dying. She looks back at him and says that isn't an option, his physical strength is way too bad. The silk farmer blushes and stutters that he's just a little tired. Back at the Ever City, the city was on fire. The people scream that there is a fire as they ran away. There is a dragon on top of a house, breathing fire everywhere, and a voice screaming for help. It was the glided fire dragon. Wan Chiao and a man in a robe are seen staring at the fire engulfing the city. A voice from behind mocks them, asking whether they are satisfied to see the view. The man in the robe looks back at the source of the voice. It was Luo Xiao, a dragon master. The man in the robe nervously says that they don't have any grudge against him, then why did Xiao do this to them? Xiao interrupts him, reminding him that he had told him he wanted her. He asks where she is as he shows him a picture of Li Yunzi. He continues that it seems that he has been too kind and that the Ever City was no longer worthwhile. Wan Xiao tells him to stop thinking about that woman because she slept with a beggar for one night, making her the dirtiest of all women. The man in the robe offers his daughter, Wan Xiao, to him for marriage, saying that she is the purest and most elegant woman in the city. Furthermore, she also has some commanding skills. Xiao angrily grabs Wan Xiao by the throat. He holds her up in the air and says how dare she touch Yunzi. He shouts that even if Yunzi isn't a pearl, she isn't any different from the rotten mud and sand. He gets angrier by the second. His eyes glow red as he says that there is no need for untouchables like her in the world. The glided fire dragon breathes fire towards them, forming a circle, and the city lord is on fire. Wancho's clothes and her skin are burnt, but she still smiles as Xiao holds her up in the air. Confused, he asks her what she is laughing for. Even in such a state, Wan Xiao mocks him, saying that before he became a dragon master, he was just dirt in the eyes of Yunzi. He did everything he could to win her affection, but she still treated him like a slave. She continues that he has come back as a stronger person to impress the Valkyrie, but she has ruined her, the goddess he loves is naked in the arms of a beggar. Xiao clenches his teeth in rage. Everything turns black and red as he burns Wang Xiao to death and he screams for her to go to hell. Xiao says that even if it is true, Yunzi can still only belong to him. Meanwhile, Yunzi and the silk farmer make it out of the secret passage. They look back at the city on fire. Yunzi wonders whether there is a dragon master in the city, while the silk farmer says it's a good thing that they left. The silk farmer asks what's her plan. He says that if her enemies found out she had run away, they'd come after her. Therefore, he offers Yunzi to stay at his place till she recovers her strength. Yunzi accepts his offer and tells him to lead the way. As they reach Mulberry Town, the silk farmer exclaims that after three nights of walking, he is finally able to sleep. Yunzi is seen sleeping on the silk farmer's bed, while he is sleeping on some chairs. He wakes up and looks at Yunzi as she sleeps. He thinks that Yunzi's power and purity were taken from her, and the Ever City was destroyed, but she had to hold back her anger and humiliation. The silk farmer feels bad, thinking that in her eyes, he's just a beggar who has taken her virginity. The next day, the silk farmer wakes up to the smell of food. He looks at Yunzi cooking and thinks the food smells good. His eyes widen as realizes that she's cooking his silkworms. He questions how could she eat his cute silkworms. 
Yunzi replies that she is hungry and there isn't any food in his house and starts eating. To stop her, the silk farmer promises to buy her a meatloaf if she doesn't eat his silkworms. The silk farmer arrives at the market. He didn't expect that. Despite looking like a fairy and having a great temperament, Yunzi could be cruel enough to fry his silkworms. As he makes his way through the market, he overhears an old man telling the children that dragons are the most honorable creatures in the world. He claims that there is a marvelous power on earth that allows all beings to become dragons. Legend has it that all living beings have their own dragon gate, and by going through it, they become dragons. Some people search for the laws of dragon transformation and help beings who have a chance of becoming dragons pass through the dragon gate. Such people are called the dragon masters. A child excitedly says that he'll definitely become a dragon master one day. The old man warns him to be kind and not to kill innocent people when he becomes a dragon master. The child asks if it is hard to find young spirits that can turn into dragons. The old man responds that there have been stories in recent months that young spirits enjoy eating silkworms, therefore if a young spirit that eats silkworms arrives, it must be captured, and the possibilities of it transforming into a dragon are high. After listening to him, a kid cheers that he has a lot of silkworms. The old man says that because of this, the price of the silkworms has gone up and the Mulberry Town is making a fortune by raising these silkworms. Hearing this, the silk farmer cries about his poor silkworms. He arrives back at home and calls Yunzi to try the meatloaf he bought. However, as there is no response, he wonders where she is. His eyes land on a note on the table. The note was by Yunzi stating that she has gone out for a little walk and had left his silkworms safe inside. He grabs the note, wondering if she will just walk away like this, and whether he'll be a disgrace to her for the rest of his life. He dismisses his thoughts and asks the silkworm if they will return to their former glory. However, he adds that it's also okay to be ordinary because there is no pressure, worry, or responsibility. The silk farmer decides that they should eat. As he turns around to leave, he is frightened by Yunzi's sudden presence. He says that didn't she leave and questions why she had returned. He expresses that she had scared the hell out of him. Yunzi tells her to act like someone from her clan. The silk farmer is confused by this. He wonders if she is talking about acting as someone from the Lee family of the ancestral dragon city-state. Just as she says that, the doors are slammed open by Xiao. They both turn to face him. Yunzi is questioned by Xiao about if the silk farmer is the person she wants to travel with. Yunzi responds affirmatively, saying that the silk farmer arrived earlier and already told the clan about her circumstances. She had instructed him to erase all evidence of her stay and leave immediately for the ancestral dragon city-state. The silk farmer smirks and realizes what is happening. He plays along and says that the clan has ordered him not to allow any strangers on their journey back home. Xiao gets offended and informs him that he is not some stranger but also a member of the clan. Yunzi confirms this by telling him that Xiao used to be a servant for her father's court and is now a dragon master. Upon hearing this, the silk farmer suggests that they should go together since they're from the same clan. Xiao calls his gilded fire dragon, and the three of them begin their journey. The silk farmer realizes that this is the dragon that has destroyed the Ever City. He thinks that Xiao was probably after him, but hadn't found out yet that he was the little beggar that had slept with Yunzi. He inquires Yunzi about why Xiao was no longer a part of her father's court. Yunzi informs him that Luo Xiao was caught spying on her while she was doing sword practice. When she found out about this, he had already been exiled from the clan by her father. Hearing this, the silk farmer thinks that he's lucky that he's safe enough even after taking her virginity. Yunzi says that Xiao has a grudge against her, and now that he is a dragon master. Before she can complete her sentence, the silk farmer interrupts her suggesting that he didn't just abduct her directly because he wanted to use this as an opportunity to return to her clan. Yunzi agrees with his suggestion. Meanwhile, Luo Xiao is getting annoyed by the silk farmer getting close to Yunzi. He tries to separate them by dangerously landing the dragon. However, his plan backfires as the silk farmer and Yunzi wrap their arms around each other for support. As the dragon lands, the silk farmer accuses Xiao of trying to kill the Valkyrie. Xiao fakes an apology, saying that his dragon is short-tempered. 
However, he questions the silk farmer, asking that as a member of the Li family, how dare he touch Yunzi? Yunzi immediately kicks the silk farmer away and makes up an excuse that servant Zhu, the silk farmer, had just been enrolled into the Dragon Tars Academy, hence his drag owning was not perfect. Xiao teases Zhu, saying that he's brave enough to even step foot in this savage land before becoming a dragon master. Zhu refrains from giving a reply, knowing that Lu Xiao is just trying to provoke him. Yunzi announces that this is the ancestral dragon city-state, and Zhu stares in shock. He remembers the saying that the ancestral dragon city-state was created from the body of an ancestral dragon. After observing the city, he determines that it's indeed true to its name. The three of them arrive at the Li royal court. Someone tells the lord not to be angry, saying it was good for Yunzi to be back. Yunzi's father slams a bowl on the floor, and one of the sharp pieces lands on Yunzi's face, cutting her skin. Liying, the head of the family, is sat on the throne with Kong Tong, who is the lady of the house, standing beside him. Liying berates his daughter, saying that she can't even protect her honor, let alone protect the ancestral dragon city-state. Xiao exclaims that he has burned the Ever City to the ground and can't fathom how the news had reached the ancestral dragon city-state so quickly. Ying angrily tells him to shut up and asks if it is his turn to speak. Hearing this, Xiao immediately bows down in apology. Kong Tong comes to Yunzi's defense, reminding Li Ying about the war merits his daughter has received and how she has expanded the city. She emphasizes that even if Yunzi's reputation is tarnished, her prestige in commanding remains the same. Ying sarcastically questions what commandeering prestige is there to speak of. He says the troops under her will also have to bear this shame. Her father decides that her guard will be disbanded and will be sent to other camps to continue guarding the West Fields. He informs her that Nan Ling Sha, her sister, will take over the position of the successor, while she'll be under house arrest. In calls out Xiao and questions him whether his dragon is a glided fire dragon. Xiao responds affirmatively. Ying commends him for showing those vagrants of Wutu that the Li family is not to be messed with. He offers Xiao to come under his wing, promising him a bright future as long as he remains loyal to him. Zhao's plan had worked. Xiao thanks Ying and Tong profusely as leave the court. Zhu on the other hand is confused. He wonders if he is invisible and why nobody is acknowledging his presence. Xiao turns to Yunzi and tries to comfort her telling her not to worry about other people's comments. He says that he'll try his best to convince her father to let him marry her. He insists that he really cares about her while Yunzi just remains silent. Meanwhile, Xu starts to get irritated. Xiao tells her that she doesn't need to answer him right away, but requests her to understand his feelings. The Dragon Master leaves while saying that he'll prove his love for her. Xu hands Yunzi a cloth to clean the wound on her face. However, Yunzi ignores him and just walks away. I in the Li family guest room. Zhu is laying on the bed thinking that although Yunzi isn't angry with him, she probably doesn't want to see him. He feels embarrassed to stay at the Li family house and wants to find a temporary job. He decides that he should plant mulberry trees before Baichi. His silkworm gets upset. Zhu realizes that Baichi had not come out of the spirit domain for many days, so he decides to check on her. He enters the spirit domain. The spirit domain is an otherworldly space for dragon masters to store their tame dragons. There he sees an extra ice cocoon. Zhu touches the cocoon and wonders why it is there. He looks inside and sees white smoke coming out of it. He realizes that Baichi is showing signs of a dragon's transformation and would soon return to the throne. He feels glad that he and Baichi will soon be able to fly like they used to. But he is also saddened by the fact that he isn't a real dragon master and can't really help Baichi. Zhu apologizes to Baichi and promises to figure out the reason for her regression and help her to become strong. He decides that he will make sure Baichi gets back to the top and that he will become a true dragon master himself. He is also reminded of Yunzi and thinks that he doesn't want to be a lifelong disgrace to her. He needs to find a safe space for Baichi's pupation stage. However, he isn't familiar with the ancestral dragon city-state. His thoughts are interrupted by a voice calling for him. He opens the door and meets Shanger, the maid of the mistress. Shanger hands him a recommendation letter, 
and informs him that Theod is sent by Yunzi for his admission to the Dragon Tamer's Academy in Lichuan. Zhu thanks her as he grabs the letter. He wonders if she is trying to make him an actual Dragon Master, in case Xiao starts to investigate. He admits that the Academy is indeed a good place to go to and decides that he'll go there tomorrow. Xiang'e advises him not to miss the Spirit Link selection and suggests he choose well. The next day, he arrives at the Dragon Tamer's Academy in Lichuan. As he makes his way towards the Academy, he is stopped by a woman asking whether he's here to see the Academy. Xu clarifies that he actually came for admission. The woman's name is Fan Yan Yan, and she is a peach seller. Fan Yan Yan laughs and sarcastically says that she couldn't tell that he was actually crazy. Xu furiously states that he isn't crazy and calls her a mean little girl. Yan Yan points out that he looks very plain and doesn't carry a spirit. She calls him dumb and says that the Dragon Tamer's Academy must have lowered their standards. Zhu makes a bet saying that if no one stops him from entering the Academy, she will have to hand over the basket of peaches. Yan Yan asks him what she will receive if she wins. Zhu says in that case, he'll buy all of her peaches. Yan Yan says that she doesn't believe him and blows him a raspberry. Zhu ignores her and arrives at the entrance. He hands his enrollment letter to a man, stating that he wants to be admitted to the academy. The man grabs the letter and instructs him to go to the front and get his academy emblem, and wait at the side for some time. Zhu smugly turns around and calls for Nian Yan to fulfill the bet. However, he sees Nian Yan attempting to sell her peaches for a low price in order to avoid giving them to him. He gets irritated by this and feels that this was worse than losing. After their silly interaction, Xu finds himself in the academy on top of a dragon with two men in front of him. The red-haired man is Li Xiaoying and the blue-haired man is Nan Yi. Li Xiaoying's uncle cheers for him, saying he's the hope of the village and that he must become a dragon master. However, he says that it is fine even if he doesn't succeed. The man continues to embarrass him until Xiaoying asks him to leave. Xiaoying faces Zhu and introduces himself. He asks Zhu's name and whether he is a new admission to. Zhu replies that his name is Zhu Minglang. Xiaoying turns to Nan Yi and also tries to get to know him. However, Nan Yi simply ignores him. Suddenly, the instructor says that the three of them are late entrance, and they should have come earlier. He informs them that they'll only be able to choose the leftover dragonlings from the dragon storage hall. The three of them aren't amused by this. As they arrive at the dragon storage hall, the instructor tells them to choose their spiritlings and get them registered for ownership. There they see many spiritlings including birds, sheep and bunnies. Chu Minglang smiles as Xiaoing gushes about selecting a spiritling. Nan Yi cuts their joy short by pointing out that a true dragon may not even exist among the thousands of spiritlings, and that allowing them to choose one is simply the academy's way of giving them hope of becoming a student. He tells them not to be so stubborn and to pick one at random. As Nan Yi continues ranting about the spiritlings, Ming Lang's attention is drawn by a silkworm among the spiritlings. Suddenly, a crocodile spirit catches the silkworm and tries to eat it. The wolf spirits do not like this and start beating the crocodile. Xu feels bad that the little crocodile spirit is being bullied. He scoops up the small crocodile spirit and instructs him to follow him from now on. The crocodile does not like this and pees on his face. Zhu gets angry by this and understands why the other spiritlings bully him. Meanwhile, the little crocodile keeps laughing uncontrollably. Zhu starts to recall the old man's words that spiritlings who enjoy eating silkworms had a high likelihood of developing into dragons. He also notices the hard bone on the little crocodile's head, thinking that it looks like a hidden horn of a dragon. He decides that this is enough for him to tolerate the crocodile spirit. He tries to entice the crocodile spirit, saying that while he may not be able to transform him into a dragon, as a silkworm breeder, he can provide him with plenty of silkworms. He further tries to seal the deal by offering him a silkworm at once and asks the crocodile again to follow him. The crocodile spirit takes the bait, and then Zhu binds their souls together. After the soul binding, he names the little crocodile spirit Haya. Xu takes Haya to the accommodation area and digs a small pond for him. Haya starts cheerfully playing in the pond after being encouraged by Xu. Xu announces that he's going to take a bath. He steps into a bucket of warm water and takes a sigh of relief. 
The next day, Xu is sleeping peacefully when he is awakened by Haya stepping on his face. Xu wishes Haya good morning and rewards him with a silkworm for enjoying the training. He decides that he'll take Haya to a nicer place for training. They both leave the accommodation area to find a spot to train Haya. While doing so, they overhear some people discussing the rumors surrounding Yunzi's scandal. Someone from the crowd tries to defend Yunzi, while Zhu thinks that the rumors are getting way out of hand. They arrive at their destination which is a lake with a waterfall. Haya gets into the lake and starts showing some impressive moves. Zhu tells him to come back as Haya starts to get a little too boastful and gets way too close to the waterfall. Zhu chases after Haya to save him. He grabs Haya and tosses him out of the water, nagging him to not be so naughty again. Haya makes some noise in pain but is finally safe. Zhu realizes that the tree branch he's been holding onto has broken. He exclaims in horror as he begins flowing with the water. Seeing this, Haya jumps into the lake and starts chasing Zhu to save him. However, Zhu tells him to go back as it wasn't safe. Haya ignores him and continues chasing after him. Haya starts to feel more and more powerful. Suddenly, the horn on his head gets bigger and sprouts out, covered in blood. Haya screams as he is about to jump off the waterfall. Zhu continues falling, waiting for his demise. Suddenly, he groans in pain as he lands on something. Zhu is confused when he looks down to see that he has landed on the waterfall flood dragon. Out of nowhere, a woman named Duan Gang, the dragon master of the waterfall flood dragon, comes in front of Zhu. She questions why he wants to die stating that his body is a gift from his parents. Zhu clarifies that he wasn't trying to commit suicide and this was all an accident. Meanwhile, Haya finally jumps off the waterfall and realizes that this was a mistake. As the little crocodile starts falling, the waterfall flood dragon saves him. Haya excitedly jumps toward Zhu, who is astonished to see that Haya's horn has grown. The little crocodile spirit licks Zhu's face while Zhu warns him that even if he has grown stronger, he can't just jump off the waterfall like that. He says that it could kill him. Duan Gang advises Zhu to raise Haya well because he has likely discovered the path to his dragon gate. She states if there was nothing else, he should stop interrupting her training. Zhu bows and thanks Duan Gang for saving them. After thanking the woman, Zhu gives Haya a tender pat and assures him that, now that he was stronger, he should be able to defeat the group of wolf spiritlings that had bullied him at the dragon storage hall earlier. Haya looks at the waterfall flood dragon in admiration. Noticing Haya staring, Shu chuckles and remarks that, of course, the little crocodile's ambition won't be satisfied by battling those tiny wolf spirits. He assures him that one day he'll be able to wrestle with a flood dragon like this as well. Back at the academy residence, Xiaoying and another student's spirits can be seen fighting. Xiaoying admits defeat, and the student insults him. Shu tells Haya not to pay attention to them. Haya's stomach growls and Zhu asks him if he's hungry. Zhu nervously hands him a grouper fish and promises to get him a basket full of silkworms the next time. Haya feels betrayed, he calls him a liar and cries that this wasn't their deal. The next day, Zhu keeps his promise and works in the dragon storage hall in exchange for silkworms. His clothes are all dirty from working. He realizes that as Haya grows up, this won't work anymore. He will need to earn money for their food. He also thinks of Baichi. He knows that since Baichi loves nectar, he will need to feed her a lot of nectar when she wakes up from hibernation. Xiaoing interrupts Zhu's train of thought by expressing his disgust at the repulsive smell of dragon poo emanating from Zhu. He suggests that Zhu should also clean the back of their classmates' houses since he's already been cleaning up dragon poo. Zhu retorts that it isn't his responsibility. Xiaoing then gives Zhu an ultimatum. Slamming his broom on the ground, he says that if he didn't show up for tomorrow's spiritling battle, he'll assume that Zhu has lost. He says that whoever loses will have to clean the area around the houses. Zhu Minglang puts Xiaoing in his place, saying that it would be reasonable and logical to accept the bet. However, since he doesn't play by their private rules, he doesn't have to do anything for them. He further adds that he doesn't need them to clean his area nor will he do any chores for them. Xiaoing gets scared by this. As Zhu walks away, Xiaoing thinks that Ming Lang didn't need to be so cocky. He dares him, in his mind, 
to speak with the wolf razor in the same manner. Zhu is back in the accommodation area. He calls for Haya, who is munching on the grouper fish. Zhu shows him the silkworms he got for him and puts the basket down. Haya's eyes shine as he looks at the basket full of silkworms. He spits out the grouper fish and starts digging in the basket of silkworms. Haya quickly empties the whole basket and lies on the ground with his full belly. Zhu is again reminded of the fact that as Haya grows up he will need more food. He wonders where can he earn more dragon food. Suddenly, he remembers that while he was coming back from the dragon storage hall, he had seen a task at the academy mission hall that had decent rewards. He decides that he'll try it out later. At the academy mission hall, Zhu is looking over the mission list. He sees a mission about sieging a city and realizes that most of the tasks were for true dragon tamers. He comments that the academy is really lax on its mission postings. A particular task catches Zhu's eye. It said that a neighboring city was being attacked by an evil demon who wanted to sacrifice the souls of the commanders and slaves to practice spiritual magic, endangering the safety of the entire population. The duration of the mission is for three months with a hefty reward of a quarter of the city tax of the neighboring city. Zhu is shocked by the hefty reward. He feels disappointed, thinking that if Bai Chi hadn't regressed, he could have actually given the mission a try. He stumbles upon another task and thinks that this could be a good way to train Haya and help him make money at the same time. The said task was about eradicating the spotted bluefish demon spirits that are in Lichuan Lake. The duration of this task was just half a month with a reward of a grain of gold. Zhu decides that he'll accept this task. At Lichuan Lake, Zhu has brought Haya. He examines the fish and realizes that when the bluefish are gathered together, they use the movement of their whiskers to notify their companions of an enemy attack. This way the other fish will be able to avoid Haya's attack in advance. Haya swims in circles, trying to chase the bluefish. Shu tries to encourage Haya by saying that the spotted bluefish aren't that much faster than him. Therefore, he could still defeat them. However, Haya is already exhausted. Shu decides to bring Haya back to the waterfall lake to practice his speed first. He throws Haya into the lake while cheering that he can do it. Haya cries that he hates this place. Haya starts training and continues till night time. He comes out of the water and lays on the ground saying that he feels exhausted. Chu says that his training has ended for the day. He adds that they should go home and tempts him with a reward of silkworms for his hard work. Haya immediately stands up and rushes for them to get home. After a week of extensive training, Haya and Zhu are back at Lichuan Lake. Zhu encourages Haya by saying that they'll successfully catch the spotted bluefish demon this time. Haya gets ready to jump in the water. He finally jumps as Zhu screams for him to attack. Under the water, Haya has found the bluefish. Zhu advises Haya to scatter the bluefish and chase them one at a time. Haya listens to his advice and catches his first fish. Zhu keeps cheering him on. After a while, Haya catches all the fish with ease and Zhu praises him. At Phoenix Falls Town, Zhu examines the grain of gold in his hand and wonders if this would be enough to buy a lot of silkworms and nectar for Haya and Baichi. As Zhu continues to walk, he is stopped by a girl claiming that she had finally found him. Zhu turns around and finds that the girl is the same peach seller Fang Yen Yen. Yen Yen accuses him of avoiding her and says that he promised her to buy a basket of peaches. Shu takes out his Dragon Tamer's Academy emblem, proving that he is a student. He shows it to her and corrects her, saying that she is the one who owes him a basket. Nian Nian is caught off guard and asks him where is his dragon. Shu teases her not to change the subject and demands the freshest, biggest, and juiciest peaches. The peach seller scoffs in anger and finally admits defeat. She tells him that he can come to his house to get the peaches after she's done selling peaches for the day. Zhu decides to ask her whether she knows of a good place that sells good silkworms and nectar. Nian Nian informs him that her family sells them, and she starts boasting about her family's business. Zhu tells her to stop advertising and says he'll buy the silkworms, the nectar, and whatever else he needs as long as the quality is good. She asks him how much he wants to order. Zhu replies that since he has a grain of gold, he'd like 10 baskets of silkworms and 10 jars of nectar. Nian Nian curses and exclaims he should just rob them. 
Xu asks her what she meant by that and accuses her looking of down on him. Nian Nian points at a pleasure boat and teases Zhu, saying that he should try it out since he needed some money urgently. She adds that the pleasure boat doesn't only offer beautiful women but also men, and he would be pretty popular among the old widowed women. Zhu gets furious and questions how she could treat a customer like that. He adds that since she is an acquaintance, he would let her have the opportunity to earn more and demands 10 baskets of silkworm and 8 jars of nectar this time, or else he'll look for someone else. Nian Nian ignores his demand, offering 7 jars of nectar and 7 baskets of silkworms. She challenges him to find another nectar seller in the town. Xu believes her and decides that he'll just take on another mission to earn more money. He tells her that they have a deal, but Nian Nian is busy with someone else. Zhu is shocked by her abnormal behavior. Suddenly, Zhu's eyes widen. He looks at the woman beside Nian Nian and Wothiers whether she is Yunzi. Zhu asks the woman what brings her here and whether she had come to specially meet him. The woman asks whether they knew each other. While Nian Nian starts insulting his flirting skills, Nian Nian tells the woman named Nan Ling Sha to ignore him and offers her some peaches. Nan Ling Sha accepts it and says that she needs to be back at the academy and bids her farewell. After she leaves, Xu asks Nian Nian what she called the woman earlier. Nian Nian says Ling Sha's name again and questions whether he is genuinely a member of the academy since he was unaware of a beauty like her. Xu rubs his head and says that he has always studied on his own and doesn't know much about the situation at the academy. Nian Nian tells him that she is the young miss of the Nan family and says that he won't ever get her, so he shouldn't pursue her. Xu questions whether he actually confused her with Yinzi. At the Li clan royal court, Kong Tong is having a conversation with Luo Xiao. She tells him that she's aware of his feelings and will soon ask Yunzi's father to consider her marriage, so he must take his chance. Xiao thanks her for this. After that, Kong Tong hands Xiao the decree that the Lord had asked her to give to him. She informs him that the nine cities of Wutu have allied and the city-state's army is already heading over so he must leave tomorrow to teach them a lesson. She further adds that this mission is different, it would make his reputation rise exponentially. Xiao accepts the scroll and promises not to disappoint them. Before Xiao could leave, Kong Tong asks him whether he recognizes the man that came with her. Xiao replies that his name is Zhu Minglang, Yunzi had told her that he's a member of the clan. Kong Tong says that there is no one with that name in the clan. She tells him to forget about it, and just focus on the mission, she would figure this matter out herself. Xiao bows and agrees. He clenches his teeth and wonders why had Yunzi lied to him about Zhu Minglang's identity. Back at the accommodation area, Zhu is found sneezing. He hears someone call out his name. Suddenly, he finds himself in the spirit domain and sees the cocoon breaking. He gushes with excitement that Bai Qi's finally emerging out of her cocoon. He looks at Bai Qi in amazement thinking that she doesn't look the same. Bai Chi rubs her face against Zhu's and Zhu tells her that he has prepared Bai Chi's favorite nectar for her. He feeds the nectar to Bai Chi, telling her to grow well. Haya looks amazed by Bai Chi's beauty. Zhu introduces Haya to Bai Chi and informs them that they'll be partners from now on. Haya waves at her, calling her pretty little Bai. Bai Chi does not like this and freezes Haya. Zhu asks Haya if he was okay while Haya defends himself saying that he isn't a scoundrel. Zhu nervously laughs as tensions grow between Bai Qi and Haya. Suddenly, Zhu looks at the students outside his window and is reminded that he has an end-of-month lesson today. At the Dragon Tamer Academy large class hall, the students are discussing Zhao's gilded fire dragon who's been massacring the people of East Dawn City. They discuss amongst themselves that Luo Xiao is a ruthless person who was recently recruited by the Li clan. One of them defends Xiao, saying that there are no men who wouldn't do the same for a better reputation. Point. One of the students says that when his wolf dragonizes, he will conquer a city and everyone will be welcome to see him. He laughs and jokes around that he would surely entertain them. Xiaoing interrupts the student and says that actually, Nan Yi should be the first to do it since his spirit was a dragon child to begin with, and is already able to release some low-level magic. He further adds that he was different from them, they still needed to search for the path to the Dragon Gate. The women look at Nan Yi with hard eyes, gushing about the fact that Nan Yi already has a dragon to begin with. 
the wolf spirit's owner gets offended and says that his wolf is just about to dragonize. He further says not to talk to him about an infant dragon child and suggests that his wolf spirit might just treat it as meat and eat it in a single bite. Nanyi turns to him and says that maybe he doesn't know the difference between a wolf and a dragon. Nanye's dragon could easily tear his wolf into pieces. The wolf spirit's owner turns toward Zhu Minglang and says that everyone has been beaten to death by him except for him. He suggests that Nanyi should fight Minglang to prove his capability. Zhu thinks that he only thought of this guy as an aggressive and competitive buffoon. He didn't think that he'd stoop so low. Zhu knew he did this on purpose and that he is trying to kill two birds with one stone. Nanyi starts to consider the challenge and asks Zhu wasn't he the same guy who was begging for a spiritling like a beggar on his enrollment. He questions whether Zhu thinks he's all that after just a month at the academy. Nanyi adds that Zhu should cling to his wild white chicken of a spiritling, arguing that he doesn't even need his green dragon and can strangle it with a single hand. Zhu scrunches his eyebrows, he wasn't expecting this. He was fine with being humiliated but he wasn't going to let anyone humiliate Baichi. Baichi opens her eyes and starts flying. The women fawn over Baichi's beauty, asking what kind of a dragon she is. Nanyi clenches his teeth and insults Baichi saying that chicken dragons like Baichi rely on their feather to survive, he taunts that perhaps they haven't seen a real dragon before. Baichi continues to fly and settles on top of the podium made of rock. Nanyi feels even more offended by this and starts to summon his dragon. The people are shocked to see that, despite only being enrolled recently, Nanyi really is a dragon tamer and already has a spirit domain. Nanyi's dragon has finally been summoned from his spirit domain. The wolf spirit's owner looks at the dragon horrified and thinks that luckily he was smart enough to let Xu Minglang test his strength. Otherwise, his big wolf spirit would have been bitten into two pieces by the green dragon. Nanyi taunts Zhu telling him to look at the difference between a dragon and a wild chicken. The women cheer for Nanyi. He maintains his composure but giggles and blushes inwardly because of the lady's comments. He orders his green forest dragon to kill Baichi. The green forest dragon makes the first move. He opens his mouth, letting out a green light, to attack Baichi. Baichi dodges the green light. She creates rings of blue light and uses them to fight the green forest dragon. The attack causes the green forest dragon to collapse to the ground. Baichi wins the fight and sits on top of the defeated dragon. Nanyi is stunned by this and everyone in the class stares at Baichi in shock. Nanyi curses out of frustration. Shu tells Baichi to return with a smug look on his face. Baichi listens to him and hurries over, sitting on Zhu's shoulder. People start exclaiming that Baichi really is a true dragon. The owner of the wolf spirit laughs nervously and lies, claiming that he knew Zhu was powerful and that he had just proven it today. Xiaoing also compliments Zhu, saying he knew Zhu was different from the rest of them. The women flock towards Zhu and compliment him by calling him awesome. They exclaim that Ming Lang will make a great dragon master in the future. They begin flirting with Zhu wishing for his dragon to become more strong and beautiful and asked him whether he has a girlfriend. This causes Xu to blush. He boasts to himself that Bai Qi indeed lived up to his expectations and fights like an adult dragon. He believes that his days of glory are returning. Zhu mocks Nanyi, advising him to recall his dragon and care for it properly, claiming that it still had potential. Nanyi starts to recall his dragon in defeat but the dragon does not listen to him. Instead, the green forest dragon stands up and yells, his body illuminated by green light. Nanyi is shocked to see his dragon advancing. The green forest dragon had grown bigger and stronger. A purple light was coming out of his mouth. He seems ready to attack Baiji. Zhu stared at the vicious dragon before him in shock, sweating nervously. He desperately tries to get out of the situation repeating that Nanye's dragon has great potential and that they should consider him to have lost this round in order to even the score. Nanye dismisses Zhu's comments as nonsensical, emphasizing that the contest was far from over, as he hadn't even recalled his dragon yet. He once again insults Baichi, mocking her as a mere chicken dragon, and asserts that possessing a few win-related abilities didn't mean she could be a real dragon. Zhu is about to admit defeat. However, Baichi had other plans as she starts to fly fiercely, ignoring Zhu who is calling for her. 
Baichi flies over the vicious dragon's head, who appears to be ready to kill her. Zhu's eyes widen as he recognizes Baichi's battle cry. He wonders whether things are about to turn serious. The green forest dragon takes the initiative and launches an attack on Baichi, using its vines to strike. However, Baichi skillfully evades the incoming vines and retaliates by launching ice towards them. This causes some of the vines to become encased in ice. Undeterred, Baichi continues to dodge the remaining vines, swiftly positioning herself in front of the green forest dragon. But then, to everyone's surprise, the green forest dragon begins releasing a poisonous purple-colored substance. Baichi is caught off guard by this. Chu warns Baichi to watch out for the poison. The students start running from the hall, trying to save themselves. The purple-colored poison lands on a pillar and rapidly melts it. The wolf spirit's owner tells everyone to run before their skin melts from the poison as he dodges it himself. Meanwhile, Baichi has encased herself in a layer of ice, effectively freezing her own body, and the poison is unable to harm her. She breaks through the ice and heads directly toward the green forest dragon's face. Zhu starts growing concerned about Baichi's increasingly reckless behavior. He raises his voice and urges her to cease fighting with the green forest dragon. Zhu activates his spiritual domain, preparing to take immediate action. He decides that the moment the green dragon makes physical contact with Baichi, he will forcefully recall Baichi back into the safety of the spiritual domain. Nanyi notices Zhu's attempts to forcefully recall Baichi and breaks into an evil laugh mocking Zhu for being scared and saying that it is already too late. Baichi looks more determined than ever. She freezes her tail and points it towards the dragon's eye. The thin ice is about to pierce the green dragon's eye. A loud noise comes from the hall and all hell breaks loose. The crowd of students look back in horror at the study hall. Baichi emerges from the smoke, victorious. She flies and lands on top of Zhu's arm. The green dragon lies defeated covered in ice. Nanya's arrogance crumbles as he collapses to his knees in disbelief. He exclaims in disbelief, wondering how his real dragon could be defeated by a lowly spirit like Baichi. Frustrated and desperate for answers, he turns to Zhu, demanding that he reveals what kind of a dragon Baichi is and how was she able to beat his half-grown green forest dragon. Before Zhu has a chance to respond, a voice says that it is a white ice morning dragon, the students turn to the voice and realize that it is none other than teacher Duan Lan and greet her. Zhu realizes that she's the same woman who had saved his life at the waterfall lake. Teacher Duan acknowledges the performance of the dragons and tells them to go back to their seats. Nen Yi asks her about his dragon's eye. She interrupts him and hands him a vial of medicine, instructing him to apply it to his green dragon for its speedy recovery. She tells him to be grateful that the white ice morning dragon didn't directly pierce his dragon's pupil, which could have been a fatal blow. Nanyi is surprised to find out that his green forest dragon is not blinded. Once everyone is back in their seats, Teacher Duan starts the lesson, stating that today's topic is about dragon bloodlines. The dragon bloodlines are separated into three great bloodlines, the ancient dragon, great dragon and azure dragon. The ancient dragons possess battle skills, great dragons have the ability to cast magic and azure dragons are best at mystic arts. Xiaoing questions the teacher about Bai Qi's bloodline. Teacher Duan informs him that Zhu Minglang's white ice morning dragon's main bloodline consisted of a silvermoon winged dragon which belongs to the azure dragon, whereas her secondary bloodline is of a starwind ice dragon, belonging to the great dragon. She also points out that during the battle, Baichi had only utilized ice and wind magic, without employing any of the Azure Dragon's mystic arts. Continuing the lesson, Teacher Duan explains the four important stages of a living creature's life, infant phase, growth phase, adult phase, and complete phase. She mentions that true dragons are categorized as Dragon Child, Dragon General, Dragon Lord, Dragon Monarch, and Dragon King. Furthermore, she reveals that Nanye's green dragon is currently in the dragon child level of the growth phase, while Chu Minglang's white ice morning dragon possesses the strength of a dragon child even in its infant phase. Teacher Duan speculates that if Shu's white ice morning dragon enters the complete phase, she may step into the dragon monarch level. She wishes Zhu Minglang to train Bai Qi well. The students admire the white ice morning dragon and are envious of Zhu having such a powerful pet. 
Chu thinks that if Bai Qi still hadn't awakened her Azure Dragon Mystic Art, it meant that he would gain its powers during the growth phase. He also realizes that since Bai Qi didn't know any dragon magic in the past, this meant her regression wasn't just a reversal of her life cycle but some kind of metamorphic rebirth. Teacher Duan tells Nan Yi to not be discouraged and explains that everyone can open multiple spiritual domains. He might also receive a very powerful pet in the future and let his impatience and arrogance in the way of practicing. Nan Yi scrunches his eyebrows at this. He side-eyes Zhu and promises himself that he'll surpass him one day. Back at home. Bai Qi is eating nectar while Zhu is thinking about the importance of nurturing and feeding Bai Qi. He is worried that if he fails to do a good job, Bai Qi's Azure Dragon Mystic Arts might never awaken. This causes Zhu to realize that he doesn't have much nectar left. He starts to think about different ways to acquire more nectar for Bai Qi. His chain of thought is interrupted by a voice wishing someone a bright future. He goes out and recognizes Teacher Duan. He is shocked to see that little pervert Haya had his head on Duan's chest. Duan turns to Zhu and asks him for a favor. Zhu agrees and leaves with her. They arrive at the waterfall lake. Duan explains that there is a 100-year-old water monster under the pond. It lacks strength but has a great sense of smell and hides among the rocks whenever she summons her deep river dragon. She doesn't want to use her mystic arts to kill the monster since it would harm the other creatures. Therefore, she needs Haya's help to draw the monster out. Zhu instructs Haya to quickly swim away when the monster tries to jump at him and tells him not to get caught and to leave the rest to Teacher Duan's flood dragon. Little Haya cries that he's being used as bait. He runs crying to the teacher for comfort. Duan assures the Haya that there won't be any danger and praises him by calling him powerful. The perverted crocodile buries his face in her chest and claims that he can do it. Haya enters the lake and starts swimming. The monster starts chasing Haya. Haya starts crying out for his mom out of fear. The monster kills the fish with his powerful pink light as it continues to chase after Haya. Zhu calls out the teacher's name, but she silences him, saying that they're not under the waterfall yet. The monster gets dangerously close to Haya who starts screaming for help. Zhu starts to activate his spiritual domain to save Haya but is stopped by Dun who tells her that he won't always be there to save him. She further adds that Haya needs to break through his potential, or else he will never turn into a real dragon. Zhu decides to listen to Teacher Duan's advice and realizes its significance. He draws a parallel between eagles and Haya, acknowledging that without challenges or pushing boundaries, eagles would remain confined to their nests, waiting to be fed. Similarly, he understands that Haya needs to be pushed beyond his limits in order to unlock his true potential. He looks at Haya with determination as the monster is about to catch the little crocodile. As the monster gets closer to Haya, he turns around and faces it. He activates his powers and a bright yellow light shoots from his horn. He attacks the monster with the bright yellow light, sending it flying through the air. The water flood dragon emerges out of the waterfall and bites the monster, killing it. Blood splatters everywhere as the monster lands in the water. Zhu is shocked by this while Dun has a proud look on her face. The lifeless body of the monster floats in the water with blood pooling around it. Zhu is suddenly reminded of Haya and begins to worry about his well-being. The water flood dragon saves Haya using his tail to pull him out of the water. Zhu carries Haya in his arms, assuring him that even the water flood dragon is impressed by his accomplishments and commends him for a job well done. Haya proudly exclaims that he and the water flood dragon successfully defeated the monster in their combined effort. Shu turns to look at Teacher Duan and starts to inquire about the monster. However, he abruptly halts his question as he observes her extracting a ball from within the creature. Duan explains that the ball is actually a demonic pearl of the violent catfish. She gifts it to Zhu as a reward for his little crocodile's hard work and informs him that the pearl would speed up Haya's dragonization. Zhu expresses his gratitude and accepts the gift. Seated atop her dragon, Teacher Duan prepares to depart, instructing Zhu not to thank her since he has rightfully earned his reward. She invites him to visit her house, where she promises to provide a jar of frosty snow tree nectar, explaining that it would be more beneficial for Baichi than regular nectar back at home. Shu tells Baichi to slow down as she hastily eats the frosty snow nectar. 
He thinks to himself that Baichi seems to like Duan Lan's frosty snow nectar. As Baichi lies down rubbing her belly full of nectar, Zhu decides that he'll go to the library the next day to gather information on how to raise dragons so that he'll be prepared in advance. The next day, Zhu is at the library. He reads a book and finds out that the Silvermoon Winged Dragon and the Starwind Ice Dragon are both fast-growing dragons, having a growth rate of only one and a half years from their infant to growth phase. He realizes that it would only take Baichi one and a half years to reach maturity and with the nourishment of the spirit domain and a sufficient amount of nectar to feed, the process could be completed only within a month. Xu closes the book and experiences a tinge of sadness at his inability to provide Baichi with pure frosty snow nectar, which could significantly enhance the growth of Baichi's ice feathers and strengthen her ice magic abilities. He places the book back on the shelf and is reminded of Haya's increased appetite as a result of consuming the demonic pearl. His eyes fall on a particular book with a golden cover. After reading the book, he is thrilled to find out that dragons like to collect large amounts of gold and silver, and looting dragon lairs is the fastest way to make money. However, he changes his mind and wonders whether he should go back to his old profession. As he puts the book back on the shelf, his eyes fall on a woman's chest. He is confused about whether she is Nan Ling Sha or Yunzi. He decides to take the safer route, acting like he doesn't know her, and says what a coincidence it is that they meet again. The woman asks him whether he really believes that it is a coincidence. Ju realizes that it is Yunzi and asks her whether she's here to visit him. The woman starts to activate her powers and clarifies that she's actually here to kill him. Shu wonders whether she wants to kill him for slandering her reputation. He asks her why didn't she just kill him before. The woman replies that she has come to the realization that keeping him alive is like keeping a poisonous thorn that stings her every time she starts to feel a little happier. She further adds that instead of experiencing pain and torture every day, it would be better to get rid of him once and for all. Zhu is caught off guard by her but understands that while he's hiding raising dragons and reading books, she has to bear with the dirty gossip. She asks him whether he has any last words to say before his death. Zhu replies that he thought she was different from the other girls since she never took out her anger on others despite suffering such humiliation. She gives him a death glare. Zhu thanks her for providing him with the enrollment letter and a chance to study at the academy. As he gets ready to meet his fate, the woman backs away from him and exclaims that she had even given him the enrollment letter. Xu suddenly realizes that she isn't Yunzi and exclaims she's Nan Ling Sha. Nan Ling Sha replies that she's Yunzi's younger sister. Xu is taken aback by the revelation and questions whether they are sisters who were born in the same house. Nan Ling Sha replies that she follows her mom's surname, while Yunzi had taken their dad's surname. She further adds that Yunzi stays in the Li clan while she stays with the Nan family. Ling Sha slams her hand against the shelf and states that So Zhu is the beggar that has dragged Yunzi down her throne as a crown princess. She is surprised that Yunzi even left him alive and let him join the Dragon Academy. She sarcastically thanks him, saying that because of him she has to wear a veil every time she goes out, and since not many people knew that they're twin sisters, her reputation could be tarnished as well. Zhu nervously tries to defend himself claiming that things aren't as they appear and that her sister T can testify to what sort of man he is. Ling Sha replies that they aren't that close and perhaps she might even think that this current predicament is all her doing. Xu tries to be understanding and says that she's a victim too. He's surprised that his sister-in-law is talking to him and doesn't know what to say. Ling Sha tells him to shut up, claiming that she has nothing to do with him. Ling Sha says that he looks pretty decent and wonders why the rumors spread to this extent, calling him a cheap, dirty beggar who's covered in sores. Xu smugly says that he did look a little handsome. Ling Sha rolls her eyes and calls him shameless. She demands to know the truth about everything that's going on between them or else she'd kill him. Zhu nervously agrees that he starts to tell her everything from the beginning about how he used to live a comfortable life on the southern side of Mulberry Town but one day he was robbed by the bandits of Wutu, leaving him to beg on the streets, and how a bowl of a poisonous porridge was the start to all this. She kicks him in the face and tells him to stop exaggerating things. Zhu insists that it is all true. Ling Xia says that she understood why Yunzi is keeping him alive. Zhu asks her the reason. 
She tells him that if he had died, Yunzi would forever be known as the one who was tainted by a beggar. However, if she kept him alive and turned him into a dragon tamer, her reputation might be saved a bit. Ling Xia expresses her realization, stating that this is how Yunzi plans to heal her wounds, by sending him to the academy, placing a bet on his future. She takes her veil out and leaves the library, telling Zhu to take care of himself, while Ling Xia is exiting the library. She overhears three individuals praising Luo Xiao. She ignores them and continues to leave, but her attention is caught when she hears the same group spreading rumors about her sister. They claim that Luo Xiao was a lewd princess from the start, and during her warring days, she would command men to serve her in her tent. Meanwhile, Zhu is sitting on the library floor when Bai Qi comes out of his robe. She cheerfully calls Zhu the greatest. Zhu giggles and exclaims that Bai Qi is right, he shouldn't care about other people's opinions. He decides that he won't let Yunzi lose the bet, and will try his best to become a dragon master as soon as possible. He decides to set a small goal for now, and he and Bai Qi start cheering that he'll step into the dragon lord rank. Others at the library think that he has gone crazy from raising dragons. One of them says that picking out a dragon is just like gambling, tons of people have lost their fortunes doing so. He hopes that Zhu doesn't become suicidal when he fails. Back at home. Zhu is telling Bai Qi and Haya that his family is famous for casting armor, and how hard it is to find dragon armor even for a thousand gold pieces. Bai Qi and Haya are amazed by this. He continues that he didn't really want to follow in his family's footsteps and wasn't that good at the craft. However, he promises that with a few months of practice, he'll make an indestructible suit of armor for them. He further adds that tomorrow he's going to the forge to find a job so that he can sharpen his skills and earn some money for their food at the same time point one day later. Zhu is exhausted from working. He thinks that he isn't as strong anymore and jokingly contemplates whether he should work at the pleasure boat like Nian Nian had suggested. Half a month later. At his house, Zhu exclaims that it was easy enough to sell armor to the soldiers, however, if they could convince the generals and nobles to buy their armor, they could easily manage their expenses. He further adds that with his current skills, he'll be able to forge a dragon armor someday. He announces that he has an expedition class in a few days as he opens the doors. Shu gets surprised by Haya's speedy growth and exclaims that the 200-year-old pearl is indeed effective. He exclaims that it has only been half a month but Haya has grown so big and decides to call him Big Haya from now on. Zhu informs Haya that he needs to go away for a few days for the expedition class, so he would have to take care of himself. Haya gets upset by this. Zhu ties a spirit collar around Haya's tail so that others don't mistake him for a wild crocodile. He instructs Haya to head towards the bridge every morning, saying that a dark girl like him would feed him silkworms. Haya happily agrees to this. At the Li clan family royal court, two marriages were going to be announced. The women gathered their mock Yunzi. A woman named Mu Ching taunts that she prefers to keep her dignity by staying at home and being clean. She further adds that when she'll come of age, she'll let the seniors handle her marriage matters and that will be considered as her contribution to the clan. Yunzi remains silent at this. Kong Tong, the lady of the house, makes a formal announcement about the first marriage, which is between Li Kong Shi and Du Qing. Kong Tong, the lady of the house, announces the first marriage which is between Li Kong Shi and Du Qing. She narrates their story recounting how Kong Shi had accompanied the old madam to the Zong Palace's annual feast the previous year. It was during this event that Du Qing, the fourth young master, fell head over heels in love with Kong Shi at first sight. She further states that they'll be heading to the Zong Palace next month to facilitate this marriage. Kong Shi states that she is willing to accept this decision, but she needs to find out what kind of a person Du Qing is. She further adds that if finds him to be a bad person who has no respect for his elders, she would ask the patriarch and the lady to reconsider this marriage. Point one of the ladies from the crowd is shocked to find out that she doesn't personally know Du Qing and exclaims that this must mean Du Qing has fallen head over heels for her by just seeing her from afar. Mu Qing also comments that rumors are going around that Ling Xiao City State's Ling family's eldest daughter went all the way to the Zong Palace but Du Qing didn't even grant her an audience. Kong Tong starts to announce the second marriage. 
She announces that it has been decided that Yunzi is going to marry into the Ling Xiao city state's Ling family. Luo Xiao is enraged by this. He thinks about how could they do this when everyone knows that he is obsessed with Yunzi. He stands up and tries to get in a word but is silenced by the patriarch who tells him to sit down. Xiao sits back down, defeated. A man in armor questions the lady about how can this be their response to the invasion of the Ling Xiao city state's Ling family that they had discussed earlier. He further points out that as the crown princess, Yunzi had massacred Ling Xiao's city's invading armies multiple times. Everyone belonging to the Ling Xiao city state hates Yunzi, so why would the Ling Xiao family be willing to connect them by marriage? Kong Tong replies that naturally, they won't agree to a normal marriage, so Yunzi will be marrying into the family as a concubine. The man in armor is appalled by this revelation and questions whether this would even count as a connection by marriage. All the ladies start gossiping, calling the decision ridiculous, and questioning how can the ancestral dragon city States still maintain its pride. One of them defends Yunzi, saying that even if she has lost her virginity, she is still their former mistress. The patriarch stands up and silences everyone. He states that their western army's morale has collapsed due to Yunzi's scandal and due to this, they're no longer able to fend off the Ling Xiao city-state's invasion. He further adds that when the Futa city's riots died down, they'll repay the Ling Xiao city-state double. He concludes that the matter is settled and anyone who disagrees shall be punished. The lady and the patriarch leave the court, dismissing everyone. Luo Xiao curses at them, thinking that Li Yunzi is only his. Outside the family court, three women discuss that Yunzi should just find a servant and marry him. At the very least, if she serves her husband well as the city lord's concubine, perhaps she'll live a better life. One of them remarks that she won't have any problems in this since she can move her waist even for a lonely beggar. The man in the armor sighs at the women gossiping and approaches Yunzi. He starts apologizing to her, but Yunzi interrupts him, saying that she's fine. The man sympathizes with her, saying that her father is easily influenced by the lady. He adds that he can't believe that her father intends to offer her to the enemies, knowing that she has made great contributions to their city. The man tells her to just escape from the city and that he would help her in finding a good man. Yunzi replies to the man named Chen that she won't run away. Chen starts to scold her, saying that ruining her life in exchange for a pitiful peace isn't worth it. Furthermore, he promises to never let a beast like Ling Xiao City step into their territory, even if it costs him his life. Yunzi asks Chen if he knew why the rebellion in Wutu will never be pacified, regardless of how many people they kill. Chen replies that the Wutu barbarians have always been keen to take advantage of the fertile soil of the ancestral city-state, but if their hands are free, they can definitely manage to kill those barbarians. Yunzi sighs, saying that there is no end to the Wutu rebels. Chen scratches his head and says that she should just worry about her own self. Yunzi slams her fist down and exclaims that she won't run away. Chu sneezes as he rides a dragon, gliding through the sky. He figures that winter is just around the corner. Xu overhears a student talking about how amazing it would be to go on a journey where they could see an azure dragon that could even control the weather. The student further adds that the azure dragon is the best dragon. However, another student points out that not all azure dragons can create clouds and rain. Teacher Duan confirms the student's claim, saying that among mystic arts every dragon possesses different abilities. Some of them can call upon rain and snow while others can put curses on each other. She further adds that even dragons with the same bloodline may awaken different abilities, depending on their growth and training. After hearing this, Chu thinks that Haya's lineage is most likely of an ancient dragon, and if he could provide Haya with heavy armor, the crocodile spirit will definitely be invincible. He also wonders what kind of mystic arts would Baichi develop since her bloodline consists of both the Great Dragon and the Azure Dragon. They have now arrived at Glory Valley City. A man bows down and greets the teachers that have arrived from the Lichuan Academy. Point one of the teachers named Kabe furiously questions the man that is the city lord of the Glory Valley City. How could he not have foreseen the lack of irrigation water in the streams, knowing that the mountains were frozen? He tells the man that the East Dawn stronghold, which is 25 miles away, is the front line of the battle and that they need to restock their supplies. He threatens him, questioning whether he believes that he would be able to keep his head if the Wutu plebeians managed to fight their way in. 
Qian Jing, the city lord of Glory Valley City, apologizes saying that Kabei was right. He informs him that he had requested a rain dragon from the ancestral city-state a month ago, but they weren't as good as Kabais and Duan lands. Qian Jing then directs the teachers and the students to rest in the mansion. Kei Bei exclaims that they don't have time to waste and need to start right away since the matter concerns the front lines and is of great importance. The city lord informs him that the temperatures are going to fall since it is about to be dark and says that the rain could turn into ice, freezing the ground and hurting the crops instead Kei realizes that the man is right and starts to walk away in agreement, while Duan says that they'll discuss the matter tomorrow. Kei turns to the students and informs them that the rain will be performed by their teacher Duan's deep river dragon, demonstrating the mystic arts. He orders them to wake up early morning so that they don't miss the demonstration. The students say yes in unison. At night time, Ju notices a fire emerging from behind the mountains and wonders if it is wartime again. He is reminded of Luo Xiao and thinks that he is still weak, while Xiao has gotten stronger. If he finds out about Ju's and Yunzi's affair, the guy would be the first one to kill him. His thoughts are interrupted by Teacher Duan calling out his name. She informs him that the rain can only temporarily nourish the crops. They require more water for irrigation and livestock. Duan tells him to check the stream at dawn to see if anything is blocking the stream and cutting off the waterway. She orders him not to go too far as there might be demons in the deep mountain and forests, and to come back before the summoning starts. Zhu bows and says that he'll do as she says. I in the morning. Zhu is there to check the stream. He asks Bai Chi why she is still so small, claiming that she should have evolved by now. Bai Chi crosses her arms in anger and says how could he judge strength by size, while Zhu laughs at this. Suddenly, his attention is drawn to something. It is a path. Ju finds it strange that there is a path over there. Dot he looks through the bushes and finds out what is blocking the stream. It is a mountain dike. He exclaims that it looks like it's been built by humans. Dot he steps on the dike and exclaims in surprise that he finds that behind the dike there is enough water for irrigation and livestock. All they need do is to open the dike stone gate. He wonders who had built this dike anyway, back at the mansion. Zhu calls out Teacher Duan and Teacher K. He suddenly stops. The city lord asks Zhu whether he had seen the dike. Zhu replies affirmatively. The city lord asks him whether he is going to inform the teachers about it. Zhu tells him to stop beating around the bush and get straight to the point. The city lord gets on his knees and pleads with Zhu not to misunderstand him and says that he has a question for him. Zhu asks him to say it already. The city lord finally asks him whether he knew that 50 miles away the soldiers are fighting with the rebels of Wutu and does he think that the soldiers and the people of Valley City will be able to resist. Xu realizes that the dike wall is the only thing keeping the rebels of Wutu from attacking Valley City. The city lord calls him a wise man for his realization. Just as he says that, it starts raining. Xu questions Qian Jing whether he thinks that the frontline fortress won't be able to stop the mobs of Wutu. The city lord soaks in the rain and starts to reply. Xu cuts him off and asks what makes him think that the front lines won't be able, able to stop the rebels. The city lord replies that two reports had come from the front lines before he met Xu. One of them was delayed. Xu comes to the realization that the front line has already failed. The city lord confirms his suspicions and tells asks him to tell the teachers to take the students and leave as soon as possible. The city lord bows and asks Xu to thank the teachers and the students for their compassion and kindness. The rebels of Wutu have arrived and are chanting the word kill. The teachers and the students observe the attack from above, sitting on their dragons, when a student calls out. For teacher K, exclaiming that they're also the citizens of the ancestral dragon city-state and if they are really going to just sit back and watch the rebels attack their cities. K shouts as he not aware of the rule that after enrolling into the Dragon Tamer's Academy, they're forbidden from participating in war unless it's to attack evil cities. The enraged student replies that those Wutu beasts are not worth pitying, they already have their own land but still keep attacking the ancestral dragon city-state's territory. Teacher Duan sighs that they're not wild beasts, they're just trying to survive. Suddenly, the dike wall starts to break and the water starts to flood the stream. The students look at the scene and exclaim that there's a mountain flash flood. The rebels of Wutu start drowning in the water and scream for help the students. 
Witness this and proclaim just how many people have joined this rebellion. There is still an army behind them. Point one of the students realizes that if they set up defenses on the other side of the sunken lake and fire arrows at those who jump into the lake, a thousand men would be enough to fend off ten thousand men. She exclaims that this must be a miraculous flash flood sent from the heavens. Another student yells that Teacher Duan's reign has saved the citizens of Glory Valley City. Even if the rebel army moves to clear the sunken lake, it'll take them a day or two, at the very least. By that time, reinforcements will have arrived. Zhu remembers Zheng's words and is impressed by his preparations. Zhu turns to the teachers and informs them that the news of the battle from the front lines has been delayed. They must reach the ancestral dragon city-state as soon as possible and inform them of the attack, otherwise, the Glory Valley city will be destroyed. Kay asks him in shock that how he knew about this. Dun exclaims that there is no time for an explanation and asks Xu Minglang to come along with them. Dun and Zhu get on top of Kay's dragon and head towards the ancestral dragon city-state. Suddenly, on their way, they encounter an explosion of fire. Zhu tells them to watch out. They find out that it is Luo Xiao with his gilded fire dragon as they fall off Kay's dragon due to the attack. Kay is pissed and says so there are dragon masters in Wutu too. Dun starts to activate her spirit domain and summons her water flood dragon. Luo Xiao has an evil grin on his face as he notices Zhu is here too. It is a great day for him. Zhu screams at Xiao that is the commander of the stronghold. Why is he not going to report the war and is instead trying to? Heard others. Xiao lets out an evil laugh and says that he worked so hard for the Li clan but instead of repaying him, they gave away the woman he's in love with to someone else. He exclaims that he hasn't only not reported the news but has also killed all the messengers and now he's going to kill them too. Kei calls him a traitor and tells him to die as he commands his dragon to kill Xiao. Kei's dragon heads to the gilded fire dragon who breathes fire towards him. The water flood dragon protects Kei's dragon with a ball of water. However, the gilded fire dragon goes through the ball and bites the dragon's neck. The water flood dragon is enraged by this and attacks the gilded fire dragon. The gilded fire dragon lets out fire through his body and both the dragons fall to the ground defeated. Xu calls out for his teachers as they start throwing up blood. Xiao has a smug look on his face. He insults them, saying that they're trying to fight with him using two inferior dragons. Kei gets up with Zhu's support and warns Xiao, saying that they don't care about his feud with the Li clan but if he kills them, he definitely won't have a good ending. Xiao is not phased by this and says if they all die, no one will find out that he was the one who did it. The gilded fire dragon breathes fire towards them. The three of them are about to be consumed by flames when a light bursts from Zhu's chest. Xiao is taken aback when he notices Bai Qi has appeared and saved the three of them. Bai Qi begins to approach Xiao in preparation for a fight. Xiao activates his ring and declares that he is not defenseless. He lets out an evil laugh and taunts Bai Qi, saying that she can't hurt him with her little wind. Bai Qi ignores his comments and attacks him with her wind powers. She looks at Xiao with anger and freezes her tail. Bai Qi attacks Xiao with her frozen tail and Xiao falls to the ground. Duan is surprised to see that Bai Qi has already entered the growth phase. Xiao covers his bleeding eye and says Yu Minglang's name, filled with wrath. The gilded fire dragon tries to attack Bai Qi, blowing fire at her, and the water flood takes notice of this. Bai Qi successfully dodges the attack. However, the gilded fire dragon begins to attack Bai Qi again. But, it remains unsuccessful as the water flood dragon uses its powers and attacks the gilded fire dragon with a python vortex. Kei takes advantage of this opportunity and summons his mud dragon to join the fight. Xiao lets out an evil laugh at this. Xu shouts at Teacher Kei to watch out. However, it was too late. Xiao had already summoned a purple dragon who stabbed Kei from behind. Kei starts to bleed and falls to the ground. Xiao screams that all of them were going to die today. Bai Qi begins to spray ice at the purple dragon, wounding it. She flees the scene, with Zhu and Duan clinging to her. Duan activates her spirit domain and calls for the Quanlin, the water flood dragon, to come back. Xiao exclaims that he won't let them run away and starts chasing them. After a while of fleeing the scene, Zhu reassures Duan that Xiao won't be able to catch up with them, 
considering the significant amount of time that has passed. They were in close proximity to the Dragon Academy. Duin replies that he's wrong and that Xiao is still chasing after them. The Gilded Dragon starts to attack them again. The Water Flood Dragon emerges out of his spirit, and Duin tells him to come back. Quanlin starts to attack the Gilded Fire Dragon while Duin tries to force him back into his spirit domain. Suddenly, blood starts pouring out of Duin's mouth. Xu calls her name as she falls unconscious. Xu pleads with Teacher Duin to hang on as she lies unconscious in his arms. Xu instructs Baichi to keep flying away and suggests she uses her wind magic to glide when she starts to feel tired. Meanwhile, the Water Flood Dragon continues to fight the Gilded Fire Dragon. Xu and Xiao stare at each other, their eyes are full of rage and have the same thought. Today's revenge is going to be repaid tenfold. The Gilded Fire Dragon opens his mouth to attack the Water Flood Dragon. Xiao calls Water Flood Dragon a bastard and tells him to get out of the way and the Gilded Fire Dragon finally bites Quanlin. Xiao curses and instructs his dragon to leave Quanlin and chase after Baichi. The Gilded Fire Dragon drops Quanlin. The Water Flood Dragon falls into the lake with blood pooling around him, starting to drown. Meanwhile, Nian Yen is scolding Haya, calling him names and questioning why did he stop chasing the fish midway. Haya shouts back that she keeps distracting him by bossing him around to catch this and catch that. Nian Yen crosses her arms and huffs, saying that she's been feeding him delicious silkworms and water for the past few days but he's too lazy to catch a fish for her, just like his master. Suddenly, Nian Nian is shocked to see an injured Quanlin descending from the waterfall. Quanlin falls into the lake, splashing water everywhere. Haya swims towards him and asks Quanlin what's wrong with him. Nian Nian warns Haya to come back, saying that the water demons want to eat Quanlin. One of the water demons tries to attack them but Haya saves them by biting the demon's neck. He fights with all the demons that try to attack Water Flood Dragon, killing them all. Haya runs to the Water Flood Dragon and asks him if he's okay. Quanlin gives him a weak smile. Haya cries out that he can't die, he still has to beat the Water Flood Dragon. Nian Yan tells Haya to hold tight as she goes to find backup. At the infirmary hall, Duan lies unconscious and a man asks Zhu what had happened. Zhu informs him that Duan's spirit domain was attacked. She suffered an injury to her soul and now is in a coma. The man corrects him, saying that she isn't in a coma. However, she would have died had he been a bit slower. He tells him that they'll try their best to save her and further adds that he'll inform this information to the institution head. But it'd be best if Shu himself went to the Li clan's royal court, since the matter is very serious. Shu agrees with him. The wolf spirit's owner suddenly bursts through the doors and informs Zhu that he should go over to the waterfall. His crocodile spirit is being surrounded by water demons over there. Zhu calls out for Bai Qi. He thanks Hong Hao, the wolf spirit's owner, for informing him as he flies away to the waterfall. Hong Hao is shocked to see that Bai Qi has grown so strong and wonders who even is Zhu Ming Lang. Back at the waterfall lake, Haya is still fighting with the water demons trying to protect Quanlin. Zhu arrives at the waterfall and calls out Haya's name. He looks at the scene and tells Baichi to kill all of the water demons. Baichi enters into fight mode and starts throwing ice at the demons, freezing them all. Zhu grabs Haya in his arms, appreciating him for saving the water flood dragon. At the infirmary hall, Zhu wishes Haya a speedy recovery and informs him that he'll be back soon. He sits on Baichi and flies away to the Li family palace. A girl looks at Haya soaking in a pond and wonders how did his wound heal so soon. Haya cockily replies that he isn't a chicken and will recover soon. She stares at his back and questions whether he is a snake and why he is shedding. Haya stares back to see the skin that had came off of his body. He starts to panic and cries out that he's dying. The girl tells him not to panic and looks at Haya's blood, wondering why is it glowing. Haya starts to panic again and cries that he's doomed and incurable. He continues crying while the girl asks the master to look at the crocodile spirit, claiming that he's dying. The master calls her a silly girl and questions her that had she not seen a spirit dragonizing before. The girl and Haya are both shocked by this news. The master tells her to stop being so excited since it isn't even her dragon. He tells her to inform Don Lan's family about her condition. 
The girl cries for the master to do something, claiming she doesn't want Duan to die. The master clarifies that Duan isn't dying but her soul is severely damaged. They need to inform her family so that they can find some spirit medicine for her before it gets too late. The girl sighs in relief that Duan isn't dead. She asks him what will happen if they find the medicine. The master replies that even with the help of the medicine it would take Duan half a year to recover due to the severity of her injuries. Fortunately, her dragon had survived, or her soul would not have been able to bear it. Meanwhile, Bai Qi and Zhu have almost arrived at the Li clan's royal court. A soldier threatens Zhu with an arrow, asking him to come down for inspection. Zhu lets the soldiers search him and observes that a bridal party is taking place. He didn't expect so many soldiers to protect this party and arrived at the conclusion that they must be special. The soldiers rudely asked him who he was and why was he there. Zhu notices that these are not the soldiers of Ancestral Dragon City State and shows his emblem as proof that he's a student of the Dragon Tamers Academy. He tells them that he's just on his way to buy some dragon food. The soldier inspects his emblem as Zhu nervously apologizes for interrupting them and says that he'll take his leave. The soldier shouts at him to get lost. Zhu flinches at this and thanks him. As Zhu leaves the place, a soldier asks why did he question this particular person since they don't normally question people. The soldier replies that Zhu is a dragon tamer and could be a soldier in disguise. The soldiers continue talking that if Zhu is a member of the Li family scout, then their plans would go down the drain. They decide to wait for five days before entering the ancestral dragon city state. Xu listens to all of this, hiding behind a tree, and feels sure that something is fishy. Point two days later, the patriarch welcomes Mr. Yang to the ancestral dragon city state for the bridal party. He tries to lighten the mood by laughing and claims that from now on, ancestral dragon city state and Lingxiao city state are friends. Mr. Yang says that this is not the case, and he's actually there to negotiate the peace, stating that there's something wrong with it. The Patriarch is annoyed by Mr. Yang and asks what is wrong with IT. Mr. Yang slams the wooden box in his hand on the floor and exclaims that the Lingxiao city-state has sent many betrothal gifts to them to show their sincerity. So why does their truce agreement not include the condition of seating four cities in the west, and why is he still not letting her meet the crown princess? Kong Tong angrily points at Mr. Yang, asking what he meant by this. She says that the only condition they had agreed upon was to have Yunzi marry into the Ling family as a concubine. Mr. Yang replies that the conditions have changed now and he is ready to wait for them to make changes in their agreement. The patriarch stands up ready to charge at Mr. Yang. He insults Mr. Yang for treating their royal court as his personal courtyard. Chen, the patriarch's brother, stops him and calmly asks Mr. Yang why should they maintain peace if the price for it is to cede their four cities. He claims that a war would be more beneficial for them rather than this. Mr. Yang starts to eat a jujube with an evil smile. He informs them that the rebel army has breached their East Dawn stronghold and is now on its way to rob their granary cities at the eastern Lichuan Plains. He is disgusted by the jujube's taste and spits it out. The soldiers are shocked by this news and gasp in surprise that how could the rebels overcome their soldiers using their sloppy weapons. While the enraged patriarch rests his sword on Mr. Yang's shoulder as he realizes that the Lingxiao city-state had no intention of maintaining from the beginning, they had only sent Mr. Yang to humiliate them. All of a sudden, Yunzi and Zhu appear out of nowhere. Yunzi asks Li Pinghai to step back. She orders him to keep Mr. Yang alive, claiming that he is useful to her, and holds a brown bag covered in blood. Mr. Yang immediately bows in front of Yunzi and says that their city lord would be very happy to see her in this attire. He also adds that they won't change their mind about seating the four cities. However, Yunzi tells Mr. Yang to accept a gift first and extends the brown bag to him. Yang refuses to accept the gift and tells her to save the gifts for her wedding night with their city lord. Yunzi is not amused by this and slams the bag on the floor. Xu smirks and asks Yang to open the bag and search for any familiar faces. Mr. Yang opens the bag and is horrified to see the decapitated heads of three of his men. Zhu reveals the truth, saying that Mr. Yang took advantage of the peace treaty to distract them and secretly send men to infiltrate their territory from the gorge so that he could break through their border to take over the four western cities. 
Mr. Yang is shocked that Zhu knew the truth. He further adds that after finding this out, Yunzi sent guards to ambush them in the gorge which was necessary for them to pass. The guards shot all their troops in the gorge, ruining their plan. As Zhu and Yunzi cornered Yang, the guards started praising Yunzi for seeing through their plan and protecting the four cities. Mr. Yang gets scared as he sees Yunzi grabbing her sword. He curses her with a gruesome death and says that she'll surely descend into hell. Yunzi clarifies that she is not going to kill him. Yang is relieved by this and thanks her for sparing him. Isunzi ignores his gratitude and says that the one he cares most about is not among the three heads, suggesting that Ling family's young master is still alive. She orders him to inform Ling Luotian about this news and tells him to write a letter to save his young master's life. But before that, he needs to eat everything off the floor as a punishment. Mr. Yang hesitatingly agrees to do it. The people start praising Yunzi as she starts heading towards Kong Tong. She snatches a scroll out of Kong Tong's hand. She looks for her name in the scroll and crosses out her name from the scroll, canceling her marriage. She throws the pen at Qing and Kong Shi and says both of them would be perfect goods for negotiating the peace if she failed to win on the battlefield. Meanwhile, the patriarch is screaming at Yang, asking why they were not informed that the East Dawn stronghold had been breached. Zhu informs the patriarch that the reason they weren't informed was because a traitor has appeared among their ranks. He reveals that Xiao is the traitor who had killed all their messengers so that the news won't reach them. He further adds that if the Lord of the Valley had not built a dike on the mountains and hadn't been supported by the floods, the rebels would have attacked the ancestral dragon city-state by now. The Patriarch is satisfied by his explanation. He asks him whether he is the Zhu Ming Lang who had posed as one of their class men and returned with Yunzi from Wutu. Yunzi defends Zhu, saying that she told him to fake it since Xiao was already with them and she already felt very of Xiao's intentions. The Patriarch commends Yunzi for her work and informs her that she is now back in charge of the military guards. Yunzi suggests her father to give her the command token for the Flying Bird Battalion, saying that she'll settle the rebellion. Her father feels unsure about this suggestion but Yunzi points out that she is the one who had dispatched the Flying Bird Battalion to help the Glory Valley City, five days ago. The Patriarch is finally convinced and gives her his permission. He announces that from now, An Yunzi has regained her position as the Crown Princess. Yang has now finished writing the letter and nervously asks Yunzi to see if he needs to add anything else to it before she lets their young master return safely. Yunzi approves the letter. She starts to leave and thanks Zhu Minglang for his help. Zhu accepts her gratitude. He follows Yunzi and asks her where are they headed, she replies the Glory Valley City. Zhu questions whether anyone else is joining them. Yunzi says that the two of them are more than enough. Meanwhile, in the middle of the ancestral dragon state city, a young boy points at the sky, exclaiming that someone seems to be flying. His dad replies that is a demigod. The boy rubs his head in confusion, questioning what is a demigod. The dad explains that demigods are humans that were able to surpass human limits and use extraordinary abilities, just like ancient beings. The boy is fascinated by this and exclaims that he'll also become a demigod one day. His dad clarifies that most demigods inherited the legacy from a demigod and needed a unique physique to become one. The boy is dejected by this news, realizing that he doesn't have a chance. His dad tries to comfort him, saying that Xiao Huang, his dog Spiritling, has a great spiritual sense and may even turn into a dragon if he works hard to open up his spirit domain. That way he could become a real dragon master. The boy asks his father whether a dragon master is more powerful than a demigod or if it is the other way around. The dad tells him that both the demigods and dragon masters have different abilities, some weak and some strong. However, demigods cannot withstand a really strong attack by a group of dragons belonging to a really strong dragon master. He further adds that demigods also don't have a spirit domain, making them unable to raise dragons. After hearing this, the boy picks his dog up and exclaims that he'll become a powerful dragon master one day. Meanwhile, Yunzi and Zhu are still heading towards Glory Valley City. Yunzi asks Zhu what is he doing. Zhu replies that he's enjoying the sensation of freely flying. Yunzi clarifies that she's talking about Zhu's hands that are grabbing his waist. Zhu immediately withdraws his hands and nervously laughs. 
lying that he isn't afraid of falling. Ju continues to say that he isn't but is interrupted by Yunzi kicking him off the flying board. Ju starts to fall to the ground when Baichi comes out and saves him. He sighs in relief at the fact that Baichi can change her size at will. Otherwise, he would have fallen to his death. Ju asks Yunzi to wait for him as she flies away. Meanwhile, at Glory Valley City, the city is in flames as the rebels continue to chant the word kill. Yunzi arrives at the scene and is greeted by a soldier. She asks him about the war situation. The soldier replies that it was a miracle that when they arrived, this small city had stood against the rebels all alone for nearly five days. He exclaims that their ancestral city-state is blessed by the heavens and that these deserted plebeians aren't qualified to step into the Lichuan Plains. Yunzi instructs the soldier to take half of the Flying Birds Battalion to Western Lin City and tells him to return by dawn, otherwise she'd kill him. The soldier bows and says yes. Wondering how did she get the military power back? Ju questions Yunzi about her decision, asking what she plans on doing about the rest of the rebels with half of the battalions gone. Upon hearing this, Yunzi accuses him of being scared. Ju curses, saying that he's not scared. After this, Yunzi starts to fly towards the rebels. She takes out her sword and lights it on fire. She strikes her sword on the ground, creating a fiery boundary between her and the rebels. She shouts at the rebels to decide whether they want to die or live and announces that whoever crosses the boundary will be considered a rebel and killed without any mercy, whereas those who don't cross the boundary will be spared and considered her citizens. She promises to help them survive through the winter. The rebels don't believe her and claim that she's just lying to buy their time. The soldiers exclaim that she cannot kill them single-handedly and that they're about to enter the Lichuan Plains. They start chanting no fear and charge towards her. Yunzi gets ready to attack them with her sword when Shu tells her to leave the rest to him. He charges at them with Baichi, shouting death to those who cross the boundary. Ju continues to charge at them as Baichi shoots ice at the rebels. The rebels scream as they're hit by the ice. One of the rebels cries out to never be a slave and continues with the attack but is frozen by Baichi. Ju exclaims that he'll spare their lives if they back away from the boundary. The rebels start to lose their cool as they find out that their second chief has died. However, decide to continue with the attack. Ju is perplexed by their decision, wondering if they are even afraid of death. Baichi and Ju continue to charge at them. Baichi attacks them again with ice, freezing the rebels. Baichi stops and Ju stares at the remaining rebels who look like they're losing their shit. Yunzi appears and asks Zhang Tua had they not have food and clothes while she was their ruler. Zhang Tua answers affirmatively. She orders Zhang Tua to tell the rebels to drop their weapons and she'd let them survive the winter. However, if they insist on being rebels, she wouldn't let them survive even past this night. Zhang Tua replies that he believes her but how will he show his face to his dead brothers if he accepts her offer? He says that if she really cares for them, she'll provide them with another way to live. Yunzi slices her hand. With blood dripping from her hand, she exclaims that this is the way to live she's offering them. Ju grabs her bloody hand and shouts at her, asking whether she has gone insane. Yunzi frees her hand from his grasp and says that she has prepared food and clothing for the people of Wutu. They're already on their way and are sufficient to survive the winter. She exclaims that if the supplies don't arrive before her blood dries, her life would be in their hands. The rebels are shocked by this and drop everything. Chu grabs Yunzi as she starts to feel lightheaded and is about to fall. He helps her sit on Baichi and asks her whether she included food and clothes in the terms of Yang Xiao's peace treaty instead of sessions of cities. Yunzi confirms this. Upon hearing this, Zhu calls her stupid but Yunzi claims that it's worth it. He realizes that she had sent the Flying Birds Battalion to bring the supplies and hopes that they make it in time. The battalion starts to arrive with the supplies and the rebels start to cheer for the crown princess. The soldier Yunzi had sent earlier greets her again and exclaims that they were fortunate enough to arrive in time and save themselves from disgrace. Yunzi orders the rebels to enter the valley city to receive food and clothing. The rebels bow down to Yunzi and thank her profusely. At the Glory Valley City's Lord's Mansion, Yunzi lies on the bed with her hand wrapped in bandages. Shu asks her to open her mouth to feed her some porridge, but Yunzi replies that she'll do it herself. 
Shu tells her not to move and just lie down so the blood can circulate through her body properly. Yunzi finally agrees as Xu feeds her the porridge. She spits the hot porridge out, claiming that he wants to burn her to death. Xu apologizes to her saying that he didn't mean to do that. She points at Baichi with her eyes, asking if she's the dragonling that Zhu took in at the Dragon Academy. Zhu replies that isn't the case, and she actually knows her. Yunzi is confused by this. He tells her that Baichi the same silkworm that had broken the dungeon bar back at the Ever City Jail. Yunzi blushes and tells him to not say another word as she is reminded of their steamy encounter at the jail. Meanwhile, Zhu thinks that she looks so cute when she gets angry. Zhu suddenly tells her that he met her younger sister at the academy. Yunzi asks who, in confusion. Zhu questions whether she has many younger sisters. Yunzi ignores his question and asks how did he meet her. Zhu explains that he first met her at the bridge. Thinking she was Yunzi, he spoke to her but she didn't say anything. The next time, he met her at the library where she pretended to be Yunzi and lied about what had happened between them. Yunzi says that he has met them all, and she doesn't think they were involved. Zhu questions whether she thinks Ling Xia and the Nan family are involved in setting her up. Yunzi sighs in agreement, saying that she has many enemies. Zhu grabs her arms and tells her not to worry since he's there to help her. Yunzi tells him to not fall for Ling Xia pretending to be her again, saying that she won't be at the academy. Zhu assures her that he'll do just that. Suddenly, the city lord starts to open the door and calls for Yunzi. He exclaims that the matter of the waters has been settled, but he stops midway when he finds Zhu and Yunzi in a compromising state. He stares at them awkwardly for a second and shuts the door back, claiming that he entered the wrong room. Zhu says that Qin Yu is a talented man and Yunzi could make use of him. Yunzi replies that she's aware and changes the topic saying that she has many enemies so Zhu needs to carefully go back to the academy before they start to make a fuss about him. Zhu grabs her injured hand and tells her not to do such silly things again, claiming that if she faints again, no one as decent as him would look after her. Yunzi kicks him out of the room, telling him to get lost. The city lord asks him if he's okay. Zhu replies that he's fine and tells him to go in to discuss his matters with Yunzi. At the infirmary hall. Zhu hears someone saying who is the owner of Haya, calling him mighty but also undisciplined for stealing food from the kitchen. Haya turns around and looks at Zhu. Zhu calls out for Haya with a smile on his face. He caresses the dragon and is shocked that Haya has dragonized. He exclaims that they can make a soul contract now. Zhu starts the process of making a soul contract by biting his finger. He drops the blood from his finger on Haya's horn. A bright yellow light flashes as the soul contract is completed. Haya enters into his spirit domain, and Zhu smiles at him. Zhu's chest starts glowing. He wonders if it is the spirit force. He feels as if his five senses and awareness have grown stronger. Zhu closes his eyes and is suddenly transported in front of a light portal. He wonders what is the light portal doing here and extends his hand to grab something. He is shocked to see that the portal is harvesting pearls. He closes his eyes again and is now back at the infirmary hall. Zhu gets excited to find out that Dragon Masters possess all kinds of special abilities and decides to harvest the soul pearls in a few days. According to the Light Orbs, the Dragon Beast can evolve by consuming soul pearls. Zhu finds this to be a great advantage. His thoughts are interrupted by a girl calling for him. She presents a receipt of expenses for Haya's stay and Zhu nervously looks at them. After some time, Zhu is on top of a cliff with Bai Qi and Haya. Zhu exclaims that the wild boar is really a demon as Haya bites the demon to death. Meanwhile, Bai Qi is flying in the air. She lands beside Zhu and drops something. Zhu exclaims where did Bai Qi find all this gold and jewelry. He asks Bai Qi whether she had stolen it from the dragon's den using his hiding technique. Baichi replies affirmatively. Zhu exclaims that he had never thought he'd find a dragon's den even while bringing food or haya. Suddenly a little dragon emerges out of the bushes. Zhu is shocked to find a dragonling and observes it from afar. Suddenly, a big creature appears in front of the dragonling. The dragonling is shocked by its sudden appearance and starts to fall off the cliff. Zhu orders Baichi to save the little dragonling. Baichi chases the little dragon and finally saves it. 
Zhu embraces the dragonling in his arms and decides to keep it. Suddenly, he hears a loud roar. He realizes it is the little dragonling's mother and starts to worry about whether she's thinking that she's stealing her baby. The little dragon's mother starts charging towards Zhu. Zhu notices this and tells Baichi to run. They flee the scene taking the dragonling along with them. At the dragon storage hall, Zhu asks the master whether the little dragonling will survive. The master replies that he can keep the little dragon alive as long as it keeps breathing. Zhu praises him, saying that he always knew that the master is just like a living deity. The master is pleased to hear this. Meanwhile, the little girl calls him out for acting like a bootlicker. The girl insults Zhu, saying that he has a poor eye for signing a soul contract with a common, crippling forest dragon baby, claiming that it has no future. However, she is proven wrong by the master who explains that this dragonling is way stronger than an ordinary forest dragon. He asks the girl named Phoebe to feed the dragonling some tree juice when it wakes up since it would help him in rejuvenating its blood. Zhu laughs as he is proven right. Phoebe shuts him up as she asks him to pay the bill for highest stay. Zhu nervously gets out of the situation, saying that he just remembered a really important task, so he'll discuss this matter later. At the foundry, Zhu looks at his creation and exclaims that the dragon armor is finally done. His joy is cut short when someone asks him to look at a poster and questions whether it is him. The poster has a drawing of Zhu and says that this is the person who has tainted the Valkyrie. Zhu looks at the poster and says who has drawn him so ugly. He is shocked to find out that it really is Zhu. He tells Zhu that he heard some rumors saying that he is the one who tainted the Valkyrie back in the cell and people were threatening to kill him. The man advises Xu to go to a plastic surgeon to get his face changed. Xu tells him not to think about such rumors and thanks him for his time and promises not to bother him anymore. He takes his leave while the man scratches his head and sighs that these rumors must have cost Xu his peace of mind. Inside the academy hall, Xu is studying when someone calls out his name. He looks back and asks what's the deal. He taunts that he doesn't take in minions. A group of people are seen gathered around Zhu. Yin Yaozu, the young master of the Yin family, insults Zhu and says who did he just call his minion. Yin Yaozu asks him if he is the fortunate vagrant everyone is talking about. Zhu exclaims that he is not a vagrant, this is utter nonsense. He lies to them, saying that he actually fell in love with Yunzi at Wutu and people made up these stories since they were jealous of him. The men are shocked to hear this. Yin Yaozu calls him shameless for thinking that Yunzi would ever be interested in him. Zhu corners him saying whether he doubts the crown princess's eyes. Yaozu quickly stops and starts stuttering, saying that he's not doubting the princess and tells Zhu to stop speaking nonsense. Zhu further intimidates Yaozu, saying that he has slandered Yunzi by accusing her of having an affair with a vagrant. Yaozu is left speechless but knows that Zhu is indeed the one who has slandered the crown princess. Zhu cockily says that he's forgiving him this time and will just pretend like he didn't hear him. He adds more fire to the fuel, saying that matters of love just can't be explained and he doesn't understand why he fell for Yunzi and claims that loving someone doesn't require a reason. Zhu thanks them for admiring his Yunzi and says that if they truly admire and respect her, they shouldn't pay attention to the wild rumors and should speak out against those who speak ill of her instead. Yaozu yells that they've always stopped such people. However, if a tumor like Zhu keeps existing, she'll never be able to get out of this mess. He exclaims that if he was in Zhu's place, he'd hang himself knowing his lowly status. The men continue to hurl insults at Zhu. Zhu shuts them up, saying that he knows they admire his wife but no more of their illusions shall be entertained. He exclaims that from now on, her reputation is his matter only. The men scream at him to stop pretending to be someone powerful and come fight with them to prove his strength. Zhu exclaims that there are so many of them if all of them challenged him one by one. However, before her can finish his sentence, Yaozu cuts him off, saying that he alone will be enough to defeat Zhu. Zhu clarifies that isn't what he meant and says that it would be a waste of time if all of them came one by one to fight him. He confidentially tells them to fight with him all at once. This leaves all the men in the foundry speechless. Yaozu cries that Shu has gone insane, to which Shu smugly replies that he's only giving them a chance to challenge him. Yaozu is infuriated by this and curses Zhu. 
He ultimately accepts his challenge and says he'll meet him at the river arena for the fight. Yaozu warns him not to blame them afterwards since himself he asked for it. Meanwhile, at the Dragon Tamer Academy arena, a man is distributing newspapers to everyone. The man makes an announcement, saying that Chu has received a joint challenge and urges everyone to go to the river arena to see his thrilling 1 vs 20 battle. Nan Ling Sha, who is hidden behind a tree, learns about this news as the man continues to repeat the word newspaper.at the river arena. Xu and the men are seen standing across one other, separated by a river. Suddenly, a woman appears from behind Xu. The men start exclaiming that it is their crown princess Yunzi. Xu inquires as to why she has come here. She replies that since he claims to be in love with her, it's normal for her to be curious about his affairs. Xu whispers in a low voice that he's certain she is in Yunzi, but Ling Xiao. He tells her to leave, claiming he has nothing to do with her. Ling Xia responds that, unlike him, the men are unaware of this. The men try to console themselves, claiming that it must be a coincidence because the crown princess most certainly wouldn't have come for Zhu Minglang as they watch the two of them interact closely. Zhu acts frank with Ling Xia, asking what she wants and saying that all this is a misunderstanding. The men curse at Zhu, feeling jealous and angered by Zhu's frank relationship with the princess. Ling Xia grabs Xu's arm and tells him to play along, claiming that nobody would believe him alone and that this would help with Yunzi's reputation. Xu is forced to play along and realizes why Yunzi asked him to be very of Ling Xia. The men are shocked and turn red from anger, unable to believe that Xu is really having an affair with the crown princess. Yao Zi looks at Ling Xia's hand around Xu's arm. With boiling anger, he calls for Xu, claiming that he'll teach him a lesson. Baishu, a teacher at the Dragon Tamers Academy, says that he'll host the battle. He gives the men instructions, saying that since they are outnumbering Zhu, they're only allowed to summon one dragon and tells them to choose wisely. After hearing this, the men immediately summon their dragons as Zhu watches. Baishu thinks that these guys must be really pissed off as he observes their dragons. He shifts his gaze at Zhu and feels impressed by his bravery. Baishu then gives instructions to Zhu, saying that he either summons all of his dragons right now or reserves the right to summon them during the battle. Zhu thanks him for the reminder and activates his spirit domain, summoning Haya. Haya emerges out of the spirit domain, and Zhu is pleased that the dragon armor he had made for Haya is fitting him quite well. Haya feels nervous, looking at the multiple dragons and exclaims what's the situation. He turns to Zhu and suggests that they run. Chu scolds him for thinking about fleeing and says that this is his training for the day. Haya starts crying that Chu is abusing him. Meanwhile, Chu tells him to stop acting scared and says he isn't going to fight them alone. Bai Chi is also going to help him. Chu starts telling him about the plan, instructing him to provoke them first but not to let them scatter too much or else Bai Chi's magic wouldn't be able to get all of them. Haya feels relieved to find out that he's just acting as bait for them. Haya starts to provoke the dragons, asking them to look at him. He turns around, presenting his butt in the air and takes a dump. Haya's plan is successful as the dragons are enraged by this and start charging towards him. Haya grabs one of the dragons who was about to attack him and throws him onto the ground. Yaozu orders his red clawed plague dragon to kill Haya, calling him a vulgar dragon. The red clawed dragon obeys his owner and starts charging towards Haya to attack. Haya stares at the dragon about to attack him, and starts crying out for his mom, in horror. As Haya barely dodges the attack, a wolf dragon gets ready to attack him. Haya activates his powers and his horn lets out a bright yellow light. He attacks the wolf using his horn, defeating him. After this, he stares at the remaining dragons and their owners, who try to act tough. The wolf dragon's owner cries out for his dragon while another person exclaims that Haya is mean and sinister just like his owner, Zhu. The dragons begin charging at Haya once more as the men instruct them to attack the crocodile together and kill him. Haya gets scared again, realizing that he won't be able to fight them all at once and cries for his mom again. Zhu activates the spirit domain and summons Bai Chi. He orders her to freeze the dragons. Baichi listens to Zhu and starts shooting ice at the dragons. She continues attacking them with ice while Haya escapes. All the dragons are now frozen because of Baichi's magic. 
The men look at their frozen dragons in shock. One of the men orders his candle dragon to melt the ice. Following his owner's instructions, the candle dragon heads towards the frozen dragons to melt them. Baichi begins shooting ice at the candle dragon to stop him. However, the candle dragon still manages to melt the frozen dragons and Baichi notices this. Suddenly, Shu tells Baichi to watch out as the red clawed plague dragon starts to attack Baichi. Baichi manages to dodge the attack. In the meantime, another dragon begins to stir up a sandstorm. The red clawed dragon attacks Baichi again, who defends herself with an ice shield. Baichi freezes his tail and points its tip towards the red clawed dragon's throat. Fausa screams as he is about to be defeated. Just as Baichi is about to pierce the red clawed dragon's throat, she is attacked by vines and gets trapped in them. Fausa sighs in relief and thanks the owner of the green forest dragon. The green forest dragon's owner tells him to attack Baichi right this moment, since his dragon won't be able to keep her confined for long. Just as Baichi is about to be attacked by two dragons, Haya emerges and attacks them, saving Baichi. The two dragons are pushed to the ground, defeated. Xu inquires about Baichi's well-being, to which she responds that she is alright. Suddenly, the candle dragon appears from behind and prepares to attack Xu. Xu activates his powers and creates a glowing yellow ball of energy between his hands, preparing to attack the dragon. He finally attacks the dragon using the ball of energy. Teacher Bai is shocked to see that Shu had used dragon armor skills to attack the dragon. Meanwhile, the dragon falls into the river due to the attack. The dragon armor skills are formed when the master creates an exclusive set of armor for his dragon, after forming a soul contract. These dragon armor skills greatly enhance a dragon master's survival. Bai never thought he'd see it happen to one of his students. Haya charges at the candle dragon and tears it apart into two pieces. The candle dragon's owner starts to fall to the ground, throwing up blood. The men, not willing to accept their defeat, question how Haya managed to defeat a top-ranked candle dragon and how Shu obtained such expensive dragon armor. They angrily exclaim that the crown princess must have bought it for him. Baichi gets up and starts to fly again. She activates her powers and a blue light flashes from her horn. Thunder and shooting stars start falling to the ground. The men are frightened to see this. The shooting stars fall to the ground, injuring the men. Zhu shows mercy and tells Baichi to stop the attack. He confidently stands in front of Yaozu and challenges anyone else who wants to fight. The men just stare in shock, unable to speak. Suddenly, Teacher Bai, who is under the rubble, exclaims that he is proud of Shu for showing them mercy. Shu expresses his apologies to Yaozu for inadvertently causing him harm. The teacher, in response, reassures Zhu that it's all right. Teacher Bai declares Zhu as the winner of the challenge and lectures the men not to pay attention to the rumors. He urges them to be careful next time and says if Shu hadn't shown them mercy, they would have been killed. Yaozu agrees with the teacher and apologizes to Zhu, Zhu declares that from now on, they should not concern themselves with his wife's reputation. The men start praising Zhu who is aware that they're just kissing ass. Meanwhile, a group of men observes the scene from afar. One of the men exclaims that they're going to do a joint challenge next month and wonders if there are any dragon generals among them. A man takes out a piece of paper. He tears it apart and tries to get out of the situation, saying that they're supposed to go hunting next month. Women start flirting with Zhu and chase him, but he quickly runs away, saying that he has important tasks to attend to. He exclaims that these women are just like tigresses as he runs away. Suddenly, Ling Sha appears out of nowhere and asks whom he referred to as a tigress just now. Zhu nervously lies that she must have heard him wrong. She doubts Zhu's explanation and grabs his arm, insisting that he repeat what he just said. Zhu gets out of her grip exclaiming that he has some important business to tend to. He quickly runs away, bidding Ling Sha goodbye. Ling Sha exclaims that it's not like she would eat him and calls him a coward. At the dragon storage hall, Xu picks up the dragonling and happily says that the little guy's wound has almost healed. He realizes that he hasn't named him yet and starts suggesting names. The dragonling doesn't like any of the names and starts crying. Zhu eventually decides to name him Qingzhua and says that if the little dragonling ever wants to change the color of his blood to something blue or purple, 
then he'll rename him Lanzhua or Zizhua. Qingzhua doesn't like this name either but decides to go along with it. At the Academy Bamboo Forest, Xu tells Qingzhua although he got a lot of money from his mother's den, he still can't afford to buy a sufficient amount of his favorite tree juice. Suddenly, Quinzhuo starts running away from Zhu. Zhu chases after the little dragonling and reaches the bamboo forest loft. Quinzhuo enters the loft while Zhu shouts for him. The little dragonling grabs a bottle and Zhu yells at him not to consume it, saying that it is painting ink. A voice clarifies that it's Phoebe tree juice and allows Quinzhuo to drink it. He turns around to see that it is Ling Sha. He asks her whether she lives here. Ling Sha teases him calling him bold for sneaking through her windows at night. Xu immediately tries to explain that he didn't mean to barge in. Ling Sha laughs at him, saying it's just a joke and asks him where he got the little dragon from. Xu tells her that he picked him up from the dragon cliff in the forest north of the academy. He asks whether she knew this dragon since he can't seem to find any record of its race and lineage. Ling Sha informs him that it's the divine green tree dragon, leader of the forest dragon clan. She says that it is unfortunate that the little dragon's breath is extremely weak, probably caused by an injury he suffered in his growth stage. She adds even if it reaches its peak, it's very hard to bring out the power of a divine green tree dragon. Qingzhua accidentally pushes the bottles of green tree juice and Zhu exclaims in concern. As the bottles of juice are about to spill on the ground, Ling Sha uses her magic to stop them. Zhu realizes that she is also a demigod like Yunzi. She uses her magic to put the juice back into the bottles. Zhu claps in admiration and exclaims that it was a great trick. Ling Sha flirts with him, saying that she has even better tricks to show him. Zhu blushes at this. He pushes her away, apologizing for causing a disturbance, and tells her to get some rest. He grabs Qingzhua by the leg and flees the place. After running for some time, he pauses to catch his breath while Qingzhua laughs at him. Zhu scolds the little dragon for laughing at him and says that was all his fault that he suddenly remembers that he forgot to ask Ling Sha where she got the juice from and decides that he'll just ask her next time. Zhu's attention is drawn to a crowd that is staring at a poster. The poster announces recent demonic attacks in different parts of the city. All students and teachers are assigned to form teams and eliminate these demonic beings. Successful participants will be rewarded with a spiritual domain fruit. However, it advises against acting alone or trying to be a hero, as no rewards will be given for individual efforts. If encountering a demonic entity, students are instructed to immediately inform the nearest teacher, who will receive half the credit for its elimination. Xu is disappointed that he needs to team up since he only knows Li Xiaoying and his friends, but they haven't even reached the Dragon Gate yet. He wonders who should he team up with. Suddenly, he hears someone calling his name. He turns around to see a group of people from which a woman named Cha Yunyun asks him if they want to join his team. Zhu is elated by their perfect timing and immediately says why yes. At the little pond hill. Zhu is with his team. A girl from the team exclaims that with the help of Cha's wind bell dragon, they'll be able to find the demonic entities soon. Suddenly, Qingzhua comes out of Zhu's robe and starts flying towards the wind bell dragon. Zhu looks at this and thinks that the Phoebe tree juice is really working since little Qingzhua has already grown wings. The wind bell dragon doesn't notice Qingzhua flying behind him and accidentally kicks the little dragon. Qingzhua starts falling while the wind bell dragon explains that he didn't mean to kick him. As Zhu opens his arms to catch little Qingzhua, a girl named Lu Xiaolu asks if Qingzhua is a carved wooden dragon. Another girl makes fun of him saying that it must be a dead wood dragon since a dead one can't be carved. Suddenly, the wind bell dragon hears a noise. They start running towards the source of the noise and Zhu tells them to be careful since the demon entities could be hiding in the bushes. A man named Jin Min Jun ignores Zhu's warning and runs faster. Calling them a coward. He runs past Zhu and shouts for the demonic spirits to come towards him while Zhu wonders whether all young people are this. Impulsive. Suddenly, a demonic spirit comes behind Zhu, ready to attack him. Qingzhua notices this and attacks the demonic spirit using vines. Zhu praises the little dragon for doing a good job. Suddenly, they see many red eyes staring at them from the bushes. The demonic spirits come out of hiding and charge at them. 
Jin Minjun summons his fiery lizard dragon who attacks the demons. The fiery lizard dragon accidentally steps on a trap. The team gets stuck in the trap along with the fiery dragon. The wind bell dragon notices this and takes Yun Yun out of the trap. Yun Yun feels the presence of a demon behind her. Zhu sees this and tells Qingzhui to clear the way. Haya lets out a bright yellow light from his mouth which shreds the demon to pieces. Haya looks at all the dead demons trapped in vines and exclaims that Qingzhui is really good at it. Zhu asks if Yun Yun is okay and where are the rest of them. Yun Yun warns Haya not to step any closer, explaining that the area is covered with vines and ferns to trap large dragons. However, it was too late since Haya had already taken a step. He screams as he falls inside the trap and gets stuck. After falling into the trap, he comes across a demonic spirit. Haya screams as he gets ready to attack the demon. Zhu warns him to be careful. He asks Yun Yun to stay safe and informs her that he's going down to save the others. Yun Yun urges him to be cautious as well that he jumps into the trap and lands safely. Suddenly, a beautiful woman walks appears in front of him. Xu feels hypnotized because he believes the gorgeous woman is Yunzi. However, Qingzhui realizes that something is wrong. As the woman is about to touch Xu, Qingzhui lets out a scream and Xu finally snaps out of his trance as he is about to be attacked by the woman, who has now turned into a vicious creature. But luckily Qingzhui saves him by trapping the creature using vines. Xu realizes the creature is a fleece flower vine rat wolf and had hypnotized him using the hypnotic elements of the fleece flower vine. He thanks Qingzhua for saving him, and the dragonling rejoices. Suddenly, the wolf demon frees himself from the vines. Xu urges Qingzhua to retreat, recognizing that he is no match for the powerful demon as the wolf gets ready to attack the dragonling. He warns Qingzhua that the creature has undergone 900 years of cultivation and is on the verge of transforming into a dragon. However, it is too late. Qingzhua gets attacked by the wolf and starts to fall. Seeing this, Zhu summons Bai Qi and says that it's now up to her to save them. Upon hearing this, Bai Qi swiftly springs into action, unleashing attacks on the wolf using rings of blue light. The wolf lets out a painful scream as it sustains injuries from the blue rings, causing it to bleed. Despite his injuries, the wolf manages to keep its composure and prepares itself to launch a counterattack. However, before he can do anything, Baichi freezes the wolf. The frozen wolf begins to laugh in disbelief, but before it can finish, it abruptly explodes, leaving behind a demon soul pearl in its place. Zhu grabs the demon soul pearl and decides to feed it to Qingzhua to increase his strength. Shortly afterwards, Zhu rushes towards his team, who are all in tears. He asks Jean if he's alright. Jean tearfully thanks Zhu for saving his life but sadly informs him that Yang has been killed. Zhu is at a loss for words and suggests that they should leave the area, saying that the deceased cannot be brought back. At the Dwarf Mountain City small courtyard, the master says that they are fortunate to have survived their encounter with the demon spirits. He informs them that he received news of a teacher who did not survive the ordeal and then expresses gratitude to them for bringing some peace back to the Dwarf Mountain City and advises them to return and rest. In response, Jean bows respectfully, stating that he will personally ensure that Yang's body is sent to the academy. He then shifts his attention to Zhu and acknowledges his strength, stating that it is comparable to that of some teachers. With that, he asks Zhu whether he would be interested in joining a team of demon-subduing teachers, mentioning that the reward for doing so would be incredibly generous. Zhu decides to accept his offer. The master cautions Zhu against acting recklessly, emphasizing that he might encounter ogres that are even 3,000 years old. He advises Zhu to inform the Red Lotus city mayor, if such a situation occurs, and let her handle it. Xu acknowledges the master's warning and assures him that he understands his instructions. At Red Lotus City Gooda Mountain, Xu walks up the stairs and comes across a woman. Surprised, he exclaims that he didn't expect her to be the one responsible for defending Lotus City. Nan Lingxia retorts, asking why she can't be in Lotus City. To which he nervously replies that's not what he meant. Xu proceeds to explain the situation sharing that he followed the teacher's instructions to come to the city and assist a group of demon subduers. However, upon his arrival, he discovered that the entire team had been killed and the demons had already vanished. 
Ling Sha exclaims in shock whether the teachers were also killed. Chu confirms her suspicions and informs her that it's been estimated that the demon's cultivation base is at least 3,000 years old. Suddenly, Ling Sha creates a fake golden dragon using her powers. She settles herself on the dragon and instructs Zhu to remain in Lotus City while she investigates the matter. Zhu exclaims in surprise, questioning the idea of staying behind. He grabs her leg and insists on accompanying her since it's too dangerous. Due to Zhu's sudden action, Ling Sha loses her balance and begins to fall from the dragon's back. As she lands on Zhu, he unintentionally ends up grabbing her chest. Amidst this, Lin Sha also accidentally hits him in the crotch. Zhu cries in pain, but Lin Sha shows no sympathy and says that he deserved it as she starts to leave. After a while, Zhu lets out a sigh of relief, thankful that the pain has subsided. He suddenly notices a group of people riding on dragons heading towards him. The men arrive at the location and declare themselves as disciples of Nan's clan. They inquire if Ling Sha is present among them. Suddenly, Nan Yi yells in anger as he recognizes Zhu Minglang. Zhu informs them that Ling Sha isn't present and explains that she asked him to stay there in her absence. He tells them that if they have any matters to discuss, they can report them to him. Point one of the students scoffs in disbelief, questioning who does he think he is to replace the teacher in the city. Zhu rolls his eyes and asks them not to bother him if they don't have anything to say. As the student starts screaming in anger, Nan Yi calms him down and tells him not to act impulsively. Nan Yi explains to Zhu that they encountered a demon spirit and came to find Ling Sha to kill it. Disappointedly, he questions whether she is truly not present. Zhu confirms his suspicions and asks what kind of demon spirit they encountered. Nan Yi tells him that they came across a thousand-year-old evil spider that was killing everyone in the lumber yard and had now gone into the deep forest. Upon hearing this, Zhu demands them to take him to the spider.at the academy lumberyard. Zhu and the students have made it to the lumberyard. Nan Yi points to the floor, exclaiming the blood is here. Zhu tells them to guard the place while he takes a look. Nan Yi cautions him about the danger and suggests that they go together. But before he can finish, one of the students interrupts and advises him not to get involved. As Zhu enters the woods, the spider launches an attack on him and he barely manages to dodge it. He hides in the bushes and sees that the spider has shifted its attention to a green forest dragon. The spider demon and her red spider start to attack the green forest dragon. Shu wonders if the evil spider is eating people in order to breed more red riders so that they can swallow the forest dragon. As the red spiders continue to attack the green forest dragon, he notices another little forest dragon looking terrified of the situation. Chu suddenly realizes that the forest dragons are Qingzhu's mother and little brother. The evil spider demon notices Zhu and gets ready to attack him. Xu curses at this as he prepares to defend himself. Qingzhu senses that Zhu is in danger and prepares to emerge from his spirit domain. Zhu realizes this. However, before he can say anything, the evil spider charges at Zhu. Qingzhu's spirit domain activates, and he finally emerges launching an attack on the evil spider using his vines. The evil spider becomes trapped, unable to move, as it gets entangled. Xu is pleasantly surprised as he sees Qingzhu's growth, recognizing the positive effects of consuming the fleece flower vine rat wolf's demon pearl. Meanwhile, the evil spider demon hisses as she frees herself from the vines and releases poisonous gas. Xu covers his nose to avoid breathing in the poison. Qingzhua sees this and grabs Zhu. He throws him into the air, making Zhu sit on him. Zhu nervously asks Qingzhua not to attempt such exciting things in the future as they flee the scene. Zhu notices the toxic gas emanating from the forest and remarks that it appears to be the location of the forest dragon. Meanwhile, inside the forest, the mother dragon is being attacked by the evil spider. The mother dragon retaliates with a powerful attack causing the evil spider to be sent flying and crash into a tree. The demon looks enraged by this, poison dripping from her mouth. They face each other once again, prepared to fight. The mother dragon launches her attack, but the demon skillfully evades as Zhu observes the ongoing fight from above and exclaims that the evil spider intends to kill the mother dragon by using the poison fog and the red spiders that he summons Haya from his spirit domain. 
Haya feels confused as he starts to come out. He fails to realize that he's suspended in midair and falls to the ground. After his fall, he finds himself in front of the evil spider demon. Haya activates his powers and a bright yellow light beams from his horn. Haya launches an attack on the evil spider demon using the beam of light. Following that, Zhu ventures back into the forest, and Qingzhua unleashes his green light, targeting the demon with another attack. Haya cheers for Zhu and Qingzhua as they take a moment to relax after their successful attack on the demon. However, the demon recovers quickly and starts charging towards Haya. The evil spider releases a huge amount of poisonous fog and Zhu realizes this was a mistake. As the evil spider releases a vast cloud of poisonous fog, Zhu becomes worried about Haya's safety, realizing that had acted carelessly. Out of nowhere, the mother dragon appears and bravely rushes through the dangerous fog determined to kill the demon. As the fight continues, Haya is surprised to find himself unharmed. The mother dragon gives the evil spider a final blow and kills it. Xu exclaims that they recognize Qingzhua as his mother and little brother stare at him. Qingzhua shoots a stern glare at his brother, who had pushed him off the cliff which makes his brother nervous. Qingzhua's mother rips the scale from her arm and hands it to Xu. After this, she goes on her way, leaving Zhu behind in a state of shock who can't believe that she actually gave him the scale. Zhu comprehends that she gave him the scale as a symbol that he no longer owes her anything and ponders whether their lives or deaths are no longer connected to him in any way. Zhu extracts the evil spider's demon pearl and feels relieved that the evil spider didn't eat another dragon, otherwise, it would have been unbeatable. Meanwhile, Nan Yi and the student are shocked to see the divine tree dragon. Zhu is concerned that Nan Yi may misunderstand the situation and think that he stole Qingzhua because his family was responsible for creating the forest dragon family. Zhu nervously attempts to clarify the situation, but before he can fully explain, Nan Yi interrupts him and asks if the saint dragon is a gift from Nan Li Sha. The other student chimes in, stating that they will investigate the truth once they return. At the Red Lotus City Hall, Nan Yi asks Ling Sha whether she gave the divine tree dragon to Xu. To which, she asks if he's talking about Quinzhuo. Zhu spits his tea out as he hears her lie, saying that it's just a remnant dragon that she gave him. Ling Sha says she met Xu in the bamboo tree at night, and saw that he's a great dragon master, and has a good relationship with her sister. Therefore, she decided to give the dragon to him as a token of appreciation for caring for her sister. Xu tells her to shut up, saying that she has nothing to do with his dragon. Nan Yi and the student exclaim, expressing disbelief at how Nan Ling Sha could give such a precious dragon to a man of unknown origin like Xu. She glares at him and defiantly questions whether she needed his permission to make such a decision. They immediately apologize to Ling Sha for their remarks, and she dismisses them stating that she has important matters to discuss with Du. She informs them that their grades have been announced and advises them to go check their ranks. As the men leave, Zhu feels that Ling Sha has screwed him over. He retorts, stating that she doesn't have a reputation to uphold, but he needs to maintain his innocence in order to marry a specific person. Ling Sha says how he can claim innocence, hinting at the moment when he caught her in midair and embraced her. Xu nervously rubs his head and says that it was a misunderstanding, he didn't really mean it. Ling Xia further teases him, saying that she heard what happened between him and Yunzi back in the dungeon was also due to a misunderstanding. She continues to tease him, mentioning that she heard what happened between him and Yunzi in the dungeon was also due to a misunderstanding. Ling Xia teasingly mocks Xu, questioning why he is silent. Feeling embarrassed, Zhu responds, saying that it's getting late and he needs to return. Just as he starts to leave, Ling Sha announces that he's achieved the highest grade in the academy. She informs him that she has already collected his reward from the academy and dangles the small blue pouch. Zhu demands that she give him his reward. He loses his balance and accidentally pushes Ling Sha. They both fall on the table and Zhu's head lands on Ling Sha's chest. She pushes him off and calls him a rascal while Zhu cries on the ground. After this, Zhu and Ling Xia are seen flying in the air, riding Quingzhuo. Ling Xia asks Zhu about the taste of the spiritual fruit as he takes a bite, and Zhu replies that it tastes average. Shortly after, Ling Xia asks him why he is riding little Quingzhuo instead of Baichi. 
Shu also asks why doesn't she just draw a dragon instead of riding with him. She responds by explaining that she had used up all her ink, which she typically uses for drawing, to exterminate the 3,000-year-old spirit. Upon hearing this, Zhu informs her that Baichi has not yet awakened from her slumber after defeating the fleece flower vine ratwolf. Changing the topic, she asks Zhu if Baichi has undergone the dragon tribulation. However, he is unable to answer her since he is unfamiliar with what a dragon tribulation entails. Ling Xia begins to explain, sharing that when anything crosses the dragon gate, it undergoes a transformation into a dragon. Each time a dragon crosses the gate, it may face a tribulation. These tribulations strengthen the dragons and make them more powerful. The stages of the tribulations are categorized as lower, upper, and peak stages. However, the exact number of levels within the dragon gate and the level a dragon will reach after passing the tribulation remain unknown. With that said, she states that it seemed Bai Qi really has gone through a dragon tribulation. Ling Xia suggests that Zhu visit either the Academy Library or the Pagoda Pavilion, informing him that there is plenty of stuff available to trade in for rewards. Zhu thanks her for the reminder. She angrily tells him to only express his gratitude instead of poking her with weird stuff, to which Xu nervously apologizes. At the Pagoda Pavilion Dragon Tamer Academy, Zhu examines the Storm Phantom Feather and expresses his appreciation, remarking that it seems promising. He considers attaching it to Baichi's feathers, envisioning how it could enable the manipulation of storms and greatly enhance the power of the Imperial Wind Technique. Meanwhile, in the Spirit Domain, Haya and Baichi are sleeping. Suddenly, Baichi wakes up. Haya looks at her in shock as Baichi starts to grow smaller. Baichi comes out of the spirit domain, and Zhu is pleased to that he's awake. Zhu looks at Baichi acting weird and realizes that she's using the heaven and earth concealing method. He prevents Baichi from stealing anything, claiming that people would kill her if they find out that she stole from the Academy's collection. At the Academy Residence Hall. Zhu is laying in his bed. Zhu feels a sense of joy knowing that the rewards from the mission have provided him with enough credit to purchase a plentiful supply of Haya pork that will last until spring. Additionally, the gold and silver jewels he obtained are sufficient to acquire frosty snow nectar for Baichi, a substance that will aid in his performance and overall growth. Furthermore, Qingzhu's favorite Phoebe tree juice was also taken care of by Ling Xia. Zhu experiences a sense of relief, knowing that he doesn't have to worry about their food supply for a significant period of time. With that said, he wonders what he should do with the scale given by Qingzhuo's mother. Zhu suddenly rises from the bed, as an idea comes to his mind. The next day, Zhu has made armor out of the scale. He decides to call it colorless soft armor because of its appearance. He makes the decision to give the armor as a gift to Yunzi upon her return from the battle on New Year's Eve. At the Lee family courtyard, Chu blushes as he thinks Yunzi will look very attractive in the soft armor he has given her. Suddenly, Shangra appears in front of Zhu and wishes him luck. She informs him that Yunzi really liked his gift. Zhu feels happy to hear this and tells her to give Yunzi his regards since she isn't seeing other people due to her injury. Shuangna says that he isn't like other people. She takes him to Yunzi and says that she'll leave them alone to have a chat. Zhu grabs Yunzi's hand with concern and asks her how is she feeling. He scolds her for working so hard and not taking care of herself. Yunzi replies that she's fine and feels much better ever since people stopped talking about their scandal. Zhu exclaims that it is all due to his great acting, to which Yunzi asks whether meeting at night in the bamboo forest with Ling Xia and exchanging gifts was also a play. Zhu nervously explains that's all a misunderstanding, the divine tree dragon belongs to him and is not a gift from Ling Xia. She addresses Zhu as, young master, and says that means he didn't give her any gift. Zhu confirms her statement and asks whether the soft armor fits her well. Yunzi shyly says that she hasn't tried it on yet. Zhu blushes and suggests she try it right now, claiming that he can adjust it if it doesn't fit her well. Yunzi sheepishly agrees to his request and goes to try it on. Yunzi glances at Shu from the fitting room and once again refers to him as Young Master. She playfully says that he is not allowed to peek at her. Shu assures her that he won't try to look. He is overjoyed that Yunzi agreed to his request and finds it surprising that she continues to address him as 
young master. He notices a significant change in Yunzi's demeanor, realizing that she has become less cold and distant. As Yunzi starts to change, Xu tries his best not to look at her. After changing, Yunzi informs him that she's coming out of the fitting room. She finally steps out and exclaims that the soft armor feels incredibly comfortable with no sense of restraint. She further adds that it looks exceptionally beautiful as well. Xu is mesmerized by Yunzi's stunning appearance in the armor and expresses that she looks incredibly beautiful. She wonders whether the skirt is too much. Xu gets crazy looking at this and grabs Yunzi in his arms and pulls her close. He looks into her eyes and tells her she's perfect the way she is. Meanwhile, the door slams open. Someone is coming. Yunzi quickly covers herself with a red cloth. Ling Sha utters that it is no wonder she had been stopped since Yunzi was having a date with her lover. Xu is shocked by her sudden appearance. Yunzi adjusts her garment and questions Ling Sha about her sudden appearance. Ling Sha threw a question back, asking why she was so ambitious. Yunzi responds that if she wants to stop her, she won't be polite. Zhu is confused by their conversation. Meanwhile, Ling Sha grabs his arm and complains about the crowded streets and the dull, boring weather. She asks Yunzi if she could borrow him to take a stroll around the ancestral dragon city-state. Yunzi immediately says no. Ling Sha realizes that she won't give up so easily. She sulks at Zhu, exclaiming why he isn't talking to her. She reminds Zhu how he used to eagerly talk to her all night without looking tired. Xu tells her not to distort the truth and says that he has already explained the facts to Yunzi. Hearing this, Ling Sha leaves while calling them boring. Xu turns to Yunzi and asks why Ling Sha came here and left so abruptly, to which Yunzi replies that she came to check on her and left once she saw that she was okay. He looks at her face and asks if she has something on her mind. Yunzi responds with a yes and declares her desire to establish a country. In their land, there is no such thing as a country since the city-states are independent of each other and are regulated by the court of the clan. Shu asks her whether she is willing to make the court an enemy in order to unite them into a country. Yunzi responds that she doesn't really have enemies except for those who stand in her way. The Zong Palace, Lingxiao City, her only clan, and the Nan family stand as the obstacles in her path. Xu points out that many people in the royal court of Li clan can have evil intentions towards her. He scolds her for neglecting her safety and not having a guard. Yunzi closes her eyes and sighs that even with an army of 10,000 men, there are only a few who she can trust. She further adds that allegiance is not worth coercion. Xu hugs her from behind and says that he will pack his belongings and move in to protect her, appreciating the trust she has shown in him by confiding in him. Yunzi disagrees with his suggestion and clarifies that she shared this information because she is afraid that he might get in trouble because of her and tells him to stay low for the time being. Chu says that he has made it clear to everyone that her reputation is his concern alone. And he has no intention of running away. Yunzi caresses his face and thanks him. He pulls her close and tells her not to thank him. Yunzi giggles as she teases him for being unable to be decent for even five seconds. She tells him to stay away from Ling Sha and Zhu happily agrees. At the academy lodging, Zhu looks around his room and notices that there isn't much to pack. Suddenly, Li Xiaoying and Hong Hao burst through the doors and ask Zhu whether the news of him moving out is true. Zhu confirms the news and informs them that he is moving to the Li clan's royal court for the time being. However, he assures them that he will return soon and continue to learn and tame the dragons once he is back. Both of them exclaim in shock that isn't the Li royal family court the home of Crown Princess Li Yunzi. Zhu confirms their suspicions and says it's just to watch the court. Li Xiaoying asks him for tips on how to live off his girlfriend, while Hong Hao cries out that Zhu has made it in life. Zhu smirks and says they need to have a handsome face like him for that and playfully teases them not to even think about it as he leaves. At Phoenix Falls Town, Zhu asks a seller about Nian Nian's whereabouts. The seller informs him that she ran away from home and is hiding in the city because her family wanted to marry her off to a man she didn't like. Zhu feels concerned for her and wonders why she didn't tell him about such a big issue. He wonders what he should do now regarding the supplies for his dragon.i in the city, 
Chu observes a man shouting at a girl to not spoil the view and demanding that she clean up the streets since Miss Nan is coming to watch the festival tonight. The disheveled girl angrily says how dare he look down on people. Chu takes off her hood and finds out it is Nian Nian. He drags her by the hood and takes her to buy some clothes and to find a nearby and where she can wash up while Nian Nian is shocked to see him. Xu informs her that he heard about her situation and asks why she is dressed like a beggar. Nian Nian tells him she didn't have enough time to change clothes. A an idea comes to Zhu's mind. Since he's moving to the royal palace of the Li clan and is supposed to have a maid, he offers her to come and work for him as a junior dragon maid. Nian Nian immediately accepts his offer. Suddenly, Nian Nian looks up and says what's in the sky. Bright shooting stars can be seen across the sky. People around them exclaim that the ancestral dragon city-state has been blessed by the heavens with this beautiful starfall. A woman excitedly says that it is the first time she's seen such a beautiful cluster of shooting stars and tells her son to make a wish, while a man asks if there are any artists in the crowd who can sketch this beautiful view. However, their joy is cut short, when Zhu suddenly tells everyone to spread out, exclaiming that the stars are falling down. Nian Nian tells him not to make a scene, the stars actually turn out to be meteorites. They start crashing down and the people scream in horror. Xu picks Nian Nian up and starts to escape. People cry out for help as the city is engulfed in flames. Meteorites have fallen in many places. Xu thinks that they don't look man-made, could it be Dash? His thoughts are interrupted by Nian Nian exclaiming in horror that it's the end of the world. Xu observes the scene as people scream out for help. A mother stuck in the rubble cries out for her child, while a man screams in pain that his leg has broken. A man starts to blame Yunzi and says that the heavens have bestowed wrath upon them due to her actions. The people exclaim that due to her waging war everywhere, she goes, the heavens have sent this punishment to get rid of the demoness and why should they suffer the wrath when it is Yunzi's savage deeds have caused this. Hearing this, everyone starts to blame Yunzi and chant that she should kill herself. Meanwhile, Inside the Li Yunzi residence at the Li clan royal courtyard, Zhu informs Yunzi about the situation outside. He tells her that people are accusing her and uttering disgusting words about her. Yunzi turns towards him and asks if he cares about those filthy words. Zhu responds that he's just unhappy for her and says that the heavens punish the world. But instead of hating the heavens, people direct their hatred towards her, and she has to bear this burden. Yunzi says that heaven is different and cannot be controlled, but anger needs to be vented. She expresses that someone will inevitably be blamed for this situation and tells him to let others believe that it's her fault. Shu hugs her from behind and assures her that it doesn't matter what the world says, he'll always stand by her. Shanger suddenly Shanger informs Yunzi from behind the door that the young master of Zong Palace, Du Qing, has arrived and the master has summoned her to the Great Hall. Xu tells her to inform the messenger that Yunzi is recovering and won't attend any meetings or see any guests. Shanga tries to protest, but Yunzi cuts her off, saying do as he says. After hearing this, Shanga says okay and leaves Dot and Family Grand Hall. It is the birthday of Nan Taigong and all sorts of important people have come to celebrate the occasion. There are rumors that the head of the Li clan, the representative of Lingxiao City and the young master of the Zong Palace have also come. It is understandable that the lord of the Li clan was invited since he is the father of the Nan family's Nan Lingxiao. However, the reason for the presence of the Lingxiao City State and Zong Palace remains unclear. Nan Taigong is a very powerful dragon master. He was once the head of the Dragon Tamers Academy and has also led the Li clan and the Nan family. Nobody would dare to disrespect a formidable figure like him. Suddenly, Nan Lingxia appears out of nowhere. Du Cheng is mesmerized by Lingxia's beauty and asks his fiance, Li Kong Shi, who she is. Kong Shi replies that she is Nan Lingxia, in charge of the Nan family while thinking what a swine he is for drooling over another woman right in front of her. Tai Gong orders the guards to close the doors as Lingxia enters the palace. The men are shocked by her appearance. They ask Taigong what this means and what's happening. Nan Taigong, the lord of the Nan family, tells them not to be nervous and says that she is Nan Lingxia, the in charge of the Nan family. After hearing this, the men feel at ease and apologize for their behavior. Taigong orders the Li clan's lord, Li Ying, to come out. 
Liang steps out and declares that they have assembled today to fight against his unfaithful daughter, Li Yunzi. Tangong points out that Yunzi had taken over the Wutu, conquered the southern state and even the southeastern Xiangtang city-state surrendered in secret. Only the Lishao city-state hasn't fallen yet. Yunzi's father exclaims that his daughter's ambition would destroy them sooner or later. So he has no choice but to do the right thing. Mr. Yang tells them that the Ling Xiao family state has been sending troops for days to show their sincerity, so they shouldn't hesitate in this matter. The elder fan of Zong Palace says that they've also sent their young master Du Qing, and he will proceed as planned. Ling Xia orders them to write their names on the scroll to participate in this campaign. She plans on temporarily replacing Yunzi and disbanding her guards so they won't need to worry about her loyalists taking revenge. A man questions Ling Xiao's ability to replace her and asks whether the loyal guards of Yunzi will even listen to her. Li Ying reveals that Ling Xia and Yunzi are identical twin sisters. The Yunzi's guards do not know Ling Xia's true face and when Yunzi was imprisoned, none of them noticed that Ling Xia had taken her place. Tang Gong declares this is the guarantee the Nan family can give them. After hearing this, Mr. Yan happily takes his pen out and says that he is on board for this punitive expedition. He begins to sign the expedition book and says regardless of Yunzi's brutal acts, she is a genius. He admires her and chooses to banish her. The men exclaim that they'll also sign out a few moments later. Tang Gong announces that the majority of them have decided to execute Yunzi with their signatures. He then says whatever the outcome of the assassination, they must not let Yunzi leave the ancestral dragon city state. Point. One of the men exclaims that they seem nervous since Yunzi is wounded. He adds that the master of Zong Palace has the ability to defeat her with a single strike if he desires, and urges everyone to patiently await the good news. Lying exclaims that he isn't nervous. Yunzi is just lucky, she even managed to escape when they imprisoned her in the Ever City. Therefore, they must not act carelessly. Ling Xia stares at her father and exclaims that he was involved in the Ever City incident. Kong Tong replies that although he was the one who imprisoned her, he didn't know what happened afterwards. Ling Xia points at Kong Tong and demands to know whether she is the one who made her suffer this humiliation. Kong Tong is left speechless. Before she can say anything in her defense, Liang screams at Ling Xia for talking to her like that. Ling Xia exclaims that the conspiracy involving Ling Xiao City, the alliance of Zong Palace, the Li family, and the Nan clan was all orchestrated to eliminate a woman who shines above all. She tells her father that he should be grateful for not being involved in the incident of the Ever City until the end. Ling Xia starts to activate her powers and exclaims that their heads are higher than the sky. However, their lives are as thin as paper. She uses her powers to reveal what is actually written beneath the punitive expedition document. It is the life or death book. Ling Xia exclaims that they have brought death upon themselves by writing their names in the book. Ropes emerge from the book and start strangling the men. The men scream for help and beg for their life. Ling Xia says that she'll wait outside for anyone who survives her art scroll. Lying calls her a bitch and demands to be let go as blood drips from his nose and mouth. Tang Gong can't believe that Ling Xia could do this. He calls her Yunzi and exclaims what she is doing. Li Ying falls to the ground and exclaims why did she betray them. He sees her leave and wonders whether their feud was a sham all along. His eyes turn white. He wonders how they could have fooled their loved ones unless they have buried their hearts for years. The memory of Nan Ling Xia expressing her desire to crusade against her sister flashes before his eyes and he finally succumbs to death. Mr. Yang bows down and thanks Ling Xia for not killing him. Suddenly, Tang Gong and Elder Fan get up. They call Ling Xia a wicked girl and wish a horrible death upon her. Ling Xia acknowledges their impressive survival, but states that, unfortunately, there is no escape from death as she proceeds to behead Elder Fan. Seeing this, Tang Gong collapses to his knees and exclaims that they have been corrupt and were wrong to oppose the development of the ancestral dragon city-state. He begs for his and swears that he will no longer interfere in any clan affairs and proceed to live the rest of his life as a retired old man. Ling Xia takes out her wand and declares that she will prepare a comfortable coffin for him where he can enjoy his old age in peace. Tang Gong screams that he doesn't want to die. However, Ling Xia does not spare him. Meanwhile, 
at the Li Clan Royal Courtyard Corridor Bridge. Someone mentions that Yunzi resides there, and she is currently without any guards. They believe it will be easy to take her down. A man named Gao Zhishun tells them not to act carelessly. He can sense the presence of a dragon master. Suddenly, Zhu exclaims that he's been waiting for them for a long time, and they must be here to kill his wife. The Zone Palace's young master Xixiong exclaims that he must be the beggar who was in the dungeon with the crown princess, while a masked man screams Zhu's name. He says it seems the rumors were wrong, however, he is still merely a mortal. A woman named Nu Xiong tells Xixiong to deal with Yunzi instead of arguing with nobodies like Zhu. The young master agrees with Su Xiong and says that they'll go first. Out he waves at the masked man and says that he can deal with Zhu. Si Xiong is sure that the masked man will make Xu's life a living hell since he slept with his goddess. The masked man exclaims that he'll make sure dash. However, he stops mid-sentence as he can't seem to find Zhu anywhere. Suddenly, Zer appears and exclaims whether he gave them permission to kill his wife. Si Xiong tells the four seniors to go deal with Yunzi while he takes care of Zhu. Xu orders Bai Qi to get them. Bai Qi immediately springs into action and uses her powers to create an ice world. They warn each other to watch out as they realize Xu isn't a weak dragon master. Si Xiong states that they shall cut off Xu's head and gift it to Yunzi. Suddenly, the masked man appears on his dragon and says leave the rest to him. His dragon showers down a lava spring at Bai Qi. Bai Qi notices this and immediately blocks the attack with ice. The masked man is taken aback to see that Bai Qi has managed to block the lava of his powerful dragon. A bang is heard as Bai Qi continues to shoot ice. Meanwhile, the masked man's dragon also continues to attack him using lava. Suddenly, Bai Qi freezes her tail and is about to poke the dragon in his eye. The masked man orders his dragon to kill Bai Qi. His dragon immediately attacks Bai Qi with his claws and injures her. Seeing this, Zhu screams for Bai Qi while the masked man laughs and tells Bai Qi to go to hell as he is about to attack her again. However, Bai Qi maintains her composure and attacks them with ice. She freezes both of them, and Zhu praises her. However, their joy is cut short, as the dragon shoots out lava in the sky. Zhu screams for Bai Qi as the lava surrounds the white dragon. Si Xiong lets out an evil laugh and says Zhu should have minded his own business while Nu Xiong activates her spirit domain. Zhu realizes things are about to go wrong. Nu Xiong summons an enormous whale dragon. Zhu is filled with shock as he realizes that the creature is of the dragon lord rank. He activates his spirit domain and summons Haya who tries to attack the whale. However, the whale electrocutes Haya. Zhu screams for Haya as the crocodile dragon falls to the ground. Zhu had forgotten that the dragon armor conducts electricity. Meanwhile, Si Xiong smirks and wishes hell upon them as he activates his powers. As he gets ready to attack, Zhu emerges with Qingzhua and expresses that he didn't expect Si Xiong to be a demigod. Qingzhua roars and attacks the intruders using vines. Zhu tells Haya to take off his armor as the crocodile exclaims that his body is numb. He listens to Zhu's instructions and immediately feels better after taking it off. Suddenly, Bai Qi appears in the sky unharmed. Zhu gazes at Bai Qi and lets out a sigh of relief, grateful that everyone is fine. Out of nowhere, the masked man and his dragon undergo an armor transformation. He tells Si Xiong not to interfere as he is going to kill Zhu by himself. Bai Qi roars as she gets ready to attack. The masked man taunts Bai Qi ridiculing her for believing that she possesses enough power to defeat them. The masked man declares that he will demonstrate the full might of his inferno dragon as his dragon releases a torrent of molten lava, aiming it directly at Bai Qi. Bai Qi's horn starts to shine, and she uses the storm spirit feather to amplify her powers. Zhu realizes what Bai Qi is doing as memories of the feather come rushing back to him. Bai Qi lets out a powerful cry causing ice to fall from the sky, freezing everything it touches. As defeat looms over him, the masked man refuses to accept it, while Si Xiong, overwhelmed with frustration, curses and ponders the source of Bai Qi's extraordinary strength that I in the end. Bai Qi's power prevails and freezes everything in sight, including the river beneath the bridge, creating a scene of icy stillness. The masked man cries to his purgatory flame dragon, urging it to rise and continue to fight. 
However, the dragon remains frozen in the icy river. Blood starts coming out of his mouth. He removes his mask, showing his face. Xu looks at him and taunts that it is Luo Xiao. With a smirk on his face, Xu falsely apologizes, saying that he didn't realize it was him. Xiao is unwilling to face death just yet. He can perceive Yunzi's image within the blood stains on his hands. Opening their dragons. Si Xiong calls Zhu a trash head and proclaims that he'll be enough for him as he charges towards him. However, Si Xiong is stopped by a man punching him in the face. The man exclaims that Zong Palace remains as shameless as ever. Ji Yu Shou Ji Xiong realizes that the person before them is Fierce Fist Henan. Nu Xiong is taken aback to see him as he had disappeared for many years. Gao Xiong mentions the rumors about him having slain a dragon in the past. However, this cannot be confirmed. Old man Xiong responds that whether the rumors are true or not, Hanan will meet his end here today. Meanwhile, Hanan waves at Xu and says that they have met again. Xu is shocked to see him and realizes that he is the farmer who sent Li Xiaoing to the academy. Hanan mentions that he has some knowledge about slaying dragons but he will let Shu take care of the young master. The corpse master dragon roars at Baichi as it gets ready to attack her. Hanan grabs hold of the corpse master dragon and says that he and Baichi will kill him together. Shu looks at Hanan with admiration. Tears flow out of his eyes as he feels he's nothing compared to him. And Yu Xiong yells for everyone to protect Si Xiong while the thunder whale blue dragon tries to attack Shu. Zhu notices this and immediately summons Haya. Hanan warns Zhu that two dragons are coming after him. Hearing this, Quingzuo immediately attacks the dragons using vines. Zhu stares at the corpse dragon and is overcome with disgust. He wonders who would raise such a creature. Suddenly, Bai Qi pierces the corpse dragon with ice which causes blood to pour out of the fourth elder's mouth. Hanan tells Zhu to hang in there while he takes on the whale dragon and the shadow dragon. Suddenly, Si Xiong appears behind Zhu and prepares to attack him. However, Zhu defends himself using the Storm Spirit Feather, as he realizes he can tap into its abilities through his soul connection. As a result, blood begins to trickle from Si Xiong's mouth and wounds. Si Xiong's minions had forgotten about Zhu's soul connection and its ability to manifest the dragon's equipment on its master's body. They tried to save Si Xiong, however, it was too late. Bai Qi had fatally stabbed Si Xiong with her frozen tail, bringing an end to his life. Si Xiong's group becomes infuriated by this act and is determined to kill Xu. The double-headed winged dragon launches an attack on Zhu, releasing a substance from its mouth towards him. Zhu says menacingly that if they truly care about Si Xiong, they should join him instead. He unleashes a powerful blue light, launching an attack against them. Xu launches an attack on Nu Xiong resulting in her clothes being ripped apart and her skin being covered in cuts. The whale dragon becomes furious upon witnessing this. Hanan didn't anticipate the dragon to be so protective of his master. Without warning, the whale dragon releases a powerful electrical surge and electrocutes Hanan. Immediately after, it swiftly charges towards Zhu with the intent to kill him and protect its master. Zhu calls for Bai Qi and Quingzuo. Hearing this, Bai Qi immediately springs into action and pierces the whale dragon's eye with his tail. Meanwhile, Qingzhua approaches the double-headed dragon from behind and severs one of its heads. Gu Xiao Xiong exclaims in despair at the situation. Zhu assures him not to worry since the rest of them will soon join them. Old man Xiong tells Gu Xiao to move as he activates his spirit domain and calls forth his shadow dragon. Zhu's face fills with horror as he looks at the huge dragon while they yell at him not to run away from the fight. All of a sudden, Yunzi appears. She takes out her sword and attacks the shadow dragon, resulting in a brilliant yellow light shooting up into the sky. The old man bleeds from his mouth as he cries for his dragon. Yunzi causes an explosion, killing them all. Hanan is shocked as he witnesses Yunzi's extraordinary strength, despite being wounded. Amid the situation, Xu boasts that he can handle them all, however, the princess is just too worried about him. Meanwhile, Hanan interjects, exclaiming that he is merely showing off. On the other hand, Quingzuo uses his vines to attack the double zero headed dragon and eventually manages to sever the dragon's second head as well. In the meantime, 
Baichi levitates over the whale dragon. Xu tells her to stop playing around and kill it immediately. Baichi listens to Zhu and delivers a fatal blow to the whale dragon by piercing its second eye. The whale dragon falls to the ground, defeated. Hanan acknowledges that since he is not a dragon master, Zhu can rightfully claim all the spoils. Furthermore, he compliments Zhu for his impressive skill in harvesting soul pearls. Zhu reassures him and says that he's majoring in harvesting soul pearls. Haya hears Zhu saying that the soul pearls are going to be a boost for him. He immediately gets up and his mouth salivates with anticipation for the soul pearls. Xu calls Haya a lazy dragon and scolds him for only getting up after hearing that he'll receive benefits. Meanwhile, Hanan swiftly grabs hold of Si Xiong's lifeless body by his hair and says that the phantom armor is still on him. Yunzi asks him why did he choose to approach her. Zhu replies honestly that it was just a coincidence and asks her to believe his sincerity for her. Suddenly, something weird happens. Some other voice inside Yunzi's head tells her not to be mean to Zhu as he could solve their problems. Yunzi tells the voice she's only preventing him from having ulterior motives. The voice asks Yunzi to let her try. Suddenly, Yunzi's eyes shift from purple to yellow, and her demeanor changes drastically. She asks Zhu to disclose where he came from to prove his sincerity towards her. Before he can answer, Yunzi remembers the time when she was just a child. The easternmost part of Ancestral Dragon City State was just a sea at that time but suddenly within a year, the land of Wutu appeared. She exclaims that the world is more mysterious than she thought. Zhu agrees with her and notices the change in her behavior. It feels like he's talking to a different person. Yunzi grabs his hands and asks whether he'll accompany her for a walk Shu blushes and immediately says yes. Yunzi tells him to wait for a minute and goes to take off her white robe. Yunzi bends over and opens her closet, contemplating what she should wear. Shu looks at her nakedness through the transparent screen as she changes. He tries to control himself and curses at the screen. At the Luhua building, Yunzi and Zhu are seen sitting across from each other while Shanger and a girl discreetly observe them from a distance. Shanger wonders why the couple isn't hugging already, to which the girl points out that it is broad daylight. Shanger acknowledges the girl's statement but then raises a question about the sky, wondering what is wrong with it. Suddenly, a huge piece of land is seen floating in the sky. The people seem to think that the sky is falling on them. The piece of land is so huge that it has covered the entire west with black clouds. Zhu and Yunzi observe the scene. Zhu realizes that the ancestral dragon city-state is breaking into pieces. As a result, small cities in the west and the Lingxiao city-state will disappear into eternal darkness. Yunzi wonders if that's how to reach the ancestral dragon city-state and Zhu confirms her suspicions. Yunzi says that she had anticipated that the continent would drift gently like Wutu instead of floating in the sky and falling like stars. Shu asks her in confusion whether she was already aware this would happen. Was this the cause of her depression? Yunzi doesn't give him a clear answer and says that there is just something unsettling. Yunzi avoids giving a direct response and instead mentions that there is something unsettling about the situation. Chu grabs her by the shoulder and tells her not to worry since he is by her side. Suddenly, Yunzi addresses the voice in her head, stating that the day they have been anticipating has finally arrived. In response, the voice acknowledges that it already knows. Yunzi thanks Zhu for having tea with her and informs him that she will be taking her leave now, to which he replies that he'll come with her since she is still wounded. Yunzi reveals her intentions to head to the western border to defend against the coming crisis and instructs Zhu to stay with Ling Xia to help stabilize the situation Zhu embraces Yunzi from behind, urging her to take care during her journey and promises to safeguard everything in her absence. Yunzi smiles at this and reassures Zhu not to worry. With that, she takes her leave. As Yunzi departs, Zhu asks for her forgiveness in her absence and reveals that he actually came from the Jiting continent and used to be a demigod sword cultivator. During his travels, he encountered a king-level mysterious power that devoured the power of the spirit veins and living beings. Baichi was affected by this devouring power, and the living being used to wither away like nothing. Shu couldn't tolerate the mysterious strange strong man's actions and decided to fight him. During that battle, he broke the Earth's veins and separated the island from Earth. 
As a result, his sword cultivation was destroyed and he fell into the vortex of nothingness which lead him to her world. Baichi suffered immensely from that battle, so he decided to become a dragon master to save her. He didn't expect that the entire Jiting province would descend into her world. Suddenly, Zhu directs his words to the seemingly empty sky, warning them that if they dare to cause sadness to his wife, he will turn them into dust. After some time, Zhu remarks that it is unfortunate that numerous incidents have been happening at the West Cliff. Otherwise, there would have been an abundance of star fragments crystallized there. Fortunately, thanks to Yunzi's assistance, Zhu managed to gather enough crystals that would sustain Baichi for a period of two months and Baichi will be able to stabilize in the Upper Dragon Lord realm by then. Zhu knows that Baichi's mystic arts will be nourished by consuming the moon and stars. The nectar is no longer sufficient for her growth. However, he knows that ordinary people like him cannot afford to feed him crystals as if they were mere candies. He sighs and hopes Baichi won't eat any sun or moon crystals. Suddenly, someone calls out his name. He turns around to see that it is Ling Sha. He asks what's she doing here, to which Ling Sha replies that he needs to come with her to the Li Clan Royal Court. Zhu is caught off guard but agrees to go with her. At the Li Clan Royal Court Hall, Xu asks about the old woman's identity who is sitting on the throne. Ling Sha informs him that she's the grandmother of the Li Clan. She usually didn't get involved in public affairs, however, after Li Ying was abolished, she had to get involved in order to control the situation. Xu notices that teacher Duan Lan is also present. He feels relieved to see that her health is fine. The grandmother begins to speak, stating that except for Yunzi, all the king-level individuals from the ancestral dragon city state are present, and she has an important message for them. She gives them the news that hundreds of dragon masters and divine mortals have been destroyed due to yesterday's incident. The Lingxiao state has perished, and the six major cities of the western Lingxiao state have also been slaughtered. A man shouts that this must be the work of the powerful man from the mysterious continent, and the grandmother confirms his statement. The man wonders what kind of faction they are and how many king level or higher experts they have, to which an official replies that it is a single dragon master who rode a purple dragon. The man asks teacher Duan whether it is true that the zone, palace's two kings, two elders and the lord of the palace were destroyed by a single person. The students express their disbelief, suggesting that this claim must be an exaggeration. Considering the immense power exhibited by a single individual from the mysterious continent, the students believe that they have no chance of winning. Meanwhile, Zhu recalls that the official is none other than Duan Chan Qing, the director of the Dragon Academy. He wonders whether Duan Lan is his daughter. Zhu's thoughts are interrupted by a voice demanding to know the in charge of the city. The voice repeats it again. Hence, Ling Xia summons her wand suggesting that they go outside. A purple dragon is seen on top of Li Clan Royal Court Hall and a boat floats in the sky. A man yawns on the boat with a woman beside him. Xu recognizes the two individuals and feels frustrated by the unfortunate coincidence. Ling Xia introduces herself as the city's ruler and asks the two individuals what brings them here. They ask Ling Xia if their city is a sect. Ling Xia clarifies that they are a city-state clan. The man advises them to behave themselves since they aren't even a sect. Ling Xia is confused by this and wonders whether the two of them have come to destroy them. The man insults them by saying that they're just a bunch of small clans with a few city-states and mediocre resources. The purple dragon starts talking and says that their land is duller than his expectations. The man turns to the woman and tells her majesty that they should head back. Suddenly, something catches the woman's eye. While the man is in the midst of explaining that there is no need for them to visit other places as the city-state they are in is already the most prosperous, he is abruptly interrupted by the woman who loudly calls out Zhu's name. Beads of sweat begin to form on Zhu's face as he nervously responds with a hesitant yes. He bows in respect to the woman who is revealed to be his aunt Xuehen. Xuehen asks Zhu why he hasn't returned and reported his safety if he is not dead. Zhu explains that he had the intention to do so, but was unable to find a way back. He pleads with his aunt to stop the war for his sake, and says he has heard about the six cities being slaughtered. He asks her how could they be so cruel when they're also just people like them. 
Shuahan informs him that she has no involvement in this war and advises him to directly speak with the Lord himself if he wishes to intervene. Additionally, she mentions that there is a rumor stating that Shen Fan couldn't endure the hardships and ended his own life by jumping into the abyss. Hence, the rumors were partially true. Xu informs his aunt that he has now become a dragon master. Xuehen is not happy to hear this since she despises dragon masters. Xuehen changes the subject and asks Zhu if Lin Xia is his wife and do they have any children. Zhu clarifies that Lin Xia is actually the sister of his wife-to-be. Xuehen urges Zhu to return home and let Lin Xia bear him a child. She believes that if Lin Xia inherits the divine spirit of either of them, it would make up for the many regrets of their people. Xu believes that his aunt doesn't need to be so disappointed and is confident that he can still save the day. He acknowledges that he may have failed to live up to her guidance, however, he has now become a great dragon master. Meanwhile, Ling Xia is perplexed at the thought of having a child. Xuehen assures him that she won't let any family take advantage of the war and kill the innocent. However, the battle between the land and city-state shall be left to fate. Meanwhile, the man accompanying Xuehen says that they should have a sparring session sometime since there aren't many dragon masters in the Zhu sect. Chu happily agrees to the man's suggestion and waves his aunt goodbye as they leave. The purple dragon also starts to leave and wonders if his holiness had actually called the dragon master Zhu Minglang. Meanwhile, on the boat, the man states that Zhu Minglang is the talented swordsman who swept through the young generation of the Jiting continent at the age of 15. Xuehen asks the man if he has heard of Zhu Minglang's reputation as a dragon master. The man, aware of Xuehen's aversion towards dragon masters, lets out a nervous laugh and reluctantly confirms her suspicions. Xuehen asks him whether he's afraid of Zhu. The man immediately denies this and exclaims that Xu is no longer a demigod and he is not afraid of him in terms of his abilities as a dragon master. Despite what he says, he secretly fears Zhu and believes that he has a frightening face. Once the boat leaves, Lin Xia demands Zhu to explain what just happened. Zhu nervously reveals that he actually belongs to the Jiting continent and that the lady she just met is his aunt. He requests Lin Xia not to judge his aunt based on her cold looks, claiming that contrary to her looks, she is a very nice person. Suddenly, Duan Changqing appears behind Zhu and asks whether he is from the Zhu sect which is known for its art of forging. Zhu tells him that he's right and explains how he fell into a mysterious sea of nothingness which lead him to wake up from a coma in the middle of the barren earth. He asks Changqing if the same thing happened to him. Changqing immediately says yes and adds that the Wutu's appearance has helped him understand some of the rules governing this vast world. Over the years, Chan Qing has been exploring the secrets of the Sea of Nothingness in various places including the Ancient Mountain, Hidden Mist Island, and the Great Wall Crossing. He never imagined that the Jiting Continent would fall from the sky. Zhu realizes that he's only been here for a few years, whereas the Dean has been unable to find his way back for decades. Zhu feels sorry for the tragic situation and decides to comfort the Dean. in an attempt to comfort him. Xu tells him there is no need for him to grieve since there is a way back home. Besides, his daughter is already so old. In an attempt to comfort him, Xu awkwardly tries to assure the dean that there is a way to return home, adding that his daughter has already grown quite old. However, his words seem to miss the mark, and an awkward silence falls between them. Suddenly, the grandmother appears and tells them to catch up later. She asks Chang Qing to tell them about the Jiting continent. Chang Qing begins to explain and informs them about the presence of an imperial dynasty and numerous countries on the continent. These countries have varying strengths and frequently engage in conflicts. However, they must abide by all rules set by the imperial dynasty. In addition, there are many other powers including clans, sects, the Dragon Palace, the Church, and the Academy. But these powers do not interfere in the wars of the country. Point one of the students states that this means there are four influential powers within the imperial court that can compete with his academy. Chang Qing further explains that the Demigod Academy and the Dragon Tamer Academy are both located in the imperial court. Comparatively, their Lichuan Academy is much smaller, not even matching the size of one of the smaller branches of the academies found in Jitung's smaller countries. 
He sighs that the imperial court considers them like barren land filled with inferior people and backward barbarians. Any state with a massive army could crush them. The grandmother asks Chan Qing whether it is true that surrendering would guarantee their safety and protection. Chan Qing firmly denies this and tells her that slavery exists in many countries of the Jiting continent. When a land is captured, its people are enslaved for 10 years, after which they are gradually turned into inferior subjects. Zhu chimes in that slaves are not protected by state rules and aren't supported by any clans. Furthermore, there is no accountability for their life and death. The grandmother asks them about their plan. Chan Qing informs her that Yunzi has mobilized all the troops of the four city-states and has them positioned at the Changxiao border. Furthermore, as long as the major powers don't make a move, they can still hope to resist the state's army. The grandmother questions whether Yunzi had been aware of the existence of the Jiting continent all along and had been patiently awaiting this moment to fulfill her desire of establishing a country. A student exclaims that they were wrong about Yunzi while another points out that even if she manages to do it, they are still a land without a lord and aren't protected by the dynasty's rules. Those powers would still continue to attack them. Suddenly, Zhu speaks up, saying that there is a way they can avoid the others from attacking them. The grandmother asks Zhu how could they do that. Zhu responds that fortunately, he is a member of one of the six great clans and proposes that they declare the ancestral dragon city-state as belonging to the Zhu clan, allowing them to collect taxes from the state. By doing so, their land would no longer be lordless and any interference would be seen as a violation of the rules. The grandmother is pleased to hear this and says that they should arrange a marriage between him and Yunzi. However, since she isn't here, he can marry Lin Sha instead. After that, they shall announce that the ancestral dragon city-state now belongs to the Zhu clan. She feels relieved that they don't need to find a replacement, since Lin Sha already has the city-state stamp. Meanwhile, Zhu and Lin Sha are perplexed by this. Zhu kindly requests the grandmother to remain calm and allow him to continue speaking. The grandmother orders a man to stop talking, while he thinks that she's the only one who is talking. Following this, Zhu explains that he cannot proceed with the plan on his own. His return to the clan is necessary for negotiating with the others since it is the clan's power that they plan on using to intimidate the other powers in the first place. Chang Qing announces he's willing to go to the Jiting continent in order to earn the support of Jiting's Dragon Tamer Academy. He hopes his friend from the academy remembers him while he is gone. The grandmother gives her approval and exclaims that now everything is in their hands. Chang Qing responds, saying that even if they get the Zhu clan or Dragon Tamer Academy's support and successfully announce the establishment of a country, they won't be free from the other powers. They'd still be competing, but just in a more fair and open manner. Furthermore, if the Zhu clan fails to compete, the other forces will come after them. Upon hearing Chang Qing's response, the grandmother expresses her concern that his journey would take too long, and during that time, other forces might wipe out all the experts of the ancestral dragon city-state. Xu reassures her that during that time his aunt will maintain the order and defend them. However, she won't be able to do anything to stop the invasion. The ancestral dragon city-state can only count on Yunzi's army to make it through this lordless period. Xu explains that as long as the imperial dynasty recognizes them as an established country, they will have a chance to avoid enslavement even if they lose the battle. Ling Sha provides reassurance to Zhu, stating that after the Ever City incident, Yunzi has never lost a battle. Zhu points out that Yunzi seems well prepared for the arrival of the Jiting continent. He asks Ling Sha how her sister knew about it. Ling Sha reveals that there was a girl named Xinghua. She is a demigod who used the power of the stars to predict the arrival of the Jiting continent. Zhu mentions that he has met many demigods but has never heard of such power before. Upon hearing this, Ling Sha tells him that he is a loner who has seen very little of the world. Zhu responds by saying that he'll find a chance to meet Xinghua one day. Ling Sha tells Zhu that she has already seen Xinghua before. Zhu becomes confused upon hearing this, and Ling Sha exclaims that she has had enough and needs to take him to a place. At the Nan family's holy forest. Zhu, Ling Sha, and two other people can be seen in the forest. One of them remarks about the hardships he encountered while collecting the essence from the wood spirit altar, 
which was meant for nurturing a new divine wood dragon or baptizing the most skilled dragon master. He expresses his dismay at the idea of giving it to an outsider with a terrible reputation. Hearing this, the man reacts angrily and slaps the person. He calls him an idiot and asks him to shut his mouth. He instructs him to quit talking nonsense since Xu has the ability to influence the fate of the ancestral dragon city-state. The man bows in front of Zhu and apologizes for his son's comments. The son attempts to explain himself, but his father responds with yet another slap. Ling Xia suggests that the son needs to be taught a lesson or two, to which his father responds that he will indeed teach him a proper lesson. After some time, the three of them arrive in front of a wood-green dragon. Zhu is taken aback as the dragon unexpectedly opens its eyes. The father informs the holy guard that they have come to gather the holy essence and requests that it accept their offerings. Meanwhile, Zhu is surprised to see a divine wood green holy dragon in Nan family's forest. The dragon accepts their offerings and provides them with its essence. The father offers Zhu ten bottles of the ten year essence. Ling Sha asks him to also give Zhu the hundred year essence. The father anxiously clarifies that the hundred-year essence holds great significance for the Nan family. However, upon receiving a stern look from Yunzi, he swiftly changes his statement, saying that only the hundred-year essence is worthy of matching the status of Master Zhu. Ling Sha informs Zhu that each bottle of the ten-year essence will last his forest dragon for ten days. She further elaborates that the best thing about the hundred-year essence is that when a dragon consumes it during the bottleneck of its growth stage, it directly advances to the next stage and awakens some potent holy dragon powers. Meanwhile, the father envisions Zhu and his dragon casually consuming their family's precious treasure. However, he dismisses the thought and realizes that they cannot prevent it. He decides it is better to willingly offer it to them and hopes that they can rely on Zhu in the future. Following this, the father suggests to Zhu that he should also give some of the essence to his other dragons. However, he clarifies that only the dragons with the forest dragon bloodline can absorb it multiple times and advises him to feed the essence to his other dragons only once. Upon hearing this, Zhu is pleasantly surprised to learn that other dragons can also drink the essence. The father proudly adds that their essence doesn't interfere with other consumables that enhance a dragon's power, such as soul pearls and phantom fruit. Impressed by the abilities of the essence, Zhu expresses his regret wishing that he had taken more. Upon hearing this, the father becomes anxious and explains that it took them many decades to accumulate the essence and requests Zhu not to take all of it at once. Zhu laughs and says that he was just kidding, acknowledging that he has already been given more than enough while the father lets out a sigh in relief. Zhu is thrilled by the idea that Qingzhuo will be able to easily advance to the Dragon Lord stage by drinking this essence. He exclaims that raising dragons is easier than he thought. Ling Xia says that they have had enough and it is time for them to leave. At the West Sif Corridor, boiling lava surrounds the place, and the place is in utter chaos. Two men notice a group of people riding dragons through the sky, approaching them from a distance. As they arrive, Ling Xia informs Zhu that despite wearing new clothes, he still has that dog like look that makes people want to punch him, to which he responds that he will consider it a compliment. Bai Hongbo, the vice principal of the Lichuan Dragon Tamers Academy, whispers to himself that it appears some adventurous people from the mainland have come to explore the Jidin continent. However, he believes they die here since they won't be able to pass the guards at the West Cliff Corridor. As they reach a bridge, a man with an earthly snake dragon asks them if they wish to enter the Jidin continent. He says that they can either turn back or perish along with the others. Chang Qing asks Zhu whether he has anything that can prove he's from the Jidin continent. Zhu says no and asks him the same question. Chang Qing replies that he also doesn't have anything. He starts to activate his spirit domain and wonders if this will count. Chang Qing summons his gigantic thousand all measure dragon. Zhu is astonished as he looks at the man's dragon. Chang Qing asks the guard whether this will work, who immediately apologizes for his rude behavior and explains he thought they were from Lichuan. Chang Qing says that he is indeed from Lichuan. The guard nervously replies that they do not discriminate against respected dragon masters and urges them to go inside. Chang Qing suggests that they head inside while Zhu thinks to himself that wherever one goes, power is most important. 
Nian Yen sighs in exhaustion that they've finally reached as they enter the place. Nian Yen is surprised to see that the Jitung continent is quite similar to the ancestral dragon city-state. Chang Qing turns to Zhu and bids him farewell, saying that he's heading to the Dragon Academy. Zhu says that he hopes Chang Qing will be able to gain the support of Jiting's Dragon Tamer Academy. Shortly afterwards, Zhu suggests taking the route through Sin City to reach the Imperial Court faster. Ling Sha agrees, mentioning that they can also find some black market sellers there and buy some dragon blood as ink. Suddenly, Nian Nian draws Zhu's attention to the star fragments being sold nearby and suggests buying them for Bai Qi. She approaches the sellers and asks them about the price, to which they respond that the star fragments cost a hundred golden pearls. Nian Nian politely requests the sellers to give them a discount since they are going to buy a lot of them. The creepy sellers make an inappropriate offer, suggesting that they will offer a discount if Nian Nian and Ling Sha accompany them for a few days. One of the men lewdly comments on Ling Sha's appearance, mentioning her nice body and long legs, which makes him excited. Suddenly, Ling Sha uses her wand to conjure ropes that bind the creepy sellers, suspending them in the air. They beg for mercy as the ropes strangle them. Ling Sha decides to let them go and releases them from her magical grip, causing the sellers to fall to the ground. Ling Sha says that this is all the money she'll give as she tosses the gold pearl in front of them. Nian Nian orders one of the sellers to put all the star fragments into Bai Qi's dimensional space who reluctantly agrees. The seller stares at them from behind as he hears Nian Nian tell Ling Sha that she's going to check the place that is selling dragon blood. The sellers cry out that they have been robbed as the three of them leave. Shortly afterwards, Xu looks at the meat in his hand, saying that he cannot believe a slab of meat like this cost him five gold pearls. Nian Nian agrees, mentioning that everything they sell here is quite expensive. On the other hand, Ling Sha thinks that the two of them are acting like cheapskates. Zhu's attention is suddenly drawn to something. He excitedly looks at the phantom leaf soul pearls and exclaims that they can exchange. Shuang joins in, saying that they have finally found food for Qingzuo. Outside the forest of the Sin City, Nian Nian suggests that they stay here for the night, saying that the doesn't look particularly dangerous. Suddenly, a voice interrupts them, yelling at the group to stop and says whether the three of them consider them to be weaklings. Zhu notices that there are eleven of them. The men address Shuang'er and Ling Sha in an inappropriate manner, threatening that if they don't satisfy them, they won't let them live. One of the creepy men eyes the women with lustful eyes and says that they indeed look superb. Xu warns them that they are picking a fight with the wrong people, to which one of the men retorts that it is actually Zhu who picked a fight with the wrong people. He exclaims that no one can steal their star fragments. Ling Sha looks at the men in confusion. She asks Zhu who these people are, to which he asks her to stop pretending like she doesn't know them. He urges her to quickly handle the situation and get rid of these people. Lin Shi replies he should resolve it himself since he is the one who started this. Nian Nian whispers to Ling Sha that these are the people she messed with earlier today. Ling Sha responds that she will just let Xu handle it. Xu decides to fight with them himself as he activates Haya's spirit domain. He finally summons Haya and orders him to attack the creepy men. Haya immediately follows his instructions and charges at the enemy's dragon. He bites the dragon's neck, causing blood to flow out. The dragon screams in pain as it dies. Nian Nian's eyes widen in disbelief as she stares at the lifeless dragon and is shocked to see that it died instantly. Xu proudly exclaims that the claws and fangs of Haya possess the ability of deterioration, which caused the dragon to die so quickly. Nian Nian asks Xu when did Haya get so strong. She recalls feeding him just a few days ago, and he didn't possess such strength at that time. Xu responds explaining that Haya recently absorbed the soul pearls of a thunder dragon. This caused him to awaken his thunder abilities and the fierceness in his bloodline. The men stare at Haya and exclaim that maybe they did mess with the wrong people. They attempt to run while yelling that the dragon is far too strong. However, Zhu stops them as he summons Quingswo and orders him to finish them off. The men scream for help as Quingswo buries their bodies in the ground up to their necks. The men beg for mercy and offer them everything they own. He advises them to reflect on their actions as they descend into hell and hopes that in their next lives, they will choose a path of redemption and become better individuals. With that said, Quingswo severs their heads, killing them all. 
Shortly afterwards, Nian Nian excitedly tells Bai Qi to look at something. Ling Xia asks whether Bai Qi is a female since she seems to like shiny things. Out of nowhere, they hear a crack in the woods. A group of people suddenly appears in front of them and calls them despicable for hurting others just for money. Xu recognizes the group of people as the disciples of the Sword Mountain sect. Nian Nian asks Xu whether he knows them. Xu explains that he used to be a disciple of the Sword Mountain sect. He recalls that one of the senior swordsmen from the sect was like a grandfather to him. It surprises him to see another disciple from the sect here. He tells Fianan that they'll drop by their sect point one of the men accuses Zhu of lying, saying that he is pretending to be a disciple. Xu tries to explain himself, saying that he really was a disciple. The man does not believe and calls Zhu shameless. Fianan begins to shout, stating that they were the ones who were attacked first and that their lives were in danger. However, the man scoffs at her claims, finding them hilarious. He points out that they are the ones standing amidst the blood of those men. Nian Nian insults the man, saying that he single-handedly lowered the intelligence of the people of Jiting. Ling Xia chimes in, asking if that means whoever kills the other side becomes a robber. She finds the logic absurd and questions the man's reasoning. Meanwhile, Zhu sighs, saying that these people are not the brightest. He suggests that they should leave the place as he doesn't have time for all of this that a disciple takes out her sword and threatens to kill Haya if they dare to leave. Meanwhile, Haya wonders why it has to be him when Quingzuo is right beside him. Upon hearing this, Baiji immediately attacks the group and freezes them using ice. A man thinks whether these are ice powers as he freezes. Zhu informs them that he will be heading to their sect now and takes his leave. At the mountain of the mountain swordsman sect, Xu asks one of the guards to inform Miao Zhu that he has come to visit her. The guard asks him to prove that he knows her. Xu thinks for a moment and says that her place has a phoenix tree with a wind belt tied to it. He asks the guard if that is enough who tells him that he'll look for her. Nian Nian asks Zhu why no one recognizes him even though he used to be one of their disciples. Zhu replies that he was 15 years old when he left. Hence, it makes sense that no one remembers him. Ling Xia asks him how Miao Zhu remembers him then. Xu explains that they used to practice together. He calls her clumsy, saying that he used to help her with some moves. Upon hearing this, the guard screams at Xu, saying that he doesn't even have the tiniest bit of sword energy. How dare he criticize their senior. The guards say that he must be another relative of unknown origin who has come to them for their resources. They exclaim that they don't need people like him in their sect. Nian Nian starts to say something. However, she is interrupted by the guards who tell her to show some respect as Miao Zhu has arrived. The guards bow in front of her, showing their respect. Miao Zhu calls out Zhu's name who then greets the senior disciple. She asks Zhu about the two ladies with him. He replies that they are demigods that are journeying with him. He introduces her to Ling Xia. Meanwhile, Nian Nian introduces herself as Zhu's maid. Miao Zhu furiously asks him why are they journeying with him while Zhu is confused by her behavior. Ling Xia grabs Zhu's arm and tells him not to hide anything about how they got along the moment they met and that they left Lichuan without anyone knowing. Zhu realizes that she's doing it again. Miao Zhu is saddened by this and exclaims that her grandfather lied to her that he was dead. However, he just didn't want to see her since he found another woman. Xu nudges Ling Xia to stop the act as he requests Miao Zhu to not get hung up on this as he has important matters to discuss with her grandfather. Miao Zhu says that she is fine with him having a mistress as long as she is the main girl. The disciples are shocked to see this and wonder whether Zhu has poisoned her with some medicine that causes confusion. Xu asks her to stop and reminds her that they didn't make any promises. He adds that he and Ling Xia aren't a couple and tells her that she just said that to find out about her relationship with him. Miao Zhu asks if they're really not a couple while Ling Xia scoffs at the thought of being called a mistress. Xu confirms his statement. Upon hearing this, Miao Zhu happily grabs his arm and says that it is time for them to proceed. As they step inside the room, Miao Zhu tells the grandfather that Xu has come to see him. The grandfather looks confused for a moment. His eyes fall on Zhu, taken aback to see him alive. He questions whether he is a ghost. The grandfather calls Zhu as Xiao Lang and tells him not to visit him, 
stating that he still wishes to live longer. Zhu reassures the grandfather, explaining that he is indeed alive. He clarifies that he wasn't dead but somehow ended up in Lichuan. Hearing this, the grandfather pinches Zhu's cheek to make sure he is real. He questions Zhu about how he possesses the breathing of a dragon master despite not having any cultivation foundation. Zhu explains that much has happened since he left, resulting in him becoming a dragon master. He reveals that he has come back to protect Li Chuan from the other forces and prevent them from dividing themselves to attack Li Chuan from all sides. He requests the grandfather to send some strong fighters to the ancestral dragon city state. The grandfather understands his situation and tells Miao Zhu to ask Senior Gutang about his willingness to stay in the ancestral dragon city state in exchange for a Haoying sword. Senior Gutang is a master in swordsmanship. Zhu feels that the ancestral dragon city will be fine with the senior's help. Miao Zhu informs him that their last Haoying sword was lost in the abandoned sword forest. However, nobody has attempted to retrieve it due to the recent strange occurrences in the forest. Upon hearing this, the grandfather tells her not to worry, saying that Xiao Lang can request the Zhu clan to create a new one. Zhu agrees with him, saying he'll give Gutan a new one after returning to the ancestral dragon city state. Miao Zhu realizes that she had forgotten how incredible his clan is at forging. After that, the grandfather tells Miao Zhu to prepare a room for Xiao Lang's friends and says he wants to speak with Xiao Lang alone. Miao Zhu does as asked and takes Ling Xia and Yan Yan with her as they all leave. After they leave, the grandpa remarks to Zhu that he has brought two attractive women with him, particularly praising Ling Xia. He jokingly comments that Zhu's taste is as refined as his own. Zhu, feeling embarrassed, tries to clarify that among those two women, one is his maid, and the other is his future sister-in-law. However, the flirtatious grandfather playfully says that she must be Zhu's mistress. Zhu tells him to stop making such comments, and Grandpa finally decides to stop interfering. He suggests that Zhu should get a strong demigod to protect himself, as he believes that having two dragon masters traveling together is a bit dangerous. The fiery swords that were stuck in the ground begin to soar through the air and start heading towards Zhu. He closes his eyes as he waits for the swords to hit him. However, the swords start flying erratically in the air as they begin to shatter with a bright red light, while Zhu levitates in the air. A thunderbolt strikes the ground, causing an explosion. However, before he can react, a dragon exhales fire from its mouth. The flames start moving towards Zhu, heading in his direction. Suddenly, the fire transforms into beams of light and starts entering Zhu's body. The big red sword starts approaching Zhu and halts right above his forehead. As the big red sword lightly touches Zhu's forehead, blood begins to trickle down from his face. The sword moves away from his forehead, removing itself. Zhu looks at the creature in front of him and realizes that it is a sword or a dragon. Suddenly, the dragon disappears, leaving the sword behind. Zhu realizes that the ghost Miao Zhu's grandfather was talking about was actually a sword aura of an abandoned sword. All the sword auras have combined to become this big red sword. Xu tries to grab the sword. He never expected to hold a sword again, let alone see this. As Xu grabs the sword, the veins in his arms start glowing. He realizes that he needs training since only his right hand can handle the sword aura's immense power. With the sword dragon aura, Xu doesn't need a cultivation base for sword fighting. He recalls that the sword he used to spend most of his time with was called Amosia and decides to name the dragon after it, calling it Amosia as well. Meanwhile, at the arena of the Sword Mountain sect, there is a fight going on. Miao Zhu is fighting over Zhu with Ling Sha. Miao Zhu says that Zhu had mentioned that she is a demigod in his team. Miao Zhu asks Ling Sha to prove her strength and demonstrate her worthiness of becoming Zhu's companion. Ling Sha asks her what any of this has to do with her. Upon hearing this, Miao Zhu draws her sword near Ling Sha's face in anger. She feels jealous of Ling Sha's good looks. She begins to charge at Ling Sha and tries to attack Ling Sha with the sword in her hand. However, Ling Sha stops the attack by using her wand to create a shield in front of her. Miao Zhu due to the impact, Miao Zhu begins to slide backwards, trying to stabilize herself. Meanwhile, the disciples are astonished to witness Miao Zhu being effortlessly blocked and pushed back. 
They question if they are seeing it right, considering that Ling Xia hasn't even taken a step yet. Ling Xia gazes at her as the senior says that she was afraid of hurting her. But now the time has come for her to go all out. Back at the abandoned sword forest, Zhu says that his spiritual realm continues to become livelier as the sword or a dragon enters it. Within the spirit domain, the three dragons observe the arrival of the new sword or a dragon and express their admiration for it. Zhu feels happy that all of them are getting along. Suddenly, Zhu's attention is drawn to the arena of the Sword Mountain sect. He realizes that a battle is taking place in the arena and decides to leave the Sword Forest to investigate. Upon reaching, he requests people in the crowd to step aside as he tries to observe what is happening. Miao Zhu, with visible marks of injury on her face, sits in a defeated manner. She wonders how Ling Xia can possess such incredible strength despite being the same age as her. She asks Ling Xia to remove her veil, as she wants to see the face of the person who defeated her. Ling Xia unveils herself, revealing her identity. Zhu rolls his eyes as he sees the disciples swooning over Lynch's beauty. Miao Zhu thinks that Ling Xia looks better than her and understands why Zhu likes her. Miao Zhu introduces herself and says that she will treat Zhu like a brother from now onwards since she lost the fight. Ling Xia tells Miao Zhu that none of this concerns her. Miao Zhu is surprised to hear this and reminds Ling Xia that she had mentioned how well she and Zhu got along from the moment they met, and how they make each other happy. Ling Xia clarifies that person is actually Yunzi. She points at a frightened Zhu and tells her to ask him for the rest of the details. Miao Zhu wonders who is Yunzi. As she is about to ask Xu about it, she notices that he has disappeared. Shortly afterwards, Nian Yan asks Xu why they had to leave in the middle of the night, as she is exhausted from flying for so long. She teasingly asks Xu why he was avoiding Miao Zhu and is he hiding something. He dismisses the matter, calling it nonsense and clarifies that Miao Zhu had already left to look for his aunt. Following this, he says that before Miao Zhu left, she told him that the annual interclan competition is about to start, and this year's prizes are far better than the previous ones. He explains that for a dragon master, resources are the most important thing. The more resources one possesses, the more powerful they become. However, he admits that he hasn't made up his mind yet regarding whether he will join or not. Nian Nian wonders aloud what is an interclan competition. Zhu explains that it is a competition where disciples from various sects and clans participate to fight for glory. Nian Nian says that Miao Zhu is a senior, but Ling Xia still won against him. This means that the strength of the people from Jiting province is mediocre. It will be quite easy for Zhu to compete with them. Upon hearing this, Zhu says that Ling Xia has only fought against one person. In Jiting, there are many other old fighters with somewhat weird but strong fighting techniques. Nian Nian points out that Ling Xia is still young. She believes that they can defeat the old, strong fighters once they become stronger themselves. Ling Xia interrupts their conversation and says that they have almost reached the place. Nian Nian, while looking at that place, says that it is very beautiful. Meanwhile, Zhu says that it used to be his hometown. As they reach the Cloud Dragon Kingdom, Nian Nian feels that the things they heard about this place from the Academy are indeed true. Zhu smiles as he says that after so many years, he has finally reached his home. They finally reach their destination, the Zhu clan, where they hear trumpets playing. Zhu notices the serious environment of the place, and Yen Yen tells him that these people might be holding a funeral. A man named Yu Shan and his wife are seen crying while another man apologizes to them, saying that his disciple didn't know that Zhu Tong was their beloved son. The disciple lost control of himself which led to this tragedy. He continues by saying that he deserves to be punished for this tragedy, and if the two of them want to punish him, they will do so right away. However, the disciple shows no signs of remorse and smirks silently. However, before he can do anything, Ching Zhuo extends his hands from beneath the ground and scares the dragon. He smacks the dragon's face and sends him flying in the air. Out of nowhere, a blue dragon starts freezing Qingzhuo's hands. Qingzhuo notices this and screams as he creates a thriving domain. He traps the blue dragon in the wooden branches and releases a green light that severs its head. Meanwhile, the host is shocked to see that Qingzhuo has created a whole forest during the fight. 
She feels sad that they can't see what's happening due to the leaves blocking their view. All of a sudden, the woman falls off her dragon and begins screaming for help. In response, Xu quickly calls Qingzhua for assistance. Qingzhua immediately extends a branch for Zhu to stand on and transports him to the girl. Zhu catches the host in his arms who blushes as she thanks him for saving his life. Ji Yufei Juin cries as he runs away from Qingzhua's branches. He calls Xu a coward and demands that he come down to face them directly. Fei Juin criticizes Zhu for supposedly seeking attention from girls even in such a situation, while Zhu continues to carry the woman in his arms. Meanwhile, Gu He, the vice head of Qi sect, observes the scene and sighs in disappointment. Tian Guan speaks up and says that he always thought there had been a decent relationship between their clans. However, his son's actions have single-handedly ruined his many years of effort to build a relationship with them. Gu He tries to explain himself, saying that he has nothing to do with this and that Fei Juin must have been influenced by the corrupt people in the city to do such things. He claims that he wouldn't do this normally even for money. Tian Guan says that he is aware that Fei Juin has fallen under the influence of the young royal's clan, led by Zhao Shi and Zhao Inga who he perceives as useless wastes of food. Lady Xiao is offended by his comment and questions whether he knows that she's right in front of him. Lady Xiao takes offense at his comment and questions whether he realizes that she is sitting right in front of him. Tian Guan responds that regardless of her presence, her son is still a useless waste of food and sees no point in further debate. Lady Xiao upon hearing Tian Guan's response, Lady Yao's anger intensifies to an overwhelming degree and she faints in her servant's arms. The servant, angered by Tian Guan's attempts to humiliate the royal family, demands to know his intentions. Tian Guan responds that there are indeed some respectable people in the royal family, causing Lady Xiao to regain consciousness as she hears his response. However, he adds that there are also useless wastes of food and escorts. Lady Xiao fumes with anger, demanding to know who did he just call an escort, and passes out again. Back in the arena, Zhu accepts Fei Jiuan's wish and comes down. Fei Jiuan says that he thought Zhu is skilled but he fell for his trick. He gets ready to attack Zhu and the host tells Zhu to be careful. Zhu successfully blocks the attack with Qingzhu's branch and says that he should be mindful of his surroundings while trying to attack him. Zhu calls him blind as Qingzhu's branches trap his arms and legs while he demands to be let go of. The host watches the scene from above, impressed by Zhu's abilities. Meanwhile, Zhu experiences a sense of pride in Qingzhu's growth and exclaims that he can now launch mid-air attacks while still maintaining control over the trees on the ground and even trap someone. Following this, he asks whether Fei Juin is from the Qi sect who says yes in agreement and calls Zhu a coward for ambushing him using his dragon's powers. Fei Juin challenges Zhu, suggesting that if he is truly powerful, he should let him go and engage in a one-on-one -on -one fight with him. Zhu calls his suggestion hilarious and asks whether all members of the young royal's clan don't have any brains. Fei Juin denies being a part of the clan and says that he's doing this because he hates selfish people like him who can't stand the fact that life and death are up to fate in the inter-clan competition. He says that Zhu cannot act as he pleases in the spiritual hall simply because someone killed his brother and accuses him of disrespecting the royal family. Zhu says that Fei Juin has been manipulated and suggests that he leaves the Qi sect or else he would single-handedly drag down the intelligence of his entire clan. In response, Fei Juin denies being used, proudly proclaiming himself as a genius born within the 100 years of the sect. Meanwhile, a man with a sword creeps up behind Zhu and tells him to die as he is about to strike Zhu's neck. However, Zhu saves himself by launching a feather blade tornado at the man causing him to fall to the ground unconscious that a blue dragon comes out of nowhere and roars at Zhu. However, Qingzhua attacks the dragon using his branches. Blood starts falling from the dragon's master, and a woman beside him says that's the sign of spiritual chaos. She didn't think Zhu would be so powerful and decides to run from the forest. However, before she can do anything, the branches trap her. Meanwhile, Qingzhua is seen attacking multiple dragons in the air, using his green light powers. The competition's host is amazed by this and says that he is absolutely dominating. On the other hand, the blue-haired man slams his fist down in anger 
and wonders why is Zhu so powerful even after losing his sword foundations. Suddenly, Zhu appears and mocks him, asking whether he can't stand a loss. He asserts that his brother's death cannot be avenged by such a minor thing and issues a warning that if he found any connection between the blue-haired man and his brother's death, he will not hesitate to break his fake limb. The revelation of the fake limb leaves the bystanders in shock, while the blue-haired man, consumed by anger, loudly shouts at Shu for exposing his secret. Among the bystanders, a man mockingly says that he didn't know the blue-haired man is using a fake limb while another man suggests that Zhu is the genius swordsman who used to be in the royal clan. He shares that he had heard that Zhu stopped being their disciple after leaving the mountain. As the conversation unfolds, the blue-haired man becomes visibly fearful, lowering his head as he listens to their words. Meanwhile, another man joins the discussion revealing that a lord-ranked dragon master had attempted to teach Shu a lesson but ended up losing his dragon and retreating. Furthermore, it is shared that Shu cut the limbs of the royal kid, leading to his expulsion from the royal clan. The blue-haired man composes himself and warns Shu to watch his steps, saying that his sword foundation is no longer there to help him. Shu ignores his warning and asks whether he is or isn't involved in the death of his brother Zhu Tong. The blue-haired man responds by claiming that his brother's death was merely an accident that occurred during the competition. He proceeds to insult Xu, questioning whether they plan on having conflicts with everyone in the world over a single death within their clan. Xu insults him back which provokes the blue-haired man, who rises angrily from his seat and firmly declares that he has had enough. As they glare at each other, Xu threatens the blue-haired man, Zhao Inga saying that he will soon taste the consequences of killing his brother and suggests that he treasure the time that is left for him. Meanwhile, within the halls of the Jiting royal palace, discussions are taking place regarding Zhu's plan. The emperor announces that since the Zhu clan started the bet, the third round of the competition will take place in Jiguan city. He further states that all participating clans shall contribute a portion of their resources to be placed in the center of the city creating a prize for all participants to fight for. Upon hearing this, everyone present in the hall supports the proposition, deeming it a great idea. Following this, the emperor addresses the Rui Kingdom attack force, saying that he has received information regarding their ongoing attacks on the Lichuan continent and proceeds to inquire about the current situation. The Rui Kingdom attack force informs him that there is a kingdom in the east of the lands ruled by a strong demigod called Li Yunzi who is good at commanding and has an army of 300,000 troops. Not even the Rui Kingdom has been able to defeat them. In response, Gu He suggests a strategy for the Rui Kingdom attack force to surround Li Yunzi's troops and compel them to surrender. The others present in the hall agree with Gu He's suggestion saying that it doesn't matter what strategy they use since their main goal is to obtain their resources and if the Rui Kingdom successfully takes control of Lichuan, they would effectively hold the majority of ruling rights, rendering the inter-clan competition pointless. The Emperor gives the Rui Kingdom attack force a month's time to obtain the ruling rights of Lichuan, and if he can't do it by then, he shall focus on their rulers instead. Yu he says to Tianguan since he went with his ideas. Now the future of the Qi sect lies with him. Meanwhile, Zhu returns to the courtyard and is taken aback when he sees Haya's wounds have healed so quickly. The woman, who was the host of the inter-clan competition, greets him, saying that he's back. Zhu asks the woman how did Haya's wounds heal so quickly, and did she apply the medicine like he asked him to. The woman explains that she was told by the young miss to rest, so she took a nap and to her surprise, when she woke up, Haya's wounds had already healed. Confused, Shu asks about the identity of the young Mississippi. The woman responds stating that she's the one who always wears a mask, and adds that there have been rumors circulating about her and Zhu being a couple. She teases Zhu, asking if he is losing his memories like Mr. Koi. Zhu ignores her comment and calls the rumors nonsense, saying that Ling Sha is not some young miss and is just a demigod within his team. The woman believes him and offers him a slice of watermelon. Zhu declines her offer and decides to wake up Haya and ask him about his speedy recovery. He calls for Haya who wakes up wondering who is calling him. Zhu inquires about the disappearance of his wounds, prompting Haya to examine his body and exclaim with joy that he has fully recovered. 
However, while doing so, Haya accidentally breaks Zhu's bedroom wall, causing Zhu to angrily summon Haya back into the spirit domain. Zhu sighs that Qingzhua already broke his house down the other day, and now Haya broke his bedroom wall. It seemed to him that he'll need to get a bigger house to live in. Shortly afterwards, Xu thanks Ling Xia for helping Haya in recovering his wounds, saying that he didn't expect her to have a rare healing dragon. Ling Xia places her painting brush down and asks how did he find out that she has dragons. I in response, Zhu reveals that he, being a dragon master himself, could sense something in her breathing. He informs Ling Xia that the third round of the inter-clan competition is approaching and it's at the highly risky Jiguan city. He nervously suggests that if he can learn more about her power, it will increase their chances of winning. Ling Xia asks him what he means by learning more, to which Xu nervously explains that it isn't what she's thinking and requests her not to misunderstand what he meant. Ling Xia sternly asks what misunderstanding is he talking about. Xu notices her anger and changes the topic, saying that he was looking for her to tell her something. He informs her that the emperor has ordered that if, within a month, Rei Kingdom is unable to obtain ruling rights for the ancestral dragon city-state, they will allow the four states of Lichuan to form a new kingdom and join the Jiting continent. Ling Xia is pleased to hear that they only need to wait a month while Xu feels sure that Yunzi can defend the city from the attacks of the Rui Kingdom till then. Meanwhile, at the Lichuan continent battlefield, in the ancestral dragon army general's tent, Shangger is tending to Yunzi's wounds. Concerned for her well-being, Shangger advises Yunzi against returning to the battlefield, urging her to rest. However, Yunzi dismisses the advice, stating that she cannot simply abstain from participating in the war. Suddenly, a soldier enters the tent and informs Yunzi that the Jiting Continent's army has attacked them. Upon hearing this, Yunzi stands up and tells him to prepare for the battle. Shangger lets out a sigh and tells Yunzi to consider commanding the team from the base instead of rushing into the battle. On the battlefield, the Jiting Continent's army attacks Yunzi's troops, their chance filled with the desire to kill. Undeterred, Yunzi emerges from her tent, commanding her troops to protect the lands. In response to her order, her soldiers rally together, chanting in unison as they prepare to protect their territory. Yunzi watches as the battlefield is on fire. Suddenly, an enemy soldier's dragon launches a metal rush at her. Yunzi propels her sword in the air, blocking the attack. As her sword returns to her hand, she wields it to defend herself from the soldier trying to attack her. However, she falls to the ground due to her injured state. The soldier says that he respects her as a warrior. However, he points out her wounded state and advises her to stop fighting since the Rui Kingdom will take over Lichuan in a month anyway. Yunzi declares that she won't back down. In response, the soldier says that she has brought this fate upon herself and determines to end her life. Suddenly, an explosion occurs. The soldier angrily demands to know what has happened and his comrade informs him that their food storage has unexpectedly blown up. Meanwhile, at the food storage, it is revealed that Qian Jing had been hiding in the Rui army and had finally got the chance to blow up their food. Back at the Lichuan battlefield, People from the Wutu announce that they have arrived to help the Queen and the soldiers of the Lingxiao city-state declare that they have also come to assist. Upon seeing this, a soldier of the Jiting army informs their general that the situation has worsened. The ancestral dragon's army just got two additional teams and has flanked them from the sides. The general orders them to retreat, while the ancestral dragon's army charges to kill them. Yunzi sheds a tear of relief that backup has finally arrived. Suddenly, Shangmer's voice pierces through the chaos as Yunzi loses consciousness and begins to fall. A few days later, the day of the third round of the inter-clan competition has finally arrived. The host welcomes everyone to Jiguan City and invites the audience to greet the participants with a round of applause. She announces that half of the resources contributed by all the clans for the competition are presently located in Jiguan City. Each participant will embark on an individual quest to locate these resources. To acquire them, they must take a bamboo torch and, upon burning it, hand it to the judge who will then provide them with the resources assigned to the torch. The host issues a word of caution, warning the participants about the presence of ancient dragons in Jiguan City and hopes that all participants will avoid them to prevent any unfortunate accidents. Chu turns to Ling Xia and asks whether she is still worried about Li Chuan. 
He reassures her that the Zhu clan investigation team has already confirmed that Yunzi successfully defended the ancestral dragon city from the advances of the Rei Kingdom. He adds that even though Yunzi became unconscious due to fatigue after the battle, she regained consciousness shortly after. They believe she will soon launch a counterattack. Ling Xia acknowledges the news and says she isn't worried. She declares that she'll obtain the ruling rights to Li Chuan through this competition, no matter what. As the sound of people bickering reaches their ears, Xu notes that a fight seems to have broken out and decides to investigate the situation by taking a closer look. A group of people are seen fighting over who found the box first. One participant dismisses the argument as childish, saying that this is a competition where the ultimate goal is not about who found it first but rather who gets to keep it in the END.AS they continue to fight. Xu says that the box likely contains resources belonging to one of the clans and tells Baichi to bring it to him. Baichi flies over to the statue and grabs the box from its hands. She brings it to Xu who opens the box and discovers that it contains the ownership rights of the Rain City. He can't believe that got a city so easily point one of the participants who had been engaged in the dispute notices that Xu has obtained it. Filled with anger, she declares that Xu has taken the box which contains the ownership rights of a city. Xu says that he'll keep the box, triggering an angry response from the woman. She declares that she won't let him keep it, and says that their Lu clan despise people like him. She warns him to hand it over instantly before they beat him to a pulp. Ling Xia notices the woman's attire, and says she seems like someone who belongs to one of the four great sects of Jiting. Xu confirms her statement and says that he has learned a lot from an elder of their sect. He admits that their indestructible golden body technique is not something to scoff at, and it keeps them protected from ordinary sharp weapons. I, in response to Zhu's remark, the woman angrily shouts that someone like him could never receive teachings from an elder of her sect. Her fellow disciple joins in agreement, saying that he should plan things out before lying. Meanwhile, the participants who were previously engaged in a fight with the Lu clan run away in fear as they notice Zhu's presence. The woman charges towards Zhu, demanding he hand over the box. Zhu hurls the box in her direction, and the woman grabs it. The woman laughs and mocks Zhu, calling him a soft boy who lacks true manliness, and says that a few threats were all it took for him to surrender the box without putting up a fight. Zhu wonders if she is an idiot while her fellow disciple prepares to punch Zhu, demanding him to hand over the contract as the woman notices the box is empty. Baichi creates a wall of ice between them, causing the man to punch the ice instead. Enraged by Zhu's audacity to hand her an empty box, the woman charges forward. Breaking through the icy and confronts Zhu directly, causing his jaw to drop at her aggressiveness. Baichi comes in front of the woman who warns her not to provoke the lunas if she can't handle their toughness. However, Baichi ignores her and freezes the woman, causing her brother to seethe in anger. He exclaims that he's going to fight Shu and prepares to punch him. However, before he can do anything, Baichi freezes him as well. Zhu criticizes the brother for foolishly attempting to fight despite witnessing what happened to his sister, and informs him that the ice will take two hours to melt. He comments that it is a matter of luck whether he will be attacked by a wild dragon or face another force. He wishes him luck and the frozen man cries as he watches them leave. Soon after, Zhu and Ling Xia hear Qin Yang's voice calling out to them. Zhu asks why is she here, to which Qin Yang responds that each group is permitted to bring three representatives from their clans and there is no reason for the Zhu clan to keep a spot empty. Furthermore, she reveals that her subordinates have confirmed that the members of the young royals clan have already gathered to deal with Zhu. Upon hearing this, he asks about their location. Qin Yang informs him that they were headed towards the Valley of the Young Dragons. She believes that Ji Guan's city will be responsible for changing the layout of the noble class and asks Ling Xia and Zhu to follow her as she leaves. Meanwhile, at the Valley of the Young Dragons, the members of the Young Royals clan wonder who had the terrible idea of hiding the box. Without the Jun level strength, no one will be able to reach the box due to the danger posed by the banyan trees. Suddenly, one of them has an idea and proposes to lure Zhu here and then awaken the bees, saying that these thousands of bees will definitely manage to take his life. Suddenly, Xiao Song gets an idea and suggests luring Zhu here before rousing the bees, claiming that the thousands of bees will definitely kill him. 
Zhao Shi praises his idea and suggests that they let other forces or casual practitioners handle it, allowing them to take the risks while they reap the benefits. The young royal's clan lets out an evil laugh as they decide to proceed with the plan. Unbeknownst to them, Zhu observes them from above and says that this isn't the right spot to attack. Qin Yang adds that they should be waiting for help, however, Ling Sha disagrees, saying that it's easy. She takes out her scroll and creates a fake dragon. She orders the dragon to go ahead. The young royals clan look at the fake dragon in horror, wondering what it is. The dragon bumps into a banyan tree and awakens the bees. As thousands of bees start emerging from the hive, the young royals clan starts crying as they immediately flee the place. As the relentless bees continue to chase him, he quickly enters the place and secures the entrance, locking himself inside. Breathing a sigh of relief, he vows to break the person into pieces responsible for unleashing the bees on him. Suddenly, he notices Zhu and asks what's he doing here. Unfazed by the question, Zhu calls the place nice. He threateningly tells Xiao Tsong that if he ever misses himself, he can come to visit the shrine Zhu is about to build for him. A terrified Xiao Tsong tells him to stop being naive, saying that the Zhu clan holds only limited influence in the capital and lies that he's not afraid of him. Zhu lightly strikes Xiao Tsung's face with his sword, causing a small stream of blood to trickle down. He then places the sword against Xiao Tsung's shoulder and poses a question, asking if Xiao Tsung wants Zhu to take action or if he prefers to take matters into his own hands. Suddenly, Xiao Tsung activates his spirit domain, unleashing a powerful force that sends Zhu flying backwards. He summons his formidable purple goat devil dragon and wickedly laughs boasting about his dragon's superior status as an upper lord rank. He taunts Zhu, saying that without his sword, he is worthless and incapable of competing against him. However, Zhu immediately summons his sword or a dragon, leaving Xiao Tsong visibly pale and alarmed. Zhu charges towards him, while Xiao Tsong stares at him in horror. He screams in pain as Zhu cuts his arm off, blood dripping from his mouth and shoulder. Xiao Tsung deems this impossible and asks Zhu hadn't he ruined his sword training. Zhu responds that even if he is ruined, he can effortlessly kill a villain like him. Xiao Tsung begs Zhu not to kill him, saying that he was just a hitman. It was Zhao Ying's idea that whoever killed Zhu Tong will get the soul pearl. He says that he didn't have any personal beef with Zhu Tong, it was Zhao Xi and Zhao Ying who wanted him dead. Xiao Tsung kneels before Zhu, trembling with fear and offers to tell him a secret in exchange for sparing his life. Desperate to survive, he even proposes Zhu cut all of his limbs, as long as he is allowed to live. Zhu urges Xiao Tsong to reveal the secret first, and Xiao Tsong discloses that the heavenly continent of the Ion River, along with its powerful instruments, is located within Jiguan City. Upon hearing this, Zhu accepts his offer saying that he'll only cut off his arms and legs if he discloses the whereabouts of the Book of Authority for the Land of River. Xiao Tsung immediately informs him that it's located at the Tomb of the Nine Armies and the valuable spiritual resources are also located near it. Xu leaves the scene after chopping off Xiao Tsung's limbs, claiming that honesty is the best quality in a human being and that he kept his promise. Xiao Tsung begs Xu to help him as the bees swarm into the room that Xu had left open. In his anguish, he curses Zhu and vows to haunt him as a ghost. Soon after, the host of the competition delivers the news to Lord Haoyong that his son, Xiao Tsong, has been killed by the Banyan bees. She urges him to accept the loss of his son and treat the matter seriously. As the host's dragon drops Xiao Tsong's body to the ground, a grief-stricken Haoyong rushes towards his son. Haoyong cries over Xiao Tsung's horrific death and is certain that Zhu is to blame for his son's demise. Filled with anger, Haoyong declares that he will avenge his son by taking Zhu's life. Upon hearing this, the host reminds him that this is the great contest of power, where life and death are at stake. She tells him that if he wasn't prepared for such outcomes, he should not have allowed his son to come here. Haoyong cries at the feet of the most revered of the Purple Forest sex guardians and desperately asks him to take action regarding his son's death. The most revered responds to Haoyong's plea, saying that he will help him in seeking revenge and declares that he will order the disciples of the Purple Zone Lean to kill Zhu whenever they come across him. Meanwhile, at the competition, 
purple smoke can be seen in the air. The host notices the smoke and realizes that the show is about to begin. Xu looks at the smoke and Qin Yang whether this is coming from the bamboo torch they were instructed to light. Qin Yang confirms his suspicions and explains that the competition is divided into five grades of white, yellow, blue, purple, and red. These grades represent the level of nobility associated with each box, with red being the highest and white being the lowest. She informs them that it appears someone has discovered the purple box. The mention of someone finding the purple box catches Zhu's attention, as he recognizes its significance as the second highest level. He suggests that they go take a look as he leaves .at the machine city. A group of participants argue with a man named Yun Zhanghe over the purple box. They demand that he hand it over before the referee arrives, warning him to stop resisting as he cannot handle all of them at once. While all of this is going on, the Zhu clan discreetly observes the scene from behind a rock. Qin Yang mentions that Zhu is familiar with Zhang He while Ling Xia recognizes him as a disciple of the Yao Shan Sword Sect and remarks that he is even stronger than Miao Zhu. In response, Zhu brushes off Zhang He, saying that he is just someone with an inflated ego and average abilities. Zhang He swings his sword, releasing multiple blue lights towards the participants who become infuriated and decide to get together to kill him. However, their plan does not work as Zhang He swiftly them with his sword, killing them all. After the fight ends, the host requests Zhang He to give her the box to claim the assigned goods. However, he reminds her that he needs to eliminate all the threats around him before the box truly belongs to him. She counters, stating that there is no one present within a hundred meters to fight him. However, Zhang He confidently asserts that there is indeed a threat within that range and calls out Zhu, stunning the three of them with the realization that Zhang He knew they were hiding. Zhu sheepishly emerges from behind the rock and stands before him. Zhang He mentions the high value of the mine and suggests that Zhu should also fight for it. However, considering the complex relationship between the Yao Mountain Sword sect and the Zhu clan, it might not be a wise decision. Zhang He expresses his desire to battle Zhu for the mine but questions if Xu has the capability to compete. Xu asks him if he is intentionally seeking trouble. Zhang He denies this accusation and retorts by saying that he heard Zhu had returned to the mountain and collected all the swords from the abandoned sword forest, just like a scrap collector. Zhang He dangles the mine deed above his sword and tells Zhu that if he wants the mine deed, he should come and take it. Filled with anger, Qin Yang confronts Zhang He and firmly tells him that if he has no intention of helping Zhu, he should leave and stop pointing his sword at him. Zhang He retorts, stating that he did not thrust his sword at Xu and if Xu desired the mind deed, he could have easily reached out to take it. Xu menacingly says that he must think he has become good after all these years of not seeing each other and begins to activate his spirit domain. However, Ling Xia stops him, saying that she'll handle it. She takes out her scroll and says that she had recently learned the sword play of his sect, and it seems to be quite generic. Zhang He becomes furious upon hearing this and attempts to attack Ling Xia with his sword, saying that winning against Miao Zhu doesn't guarantee her victory against all the disciples of the Yaoshan sect. Ling Xia effortlessly dodges his sword and draws snake-like creatures to life. As the creatures encircle him, Zhang He insults Ling Xia and tries to attack them. Suddenly, a hand grabs his leg, causing him to realize that they aren't an illusion. Fearful, Zhang He drops his sword and hastily retreats, leaving his sword behind in the mud as the snake-like creatures gradually fade away. He finally makes it on top of a rock and sighs in relief. However, he suddenly hears people laughing at him, saying that they've heard of people flying on their swords but have never seen a sword step on MUD.AS they continue to laugh at him. Zhang He's anger escalates, and he retrieves his sword from the mud. Filled with rage, he charges at Ling Xia, accusing her of trickery. He destroys the eight trigrams platform she had created and dismisses her attempt to use his sex trigrams platform against him, claiming it to be beyond her capabilities. Xu interrupts, asking Zhang He when he will set aside his ego. He defends Ling Xia stating that she is capable of drawing even the eight stone platform and there is no secret art formation she cannot paint. Upon hearing this, 
John He's eyes widen in shock as he realizes that she knows the sword damage formation of their sect. A yellow sword starts to emerge from beneath the ground as Zogna watches in shock. Suddenly, the sword cements itself into a huge rock and appears above Zhang He, who is forced to carry it. Lin Sha creates three more swords. The blue sword starts heading towards Zhang He and attacks him, causing the rock to fall along with him. He stares at the pink sword coming at him and wonders if this is the real power of the Sword Damage Foundation. Zhang He is in disbelief that how can a mere painter defeat a great disciple of the Yao Shan sword sect like him, as the sword stops just inches away from his face. Ling Sha confidently approaches Zhang He, and says that although she only drew four swords in the Sword Damage formation and only three of them manifested, he has already lost the battle. Zhang He can't handle it anymore and finally admits defeat. Shortly afterwards, John He is seen apologizing for bringing disgrace to the Yao Shan sword sect. Wu Feng reassures him, saying that it's alright since everyone in the imperial capital knows that Zhu represents their sect. However, upon hearing this, John He feels a sense of betrayal, as if his chest has been pierced by arrows. Suddenly, red and purple smoke fills the sky, capturing Zhang He and Wu Feng's attention. Zhang He realizes the smoke is coming from the area where Zhu was and can't believe Zhu had two of the highest level boxes in his hands. Back at Zhu's area, the host wishes him luck and explains the rules that he will have to hand over the boxes and eliminate all threats to secure their possession. However, Zhu surprises her by revealing that he doesn't have the boxes. Confused, the host asks why he lit the beacon. Zhu points behind him and reveals that another group has it. The host realizes that Zhu has used the red beacon as a trap to lure everyone to his location and kill them all at once. Zhu turns around and announces to the group that he wants all the boxes they have on them. The group of participants think that he's gone crazy and exclaim how dare he try to rob them. Zhu summons Bai Qi, Haiya and Qingzhua and orders them to eliminate the group. Meanwhile, Ling Xia uses her paintbrush to draw a wall around them. The group starts feeling anxious as they try to figure out what's happening. The host observes the scene from above and announces that the group has been surrounded and there is no way to escape this time. The group of participants gets infuriated at the Zhu clan's audacity to surround them and summons their dragons. One of them tells Haya to taste the power of his lightning charm as it flies over to Haya and sticks to his mouth. The charm summons lightning from the sky that strikes Haya, resulting in a powerful explosion. As Haya lies unconscious, the man starts laughing as he mocks Haya for trying to mess with their Fu clan. However, his laughter abruptly ends when Haya unexpectedly wakes up and strikes him with his tail, causing blood to trickle down from his head. Haya absorbs the energy from the blood and releases a bright yellow light from his mouth, causing a woman to scream as the light forcefully tears apart her clothes. Meanwhile, Qingzhua unleashes his powers causing the surrounding area to flourish with the growth of a magnificent forest. Suddenly, a light wolf dragon of the upper stage dragon lord rank emerges, shooting a bright red light from its mouth directly at the forest. A scared Qingzhua looks at Zhu, realizing that they are doomed. Another dragon appears out of nowhere and charges directly towards Zhu. However, before it can do anything, Qin Yang punches its head, telling the dragon to bow down. She continues to punch the dragon, saying that she won't let the dragon hurt Zhu. Meanwhile, a participant notices the dragons trapped in Qingzhua's vines. Suddenly, a wooden hand comes from the forest and punches the man, causing blood to pour out of his mouth. Suddenly, Qingzhua undergoes a dramatic increase in size. Upon seeing this, the participants realize that he's a peak dragon lord. They wonder how it is possible for him to possess three bloodlines, and realize their fate was sealed from the very beginning. They start to flee the place and the light wolf dragon follows them. However, they're suddenly attacked by a purple dragon which is revealed to be Lingxia's. The man screams as the dragon gets closer to his face, ready to kill him. Shortly afterwards, at the Jiguan City Pavilion, the most revered of the purple forest sex guardians comments that Zhu is so young, yet already so cunning and deems his conduct as terrible. In response, Wu Feng points out that Zhu fearlessly lit the beacon without caring about the strength of his opponents. He commends Zhu for his ability to devise a successful strategy while fighting off multiple people. 
He finds it ironic that Ju is being labeled as cunning despite his admirable qualities and says that the Purple Sect is just too weak and unwilling to admit their defeat. Suddenly, Zhang He tells Wu Feng that Xu has lit another red beacon. Hearing this, Wu Feng laughs, realizing that Zhu is planning to rob another group of people. He admires Zhu's courage and strength, reflecting on his own youth and acknowledging the similarities between them. Meanwhile, Zhang He doubts Wu Feng, wondering how has he never heard that he was as crazy as Xu. Back at the competition, Zhu wickedly laughs, exclaiming that he's rich. He says that it's unfortunate that there aren't many valuable boxes left, otherwise he'd keep on robbing them. Zhu asks the host if he can hand the boxes to her now and the woman agrees. Zhu suggests that they should depart for the Nine Army Cemetery. Qin Yang agrees but warns Zhu that most of the people in Jiguan City are still above the Dragon Lord rank. Therefore, he needs to be careful when they reach the Nine Army Cemetery. Xu asks her whether she knows what's special about the Nine Army Cemetery. Qin Yang responds that it's Wushangjuan. Meanwhile, the host wonders how is she gonna carry so many boxes and realizes that she'll need to summon a storage dragon for it. Qin Yang continues that Wushangjuan is a top disciple of the Purple Sect Forest. She has heard that both his Purple Cloud Dragon and Golden Dragon are monarchs. Upon hearing this, Zhu nonchalantly says that's as good as when he had his sword foundation, leaving Qin Yang and Ling Sha speechless. At the peak of the Nine Army Cemetery, people are fighting with the statues to obtain the boxes. A brown-haired man screams for help as the general statue attacks him to stop him from taking the purple box. Meanwhile, Zhao Xi arrives at the cemetery with Su Mao, Zhao Qin, Zhao Wu and Du Jiu. Zhao Xi warns his teammates to be mindful of the statue that goes after the people who take its box. When Mengru, a woman from the small mountain sect, watches the scene unfold as her teammate criticizes the brown-haired man for attempting to snatch the boxes despite being unable to fight against a mere stone statue, the brown-haired man vows to give the purple box to the person who helps him. However, it is too late, as the general statue kicks him with its food, causing blood to pour out of his mouth. The statue retrieves the purple box in its hand as the man crashes to the ground. Fu Shume, an elder of the White Dragon Palace, nervously says that the strength of these statues is at least of monarch rank. He realizes that this won't be as easy as they thought. Suddenly, the purple-haired man tells everyone to look somewhere. Everyone looks at the sky as Xu arrives at the cemetery. Xu announces that all of the boxes are going to be his, leaving people shocked. Xu jumps on top of a statue and suggests everyone run from the cemetery. A criticizes Xu for speaking nonsensical claims, stating that most of the people and monsters present at the cemetery are upper stage lords. Another man counters, saying that Xu wouldn't speak with such confidence if he wasn't sure of his abilities. However, someone next to him expresses doubt, suggesting that Xu is merely a self centered individual who enjoys boasting. The most revered of the Purple Sect laugh at Wu Feng, mocking the wisdom and courage he mentioned earlier. He taunts that Zhu is merely inviting death upon himself. In response, Wu Feng confidently states that the fight is still ongoing and promises to deliver a resounding slap in the face to the most revered in due time. Zhao Qin proclaims that he wasn't expecting Zhu to arrive and says that rumors had been going around that Zhu is full of himself. He remarks that they seem to be true and mocks Xu by calling him a clown. Meanwhile, Su Mao decides to teach Xu a lesson and summons his Violet Fire Azure Dragon. The Violet Dragon charges towards Xu and prepares to attack him. Xu orders Bai Qi to Ice Age him. Bai Qi shoots ice at the dragon. Upon seeing this, the Violet Dragon shoots a Violet Light as well. Their ice and Violet Light clash against each other, creating a powerful collision. Su Mao realizes that something isn't right, his Violet Fire Azure Dragon isn't a match for Bai Qi. Meanwhile, Zhao Xi orders Du Jiu to kill Xu. Upon hearing this, Du Jiu immediately springs into action, leaping into the air, he gets ready to attack Xu with his metal fist. Zhao Yaij maliciously laughs as he anticipates the attack. However, Xu notices Du Jiu charging towards him, realizing that Du Jiu is not a real person but rather a puppet, he quickly evades the attack as Dujio smashes the statue's head with his metal hand, causing a powerful explosion. Asu lands safely on the ground, 
Xiao Yaij declares that every single day for years he has been plotting Zhu's demise and that day has finally arrived. Xu commends Xiao Yaij for hiding so well and says that he must have worked hard to build his puppet. He mocks him, asking if Zhao Yuga relies on his puppet's assistance even when it comes to sleeping with people. He wonders that if he has a child, will the child belong to him or his puppet? Zhao Yaij becomes enraged upon hearing this and screams for him to die. Du Jiu immediately charges towards Zhu and as he is about to attack him, Xu takes out his sword and slashes his metal arms, breaking them into pieces. Zhao Yaij starts to cough up blood as Xu threatens to chop his limbs again. He orders Bai Qi to stop playing around and destroy the enemies. Upon hearing this, Bai Qi attacks the violet dragon with ice, causing it to crash to the ground. Su Mao also starts coughing up blood as Zhao Xi insults him for being so weak. Zhu warns them to leave the place if they wish to live. Suddenly, Shang Jun from the Violet Sect summons his Golden Heaven and Violet Cloud Dragon. He says that Xu had challenged their sect years ago, however, he wasn't present at that time but now he has the opportunity to teach him a lesson. Yi Guang from the Demigod Academy interrupts Shang Jun, saying that he has never met a jerk like Xu before and requests that he fight Xu first. Meanwhile, Foot Monk Yang Hua from the Noble Wuxia Sect prays to Amidba. When Mengru also comes forward, saying that she's also going to take revenge on Xu for stabbing her. As they all get ready to fight Xu, he smugly tells them not to rush, claiming that he himself despises wasting time more than anything and urges them to attack him all at once. Observing the scene from the sidelines, a man voices his disapproval, saying that Xu does not treat others like human beings, while a woman beside him swoons over Xu. Shang Jun steps forward, declaring his intent to test Zhu's capabilities and orders his Violet Cloud Dragon to attack him. As his Violet Cloud Dragon begins to head towards Zhu, Zhu unexpectedly summons his sword or a dragon, leaving Shang Jun shocked. Realizing the potential danger, Shang Jun hastily orders his Violet Cloud Dragon to come back. However, before it can do anything, Zhu swiftly strikes the Violet Cloud Dragon with his sword, causing it to fall to the ground in defeat. Y Guang declares that he'll do it, and charges towards Zhu, screaming at him to die. In response, Zhu confidently points his sword forward and warns that Yi Guang is inviting his own death. Yi Guang's fist and Zhu's sword collide, causing a burst of purple and yellow light. Yi Guang curses as Zhu asks whether that's all he's got. Upon hearing this, Yi Guang becomes infuriated. He thinks Xu is a show-off and desperately wants to beat the crap out of him. Suddenly, his anger turns into fear as Xu's sword appears right in front of his face. Yi Guang tries to dodge the sword, wondering why a mere sword life form possesses such tremendous strength. However, finds himself unable to escape as the sword nears dangerously close to him and slashes his neck causing blood to spurt out. Y Yi Guang screams in pain as the sword begins to return. Suddenly, Shang Jun appears on his Golden Heaven Dragon, which expels a potent yellow substance from its mouth, launching an attack against Zhu's sword. Meanwhile, his Violet Cloud Dragon roars as it regains consciousness. Shang Jun smirks, feeling undefeatable, he says that he won't be careless this time. Suddenly, the sword attacks the Violet Dragon on its tail causing it to bleed. The violet dragon groans in pain as it starts falling to the ground. Seeing this, the golden heaven dragon golden heaven dragon responds by once again attacking the sword or a dragon with its potent yellow substance. However, the sword remains unfazed and attacks the dragon on its head. Upon seeing this, Shang Jun's confident smirk is replaced by a horrified expression as he is left speechless. Zhu stands with his arms crossed, feeling invincible, he says that it's time and tells his sword to drink the blood to sharpen its edge. Meanwhile, Wen Mingru, with a sword in her hand, tells her teammates to attack Xu and they start heading in his direction. Xu calls his sword, bringing it closer to him. As it appears in his hand, he observes the blood inscription on it and realizes that just a few more drops of blood are needed for its awakening. He suggests that the blood of a skilled sword cultivator would be perfect just as when Mingru is about to attack him. Hearing this, she challenges him to prove his skill if he wishes to obtain her blood. In response, Chu prepares to strike Wen Mingru with his sword. 
surprised by his sudden action, when Mingru barely manages to block his sword, and in the process, her hand gets cut, causing her to hiss in pain as blood to flow out. Zhu looks at her undeterred as she backs away from him. She realizes that Zhu is way too strong as she can barely hold onto her sword when fighting him. Meanwhile, when Mingru's blood fulfills the sword's requirement, and Zhu's sword begins its awakening process. As his sleeve ignites with the sword's energy, he declares that he might be a nobody but his sword can reach the heavens. Witnessing this, Zhao Wu realizes the severity of the situation and tells Zhao Chen they must not let him awaken his sword successfully. He suggests that they charge together to stop him. As Zhao Chen screams for Zhu to die. As Zhu's sword rapidly expands and radiates a vibrant yellow glow, he declares that his sword formation is not an array but rather a swordsmanship. He tells them to look closely at the first ever swordsmanship and hurls it to the ground. Everyone starts screaming to flee the place as they witness the descending sword about to collide with the ground in a potentially catastrophic crash. However, before they can do anything, the sword crashes and causes a massive explosion. In a state of disbelief, onlookers observe, with shock and horror, the lifeless bodies of those who perished, while the injured victims cry out in agony. Undeterred by the devastation, Zhu initiates a second swordsmanship, unleashing a brilliant blue light to strike at the enemy dragons. Following this, he launches the third swordsmanship, causing bright purple beams of light to come out of the sword and attack them all. Continuing his relentless onslaught, Xu unleashes the fourth swordsmanship known as the Earth Sword. With a forceful strike, the sword penetrates the ground, resulting in a resounding crack as the ground splinters into fragments. Witnessing this, Zhang He questions Wu Feng whether the sword formation is truly a swordsmanship. Wu Feng admits that it is the first time he has heard about it and witnessed such immense power. He commends Zhu acknowledging that he is becoming increasingly challenging to battle with. Meanwhile, Xu further unleashes the fifth swordsmanship, known as the Thunder Sword and electrocutes his enemies. Not stopping there, he employs another swordsmanship called the Fire Sword and attacks them with circles of fire. Zhao Xi tries to flee the scene, bewildered by how his crappy sword has transformed into an unstoppable force. As the battle reaches its climax, Zhu unleashes his final swordsmanship shooting it at Wenmingru. The sword impales her arm and continues its trajectory, striking a nearby wall and triggering a massive explosion. Amidst the dissipating smoke, a gaping hole becomes visible in the damaged wall. Witnessing the destructive aftermath, people start fleeing the place, exclaiming that Zhu is out of his mind. Feeling a deep sense of exhaustion, Zhu sighs, recognizing that his skills have gotten rusty since he abandoned swordsmanship. Therefore, he can only employ up to seven swordsmanship, but he believes they are sufficient for now. I in the midst of the chaos. A terrified Zhao Wu exclaims that Zhu's swordsmanship is far too strong. He announces that he's choosing to leave and an injured one Mingru agrees with him. Meanwhile, Shang Jun advises everyone below the monarch stage to give up and leave. However, Zhao Chen disagrees, saying that Zhu has already used up all his energy and tells them to stop being weak that he summons his poisonous bone dragon, declaring that they will unite and defeat Xu. Observing this, Xu arrogantly says that their attempts to defeat him with such useless remnants are merely wishful thinking. Suddenly, a pink-haired woman starts laughing as Xu realizes that he has been surrounded by a thousand kilo charm. She introduces herself as He Ching, the charm cultivator. He Ching asks him to enlighten her as she throws the charms. Zhu realizes that he was too careless, causing him to fall into her trap. Zhao Chen applauds He Qing for her strategic move and orders his dragon to shoot Zhu. Zhu realizes that he is doomed as the poisonous bone dragon shoots a purple light at him, causing Qin Yang and Ling Sha to scream his name. In a surprising turn of events, an unscathed Zhu appears, questioning whether that's all they can do. Wearing a formidable suit of armor, he confidently taunts his opponents proclaiming that their useless attacks cannot harm him. Qin Yang feels pleasantly surprised, realizing that Zhu remains unharmed, while Ling Sha reassures herself that there is no need to worry about him. Witnessing Zhu's resilience, an enraged Shang Jun asks He Qing to provide his golden heaven dragon with a golden armor charm. He Qing agrees and retrieves the charm from her attire. 
Equipped with the Golden Armor Charm, Shang Jun orders his Golden Heaven Dragon to teach Shu a lesson. The Golden Heaven Dragon starts to create a ball of energy in its mouth while the charm entraps Zhu. However, Zhu boldly proclaims that a mere thousand kilo charm cannot trap him and uses his powers to burn it. Seizing the opportunity, Zhu swiftly evades the attack as the Golden Heaven Dragon unleashes its golden energy. He Ching is astonished to witness Zhu's ability to break her charm, while Shang Jun urgently screams for them to stop him as Zhu cuts the tail of his Golden Heaven Dragon. Xu tells the poisonous bone dragon, charging towards him, that he's inviting death upon itself as he uses his flaming hand to slice the bone dragon into two pieces. Meanwhile, the golden heaven dragon and the violet cloud dragon prepare to attack Xu. Xu exclaims that it's over for them and uses his heaven sword to rain flames. Seeing this, He Qin tries to stop the attacks using her charms. However, her charms are quickly consumed by the flames unleashed by Zhu's attacks. Yi Guang manages to stop the flames with his blue rings but his efforts begin to waver as the relentless assault continues. Meanwhile, Foot Monk Yang Hua prays to Amitabh Buddha for blessings and manifests a protective shield around him, shielding him from the fire. Zhao Qin urges his ghost dragon to hold on, expressing confidence that they will win if they can withstand the attacks. However, Shang Jun disagrees, saying that despite them being in the majority, they are unable to defeat Xu and his formidable sword. Observing the events unfold, Wu Feng leaves Zongha in a state of shock as he reveals that Zhu's mastery of swordsmanship lies at an exceptionally high realm, with the power of his heaven sword reaching the level of a medium monarch stage. He explains that while they classify each stage further in low, high, and peak, the realm of the monarch stage and beyond is vast encompassing further classifications such as semi, low, medium, high, and peak. Zhu eventually ceases his attacks and Shang Jun thanks him for showing mercy. However, in a bitter tone, he refuses to acknowledge Zhu's dragon-taming skills, claiming that he solely relies on his sword dragon which is extremely rare in the world. He emphasizes that without it, Zhu would not stand a chance of winning and says that he will surpass him soon. Upon hearing this, Zhu tells him to stay where he is. He tells Shang Jun that he can leave, however, the box must stay. He then turns to everyone and demands them to hand over their boxes or taste his power again. Hearing this, He Qing accepts her defeat. Suddenly, she warns Zhu to be careful as Zhao Qin appears behind Zhu on his dragon. He touches Zhu's back, unleashing a surge of electrifying energy and triggering a massive explosion. He breaks out in evil laughter, saying that he's not a loser like the others. He points out that Xu has already used up his energy and has now been injured, so it would be best for him to hand over the boxes. As the smoke began to subside, an injured Zhu confronts Zhao Qin with a veiled threat, questioning the satisfaction of being alive. He summons his sword and initiates a swordsmanship. Xu points at the ground, causing the sword to descend violently towards the earth. Seeing this, Monk Yanghua exclaims that Zhu is on a rampage and prays upon Amitabh to save them. Meanwhile, at the hall, and King denounces Zhu's actions, saying that it's absolutely unacceptable to take the life of a member of the royal family for the sake of fame. He slams his fist down and demands Tianguan to stop Zhu immediately. Tianguan calls this ridiculous, questioning whether it is reasonable to kill the son of the master of Zhu clan. He argues that anyone can see that Zhao Qin is the one who tried to kill Xu first. Suddenly, the hall starts to shake as they witness the descending sword crash into the ground, triggering a massive explosion. As the smoke dissipates, the injured and lifeless bodies of Zhao Qin and the others lie on the ground. Zhu, resting on his knees, asks the host about the ownership of the boxes, to which she responds that he's the champion and the boxes rightfully belong to him. Everyone starts to cheer as Zhu and Ling Sha leave the place. Zhu presents the ownership documents of Li Chuan and its affiliated four city-states, saying that now it depends on whether Yunzi wins or not. Hearing this, Ling Sha responds with absolute certainty that Yunzi will not lose. Shortly afterwards, inside the Zhu clan's inner courtyard, Tian Guan and Zhu are seen dividing the prizes from the competition. Tian Guan hands over the boxes to Zhu, Acknowledging that he obtained them through the competition, he says that he would never take them away from his son. 
However, Zhu responds that the division is unfair. He reminds Tianguan of their agreement to split the profits equally and points out that he has only been given 40% instead. Tianguan tells him to stop acting shameless and reminds him that he stole their expensive swords from the sword house. Zhu explains that he took them for the competition, otherwise, his sword dragon would not have been so powerful. Tianguan tells him to stop making a big deal and hands him a soul contract ring, saying that this will be enough compensation. Zhu huffs at this, calling it perfunctory. Tianguan tells him to stop pushing his luck and reveals that the ring can increase a soul contract directly and would be beneficial when he gets another dragon. Zhu calls it uninteresting and points out that their family. Tianguan's share will eventually belong to him, therefore, it is reasonable that he gets more. Upon hearing this, Tianguan angrily kicks him out of the courtyard, saying that he'll give his share to his daughter-in-law instead. At Zhu's house, Nian Nian engages in a conversation with Mr. Koi about Zhu's exceptional swordsmanship. She describes how, as Zhu's swordsmanship descends, a wave of darkness engulfs the entire sky, causing fear to grip all the participants in the Nine Army Tomb. She adds that her heart jumped out when she was on the wall. Hearing this, Mr. Koi refers to Zhu as a mere kid and says he underestimated his strength. Zhu interrupts their conversation by clearing his throat to announce his presence. He says that is now a grown-up and asks Mr. Koi why he keeps calling him a kid. Nian Nian hops onto Zhu's back and exclaims that he has finally returned after dividing the black money. She excitedly says that they will now become rich and have the means to buy food for their dragons. However, Zhu interrupts, expressing his discomfort with their closeness. He asks Nian Nian to get off his back. She hops down and says that she just got too excited due to his handsomeness. Zhu scoffs at this and points out that she's only excited about the money. He questions how could she call it black money when he won it from the competition rather than engaging in any illegal activities. M. R. Koi interrupts their conversation, asking Zhu to show him his powerful awakened swordsmanship. Zhu explains that the awakening of the inscriptions depends on various factors, such as the environment, specific incidents, and battles and they need to understand the history of these well-known ancient sword inscriptions before unsealing them. He informs Mr. Koi that the only awakened blood inscription is dim for now and his dragon requires more swords to charge the energy required for the awakening process. Upon hearing this, Nian Nian rolls her eyes, saying that she originally thought the swordsmanship was so fierce. However, turns out it can only be used once. Zhu nervously rubs his head, saying that it just fell asleep for some time. He compares it to his body feeling exhausted after the awakening process, and says that perhaps both he and the inscription need to rest for a while. Nian Nian says that it seems his body is weak and tells him to train hard. She points out that Ling Sha is still fearless and lively even after the competition. Zhu, feeling embarrassed, changes the subject and asks whether she prepares the food for his dragons. Nian Nian nervously responds that she'll go and prepare it right away while Zhu scolds her for talking too much. But before she can leave, Mr. Koi tells her to wait. He tells Zhu that he should collect items to strengthen Bai Chi to raise her properly. The cultivation stage should reach peak Dragon Lord before it evolves. By doing this, Bai Chi will reach the medium monarch stage when she evolves to a complete stage. However, the only downside is that it costs a lot of money. Zhu asks the fish which items he should collect. He states that he'll ask Nian Nian to collect them as they don't lack money. Suddenly, the dementia fish forgets what he was talking about. Zhu reminds the fish that he said Bai Chi needed strengthening items to help evolve to a complete stage. Mr. Koi exclaims that he remembers it now and suggests that Zhu takes Bai Chi to Dragon Cloud Kingdom to train, as there are a lot of good items over there. Hearing this, Zhu says that almost all quotas are for the royal family members, to which Mr. Koi tells him to find some way to get them. The fish starts to leave and invites Nian Nian for a walk in the market saying that perhaps they'll find some strengthening items. After they leave, Zhu decides that he'll ask for Qin Yang's help to get the quotas. At the Zhu clan training center, Qin Yang exhibits incredible strength and determination as she performs pull-ups with one hand. She continues to exercise until she completes a thousand pull-ups and finally stops. She exclaims that she needs to train hard so that she does not become a burden for Zhu. Suddenly, 
Xu opens the door and is met with the sight of Qin Yan, drenched in sweat from her intense workout. Embarrassed, Xu quickly covers his eyes and apologizes for not knocking. He hastily runs out of the room and waits outside. Qin Yang opens the door and says that he doesn't need to knock. Zhu nervously says that he heard she just came back after meeting her dad, so he decided to come here to find her. Qin Yang confirms this and reveals that she had intended to seek him out as well. She proceeds to inform him that Tian Guan has requested his presence at the royal court tomorrow, and it has been arranged by an king as Zhu killed a member of the royal family. However, Qin Yang reassures Zhu, sharing that his father said not to worry as he has already taken care of the matter. Following this, she asks Zhu what he wants from her. Zhu responds that he needs her to get two quotas from the royal family members for him and Li Sha, as he wishes to go to the Dragon Cloud Kingdom. Qin Yang reveals that there are some people within the royal family who are interested in purchasing their covenants. Qin Yang suggests that they exchange some of their useless covenants in return for the desired quotas. Zhu thanks her for her help and Qin Yang assures him that she'll do it. Meanwhile, inside the royal palace, the emperor cheers, saying that it is a good day for them to gather at the palace. Suddenly, a man comes running through the palace gate and cries that something bad has happened. Tian Guan informs Xu that the man is the chaplain of the Rei Kingdom suggesting that something significant has happened to shift the dynamics of the war. The emperor asks why the chaplain is so afraid. The chaplain kneels in front of the emperor and begs him to recruit the ruler of the Lichuan continent, Li Yunzi. Hearing this, the emperor asks him to report truthfully about what had happened. The chaplain explains that the emperor ordered the Rui kingdom to take over the Lichuan continent, and they managed to injure Yunzi by sneak attacks. Zhu feels concerned to hear that Yunzi was injured. The chaplain continues that despite their attacks, Yunzi retaliated by sending someone to burn their barn. After this, her forces successfully destroyed the canyon and stopped the Rui kingdom's reinforcements from entering. To make matters worse, the chaplain discloses that Yunzi recovered within a few days and led her army to successfully conquer the Rui kingdom. He pleads once more, begging the emperor to recruit Li Yunzi in order to prevent the potential massacre of their citizens. Tian Guan whispers to Zhu that he didn't expect his daughter-in-law to be so mighty. Zhu responds that they initially planned that Yunzi would defend and he would get the governing rights of Li Chuan. However, she simply took over the Rui kingdom. Following this, he sighs in relief that Yunzi is safe. Suddenly, a man slams his hand onto the table. He declares that they cannot recruit the little girl ruling Li Chuan and boldly claims that he can destroy her easily. Tian Guan reminds the man Li Chuan belongs to the Zhu clan now and casually issues a veiled threat, implying that if the man wishes to mess with them, he should be prepared for the Yao Shan sword sect to confront his dragon tiger sect. The queen of the Jiting dynasty speaks up, announcing that Li Chuan is no longer an unknown continent. Therefore, every faction should stop intervening. The emperor orders the chaplain to write a recruitment edict. He declares that the Zhu clan shall invite Yunzi to the royal palace for a discussion, and she will be the queen of the Lichuan continent. He then turns to Zhu and says that an king has reported to him that Zhu has killed a member of the royal family. He recalls that a few years ago, Zhu had been exiled for chopping Zhao Yai's limbs. However, now he became worse and actually killed a member of the royal family. Zhu explains his actions saying that Zhao Wu and Zhao Chen had sneakily attacked him first and thousands of citizens living in the capital bear witness to that. He says that he only attacked to defend himself and apologizes for their accidental death. The queen confirms his story and suggests the emperor should exile him for a few more years instead of giving him the death penalty. The emperor decides to take her advice and informs Xu that since he performed well in the competition, he is allowed to stay till the Chinese New Year. However, he must leave immediately after it. Zhu accepts the punishment. Meanwhile, a man shoots daggers at him from behind, feeling that Zhu shouldn't be so proud of himself. The man vows that he won't let go of anyone from the Zhu clan. At Zhu's house, Qin Yang informs Zhu that a lady from the royal family wants to exchange their deeds. However, the lady insists on meeting Zhu in person to discuss the terms and conditions of the exchange. Zhu asks her for the time and location of the meeting, to which Qin Yang responds that she wants to meet him tonight at the Chinese restaurant. At the Chinese restaurant, 
the lady reveals herself to be Zhao Mei'er. She informs Xu that she used to visit the Zhu clan in her childhood and asks whether he remembers bullying her. Xu wonders whether he has seen her before. Despite his uncertainty, he decides to say yes to see how she responds. Zhu lets out a slightly forced laugh and tells Mei'er that he remembers her. Mei'er grabs her arm and asks whether he remembers how he bullied her. Zhu quickly realizes that he has fallen into a trap. Coughing nervously, he demands her to stop behaving inappropriately and release him from his grip. Mayer pouts, saying that he is breaking her heart, and says that wasn't what he said while beating her ass in the past. Xu tells her to stop spouting nonsense, and says that they should move on to the deeds. Mayer puts forth her conditions, stating that she wants the deed of Cloud City and three gold mining rights. However, Zhu firmly denies her demands, saying that he is only willing to offer one gold mine and two silver mines at most. Mayer accepts his offer but says that she has one more condition. Curious, Zhu asks her what it is. To his surprise, Mayer unexpectedly calls for her sisters to come out. Zhu questions Mayer what she means by this. Her sisters reveal themselves and start admiring Zhu, calling him a legend. Mayer explains that his epic Nine Mountain military tomb war is well known in the capital and her sisters want to share his luck by sleeping with him. Hearing this, Zhu exclaims whether she is joking. Point one of the sisters suddenly hugs him, saying that she finally met him in person. She exclaims that she's heard that Zhu has the deed of the Earth City and asks if he would be generous enough to give it to her. Zhu realizes that they're doing this to make deals with him. The rest of the sisters appear reminding him not to forget about them. They ask him to share his luck with them. I in an attempt to seduce him, the sisters strip naked and start making indecent noises. However, Zhu does not give in and beats them up, claiming that he is a righteous man who won't betray his wife. At the entrance of the Cloud Dragon Kingdom, a guard from the royal family gives instructions to Zhu and Ling Sha for their journey. The guard informs them that while dragons within the Cloud Kingdom aren't hostile towards humans, they should avoid provoking noble dragons. He adds that if any accidents occur during their time in the Cloud Kingdom, no one will be able to help them. Furthermore, the guard says that any dragons or treasures they obtain within the Cloud Dragon Kingdom will rightfully belong to them. To aid them on their journey, the guard hands Zhu a light jade and reveals that the light jade possesses vitalizing properties and will consume a significant amount of vitality while they explore the Cloud Dragon Kingdom. Xu is advised to be attentive to the Light Jade's condition, and if it becomes dimmer or runs out of energy, he must prioritize leaving the kingdom or else he will be frozen by the cloud ice no matter how high his cultivation is and will become a part of the snow and ice accumulated in the Cloud Dragon Kingdom. Xu takes the Light Jade, thanking the guard for his guidance. Following this, Xu and Ling Sha step inside the Cloud Dragon Kingdom. Zhu comments that if the ancestral dragon city-state has a historical remnant similar to the Cloud Kingdom, it could bring prosperity to it. Hearing this, Ling Sha mentions that she remembers discussing the historical remnant with her grandma during her childhood. She wonders if her grandma knows something and decides that she'll ask her about it when they go back. Suddenly, Ling Sha grabs Zhu's arm, she mentions the cold weather and requests Zhu to warm her up. Chu blushes as he feels her curves and wonders why she is suddenly acting like this. Ling Sha playfully flirts, asking if she looks good, to which Xu responds with a hesitant yes. However, Bai Qi interrupts the moment by calling out to Zhu. Zhu immediately releases his hold on Ling Sha and hastily excuses himself, saying that it appears Bai Qi has discovered something nice. Ling Sha watches as Xu rushes away and calls him a coward. Baichi makes his way to a tree and carefully plucks a pear from its branches. Suddenly, some owls start heading in her direction. Xu suggests Baichi to leave some for them. However, Baichi does not listen to him and attacks the owls, causing them to flee. Seeing this, Xu finds himself speechless as Baichi celebrates its victory. Suddenly, he senses that Haya wants to come out of the spirit realm to eat some fruits. Xu summons him and explains that these cloud fruits are only suitable for Baichi, however, he can find something else to satiate his appetite. Filled with excitement, Haya begins running eagerly in search of something to eat. However, he suddenly steps on a trap, causing him to cry out for help as he starts falling. 
Xu remembers that Qingzhua is currently unable to assist due to the recent consumption of the spiritual wood pill. He turns to Bai Qi and orders her to save Haya. Bai Qi immediately goes to save Haya and grabs him by his back. Bai Qi struggles to pull him up while Haya encourages her, telling him that he can do it. Bai Qi successfully manages to pull him up, causing Zhu to breathe a sigh of relief. Zhu thanks Bai Qi for her help while Haya calls her awesome. Suddenly, Ling Xiao's bluffing beast rabbit dragon laughs at Haya and says that he should lose some weight. Zhu is surprised to see a rabbit, while Haya recognizes the dragon. Ling Xia informs Zhu that he is a bluffing dragon. Zhu asks Haya if this bunny dragon is the one that healed his wounds, and Haya confirms it. The rabbit dragon gets offended and calls Zhu stupid, saying that he's a bluffing dragon, not a bunny dragon. Zhu says that he didn't expect to see another beast that can speak the human language besides Mr. Koi. Ling Xia explains that her dragon transformed from a bluffing beast and therefore is a bluffing dragon. However, he doesn't like being called a bluffing beast or dragon. She asks Zhu to call him by his name, Little Chang'e. Zhu responds that the name Bluffing Dragon suits him better. Ling Xia tells him to knock it off and says that he should take Haya back as Bai Qi is exhausted. Zhu realizes she is right as Haya roars, saying that he's sorry. Zhu summons Haya back into the spirit domain and apologizes to Bai Qi, saying that he will make Haya start losing weight from tomorrow onwards. Little Chang'e tells Bai Qi to not be fooled by Zhu. He calls Zhu a bad person, saying that he mocked his name. Zhu extends his hand to pet Chang'e, saying that he isn't mocking him. He thanks Chang'e for healing Haya while Chang'e demands that he gets his hands off of him. Zhu's hand accidentally brushes against Lingxia's chest, causing Chang'e to call him a pervert as he attacks Zhu. Zhu tries to explain that he didn't do it on purpose when suddenly, Mr. Koi emerges out of the spirit realm. Mr. Koi looks at Chang'e and says that he didn't expect to see another bluffing dragon who has even transformed into a dragon. Chang'e feels scared and rushes to Ling Sha, exclaiming that the fish can speak. Mr. Koi laughs at this and calls Chang'e cute. Chang'e does not like his comment and asks Ling Sha whether he should pretend to be unhappy to show his coldness and pride. He feels that he should have kept silent to make him look graceful. Suddenly, the dementia fish forgets Chani and repeats his comment, causing Chani to call him senile. Mr. Koi feels offended by this and exclaims that he's not senile. He explains that his brain is filled with wisdom so he chooses to forget about useless things. Chani realizes that he forgot to keep quiet and reminds himself to remain silent to appear graceful and aloof. Meanwhile, Zhu and Ling Xia observe him awkwardly. Following this, they decide to explore the Cloud Dragon Kingdom. As they venture further, they stumble upon a cloud tree surrounded by three dragons. The fruits hanging from the cloud tree are known to improve a dragon's cultivation. Zhu's eyes gleam at the sight of the fruits. He says that these fruits are incredibly expensive outside, but here they can gather them for free. Ling Xia points out that the three sacred fiery dragons surrounding the tree are at the monarch level. Getting close to the tree without alerting them would be a difficult task. She questions how they plan on successfully picking the fruits without alerting the dragons. Zhu responds that they'll distract them. He suggests that Bai Qi and Mo Yi put on a performance to distract the dragons while they gather the fruits. Hearing this, Bai Qi reluctantly chirps in agreement. They apply Ling Xia's red ink on Bai Qi's feather to make it look like he's injured. One of the sacred fiery dragons howls as he notices Bai Qi come closer to the tree. The dragons fix their gazes on Bai Qi, their watchful eyes studying her every move. Suddenly, Mo Yi launches a surprise attack on one of them, diverting its attention. Meanwhile, one of the dragons greets Bai Qi and assures her that they mean no harm. However, Bai Qi ignores his words and continues to chirp away. Seeing this, Xu fascinatingly says that Bai Qi and Mo Yi are great actors. He decides that four fruits will be enough and leaves the rest for the sacred fiery dragons. He calls Bai Qi and Mo Yi to come back. However, one of the dragons notices Xu and realizes that they've been deceived. He angrily roars at Bai Qi, calling her a liar, and injures the white dragon. Bai Qi tries to get away, while Xu shouts her name in concern. Suddenly, Ling Xia calls Bai Qi to come above. She appears on top of a Chiwen dragon and tells the dragons that they've screwed up, causing them to growl in fear. Meanwhile, 
Chani asks Bai Chi to spread his wings so he could heal his injuries. Zhu anxiously asks about Bai Chi's well-being. Chani reassures him that it's a minor injury, and he will heal it soon. Zhu mentions that the dragons are at the monarch level and asks whether Ling Xiao will be fine. Hearing this, Chani assures Zhu that there's no need to worry about her. He confidently declares that the dragons have invited trouble upon themselves by messing with his awesome master. Suddenly, a loud bang is heard, causing concern to wash over their faces. Xu turns around to check Ling Xiao's well-being. Ling Xiao reassures him, saying that she has simply knocked the dragons unconscious. Zhu nervously says that Ling Xia is indeed awesome as Chami scolds him for doubting his master's abilities. M. R. Koi interrupts their conversation, saying that Ling Xia is T as she can harness the ancestral dragon's descendant. Mr. Koi interrupts their conversation, praising Ling Xia for her ability to harness the ancestral dragon's descendant. Zhu is confused to hear this. M. R. Koi begins to explain that the Chi Wen dragon was the daughter of the primogenitor dragon and only Qi dragons with pure blood can bear the name Qi Wen. In ancient times, a woman found that the primogenitor dragon's soul could be fused with humans. This led to the emergence of dragon tamers. That woman was called Chen Ji and only her descendants possessed the ability to harness Chen Wai. Hearing this, Zhu realizes that if Ling Xia is indeed a descendant of Xin Ji, then the relic of the Lichuan continent could potentially be the ancestral dragon itself. This leads him to wonder whether the Lichuan continent fell from a bigger world, like the barbaric land. If that's the case, Lichuan could be even older than the Jitting continent. As Xu ponders further, he comes to the conclusion that the powers of a painter and a dragon tamer would not normally coexist within a single soul, unless Ling Xia has two souls, one belonging to a painter and the other to a dragon tamer. This realization makes him wonder if it is the same case for Yunzi. He recalls that Yunzi sometimes acts tough and at other times she's tender. He wonders whether this means she also has two souls. Zhu seeks confirmation from the dragon tamer, asking if she and Ling Xia share the same body but possess two souls, with her being the dragon tamer and Ling Xia being the divine mortal. The dragon tamer confirms it, saying that he has finally realized it. Hearing this, Zhu asks whether Yunzi also has two souls. The Dragon Tamer confirms his suspicions and explains that Yunzi and Ling Xia are twins. She introduces herself as Nen Yusuo and says that Xinghua is her twin. Yusuo explains that they are several years younger than their other two sisters. However, a tragic incident occurred during their childhood, resulting in the separation of her and Xinghua's souls, which now reside separately within Yunzi and Ling Xia's bodies. Xu apologizes to Yusuo saying that he didn't mean to remind her of her sad past. Yusuo accepts his apology and proceeds to share another secret with him. She reveals that the person Zhu had slept with in the dungeon was not Yunzi. Zhu is shocked to hear this and asks her about the true identity of the person. Yusuo leans in and whispers that it was Xinghua, the other soul residing within Yunzi's body. She adds that Xinghua is an astrologer and was unable to protect herself, so she was trapped in the dungeon. Upon hearing this, Zhu exclaims that this is impossible and he is sure that it was Yunzi. Yusuo says that he does not need to believe her. Yunzi will be arriving in the capital soon, so he can ask her then. With a dejected look on his face, Zhu wonders whether it was really Xinghua in the dungeon, and if so, how is he supposed to continue the relationship he built with Yunzi? He wonders whether Yunzi had been with him the entire time, or did Xinghua also appear sometimes? His mind races with thoughts as he remembers that Yunzi will soon visit the capital and wonders how is he going to face her when she arrives. He chastises himself for confirming his suspicions and feeling bad about the messy situation. He blames Yusuo for telling him the truth. Yusuo interrupts his thoughts, saying that she saw a cloud well nearby. She explains that it is a wonderful place for cultivating and can boost the speed of expanding their spiritual domains. Upon reaching the cloud well, Xu points out that a lot of dragons are fighting for the cloud well. Yusu acknowledges the difficulty of cultivating in the well and suggests that every day they shall take turns to cultivate, so one of them is always present to drive away the dragons. Xu agrees with her suggestion, and to decide who will take the first turn, they play a game of rock-paper-scissors. Yusu loses the game and huffs, saying that a gentleman would give precedence to girls. 
Zhu ignores her comment and nervously thanks Yusuo for letting him go first. Suddenly, Yusuo's eyes change color and she asks who told him that she's Yusuo. Hearing this, Zhu realizes that she has turned into Ling Xia. Ling Xia tells Zhu to start cultivating, reminding him that he has only one day. Within the spiritual eye of the cloud sea, Zhu assumes a cross-legged position, surrounded by bright blue energy. He enters into a state of deep cultivation while his dragons closely observe him. Zhu decides to put his spirit domain to the test to see whether it is able to replicate the way the cloud sea absorbs qi. As he begins the process, Zhu and his dragons levitate in the air, enveloped in a radiant aura of bright blue energy. He is amazed by the results, as his spiritual domain has expanded significantly, and it can now even produce qi. He observes Bai Qi and realizes that she will enter the maturation stage in some days. He shifts his gaze to Haya and Qingzhua, noticing that their cultivating has sped up. It becomes evident to him that it won't be long before they reach the monarch level. Realizing that it is now Ling Xia's turn to cultivate, Zhu decides to exit the cloud sea. Chang Yi is seen cheering for Qi Wen to burn a dragon. The dragon growls in fear as Qi Wen chases it. Zhu calls out for Yusuo, saying that it's his turn to guard her. Yusuo reminds him that they agreed to take turns every day. With a smug expression, Zhu asks her whether it has been less than a full day and suggests that he is willing to go beyond their initial agreement and extend his time guarding her. Yusuo quickly dismisses Zhu's confidence, stating that if it weren't for her and Ling Xia taking turns to drive away the dragons, he would have become their food. Chani, not holding back, calls Zhu stupid and reveals that it has actually been two days since his last turn. Hearing this, Zhu nervously apologizes. Acknowledging his mistake, he promises that he'll guard her for two days as well. Yusuo informs him that a fierce 9,000-year-old dragon almost hurt her Qi dragon last night. She hands Chani to Zhu, saying it is good at healing. Zhu tells her not to worry, saying that he has got it. Meanwhile, Chani tells Zhu to avenge Yesuo. As Zhu begins to guard Yusuo, a 7,000-year-old demon firecrest gold vulture appears before them. Chani feeling annoyed says that the vulture keeps staring at him with wicked eyes. Zhu teases Chani, saying that vultures and eagles like to eat rabbits. In response, Chani exclaims that rabbits are incredibly cute and wonders how could they even contemplate eating rabbits. Zhu laughs at his meltdown and tells him not to worry, saying that he'll handle it. Chani encourages him to pluck out its feathers and make the vulture bald. As the vulture comes charging towards them, Shu tells Moe to teach him a lesson. Moe charges towards the vulture and attacks him with a shining dragon sword. However, the demon vulture remains unharmed. Shu realizes that the vulture is far stronger than anticipated. He quickly calls Moe back to try a long distance attack instead. As Moe starts to retreat, Zhu urgently warns him to be cautious of the vulture's third eye. The vulture unleashes a bright red light and attacks Moe with it. However, Moe is unfazed by the attack and charges back towards the vulture. Unleashing his sword spirit, he attacks the demon vulture, causing an explosion. Emerging from the smoke, Moe appears to have defeated the vulture. However, the demon vulture charges once more, refusing to be defeated. Undeterred, Moe launches another attack, resulting in yet another massive explosion. Due to the force of the attack, the vulture loses its feathers which causes Chang'e to laugh at its bald appearance. Xu is proud to see that even a 7,000-year-old demon cannot defeat his powerful sword spirit dragon and confidently asserts that even a 9,000-year-old demon would not be able to defeat it. He glances at the frightened dragons and believes that Moe's actions have temporarily deterred them. Despite not being in the spiritual eye of the Cloud Sea, Zhu senses the abundant qi present in the area and feels that it would be a waste not to absorb as much of it as possible. Chani interrupts Zhu's thoughts, demanding that he stops sitting around and go after the bald vulture. Expressing his desire to have a roasted vulture, Zhu tells him to stop it, reminding him that they can't leave or Yusuo will be in danger. Chani agrees with him, realizing that he almost forgot that he needs to protect its master. Shu says that the dragons will not dare to attack them while Moeyo is present and asks Chani to refrain from disturbing him while he cultivates. Closing his eyes, Zhu enters the spirit domain to see that Baichi is about to enter the maturation stage. 
Suddenly, Changi screams in Zhu's ear that he has bad news. Zhu reminds him that he had told Changi not to disturb him and asks what has happened. Changi exclaims that the bald vulture is back as he points in its direction. Confused by the vulture's quacking sounds, Zhu turns to Changi for an explanation. Changi relays the vulture's message, revealing that the vulture has not accepted its defeat and has now brought a helper. Moreover, the vulture is demanding that they kneel down and apologize to it. Upon hearing this, Zhu exclaims that the vulture hasn't learned its lesson and commands Moe to confront the vulture and demonstrate his capabilities. Without hesitation, Moe takes off after the bald demon vulture, causing it to immediately flee in fear. Suddenly, two terrifying red eyes become visible in the sky. Chang'e laughs at the vulture, saying that it's shouting for help. He encourages Moe to catch it, saying that he will enjoy a roasted vulture. Meanwhile, Zhu ponders why the vulture would call for help when it already has a helper by its side. He realizes that something is wrong and orders Moe to come back. Moe listens to him and starts to retreat. Suddenly the vulture starts quacking in fear as the red-eyed creature unexpectedly devours it. Seeing this, Changi starts laughing, saying that the stupid vulture was eaten by its own helper. Meanwhile, Zhu realizes that the red-eyed creature is a 9,000-year-old scarlet-scale python. Changi exclaims that it is the same dragon which almost hurt Chi Wen and asks Zhu to immediately take action. Zhu reassures him, saying that he's got it and orders Moe to attack the python. Moe immediately charges towards the scarlet-scale python, ready to attack it with the great sword. However, the python retaliates by expelling a toxic substance from its mouth. Zhu unleashes a nine-chain sword, causing Moe to trap the python in chains. However, the scarlet scale python swiftly breaks free from the chains, exhibiting its formidable strength. Zhu begins to grow concerned as he realizes that while Moe was able to easily defeat the vulture, the python proves to be a much more challenging opponent. He didn't expect that a 9,000-year-old demon would be so much more powerful than a 7,000-year-old one. Suddenly, the python opens its mouth wide and engulfs Moe, trapping him in its stomach. Witnessing this, Zhu remembers that Moe had previously informed him that the python possesses an infinite stomach, making it impossible for him to escape by breaking through from the inside. With this realization, Zhu understands that the only way to save Moe is to destroy the python from the outside. Chani hits Zhu on the head, questioning how the python could have swallowed his sword. Zhu responds that it seems they might need Yusuo's help. Suddenly, Zhu's attention is drawn to the spirit domain as he senses a shift in its energy. Zhu realizes that Baichi has finally advanced. He immediately summons her out of the spirit domain and asks Baichi to save Moe, saying that they are counting on him. Baichi immediately freezes the python in ice. Some of the ice starts falling, causing the nearby dragons to realize that they should are you and dot as the ice begins to crack and fall. The nearby dragons recognize the danger and decide to run. Meanwhile, Baichi continues to attack the python, shooting icy frost at it. The python roars as it manages to break free from the ice. However, its attention is drawn to the emergence of strange portals with ice coming out of them. Meanwhile, Zhu reflects that he thought Baichi would require half a month of sleep. But to his surprise, Baichi advanced much sooner than anticipated. He feels that this is a great opportunity to test Baichi's new powers. The python dodges Baichi's ice and begins to generate a magnetic field within its mouth. Emitting a fierce roar, the python starts to draw Baichi into its magnetic pull. Realizing the python's strategy, Zhu instructs Baichi to eject icy dust in response. Responding to Zhu's instructions, Baichi expels icy dust and freezes the python. Zhu turns his attention to Moe and tells him that it's time to come out. Upon hearing this, Moe channels his strength and forcefully bursts out from the python's stomach. Following this, Moe charges towards the scarlet scale python and slashes its body in half. As the lower half of the python's body attempts to flee, Changi points towards it, urging Baichi not to let it escape. Baichi swiftly reacts, creating a barrier of solid ice. She places it in the path of the fleeing dragon and blocks it from running away. However, despite Baichi's efforts, the 9,000-year-old python sheds its scale and finds another way to escape. 
Xu instructs Mo Yi to let the python go, acknowledging that they have already got its most precious item, the Scarlet Scale. Moreover, it's more important for them to protect the spiritual eye of the Cloud Sea. Xu notices that both Bai Qi and Mo Yi have advanced to the Middle Monarch level and feels happy knowing that he now possesses two dragons of that stage. However, he remembers that Mo Yi can only exert its Middle Monarch level strength after it awakens. He needs to practice more with the Sword Dragon to have a better understanding of it. Xu decides to initiate his training by taking flight on the sword. As they fly, Xu suddenly loses his balance and falls off the sword. He groans about his aching back and cries that couldn't Mo Yi have been a bit slower during their flight. He gets back on the sword and instructs Mo Yi to fly again. As they continue flying, Zhu praises the sword dragon, appreciating its performance during their training session. Point two days later, Zhu's attention is drawn to Yusua inside the cloud well. He realizes that she has finished her cultivation and asks Mo Yi to take him inside. However, as they begin the descent, Zhu becomes alarmed and urgently shouts at Mo Yi to calm down, advising him not to rush their descent. Meanwhile, Yusu notices that their lamp jade has almost depleted, causing her to realize that they need to leave the kingdom soon. However, before she can fully process this, she sees that Zhu is about to fall on her. They both groan as Zhu lands on top of Yusu in an inappropriate manner. Seeing this, Changi turns away and closes his eyes as he feels embarrassed on behalf of them. Yusuo calls Zhu a pervert as she kicks him out of the cloud well. Shortly afterwards, Zhu arrives at the courtyard and proceeds to take a bath to refresh himself. As he enjoys his bath, he suddenly hears the door being opened. Zhu quickly tries to cover himself and asks the person how could they enter without knocking. Tianguan calls him a bastard and questions whether he thought a girl has entered. Zhu nervously responds that he just arrived from the Cloud Dragon Kingdom and intended to visit him after the bath. Tianguan smacks Zhu on the head and tells him to cut it out as he reveals that he has some news. Zhu asks whether something good or bad has happened. Tianguan reveals to his son that the Lichuan continent has been officially made a country and is now called the Lichuan Kingdom. Shocked by the news, Zhu stands up and exclaims that this means Yunzi has become the queen of Lichuan. He proceeds to ask where Yunzi is. However, Tianguan responds that Yunzi chose to give up her position as the queen and made the decision to become the Grand Counselor instead, causing General Qing to take her place and become the King of Lichuan. Zhu reflects on his past encounters with General Qing and recalls the rumors about General Qing being a reliable and trusted subordinate of Yunzi. He believes Yunzi made the right decision as the Grand Counselor is more influential than the King and by doing so, she can also choose to take a back seat. Suddenly, he looks at his dad staring downward and asks him what's wrong. Tianguan laughs, saying that it's nothing. He was just noticing that his son is really strong. As he exits the room, Zhu, feeling embarrassed, exclaims that his image has been damaged. The next morning, in the lake of the inner courtyard of the Zhu clan, Zhu lies on a boat. He feels sad that Yunzi didn't come to the coronation. It seems that he'll have to go to the Lichuan kingdom. Suddenly, his boat collides with another boat, and he sees Ling Sha sitting in it. He asks Ling Sha if she has also come here for fun. As she remains silent, he asks whether something is bothering her. She finally speaks up and says no. Xu informs her that Yunzi did not come to the coronation so they don't need to stay till the spring festival. He suggests that they go back to Lichuan for a few days. However, she expresses her desire to travel around and says that she doesn't want to go back at the moment. Xu is taken aback by her response but decides to respect her wishes. He tells her to take care of herself in Jiting while he's away and asks where she would like to visit. He offers to recommend some places if she wants his suggestions. Upon hearing this, she accepts his offer. Zhu starts recommending places to her, saying that she can visit the Xiuhe Kingdom which is filled with countless snow dancing butterflies or she could go to Mang Frontier City in Nihai. Zhu suddenly notices Ling Sha sitting on a chair as she reads a book. He is baffled by this sight and wonders what is happening. His attention shifts back and forth between Ling Sha and the woman standing in front of her and he can't help but question why there are two bodies when their two souls share the same body. The woman speaks up, saying that it seems Ling Sha has told her everything. 
Xu feels something is off and realizes that the person standing beside him is Yunzi. He curses himself for not recognizing his wife. He starts thinking about why she didn't clarify that he had mistaken her for someone else and wonders whether Yunzi was trying to test him. Zhu feels thankful that he didn't cross any boundaries, realizing that he narrowly escaped a compromising situation, he feels it could have been more astonishing than facing a group of people alone. Yunzi interrupts his thoughts, asking whether he didn't want her to come. Zhu nervously responds that he definitely wanted her to visit, he was feeling just a bit too excited. Yunzi informs him that she's going to have a conversation with Ling Xia and says that she'll speak with him later, as she leaves. As Zhu waits for Yunzi to come back, Nian Nian informs him that the two ladies are having a fight. Startled by the news, Zhu asks Nian Nian to clarify which two ladies she is referring to. Nian Nian whispers that Yunzi and Ling Xia are arguing about something and it seems as if they're in conflict. Zhu asks whether she was eavesdropping. Nian Nian nervously denies it and claims that she was merely passing by. She informs him that she has other matters to deal with and decides to take her leave. Zhu is taken aback by the news of the conflict between Yunzi and Ling Xia. He reflects on a previous incident where they appeared to be getting along well, which leads him to wonder if it was the other soul Xinghua. He thinks that maybe Ling Xia only has conflicts with Yunzi and is on good terms with Xinghua. Zhu stops Nian Nian from leaving, saying that he has something to tell her. He reveals the secret about Ling Xia and Yunzi, causing Nian Nian to realize the reason behind Ling Xia's sudden mood swings as she exclaims that all of it was because of the souls. Zhu confirms it saying that she said Yunzi was having a fight with Ling Xia so he decided to tell her the truth. Yen Yen says that it might not be Ling Xia and says she'll go check again. However, as she starts to leave, she bumps into Yunzi. Yen Yen asks her whether she is Yunzi. Yunzi confirms her identity, causing Yen Yen to bow in embarrassment. She says that she'll leave the two of them alone and leaves. Zhu asks Yunzi why she has a gloomy expression on her face and questions whether she had a fight with Ling Xia. Yunzi denies it, saying that's just their way of getting along. She changes the subject and informs Zhu that she wants a favor from him. Zhu asks her what she wants. Yunzi explains that due to her sharing one body with Xinghua, she cannot always be present. She adds that Xinghua lacks the ability to protect herself which resulted in the incident in Eversity.A. As Zhu listens, he realizes that it is true that he did not sleep with Yunzi that night. However, he quickly reminds himself to stop dwelling on such thoughts as he thinks about all the times Yunzi was beside him. He makes up his mind that it is Yunzi who will be with him forever. Yunzi notices Zhu's distant expression and asks what he is thinking. In response, Zhu takes hold of her hand and quickly reassures her that it is nothing. He tells her that he will keep her secret safe and won't reveal it to anyone. Yunzi looks into his eyes and says that she believes him. Xu feels her hand is unusually cold and notices her weak breath. He exclaims that he heard she had already recovered from her injury and asks if that is not the case. Yunzi tries to reassure him that she is fine, however, she suddenly starts to lose consciousness. Xu takes her to his house where she lies in his bed, unconscious. Mr. Koi reveals that she has suffered soul trauma, it is incurable, and she doesn't have much time left to live. Hearing this, Xu asks him to explain what happened to her. And Mark Koi explains that Yunzi used a power that she was not supposed to use, resulting in her current condition. Yusua speaks up, saying that it is the price of soul burning and sacrificing. Xu asks her to explain what that is, causing her to reveal that it's a secret technique that they inherited from their mother. They have the ability to burn their soul and sacrifice it to the heavens and earth in order to obtain divine power. Ling Xia explains that Yunzi used this technique to defeat the Rei Kingdom, resulting in soul damage. She adds that even in her agonizing condition, Yunzi managed to come and see him. Upon hearing this, Xu slams his fist down in frustration and regret. He blames himself, saying that he should have stayed by her side and fought against the Rei Kingdom. Yusuo tries to reassure him, saying that if he hadn't won the inter-clan competition, some other force would have obtained ownership of Li Chuan. In that case, even though Yunzi defeated the Rei Kingdom, she would have suffered more. Mr. Koi agrees with Yusuo and reassures Zhu 
saying that he knows a way to make up for the weakness of her soul. Zhu immediately asks the fish what it is. However, before Mr. Koi can say something, Yusuo reveals that her grandmother told them that if they use the soul burning and sacrificing technique, they must find the ancient divine lamp jade to make up for the loss of their souls. If they are unable to do so, they won't live past the age of 25. Hearing this, Zhu exclaims that there's no time to lose, he must find the jade as soon as possible. Yusu explains that it's not that easy. Her mother sacrificed her life and only managed to make her and Xinghua's souls stay in Li Sha and Yunzi's bodies. If they had gotten hold of the ancient divine lamp jade, her mother might still be alive today. Yusuo continues, sharing that she has searched many forbidden places, but the jade was nowhere to be found in Lichuan. Mr. Koi speaks up, revealing that the ancient divine lamp jade originally belonged to the divine dragon sect and was in charge of Shinji who manipulated the ancestral dragon. Over time, the divine dragon sect split into factions, forming forces such as the purple forest sect, the black dragon palace, the ancient dragon palace, and the divine mortal academy. Similarly, the ancient divine lamp jade was also divided into several pieces and became the most authoritative symbol of the forces. Some countries existing for thousands of years even take the jade pieces as imperial jade seals and make them stand for the supreme kinship. As he hears about the treasures of the forces and the imperial jade seals, Zhu says that there must be at least one jade piece in the capital. Ling Sha responds that no one would give such stuff unless they were about to face death. Suddenly, the dementia fish forgets what it was talking about, leaving them annoyed. Zhu stares at Yunzi with a dejected on his face. He feels sad that she decided to fight on the battlefield at the cost of her soul and life instead of living a peaceful life like the other girls. And when everything is finally settled, she doesn't have time left to stay with him. He tells them to take good care of her as he leaves, saying that he's going to ask his father for a solution. Shortly afterwards, Tian Guan is shocked to hear the news that his daughter-in-law is going to die. Zhu reveals that only the Divine Lamp Jade can save her life and asks his father whether the royal family has a piece of it. Tian Guan sighs, saying that they don't have the jade, and says that he must be aware that the existence of the Cloud Dragon Kingdom made the Lamp Jade an extremely rare item. If the royal family had a piece of it, they would have used it by now to trade with the Cloud Dragon Kingdom's resources. Zhu says how should they proceed forward and asks whether the other forces and kingdoms might have it. Tian Guan responds that it's only been described in the legends, he has no idea where it might be. They wonder whether Yunzi will really die just like that. However, Tian Guan suddenly remembers something. He tells Xu to go to his mother's sect, claiming that they must have the jade. He recalls that when he married Zhu's mother, he was allowed to enter the sect for the first time. He saw an ancient tower over there and it had a piece of the rare lamp jade dot he didn't know what it was at that time. But now that he thinks about it, it seems to be the ancient divine lamp jade. Zhu says that he's going to see his mom right away. However, Tian Guan stops him, saying that men aren't allowed to enter the Miao Mountains. Moreover, he's going there to take their treasure away. Hence, he must be fully prepared before he goes there. Zhu asks his father if he has a plan. Tian Guan whispers that he can ask Wu Feng to give him a visiting card. After this, he can go to the Sword Sect in the Miao Mountains on behalf of the Sword Sect in the Yao Mountains, and take away the Lamp Jade when no one is looking. Zhu exclaims that stealing and says that it's not right. Tian Guan says there is nothing wrong with it, Zhu's mother is one of the commanders of the sect. He's just going to take something from his mother, it's not stealing. Zhu says that even if he does it, what would happen if he were to get caught? Tian Guan advises Zhu that if that happens, he should tell his mother that Tian Guan incited him to steal it. Following this, Zhu should ask his mother to come to him or request that Tian Guan goes there to negotiate his release. I in this way, Tian Guan will have a chance to see his wife and turn things around. Zhu says that he feels his father is using him to achieve his filthy goal. Tian Guan calls this nonsense, saying that it's a win-win situation for both of them and that his desire to see his wife is not filthy at all. Inside the Orchid Manor, which is a branch of the Sword Sect located in the Yao Mountains, Wu Feng explains that their Sword Sect specializes in fighting with swords. While the Sword Sect based in the Miao Mountains specializes in flying on swords, 
Just as he is about to reveal the most remarkable person within their sect, he suddenly notices Zhu's presence. A woman asks whether Zhu is the most remarkable person. With a smirk on his face, Zhu says that he isn't worthy of being the most remarkable person. Wu Feng clarifies that the most remarkable person in their sect is Zhu Xiuhen, who happens to be Zhu's master. Upon hearing this, the smirk on Zhu's face is immediately replaced with a mortified expression, as he is left speechless. Zhu informs Feng that he is here because he wants to visit the sword sect in the Miao Mountains to learn more from them. He didn't expect to find some disciples of the sword sect in Miao Mountains over here. He says that he can now personally ask them for their opinions. Wu Feng supports this, saying that sword cultivators should not refuse to progress. And he adds that it's a good chance for the two sects to exchange their views. The female disciple expresses that Wu Feng has provided them with a lot of insight into the cultivation of the sword sect in the Yao Mountains. If they could have in-death communication, their cultivation would improve greatly. The female disciple says that she will report Zhu's request to the seniors. Zhu thanks her in advance for her help. The female disciple accepts his gratitude and mentions that, due to his mother, he is technically the young master of their sect. Zhu shares that he also said the same thing when he tried to break into their sect, however, he ended up getting a beating. Zhang He tells his uncle that he wants to go there too. Wu Feng responds that it's not his decision and suggests that he asks Zhu about it. Zhang He hugs Zhu as he tries to flatter him. However, Zhu tells him to get his hand off of him. Zhang He grabs Zhu's leg, begging to be taken along. Zhu exclaims that he changed his behavior so abruptly and finally allows Zhang He to come with him. As Zhu notices Wu Feng preparing to leave, he asks him where he is going. Wu Feng casually mentions that he is going to pack his belongings, but accidentally slips up that the sword sect in the Miao Mountains is filled with beauties. Realizing his mistake, Wu Feng quickly corrects himself, saying that he meant the sect is filled with powerful cultivators. He adds that despite not being too old himself, he also wants to learn more about their swordsmanship. Xu realizes that his real purpose was to meet the beauties and what he said about making progress and exchanging views was just an excuse. As he arrives at his house, he remembers that the sword sect in the Miao Mountains is far from here. The wind will be strong, and it will be cold when they'll fly in the sky. He feels that it would be bad for Yunzi's health, and it seems to him that they'll have to spend more time getting there by land. He wonders how Yunzi is doing now. Deciding to enter her room, he sees that she's awake. Xinghua gets startled by his sudden appearance and accidentally drops a plant. Zhu immediately rushes inside her room and catches the plant. He tells her not to worry, saying that he caught it. Zhu asks her whether she is Xinghua as he notices her avoiding eye contact with him. He knows that Yunzi would never do something like that. Xinghua confirms his suspicions, causing him to immediately apologize for mistaking her for Yunzi. Xu informs her that they'll leave the capital tomorrow and says that he has prepared some carriages for Yunzi. Xinghua informs him that Yunzi won't wake up for some time. However, she tells him not to worry, saying that Yunzi just needs some rest. She tells him that it will be only her for the next few days. Zhu acknowledges this and comments that she also looks weak. He advises her to rest early and assures her that he won't disturb her any further as he starts to leave. However, he stops in his tracks as Xinghua asks if they could leave the city using the North Gate. Xu says that they could do that, but the sword sect in the Miao Mountains is in the west. They would need to take a longer detour. As Xinghua looks at him with eyes full of hope, causing him to give in to her request. He says that it's fine and they'll do as she says. The next morning, Zhu yawns as he wakes up. He notices the plant that had almost broken the previous night and realizes that Xinghua kept the lamp lit all night just to save the orchid. As he opens the door, he sees Xinghua and Yusuo playing around with each other. Xu comments that they woke up pretty early. Yusuo introduces Xinghua and warns him not to cross any lines. Xinghua blushes as she tells Yusuo to not be mean. Chu tells Xinghua to let her say whatever she wants since they'll be family in the future. Xinghua tells Zhu that Yusuo mentioned the ancestral dragon relic and says that there might be a piece of the lamp jade over there. Besides, both Zhu and Yusuo are dragon tamers. There are a lot of spiritual wells in the relic that are good for their cultivation. She says that if they find the relic along the way, 
they should go and check it out. Xu responds that they don't have any clues and it's hard to find the entrance. Yu Suo disagrees with him, saying that Xinghua can easily find it through astrology. Hearing this, Zhu is reminded that Xinghua is an astrologer. He wonders whether she was trying to find the lamp jade through her astrology last night. He realizes that if she manages to find it, Yunzi will be able to wake up sooner. Nian Yan suddenly interrupts his thoughts as she informs him that the disciples of the sword sect in Niao Mountains are waiting outside. Xu tells Xinghua that it's time for them to leave. At the west gate of the Jiting continent's capital, Commander Hao Xingxing of the Imperial Guards waits for Zhu's arrival. He exclaims that they'll surely capture the bastard from the Zhu clan alive and bring him to Xiaotsong's grave to avenge him. Suddenly, a soldier appears and asks Xingxing whether he has just arrived from the battlefield. Xingxing says that the soldier just came in time and orders him to find out from which gate the people from the sword sect in the Yaoshan Mountains and in Yao Mountains leave the city. The soldier informs him that he saw many sword fairies leave through the north gate when he was on patrol early in the morning. He points out that it's been a while since they've left and asks whether he wants him to stop them. Hearing this, Xingxing exclaims that he won't let Xu go for killing his nephew, while his companion can't believe that they actually left through the north gate. Meanwhile, at the Fortune Inn, Wu Feng comments that they made a detour after leaving the capital through the north gate. If they used the west gate, they would have arrived at the frontier where there is a route for them to fly. The female disciple says that he hasn't told them why they had to make a detour. As Xu is about to respond, a man suddenly appears and says that Xu's uncle has asked him to remind Xu that a man called Hao Xingxing has been trying to catch him. They've even sent people to watch the west gate in the morning and are planning to take Xu to Xiaotsong's grave in order to kill him. The man then hands him a map saying that it contains the location of their clan bases and fortress towns in the Jiting continent. He says that Xu can go to any of these places if he is in need. Xu takes the map and dismisses the man, telling him that he'll be fine. The female disciple asks whether he just predicted that someone would try to ambush him. Xu smiles, saying have a guess as he looks at Xinghua. At night after everyone leaves, Xu asks Xinghua if she truly predicted that someone would try to hold them up. Xinghua says that she knew that he would get in trouble, but she doesn't know the details. Xu asks whether she can foresee if their journey will be fortunate or unfortunate. For example, will they be able to obtain the lamp jade? Xinghua says that they can obtain it, but she cannot foresee the cost that they'll have to pay. Intrigued by her abilities, Xu asks how she is able to foresee the future. Xinghua responds that something that will happen in the future occurs to her as a dream in her sleep. Hearing this, Xu asks her how she distinguishes between a dream and something that will actually happen in the future. Xinghua reveals that she can either wait for an omen or find it out herself. She says that some details of the dream stay in her mind. When she wakes up, if the details from her dream match the reality, she realizes that the event will likely happen. The more omens she receives, the faster the event will occur. Xu asks her to give her an example. Xinghua beings to explain that when they are doing something ordinary for them, such as spilling water from a glass while drinking or a bird coming into their sight while walking. Before she can complete her explanation, Zhu interrupts, saying that it's like her talking to him right now. Xinghua continues that during these ordinary moments, they experience a feeling of familiarity, as if they have already experienced the event before. She reveals that when Zhu mistook her for Yunzi the previous night, she had the same sense of familiarity. This led her to deduce that the events she dreamed about will most likely happen. According to her dream, if they had gone through the west gate, someone would have been injured and would have lost a lot of blood. She says that unfortunately, the images she saw were incomplete and were like fragments of the scroll, and this is why she advised Zhu to take the north gate instead. Zhu stares at her, thinking that although Yunzi is the one in front of him, her behavior and mannerisms are completely different. He thinks that even if Xinghua and Yunzi share the same body, they are still completely independent individuals. Meanwhile, Xinghua blushes because of Zhu's intense stare, thinking that how could he be staring at her like this. Zhu blushes as he asks whether she is also able to predict someone's marriage. Xinghua says of course and asks whose marriage he wants her to predict. Zhu nervously stammers, saying that he wants to know about his own marriage. 
but he quickly changes his mind and asks about Yunzi's marriage instead. However, he decides to drop the question, saying that if he knows everything about the future, life would become boring for him. Xinghua can't help but cover her face and giggle at Zhu's nervousness. Zhu looks at her and feels that her smile is very gentle. It doesn't have an extremely cold and indifferent feeling, she's like a warm girl. Xu suddenly says that it might be impolite to ask such a question, but he wants to know why did she not avoid the incident in the Ever City if she could predict the future. Xinghua asks whether he ever wondered why that happened to him. Hearing this, Xu asks whether she has already changed her fate. Xinghua responds that she isn't a god who could change her fate. Perhaps she could avoid certain events, but as a result, something more tragic would happen. She says that this result is the most fortunate for them. She reveals that the incident that occurred in Ever City is the answer to Yunzi's marriage. Upon hearing this, Zhu realizes that even if he hadn't been in the dungeon that day, he and Yunzi would still be together. He mentions that it's late at night. He says that he'll leave now and tells her to rest. As he stands up to leave, Xinghua reveals that Yunzi is unaware of the information she just shared with him. Zhu thanks Xinghua for her honesty and leaves her room. Standing outside, Xu wonders if she really didn't change anything. He believes that the final result may be the same, but the details of fate would be different. He realizes that it was fortunate for him to have been in the dungeon during that time, as it would have otherwise been a painful memory for Yunzi. Inside the room, Xinghua feels that this scene is also familiar to her. The next morning, Wu Feng points out that there is a flock of eagles in the area. He warns that if they were to fly directly through the area, the eagles might perceive them as invaders and gather to attack. So after they are done resting, they will have to cross the grassland on the ground. Zhu agrees with him, saying that they'll do as he says. Meanwhile, Zhang He observes Ling Xiao's painting and exclaims that her drawing is wonderful. Ling Xiao glances at Zhang He, causing him to introduce himself and remind her that he had a duel with her back in the Mechanism City. He notices that Ling Xiao's expression seems to suggest that she doesn't remember him. He wonders if she thinks the ones she defeated aren't worth remembering. Ling Xia throws her painting away, causing Zhang He to freeze due to her coldness. Ling Xia walks over to Xinghua who is sitting on the grass. She asks her what's the matter and what she saw. Xinghua reveals that she saw something terrible at the end of the grassland. Ling Xia asks whether she means that she dreamt about something that is similar to what's happening right now. Xinghua confirms this and Ling Xia asks whether the event has already occurred. Xinghua replies that her dream was quite blurry, making it difficult to see the details clearly. Ling Xia says that she's there to take a look. Xinghua tries to protest, but Ling Xia tells her not to worry and asks Xinghua to trust her. Zhu appears with Nian Nian and asks them what's happening. Ling Xia informs him that she's going to take a look at the end of the grassland. Zhu is taken aback by her sudden decision to go there and wonders whether Xinghua predicted something again. He tells Ling Xiao that he'll come with her and tells Nian Nian to have a chat with Xinghua while they walk around. I end the river of the grassland. Zhu and Ling Xiao find themselves in a boat. Zhu says that he has doubts regarding Xinghua's ability and asks whether the events she sees in her dreams are somehow connected to herself. Ling Xia explains that the events Xinghua sees occasionally intrude into her dreams regardless of whether they are directly related to her or not. In her dreams, she would even play the role of one of the miserable people and empathize with him until she woke up. Xu asks wouldn't that be quite painful for her. Ling Xia confirms this and says that if the event doesn't happen or can be stopped in time, the torment of the dream disappears. However, if the event occurred, that torment would keep lingering in her mind for a long time, which would make her sleepless. Xu wonders whether this is the price of being an astrologer. Ling Xia says that if Xinghua makes a prediction, there are side effects for her. Because of this, Xinghua spends most of her time in an unconscious sleep so that she can't see anything she isn't supposed to see. However, because Yunzi has been wounded badly this time, this is the longest time she has been awakened in years and it will also be her longest ordeal. Xu questions if they deal with the event she saw, Will it take away the side effects of her prediction? Ling Xia confirms this and says that they need to prevent the tragic event from happening. The majority of the events Xinghua dreams about are extremely tragic. 
Xu realizes what favor Yunzi wanted from him and promises to keep Xinghua safe during this time. Suddenly, Xu and Lingxia's attention is drawn to a place that is surrounded by rocks. As they arrive at the place, they are shocked to see the dead bodies of people. Their eyes have been gouged out, and the word slave is written over them. Ling Xia exclaims that this is an evil sacrificial altar. Zhu remembers that there is a slave city in the west of the fire practice. In that city, there are the slaves whose countries were conquered for sale and some wild tribes. He says that it could be an evil sect that brought them here, then gouged their eyes out and slaughtered them as sacrifices to their evil demon. Ling Xia says that the event Xing Hua saw was supposed to happen, but it has already occurred. Xu hushes her and tells her to look forward. A blood leech emerges from the pool formed with the blood of slaves. Xu sees the blood leeches transforming into dragons and remembers that the blood leeches feed on people's blood which is full of resentment and curses. He realizes if they manage to transform into dragons, they'll kill a lot of people. Ling Xia draws on her scroll and summons a falling rain washing. The falling rain washing begins to hurt the leeches. Zhu is shocked to see that the leeches have the power of the dragon general right after their transformation. He summons Qinghua out of the spirit domain and orders him to kill the leech. As the leech starts to escape, Zhu tells Qinghua not to let it get away. Qinghua uses its secret dragon radiance and attacks the leech, causing it to howl in pain. He continues to attack until the leech falls back into the blood pool. Zhu thinks that after this land is purified, the other evil creatures will stop appearing. He feels that it's the kindest thing to destroy such an evil creature before it's born. He wonders whether God decided to give Xinghua these abilities because he felt pity for the people but didn't have time to rescue them. Ling Xia interrupts Zhu's thoughts, telling him to also wipe out the grudges and Zhu agrees to it. Xu takes out his soul core gathering and notices that it still has the power of dragon transforming, which helps spiritual beasts leap over the dragon gate. He feels it is unfortunate that the core is too hostile for his dragon, so he can only sell it. Ling Xia says that the land has been purified and tells Zhu that it is time for them to go back. As they return, Wu Feng asks why they left the team alone. Zhu says that he wants to ask him something and reveals that he and Ling Xia found a sacrificial altar on a hill. He adds that many people had their eyes gouged out and were thrown into a blood pool and it seemed they were sacrificed to something. Upon hearing this, Fong reveals that there is a demon city where people worship a bear eye god. These worshippers belong to the bear eyed sect. They believe that all violence, sins and impulses in the world originate from the eye and the eye holds the power to manipulate people's thoughts. The worshippers of the bear eyed sect often force people to join their sect and gouge their eyes out, and when those people were unable to care for themselves, they ultimately decided to become the slaves of the sect. Fong adds that there are some backward and ignorant tribes in the remote areas of Lichuan. Some of these evil sects earn money through a seemingly miraculous formula of brainwashing people with evil thoughts. To make matters worse, these sects also have some secret skills that make their members powerful in a short time. They can even directly transform ordinary people into dragon tamers or divine mortals, but the price for it is terrible. Fong suggests that if Xu wants to figure it out, they can reroute and have a rest in the tablet city. He mentions that there is a stronghold of the bear eyed sect over there. Zhu knows that if they didn't deal with it completely, the nightmare Xinghua foresaw won't be over. He doesn't want her to suffer anymore. He accepts Feng's offer. Feng says that they should inform the girls from the sword sect in the Miao Mountains about it, believing that they would also like to help them in wiping out this evil sect. At the entrance of the tablet city, Nian Nian exclaims that the food for the dragons is almost used up again. Chu points forward, saying that there is a market up ahead. Perhaps they can buy some dragon food over there. Data slave seller informs them some slaves have been brought here from some remote places. They were originally from an aristocratic clan, including servants, relatives, and daughters from the clan, and they can buy all of them just for 100,000 golden grits. A man wearing a blue robe tells a bearded man that Li Yunzi is here. He suggests that they beg her to save them. He adds that the ancestral dragon city-state has already been established into a country and has become a part of the Jiting continent, and Yunzi has become the grand counselor of the kingdom of Lichuan. The bearded man responds that it is useless since they opposed her establishing the state, 
and tells him to forget about it. The bearded man thinks that if he can keep his clan members alive, he'd surrender to Yunzi's power. He remembers that they opposed Yunzi's plan to establish a state because they wanted to maintain the dignity of their Link clan and if they had not done that, their clan members wouldn't have been enslaved. As the slaves beg for Yunzi to save them, the strikes one of them with his whip, exclaiming that he is annoying. Xinghua says that they should have a look at the slaves. Xu asks the seller where he got the slaves from. The seller replies that they got them from the Lichuan continent and asks whether he is interested in buying them. He offers Xu all the gentle and cultured women of the Ling clan for the price of 100,000 golden grits. As he hears that they are from the Ling clan, Zhu says that he's not interested. He informs Xinghua that they're the ones who tried to force Yunzi to marry into the Ling clan as a concubine. He says that they should ignore them. However, Ling Xia says that she'll buy all of them. Zhu is shocked to hear this and wonders how can she pay the hefty price of 100,000 golden grits without any hesitation. The seller praises her choice and asks where should he send them. Ling Xia tells him to send it back to the Lichuan continent and make sure to inform the Nan clan and the ancestral dragon city-state that these people are their servants. She threatens to wipe out his slave camp if any of them died or lost any body parts while being sent back. The seller says that since she also gave them the money for the fair, he'll make sure to fulfill her requirements and won't make any mistakes. Meanwhile, Chu thinks that Ling Xia is indeed very rich. The freed slaves bow down and thank Ling Xia for her kindness, saying that they'll make sure to repay her kindness. Xu asks a man named Ling Tu to come close, saying that he has something to ask him. He asks Ling Tu if he has seen a group of Gaojai slaves who were dragged out of the city and were recently killed. Ling Tu informs him that a group of slaves had escaped to the east three days ago. He heard that they were caught and killed, however, he doesn't know if they got their eyes gouged out. Xu asks him who those slaves belonged to. Ling Tu responds that they also seem to belong to the Wolf Tooth camp. He informs Xu that even if those slaves didn't escape, they still would have been killed. Xu asks him why is that, to which Ling Tu responds that Xu will figure it out once he takes a look at the tablet city. However, he informs Xu that there are a lot of guards at the back tablet and suggests that it'd be better for him to go at night. Xu thinks that it seems a group of slaves escaped and were captured near the hill, leading to them being slaughtered as sacrifices by the Bear Isex members. He wonders why Ling Tu said that they still would have been killed. As night arrives, Ling Xia sarcastically says whether they are going to see another sacrificial ritual. Xu sighs that it seems those are unsold slaves during the day. He feels exhausted knowing that he'd have to explain all of this to Yuzhua after they finish this thing. He suddenly hushes Ling Xia, saying that they have arrived at the place. He notices that there is a heavy smell of blood emanating from the place. He tells Ling Xia that the smell is coming from behind the tablet and says that they should check it out. As they look behind the tablet, their eyes widen in horror and shock as they stare at the view. They see naked slaves in a blood pool with leeches in them. A man screams for help as the leeches devour him. Xu can't believe that there is a blood leech dragon here and notices that they've already reached the high monarch level. Ling Xia says that she can't stand it anymore. As Xu looks at the slaves drowning with men in black robes guarding the area, Ling Xia says that they should get out of there as she leaves. Xinghua asks Yusuo why is she so pale. Yusuo tells her not to worry, saying that she just saw something really disgusting. She asks Yusuo what she saw. Yusuo reveals they saw a horde of blood leeches eating each other, and using the blood and the evil aura to transform into dragons in a sacrificial altar on the hill. With a dejected look on her face, Xinghua says that it is the same as what she dreamt about. Yusua says that there's a blood pool behind the huge tablet, and is like an evil container that has already gathered countless evil creatures. Because of this, she feels afraid that the blood leech dragon that was born there will be an evil one. A disciple of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains named Bai Qinan slams her hand on the table, and exclaims that they shall destroy the evil sect. Fong asks whether this is the doing of the bear-eyed sect. Xu asks who is the new disciple. A disciple introduces Chinan, saying that she is one of her martial art fellows. Chinan happened to meet them when she was traveling and intended to go back to the sword sect in the Miao Mountains with them. 
phone calls the slave killers cunning, saying that because they killed slaves, they don't have a right reason to root them out completely. A woman named Qin Yuan enters the room, saying that if they intend to directly take action, they won't be able to find people from the bare eyed sect at all. Qin Yuan tells Zhu that the matter of the bare eyed sect should be put on hold, and informs him that there is something more urgent that he needs to watch out for. Zhu asks her what's the matter. Qin Yuan reveals that the prince and Zhao Inga have assembled a group of desperate mercenaries who are led by Hao Xingxing. They are trying to track Xu's whereabouts and want to kidnap him to threaten the Pei State. Hearing this, Xu thinks that his father raised an army of black armored picked troops who are strong enough to wipe out any forces except the four big sects and the six largest clans of the Jiting continent. He wonders whether Prince Am wants to make trouble for him due to this or he just wants to have control over the black armored picked troops. Xu says that the Hao clan is just a scapegoat. Those mercenaries have no identity, and if they got exposed, the Hao clan will finally bear the consequences. He says that Prince Ang and Zhao Yaij will still be able to hide behind the scenes and exclaims that they are indeed cunning. Qin Yuan assures Zhu that those mercenaries will be killed by tonight. Zhu asks whether she found out who gave them the information that he was going to leave the city. Qin Yuan reveals that it was the housekeeper who was responsible for serving the people from the sword sect in the Miao Mountains in the royal family's mansion. Point one of the disciples of the sword sect in Miao Mountains apologizes to Zhu, saying that they were careless for talking about it in front of the housekeeper. Xu asks Qin Yuan to leak the news that they'll go behind the tablet to check something. Qin Yuan realizes that he's trying to get them killed by others. She says that she'll do it immediately and leaves. Nian Yan asks why she hasn't seen Qin Yuan, to which Xu says that he hasn't seen her either. Hearing this, Nian Yan realizes that they've been secretly protected on their journey. Zhu cracks his fingers, saying that they won't be protected once they leave the kingdom. The chains clanked as the slaves were being taken away. Xu is also among them. He notices the black-robed guards telling their master that the new batch of slaves has arrived. The master stands in front of a slave while holding a knife in his hand. Xu recognizes that these people belong to the bare-eyed sect. The slave cries out for mercy from the master. But the wicked master tells him not to worry, saying that the pain will soon go away. He gouges out the slave's eyes with the knife in his hand, causing blood to spurt everywhere. The slave screams in pain and cries out for help. The master offers him to become a member of their sect and be released from his suffering point one of the guards offers to help him. But the master denies his offer, saying that he'd like to do it himself. The master licks off the slave's blood from his knife, saying that he used to be a clumsy pedicurist. He recounts an incident where he accidentally hurt a guest's toe. Even though the guest only bled a little, his men ripped the master's eyes as punishment. He continues to recall that he also used to clumsily take people's eyes, and they would always scream in excruciating pain. Gradually, he became more skilled at it, and it was only a matter of a few seconds before those people felt the pain. Xu clenches his fist in anger and calls them psychopaths for taking the slave's eyes out while they're still alive. He asks the master if he can't do it after they die. The master exclaims of course not, and says they won't be able to get the essence of the bare-eyed sect after death. He says that without eyes, the fear cannot be seen, and without fear, they'll be fearless and carefree. Only then can they see the true God in their heart. Zhu responds that the master is not skilled at gouging their eyes out, and they're not willing to worship the bare-eyed God. He points out that the guards still have their eyes and questions how are they qualified to perform this ritual. He proposes that they take out their own eyes first, he'll do it after them, and then they can worship the bare-eyed God together. The guards look at each other in fear, and the master suddenly charges towards Zhu, exclaiming that he is the only one who can do the ritual. But before he can do anything, a guard interrupts him and exclaims that he has bad news. The master tells the guard to tell the news after he has Zhu's tongue and eyes out. The guard reveals the news anyway, saying that a group of powerful men have surrounded their tablet. The master asks whether he knows where they came from. Xu smirks and exclaims that he knows about it. This infuriates the master. He tries to attack Xu with his knife and tells him to shut up. Xu takes off his robe and lies that he is Zhao Yaij, the young lord of the royal family. 
He says that he has been watching the master for a while and has sent these powerful men to kill all of them. Fon yells out that Zhu needs to be protected. The mention of Zhu's name confuses the master. He questions whether Zhu is Zhao Yaiji or someone else. Hao Xingxing tells his mercenaries that Zhao Yaiji is over there. He commands them to take the master down even if they need to kill him. The mercenaries spread out and start heading towards the scene. The master realizes that he has been fooled and orders his guards to kill them. Meanwhile a few mercenaries yell at Feng as he flees the scene. A blue-haired mercenary says that Zhao Yaiji is at the execution ground and is being protected by a group of guards in black robes. A brown-haired mercenary exclaims that they shall kill them all. As they begin to leap towards the guards, a leech suddenly appears out of the blood pool and catches the brown-haired mercenary off guard. As the leech roars and engulfs the brown-haired mercenary, the remaining mercenaries watch in horror, wondering what the evil creature is. The master lets out an evil laugh. He refers to them as mere mortals and scoffs at their audacity to think they can destroy the bear eye sect. He exclaims that he'll show them what a real eyeless dragon is. An evil blood leech dragon emerges from the blood pool and roars at them. The blue-haired mercenary is shocked to see the evil dragon and exclaims that the Zhu clan has gone against God's will. The master asks him what he means by the Zhu clan. He calls them dogs of the royal family and says that since they have dared to fight against the bear eye sect, they'll be the offerings for his dragon. He steps on the dragon, saying that eating a single person who cultivates is worth eating a thousand ordinary people. As the evil blood leech dragon lifts him up, the master thanks Xu for bringing so much delicious food for his dragon. Xu tells the slaves to leave. One of them replies that they are unable to move. Zhu immediately summons Haya and orders him to take the slaves out of the place. Haya howls and stops the evil blood leech dragon from attacking. Zhu feels thankful that he already asked for advice. If he had acted rashly, there would have been many casualties even if Wu Feng and Bai Qinan were present. The master points at Zhu and orders his dragon to attack him first. Zhu is surprised that he aimed so well despite being blind. He summons his sword and asks if the master thinks he fears him. As the leech dragon charges at him, Zhu attacks him with his sword, causing blood to spurt everywhere. As Moe roars, Hao Xingxing appears on his dragon. He screams Zhu's name, telling him to go to hell. Zhu exclaims that he just arrived on time and says that he will reward Xingxing if he kills the evil blood leech dragon. He giggles as he apologizes to Xingxing in his mind. He needs Xingxing to distract the dragon. The master is shocked by Zhu's audacity to belittle them. He starts to create a red ball of energy and exclaims that he'll kill his man first and then rip Zhu's bones from his body. As Xingxing shouts that he's not Zhu's man, he is taken aback to see the red ball of energy shoot into the sky. The master bursts into evil laughter and exclaims that none of them will get out of there alive. The ball of energy turns into an evil eyeless dragon and lets out a mighty roar. Xingxing realizes the severity of the situation and exclaims that they need to retreat. The master tells his disciples to accept the evil eyeless dragon's gift with their arms wide open. The evil eyeless dragon lets out leeches from its mouth. The leeches begin to head towards the mercenaries. Xu says that he's not a believer. He runs, exclaiming that they need to stop disgusting him with this stuff. The leeches enter the black-robed guard's bodies and transforms them into monsters. The blue-haired mercenary attacks a monster with his sword, but weird tentacles start coming out of its wound. The tentacles grab his sword, causing him to wonder what kind of a monster it is. The blue-haired mercenary suddenly screams for help as it grabs his head. But no one comes to his help as the monster squashes his head with a boom. The rest of the mercenaries start running as the monsters chase them. Asu tries to escape. He observes the scene and realizes that things have gotten tricky because evil has entered their bodies and demonized them. He suddenly notices that Bai Chinan has arrived. Chinan launches a flying sword flash at the monsters and electrocutes them. Zhu is shocked that she has used a flying sword flash. He thinks that he should try imitating it with his sword spirit dragon. As one of the monsters lies defeated, Shu asks his sword spirit dragon if he has got what it takes and the dragon buzzes in agreement. 
Shu launches a flying sword flash at the monsters, causing a massive explosion. Moe slices the monsters and causes another explosion. Chinan wonders whether he's sure that's the flying sword. She believes that he's thrusting them blindly. She informs Shu that sword flash is about diving and zinging. She emphasizes the flash must be as precise as a flood dragon diving into a pond and zinging out of the vast sea. Zhu realizes his mistake and nervously agrees with her. Chinan says that let the sword dive first and launches her sword. However, the sword is nowhere to be seen and Zhu exclaims in shock that it has disappeared. Chinan says that the unsheathed sword is like the lightning that flashes across the sky. The sword descends from the sky and pierces the evil eyeless dragon. Shu realizes that he needs to let his sword dive first and launches the sword flash. His sword disappears, and the eyeless dragon comes charging at them. However, the sword flash arrives just in time and slashes the dragon's head off. Shu thanks Chinan for guiding him. Chinan thinks that no one in her sect has mastered this technique by just watching it twice. She believes that Zhu is indeed a once-in-a-millennium talent. As the evil eyeless dragon begins to recover, Chinan says that it is very powerful. She suggests that they eradicate the dragon together before it causes more trouble. Zhu agrees with her and immediately summons Baichi. Baichi shoots ice at the eyeless dragon, causing it to freeze partially. She creates a whirlwind of bright blue energy with ice in it. The evil dragon lets out a mighty roar as it crashes into the whirlwind and gets trapped inside. Shu tells his sword spirit to quickly kill the evil dragon. The sword spirit immediately enters inside and slices the dragon. The master curses in frustration and orders his eyeless dragon to suck blood. Shu realizes that the dragon can recover through blood and orders Baichi to freeze it. Baichi springs into action and successfully freezes the blood but the master exclaims that no one can stop him. The evil dragon lets out leeches out of its body. The leeches attack the guards and turn them into evil zombie-like creatures. Chinan orders her sword to cut off the evil dragon's tentacles, and her sword immediately attacks it. Zhu appears flying on his sword and unleashes a sword spirit rain on the dragon. As his sword or a dragon attacks the eyeless dragon, the master curses. He can't believe that his monarch level dragon has been defeated. He tries to flee the scene and says that where there is life, there is hope. However, the head of the mercenary slices his head off and calls him a mere ridiculous cultist. Fong tells the head that he did a good job and asks where he is from. He questions why the head chose to serve as a dog for some authority instead of embracing the freedom and righteousness of being a swordsman. The head thinks that the smell of foam was so faint that he was unaware of his presence. He wonders if foam feels that a sneak attack isn't worth it since he could have easily thrust his sword from behind and killed him. He tells foam to cut the bullshit and threatens him, saying that he has come to kill Zhu, but he doesn't mind killing another person. He exclaims that today he'll have Feng's soul imprisoned in his sword forever. Hearing about the imprisonment of the sword, Foam wonders whether the head is a member of the Cell's Word sect. He says that his sect always used to be compared to the mercenary sect. He insults him by saying that it gradually declined due to lapdogs like him. Foam takes his sword out and throws the scabbard into the air. The head mercenary wonders why he did that. He thinks maybe there is a secret in the scabbard and decides to keep an eye on it. Foam creeps up behind the head as he gets ready to attack. The head curses, realizing that Foam made the first move, leaving him unable to dodge. He decides to break the force of his sword by his own and takes his sword out. Foam exclaims that's what he wants and attacks the head who blocks it with his sword. The mercenary thinks that he must have a secret move. As they continue their sword fight, he starts to believe that the scabbard has something. But unluckily, he has seen him through. Foam asks the head what's he looking at. As the mercenary realizes something is wrong, Foam attacks him with his sword and blood spurts out. The injured head mercenary realizes that there was no secret move, Foam had just figured out how much it'll take him to pull and slide his sword back into the scabbard to defeat him. The man kneels, his blood spilling on the ground. He falls face first and succumbs to his death. It seems a lot of forces have joined Prince on. 
Foam wonders if all members of the Cell's Word sect or only the head mercenary have joined. As he realizes that he needs to inform Zhu about this, a boom is heard as blood spurts out from the ground. Seeing this, Foam wonders how things are going for Zhu. The seemingly defeated evil eyeless dragon has regained consciousness. The dragon roars as it unleashes a swarm of leeches out of its body. The leeches charge towards Zhu, and one of them manages to disrupt Zhu's balance, causing him to tumble from his sword. Zhu screams for Baichi to save him. Baichi appears just in time, and Zhu safely lands on her back. Zhu sighs in relief, saying that it was a close call. He realizes that he and his sword or a dragon need more practice to work well. His attention is drawn towards the eyeless dragon closing in. The people start screaming for help while running, as the evil dragon devours someone. Shu orders Baichi to stop the dragon, stating that they must not allow it to continue killing people in the city. Baichi charges towards the dragon, however. Before she can do anything, a huge wall of ice erupts from the ground with a boom. Zhu is taken aback to see this. Shinan appears from the ice and orders the evil eyeless dragon to stop the killings. The eyeless dragon roars at her as she prepares to launch a sword flash at it. She unleashes her sword which attacks the dragon, causing it to howl in pain. Suddenly, Chinan appears dangerously close to the dragon's mouth. Zhu exclaims for her to watch out. Baichi immediately shoots ice at the dragon and saves Chinan. Zhu carries Chinan in his arms as Baichi takes them to safety. Zhu asks her if she is alright. Chinan responds that she's okay. She informs Zhu that the evil dragon cannot hurt her because it is afraid of the fire generated by the meteorite on her sword. Zhu gets an idea and informs her that he has a way of killing the dragon with a single blow. He requests her to guard him, and Chinan agrees. Xu prepares his sword spirit dragon, remembering that it has the fire caused by heaven from the ancient flame-bladed sword. This fire is as powerful as a meteorite. Chinan stares at Xu, wondering whether it is the fire from heaven. Xu asks Chinan for her sword and she gives it to him. Xu's eyes turn red and blood drips from his mouth as he unleashes a double sword flame tornado upon the evil dragon. Chinan asks Zhu whether he is alright. Zhu responds that he's fine, he just exerted a lot of force and needs a moment to collect himself. Zhu says that like he suspected, he was barely able to use the trick just now. But fortunately, he finally killed the evil dragon at last. While extracting the dragon's soul core gathering, he mentions that the evil dragon is at the monarch level and its soul core must be of high quality. He knows that he can't use the soul core but perhaps he could trade it for a wealthy city. He calls it doing the right thing and receiving profound rewards in return. Upon hearing the news of Hao Xingxing's escape, Zhu says that it is all right and someone will deal with Xingxing. He exclaims that the Zhu clan is not to be played with. Chinan suggests to Feng that they write a letter to their commanders to report what has occurred in the tablet city. Feng responds that he was thinking the same thing, and the gravity of the situation is starting to hit him. Meanwhile, a slave feels thankful that the dragon has been killed, otherwise they'd be dead. However, he feels sad that even though the dragon is dead, they still won't have a chance to live a good life. Fong says that even if they are slaves, no one should have the right to kill them at will. He adds that not only is it against humanity, but also makes it easier for evil sex to take advantage. Ultimately, the people of the Jiting continent will be the ones suffering. Zhu feels that maybe the city lord of the tablet city is involved in this. He decides that he will tell his uncle Zhu Yushan and let him look into the matter. He wonders what it'll be like in the remote areas and how many evil cities are out there. Chinan says that the members of the mercenary camps are venal scum. She exclaims that they must have something to do with it. Zhu reveals that the mercenary camps are being backed by very powerful warlords. He emphasizes they can't restrain the camps unless they abolish slavery. Zhu thinks that it seems Lichuan is a nice place. At least, there isn't such a wicked city in the barbaric land and the ancestral dragon city-state under Yunzi's rule. He feels that it is unfortunate Yunzi was injured, otherwise it would have been nice for them to conquer the Rui Kingdom. They have finally arrived at the capital of the Miao Kingdom, and it'll be four to five days before they head into the Miao Mountains. 
Xu informs Xinghua that the Miao Kingdom is also called the Flower Kingdom, and even its Grand Counselor is called the God of Flowers. Because of this, they are able to see all kinds of flowers everywhere in the kingdom. Zhang He questions whether there is a festival happening, he exclaims at the sight of the many people and lanterns. Qinan informs him that it is the Flower Gathering Festival. However, she clarifies that it isn't exactly a typical festival. She reveals that every year, many people from other countries come and try when it's time to take a son-in-law. Zhu asks what she means by taking a son-in-law. Qinan responds that it has been like this throughout the Miao Kingdom's history. In this festival, princesses choose their husbands once they reach the marriageable age, and it's usually held in autumn when the maple leaves turn red. She reveals that the daughters of the dukes on different lands began to follow them, and gradually, the ordinary girls started to choose their husbands at this time of the year as well. Phone whispers to Zhu that he heard that's how Xu's parents met. Hearing this, Zhu says that didn't they have an arranged marriage? Feng says yes, but adds that Zhu's grandfather had chosen his mother, the master of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains. His mother said that she would only marry Zhu's father if he could stand out from the crowd at the festival. Zhu remembers that his mom gave all of her attention to cultivating and ultimately returned to the Miao Mountains. He feels sad, thinking that his mom probably doesn't even remember his name now. The next day, Xu feels irritated by a noise and covers his ears with the pillow. He wonders what's with the noise so early in the morning that he looks out the window and sees a crowd gathered around a woman. The crowd exclaims that it's Princess Luo Shui, the unsurpassed beauty at the flower festival. Someone from the crowd exclaims that she looks even prettier with her mask, while another person wishes he could take her mask off and look at her face. Suddenly, Zhu hears someone knocking on the door. He opens the door and sees that it is Yunzi's body. He hesitantly wishes her a good morning and wonders whether she is Xinghua or Yunzi. The woman addresses him as Mr. Zhu and says that she saw the ancient divine Jade Lamb. Hearing her call him Mr. Zhu, he realizes that it is Xinghua. Zhu asks her where's the Jade Lamb. Xinghua points at the window, leaving Zhu confused. He asks whether it is on the branch and Xinghua says no. Xinghua looks confused, prompting Zhu to ask what's wrong. She points at Princess Luo Shui and says that it's on her face. Xu asks whether she means the silver mask she's wearing is the lamp jade and Xinghua confirms it. Suddenly, Zhu sees the princess staring in their direction. As soon as the princess averts her gaze, Xinghua's expression turns uneasy. Seeing this, Zhu realizes that the princess was looking at Xinghua instead of him. Nian Nian tells Zhu that they need to save food for Haya. She comments that Haya has been eating a lot recently and compares him to a pig. Zhu thinks that Haya can eat even more than a pig. As Ling Xiao's body appears, Zhu looks at her, wondering who she is. Nian Nian proposes a bet and confidently says that it's definitely not Ling Xiao. Zhu bets 10,000 grains of gold sand and exclaims that she is indeed Ling Xiao.As Ling Xiao's body greets Zhu with a good morning. He nervously greets her back, realizing that the person before him is Yusuo as Ling Xiao would never greet someone herself. Nian Nian motions for him to hand over the golden sand. Zhu sighs in disappointment and hands it to her, saying that she won this time. Yusuo questions what are they betting on. Nian Nian hesitantly says that they were just guessing who it would be today. She quickly rushes away, saying that she needs to get some necessities. Yusua asks whether they make a bet every day. Zhu nervously rubs his head, saying that the journey is boring, so they do it. Yusua shows him a golden bead and says that she also wants to bet. Zhu is surprised to see that she has such a big golden bead. He calls that it is unfair since she already knows will appear tomorrow. In response, Yusua proposes that they wait for seven days. If she appears after seven days, then Zhu will give her a good golden bead. However, if it is Ling Xia, Yusuo will give him the bead. Zhu asks Xinghua if they can choose to wake up. As Xinghua says no, Zhu accepts Yusuo's offer and bets one good golden bead. He suddenly mentions that Xinghua found out that Princess Lu Shui has the lamp jade, but she has turned it into a silver mask. He asks Yusuo if she has a good plan to get it. Yusuo responds that it's easy, they should just rob it. 
Hearing her advice, Xu sarcastically thinks that only Yu Su would give such a unique, bold, and good idea. Shortly afterwards, the three of them are seen with Wen Mengru. Mengru informs them that the silver mask is the symbol of the royal princesses. They start wearing it at the age of 18 and rarely take it off. Zhu questions then how do they wash their faces. Mengru explains that they do take it off to wash their faces, however, they don't show their sacred faces to strangers, especially strange men. She adds that many authorities also have this rule and some fathers never get to see their daughters without the veil after they turn 18. The masks can only be taken off on the wedding night by their husbands. But there are also some girls who have many husbands and boy toys, and most of them do not wear masks. As for ordinary girls, they can decide if they want to wear it or not. Yusua shocks Zhu as she lies that Zhu fell in love with Princess Luo Shui at first sight. She says that he is too embarrassed to ask her, so she's asking on his behalf, what will it take for him to become the princess's husband? Zhu thinks that Yusua should stop talking nonsense, and that she'll get him killed. Mengru is taken aback to hear this, she says that doesn't he already have two beautiful wives? Yusu responds that all men are fickle in affection, they need to submit to his desires so that he won't loathe them. Mengru says that it is easy. With his identity and talent, he can just go to the palace and express his wish to marry the princess. However, she says that in the Miao kingdom, even a farm girl won't accept her husband having a second wife, let alone a princess. Ju coughs in embarrassment and tells Mengru to not listen to Yusuf, claiming that he didn't mean that at all. Yusuo continues with the act and tells Zhu to stop being embarrassed, exclaiming that she doesn't mind even mind it. Zhu thinks that he can't let her go on. He immediately opens the door and drags them out, saying that he has heard about the many resources of the Black Dragon at the Dragon Lady Palace, and they are going to check them out. As they arrive, Zhang He says that the Dragon Lady Palace looks much grander than their palace. Foam fakes a cough, saying that their sect always keeps a low profile. Meanwhile, Zhu says that the Dragon Lady Palace is one of the seven Black Dragon Palaces. Since it happens to be in the Miao Kingdom, there are many female dragon tamers over there. A woman named Luo Miaoyu suddenly appears in front of them. She asks whether they are competing for a girl. She warns them that joining is easy, but they need to be strong enough to compete. Zhu nervously thinks that why this palace also needed to be a place for competing. Yusuo hugs Zhu, saying that he can strive to be Princess Luoshui's husband. She tries to tempt him by mentioning the princess's beauty, but Zhu remains firm, saying that he can't do anything that will hurt Yunzi. Yusuo asks whether he still wants to save Yunzi. She reassures him that Yunzi won't mind him having a second wife as long as he can get that lamp jade. She further tries to entice him, suggesting that it would be the best of both worlds. Xu hesitates for a moment but finally agrees, saying that he will do it for Yunzi's sake. However, he will only pretend to join the competition, and once he gets the lamp jade, he will run away from it. Miaoyu compliments Xu, saying that he is a pretty handsome gentleman. Xu introduces Zhang He and says that he has been single for a while. He says that Zhang He would like to join the competition to win a girl's heart by showing off his cultivation. Zhang He reluctantly agrees, saying that he will only compete to check who has the best skills. Miao says that it's too soon for him to say that. She takes them to the girls and says that they are all great disciples of the Dragon Lady sect and are about to get married this year. Miao Yu reveals that several foreign princes and lords are waiting at the side palace and at least a thousand brilliant talents are waiting outside. Since they are honored guests who have come so far, she arranged for them to compete after the princes. Zhang He looks at them in awe and asks if he can choose any of them if he wins. The girls start laughing at him as Miaoyu reveals that the girls will be the ones who will get to choose if he wins. Miss Song mockingly asks which poor country they have come from. Miaoyu introduces them all, saying that these honored guests are Wu Feng, the master of the sword sect in Yao Mountains, his first disciple Yun Zhang He, and Zhu belongs to one of the six largest clans, the Zhu clan. Miaoyu leaves after this and advises the girls not to miss their chance. A woman starts flirting with Zhang He, saying that he must be very powerful since he is the first disciple. 
She asks if he could swing a sword for the girls and Zhang He immediately agrees. Meanwhile, another woman flirts with Zhu. She says that he is much more handsome than her husband and asks him to spend a few nights with her. Fong also blushes as a woman asks him if he has a wife. Suddenly, a short man appears with his guards. He asks where the Hicks have come from and demands that they be kicked out. Miao Yu addresses the short man as Prince Liang and starts to explain. However, Prince Liang interrupts her, saying that they both have their own rules and he has never fought for anything. He menacingly says that those who can't take a hint are already dead, and he is kind enough to only kick them out. Zhang He feels angered and exclaims that he's just talking tough. As he approaches Prince Liang, he feels confused to see the prince approaching Xu. Prince Liang orders his minions to break Xu's legs and throw him out. Xu is taken aback by this and wonders why the prince wants to break his legs when he has done nothing but stand there without saying a word. He asks Prince Liang if he can tell him the reason for it. Prince Liang says that he had a handsome cousin. Although his cousin grew up with him, he took one of his beautiful maids. Because of this, he gets mad whenever he sees a handsome face. He reveals that Zhu looks like him and looking at Zhu makes him feel uncomfortable. Zhu exclaims that the prince is just jealous of his handsomeness. The prince's guard asks if he needs to make Zhu infertile, and the prince answers that he must do it. Fong warns Zhu that the man is unusually a master at force and tells him to be careful. Zhu says that it is unfortunate that Haya doesn't eat humans. Otherwise, he could save a lot of money if it ate those who seek death. As he summons Haya out of the spirit domain, Prince Liang taunts him, asking if he plans on humiliating himself with the dragon general. Zhu responds that Haya alone can deal with a bunch of losers like him. Haya agrees with Zhu and spits at the prince's face. Prince Liang wipes his face and orders Zhang Zhangjiu to kill Haya first. Zhang Zhang Jio immediately begins to charge at Haya. As Haya roars and gets closer to him, Zhang Jio tries to stop Haya from attacking by holding his horn. However, he fails as Haya pushes him away with a bang. Haya charges at Zhang Jio, ready to attack. Zhang Jio laughs at him and lands a punch on Haya's face. Ju realizes that Zhang Zhang Jio is good at breaking force and Haya has met his match. He tells Haya to come back and summons Qinghua out of the spirit realm. He orders Qinghua to attack and Qinghua begins to create a bright green ball of energy in his mouth. The green light swishes and creates branches of wood. Zhang Zhang Jiu observes the light and it suddenly starts smacking him. Prince Liang calls Zhang Zhang Jiu useless and orders Zhang Ba to go next. Zhang Ba strikes the ground and it starts to crack. Qingzhua notices this and immediately springs into action. He entangles Zhang Ba with its branches and throws him on the ground. Seeing Zhu's power, a woman flirtatiously asks if Xu has the time to spend a night with him. Prince Liang exclaims that there is nothing so great about being a dragon tamer. He says that he has won too and orders Zhang Qi to fight. Zhang Qi summons his iron core turtle dragon and commands it to smash Qingzhua to pieces. Xu tells Haya to deal with the iron thing. He puts on a molten heavy armor on Haya and commands him to attack. Haya roars as he bites the dragon's neck, defeating it. The prince gets more and more agitated by this. He orders Zhang Lu, Zhang Chu, and Zhang Si to attack. He curses in frustration and feels regret that Zhang San, Zhang Er, and Zhang Yi are not with him today. He can't believe that a punk like Xu could compete with him. Miao Yu asks why didn't he bring his three more powerful men and questions if he is still thinking about going to the princess's mansion. The prince responds why does it matter even if that's the case. Miao Yu responds that she is afraid that he might have to suffer a little today. Xu tells Haya that he doesn't like the prince being arrogant and orders him to throw out the bastard. As Haya grabs the prince, he screams to be let go. He exclaims that if the dragon hurts him, he will kill everyone in Zhu's clan with an army of 200,000 warriors. However, Haya doesn't care for his threats and throws him out. Seeing this, the women agree with throwing out the incapable prince and his men, and say that they don't want a loser like him. Suddenly, a woman hugs Zhu and exclaims that she wants him. Seeing this, 
Zhang He cannot fathom what the woman finds so appealing in Zhu. He exclaims that Xu just summoned dragons and they aren't even as strong as him. Feng suggests that perhaps it's due to Zhu's handsome face like the prince had mentioned earlier. Xu clarifies to the ladies that he just came to visit the well-known dragon lady palace. He only wanted to check if there were any suitable dragon scales and had no intention of getting married. With a dejected look on her face, the woman says that Zhu must want to get into the princess's mansion and claims that's the way men are. Xu hesitantly confirms that he indeed planned to visit the princess's mansion, however, he only wanted to have a look and that was his only idea. The woman wipes her tears, saying that she has heard many men say such things before. She exclaims that they think that the grass is always greener on the other side. Phone clarifies to the ladies that this is a misunderstanding, they only came to exchange views with the sword sect in the Miao Mountains, and it just happened to be during their festival. He adds that they aren't even aware of the process through which the ladies choose their husbands. Hearing this, Miao Yu begins to explain the process. She informs them that every year around this time, men come to the capital to visit well-known or ordinary families. Although the girls never decline the men, they don't choose them right away. They usually sit in the courtyard and test these men. If a girl begins to fancy a man, she writes his name on the maple leaf with a special ink and then presents it to the imperial palace. Fong asks in confirmation if they really present it to the imperial palace. Miryu says yes and tells him that if a man is excellent, his name appears many times on the leaves. The ladies call such a man an ideal husband. A week after all the leaves are collected, they then bid for the ideal husband, and the man marries into the family that bids the highest daughter redhead woman flirts with Ju, saying that many ladies from noble families will like a man with both beauty and talent like him, and maybe they will have to fight with the princesses for him. Meanwhile, Ju thinks that he didn't expect that the princesses couldn't avoid the festival. Zhang He questions whether this isn't just like buying men openly. The redhead responds that he can think of it that way, but the girls in the Miao kingdom are very grateful, they never force men. If a man is not ready to get married, he doesn't have to join, they aren't just gonna tie him up. Zhu realizes that the role of men in the Miao kingdom is indeed very subservient, and they have no choice except for waiting for bids. Zhu says that he now understands the process, and asks if they can talk about buying dragon scales. The redhead says sure and tells him to follow her. As they enter the collection pavilion, the redhead shows him the dragon scales that he can exchange his soul core for. She hands him a jar, saying that it is all in here. Zhu grabs the jar and thanks her. Suddenly, his attention is drawn to something. He points at a feather and asks the redhead what it is. The redhead compliments his keen eye. She reveals that it is the treasure of the Dragon Lady Palace and requests him to look carefully. She blows at the feather, and it starts glowing. Zhu notices that the feather can change from hard to soft with a single blow, and its form can also change at will. He thinks that it's like the icy fuzz of Baichi. The redhead reveals that it is called the Eternity Feather, and it comes from a rare sacred shapeshifter. She says that it used to produce flames, thunder, and lightning. But unfortunately, they weren't good at taking materials, so when they got the feather, it was damaged. Zhu thinks that the feather is really light, and it will be able to change freely with the change of Bai Qi's feathers. He decides that it would be perfect for Bai Qi's dragon armor, and asks the redhead if she can sell it to him. The redhead responds that it depends on how much he is willing to offer. Zhu shows her a cloud fruit and asks if it will be enough. The redhead is surprised to see the cloud fruit and exclaims that it is filled with spiritual chi. Xu thinks that Bai Qi has already eaten two of them, so it wouldn't be bad for him to trade the extra fruit for the feather. The redhead says that the fruit is also a rare thing for them, and accepts the deal. She offers him a 50% discount if he agrees to spend a night with her. Hearing this, Zhu immediately flees and leaves her wondering where he left. Shortly afterwards, Xu says that the materials for the dragon armor are ready and Ling Xia is done with the design. He asks Bai Qi if they should start making it now and Bai Qi chirps in agreement. Xu wonders whether they need a ritual like sacrificing some other materials or making some easy small objects. He says that the precious feather can only be used once so they can't afford to fail. 
Zhu says that he should worship Mr. Koi first and calls him the mascot of the Zhu clan. He decides to invite Mr. Koi whenever he makes dragon armor. After searching for the fish, Zhu wonders why he can't find him anywhere. He jokingly suggests that maybe he was taken by the cook to make soup. Zhu suddenly realizes that he doesn't need to be superstitious about this and thinks that perhaps he could ask Xinghua to predict if he can successfully make the dragon armor. Zhu arrives at Xinghua's place and knocks on the door, asking if she's in there. Xinghua says yes as she opens the door in just a towel. Zhu exclaims in shock and his nose bleeds as he looks at her. He blushes as he nervously informs her that he has decided to make a dragon armor, but since he is not skilled at it, he has high a chance of failing, so he wants her to predict if he can successfully make it. He covers his face, thinking that Yunzi and Xinghua are the same person. He wonders why would God torture him like this. He continues to think that Ling Xia and Yunzi are twins and Ling Xia and Yusua are the same person. He feels that this is the greatest torment, and he cannot handle it anymore. Xinghua apologizes and says that she isn't Yunzi. Zhu responds that she doesn't need to apologize and he is the one who should be saying sorry to her. Xinghua covers herself with a robe and predicts that he will succeed in making the dragon armor on one autumn night when it is extremely cold. Zhu realizes that she's right and says that the material he will use all contains the ice elemental essence. Therefore, the temperature must be a factor in his success or failure. He says that it is a good idea and thanks Xinghua for doing him a big favor. Following this, he begins to leave and bids her farewell. He runs out of her place, thinking that he won't be able to control himself if he stayed any longer. He decides to find some materials with the ice elemental essence to help calm him down. After some time, Chu tells Baichi to try on the dragon armor he has created. As Baichi wears it, Chu asks her if it fits all right. Baichi responds by happily chirping in agreement. Chu decides that the next day, in the extreme cold, he will extract the inscription from the Eternity Feather and add it to Baichi's armor. He thinks that this is a make-or-break situation and decides to invite Mr. Koi for his fortune. The next evening, Mr. Koi asks Zhu why he called him here in the middle of the night. He says that he is not interested in making the dragon armor and is having a good time traveling these days. Zhu laughs and tells him not to worry. He says that he just wants to gain some luck from the fish so that he can succeed. He gets started with the process, and the feather starts to glow in various colors. Zhu comments that the feather has four different kinds of fragments including lightning, candlelight, flame, and ice. He says that it is indeed difficult to extract only the ice inscription. A blue light begins to emerge and he finally extracts the ice inscription. Zhu exclaims that the hardest part is done and decides to integrate the wing, feather, claw and body into the stove. As the potion simmers, Zhu wonders how the dragon armor will turn out. After two hours, Xu tells Mr. Koi that he's opening the stove. As he begins to say something else, Mr. Koi interrupts him and tells him to go ahead. He sarcastically asks whether Zhu wants him to dance while he opens it. He exclaims that he is not a mascot, but a Koi with dignity. As he opens the pot, the armor emerges out of it. Zhu thinks that treasures are supposed to blaze while coming out of the stove, but this dragon armor is not radiant. He wonders whether he failed to add the inscription to it. He changes his mind and believes that they will know if it is good when Baichi tries it on. Baichi chirps as it tries to wear the armor. Shu tells her to go into the mode of combat. Baichi transforms into her mode of combat and successfully wears the armor. As Shu wipes the sweat off his forehead, he exclaims that the armor is so radiant and he has finally succeeded. Mr. Koi exclaims in disbelief that it is a small sacred object. Chu thinks that at least one of the five parts of the wing, feather, claw, tail, and body has the inscription. Mr. Koi wonders how could an amateur like Chu make the armor so successfully. He wonders whether he can truly bring good luck to people. Chu cockily says that it is due to his talent. He calls himself a once in a millennium talent and boasts that he can easily master sword cultivation, dragon taming, and forging. Mr. Koi vomits at his antics and exclaims that he just got lucky this time. A woman knocks on the door and calls for Zhu. 
Xu opens the door and sees that it is Wan Feng. He asks her why has she come so late. Wan Feng informs him that the three masters of their sects have agreed to let them in, so they can enter their sect tomorrow. She says that since Xu has been indulging in forging these days, the masters were worried that he might delay his arrival, so she was sent to inform him about it. She says that he needs to arrive early tomorrow since their sect dislikes men. She also mentions that since he belongs to the sword sect in Yao Mountains, he will most likely be challenged by many sword cultivators when he gets up there. Zhu acknowledges her advice and thanks her for coming. He closes the door and exclaims that tomorrow, he will finally wash away the disgrace he had faced in the past. He wants Consort Wen to know that he is no longer that defeated small sword cultivator anymore. Zhu asks Bai Qi if she has forgotten the arrogant woman. Bai Qi chirps, saying that she indeed remembers her. Zhu thinks that although she might become as powerful as his master Xuehen one day, she isn't that strong yet, and now that he has the sacred dragon armor, Bai Qi should be able to compete with a powerful person at the high monarch level. However, he sighs thinking that all of this isn't important. Their main focus is to obtain the ancient divine lamp jade to save Yunzi. The next morning, they have arrived at the hill gate of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains. Qi Nan informs them that they are at the foot of the Miao Mountains and instructs them to look behind her. She reveals that their sect has engraved the swordsmanship and motions on the stone ladders and they can observe them while climbing. Zhu realizes that he didn't notice them since he was too busy fighting last time. He calls the carvings exquisite and says that they can learn different swordsmanship on the bypaths. Although each bypath leads to the sword pavilion in Yao Mountains, there are some tantalizing carvings that trap the people. Xu asks if the carvings will make it difficult for them from here. Qinan responds that if the swordsmanship does not help him at all, he can just follow them up the mountains. Feng exclaims that the sword sect in the Miao Mountains is indeed known for its profound foundations, and the paths of swordsmanship must be the whole life's work of numerous predecessors. He remembers the saying that when one is in Rome, they should do as the Romans do. He says that since it's a test, they might as well try it. Qinan says that if that's the case, they will be waiting for them at the sword pavilion. She bids them farewell, saying that they will meet each other at the top, and flies away with her fellow disciples. Fong says that they should go separate ways and decides to take the middle path. Zhu agrees with him and says that he'll take the left one. Ling Xia tells Zhu to wait. She warns him that there are some tantalizing carvings on the path he has chosen. Zhu thinks that she is indeed a painter. She saw a problem by just taking a glance. Zhu asks whether he will get lost in the Miao Mountains if he is unable to discern things in the tantalizing carvings. Ling Xia says yes and informs him that once he can't solve the meaning of the swordsmanship, he will go in circles and will become obsessed with it. Hearing this, Zhu cockily suggests that they shall see who reaches the top first, and Ling Xia decides to accept his challenge. As Zhu makes his way, he comes across a lot of swords stuck in the ground. He realizes that it is a sword burial. The swords catch fire as Zhu's sword or a dragon emerges beside him. He realizes something is weird and wonders if there are also sword spirits in the area. Mr. Koi informs Zhu that the two sects in the Yao Mountains and Miao Mountains used to be a single sect. Since these two groups fought to separate themselves, they don't know how many top tutors died and how many famous swords were damaged back then. Xu asks if he knows more about IT. Mr. Koi reveals that to mourn the sword masters, there was an abandoned sword forest in the Yao Mountains and a sword burial in the Miao Mountains. He adds that the descendants of these sects might have forgotten about the long and enthralling battle, but these ancient swords still remember it. She wonders whether, in the end, there was no sign of a victor on any side. He remembers that his dad said the swords would only wake up under certain circumstances. The sword spirit dragon has a lot of swords in the abandoned forest. Xu thinks that no wonder it resonates with these spirits and is amplifying their obsessions and wills that he suddenly notices a bright purple light. As he begins to follow it, he is shocked to see that they look like human figures. Xu nervously asks Mr. Koi what it is. Mr. Koi tells him not to panic and says that it's similar to a ghost market. Xu is taken aback to hear this and exclaims that this place seems haunted. As burning swords head to fight the ghosts, 
He watches the swords attack them and realizes that it is a fire mark sword. The fierce battle has activated the fire inscriptions. He can't believe that they are the Archean sword and the Archean inscription. Shu says that he has the blood sword, the fire mark sword, and the Archean sword. He wonders if he can activate a few more inscriptions. Meanwhile, Fong finally arrives at the Rising Sun Pavilion. One of the disciples of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains offers him to take a seat. Fong asks if he is the first one to arrive and wonders if he is faster than the people who have visited in the past. The disciple responds that they had a few visitors but she does not remember them. However, she points at Ling Sha, who is sitting inside a tent, and says that she is faster than Fong. Fong is impressed by Ling Sha and thinks that even though she isn't a sword cultivator, she understood the carvings more thoroughly than him. As Fong begins to enter the tent, the disciple stops him and tells him to follow her. Zhang He is shocked to see that Xiaoing has been invited into the shade even though she is less powerful than him and is also his junior. He wonders whether they really treat men and women so differently in the Miao kingdom. As he tries to enter the tent and introduce himself, a disciple tells him to sit outside the tent. Zhang He looks at Feng sitting outside and joins him. He says that they came all the way to the Miao mountains and finally made it to the top. So why are they not being taken seriously? Fong says that isn't exactly the case and points out that Xiaoying received a warm welcome. Zhang He exclaims that they aren't even being given water on such a hot day and are being bullied just because they are men. He questions when will men be tough, while Fong tells him to calm down. Zhang He suddenly remembers Zhu and asks Fong why has he not arrived yet. He wonders whether Zhu has lost his way. Fong sighs saying that Chu has no cultivation, so maybe it is difficult for him to understand the carvings. He tells Zhang He that they should wait a bit longer for him. A an hour later, Chu finally arrives at the top. He notices Feng and Zhang He are sweating profusely due to the hot weather. A disciple tells Zhu to have a seat outside. However, Zhu walks past her and enters the tent. The disciple informs Zhu that they have a rule that men cannot enter inside. Zhu Kakli replies that they can set their rules, but it is up to him whether he follows them or not. The disciple asks why is he being so rude. Zhu responds that even the first disciple of their sect is being deferential to him. He exclaims how dare she tell him what to do. The disciple shouts that he is at their sect and they do not allow lowly men like him to act as they wish. As Zhu tells her to piss off, Zhang He and Feng begin to cheer for him. The disciple questions Zhu if his disciple acts so disrespectfully and is left unchecked in his sect. Feng clarifies that Zhu is actually his junior, not his disciple. He thinks that how can he discipline Zhu when even the Grand Master can't control him. The disciple stands firm and says that they have had this rule for 1000 years. She says that they won't exchange views regarding swordsmanship unless Zhu follows it. Xu thinks that it isn't necessary to know about the old, boring, and unpractical swordsmanship. Xu says that complacent girls like her hide in the deep mountains and think that they are better than other cultivators only because they rarely go down the mountains. The disciple responds that he is just talking tough. She says that he is the second person who has said a bunch of nonsense after all these years. Xu curiously asks who was the first one. The disciple responds that it was a sword cultivator who broke into their sect. She says that he was only able to leave unharmed because he was Master Ming's son, but she is not sure if he can. With a smug expression on his face, Zhu reveals that he is the one who had broken into their sect. The disciple is shocked by this revelation. Her fellow disciples began to gossip amongst themselves. One of them says that she remembers Zhu as Master Ming's son while another affirms that it seems it is really him. They recount an incident when Zhu forcibly infiltrated their sect and defeated all their disciples many years ago. Fortunately, Consort Wen had stepped in and drove him down the mountains. Otherwise, the sword sect in Niao Mountains would have faced utter humiliation. The disciple tells Feng that since Zhu was his junior, it means that he is also junior to her. Therefore, she believes it would be acceptable for her to engage in a fight with Zhu. By doing so, she could both learn from his sex techniques and also teach him the rule of their sect. 
Zhu, accepting her challenge, responds that he will teach her the rule of this world, that the weak are humble and the strong are respected. The disciple says that he has spoken well. She leaps in Zhu's direction and declares that they should begin fighting. Zhu agrees with her and cockily says that it would be great for her to fight an excellent sword cultivator like him. The disciple retorts, telling him that he is being far too arrogant. She charges towards Zhu, summoning the power of the roaring sword. With a smirk on his face, Zhu says that outstanding men like him act like a gentleman outside the Miao kingdom. However, since she is a woman, he will make it easy for her to win. Offended by Zhu's demeaning comment, the disciple exclaims that if his sword manages to move her even an inch, she would consider it as being defeated. She thinks how dare he call her just a woman, and cracks the ground by striking it with her sword. Zhu recalls the incident when Consort Wen drove him down the mountains and remembers the utter humiliation he had faced. He thinks that he needs to be arrogant, otherwise he won't be able to wash away the disgrace. He decides that it is about time these women learn to respect men. Zhu exclaims that he will break her. The disciple charges towards Zhu, saying that she wants to see how a blowhard like him will resist her powerful attack. As she tries to strike him, Zhu says that, on his way, he learned a few motions from their simple carvings. The disciple responds that although their two sects plan on exchanging views about swordsmanship, he isn't qualified to teach her how to use the swordsmanship of her sect. Zhu says sword flash and the sword or a dragon immediately hides in the spirit realm. Confused by the sword's disappearance, the disciple wonders how is it possible that she can't feel the presence of his sword. In her sect, even those who are adept at using the sword flash and the hidden sword technique, hide the sword in the dark and leave some traces behind. She wonders whether Zhu has already reached the level of shadow swords. Her fellow disciple addresses her as Miss Lin and explains that Zhu isn't utilizing the flying sword flash technique. Instead, he just summoned his sword spirit dragon back to the spirit domain. Zhang He and Feng burst into laughter. Zhang He calls Zhu cunning and exclaims that he thought Zhu would use some great swordsmanship when he was bragging. Feng exclaims that he can't stop laughing due to Zhu's humorous actions. He reveals that Zhu is no longer a sword cultivator, but a dragon tamer instead. He informs Miss Lin that Zhu is using a rare sword spirit that can turn into a dragon and is able to use most of the swordsmanship of different sections upon hearing this. Miss Lin curses in frustration. Zhu says that he was just kidding. He declares that he will use the actual swordsmanship of her sect and urges her to keep on her toes. Miss Lin says that the swordsmanship of their sect is profound and mysterious. She exclaims that it is ridiculous for him to believe that he can master it after having just arrived. Zhu calls her narrow viewed. He tells her to carefully observe his firefly sword and check if it is authentic. As the firefly sword begins to charge at Miss Lin, she wonders how could this be. She is unable to believe that it is indeed the real Firefly Sword and that its Firefly Flying River is at an extremely high level. The disciples observing the scene exclaim that Zhu's dragon seems to be stronger than Miss Lin. They are shocked to see that Zhu can use the Firefly Sword at such a high level, even though he learned it merely by looking at the carvings once. The Firefly Sword finally crashes and causes a massive explosion. Mo Yi had devoured all the ancient swords at the sword burial in the Miao Mountains. Because of this, it has now almost reached the high monarch level and can easily use the Firefly Sword. Zhu warns Miss Lin to be careful and exclaims that he is really going to use the sword Flash. As the smoke dissipates, Miss Lin says that she won't be afraid of a liar. However, she suddenly notices that her clothes have been torn to shreds. With a smug expression, Zhu asks if he can now sit wherever he wants. Miss Lin stares at him, speechless. Zhu suddenly asks her where is Consort Wen and says that he hasn't come here to challenge nobodies like her. Consort cries upon hearing the insult and thinks that he has gone way too far. Suddenly, Consort Wen appears out of nowhere and says that since Zhu is no longer a cultivator, there is no need for them to compete. Zhu is shocked to see that Consort Wen has now become the leader of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains. Consort Wen says that, in her mind, the only one worth competing with her is his master Zhu Xiuhen. Hearing this, 
Xu thinks that whether this is how it feels to be looked down upon. As far as Xu knows, there are three leaders of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains. One of the leaders is supposed to be traveling and the second one is his mother, who is cultivating at a far waterfall house in the mountains. The last one is Consort Wen, who is presiding the meeting over there. He realizes that, at this time, no powerful cultivators would be around the ancient lamp jade. Xu subtly tells Ling Sha to find a chance to distract everyone, so that he can steal the lamp jade. Fong says that since Consort Wen has arrived, should they begin exchanging views? Consort Wen agrees to his request. She says that she has heard that the sword sect in Yao Mountains is known for its 17 tricks of sword attacking. She asks Fong if he could demonstrate them to her. Fong responds that even though he is specializing in sword fighting, he does not know the tricks. He suggests that Zhu shall show them to her. Hearing this, Zhu spits out his drink, thinking that Fong screwed up his plan to steal the lamp jade. Dot he tries to get out of the situation, saying that he can't do it without his cultivation. Fong does not get the hint and tells him to just show some moves. It doesn't matter if they work or not. Consort when asks Fong how many tricks she knows. Fong responds that he has learned approximately 12 of them. Fong winks at Xu, thinking that he is so nice for giving Zhu a chance to showcase his skills. He thinks that since Wen looks down upon Zhu, he should show her something impressive. Hearing that Zhu knows 12 sword attacking tricks, the disciple starts swooning over him and exclaims that he is very powerful. Zhu nervously says that there is no point in doing some moves and they aren't any different than a sword dance. He calls Fong a fool in his head. Ling Sha suddenly stands up and declares that she will do it. Zhu sighs in relief, knowing that she is aware of his intentions. Consort Wen asks Ling Sha if she is a painter. Meiru reveals to the consort that Ling Sha once defeated Zhang He in a competition using the tricks of sword attacking. Upon hearing this revelation, Consort Wen says that they will see. She tells Ling Sha to go ahead and start with the tricks. Ling Sha takes her brush out and a bright purple energy surrounds her as the sky rumbles. As she shows them the first trick, the disciples are amazed by her power and exclaim that she is very good at it. Meanwhile, Zhu sneakily escapes the scene that he finally arrives at the location of the Lamp Jade. Zhu is unable to believe that he got there so easily. He notices that they don't seem to be taking any precautions and there isn't even a guard over there. He exclaims that God is helping him today that he summons Bai Chi who uses its magic of hiding things from the heavens and the earth. As they reach the top, Xu tries to replace the lamp jade. However, a bright purple light suddenly emerges, catching him off guard. As Xu watches the bright purple light rumble, he questions whether Ling Sha is so powerful and realizes that he needs to quickly head back before she is done. He tells Baichi to take them back and they begin to fly away. Ling Sha wipes the sweat off her forehead. The disciples of the sword sect in Yao Mountains clap for her and call her impressive. Suddenly, Zhu also starts clapping. He exclaims that the swordsmanship of the sword sect in Yao Mountains is indeed the best. Ling Sha huffs and thanks God that she made it. Consort when compliments Ling Sha, saying that she is indeed good. Zhu says that she used their swordsmanship. I and the Yao Mountain Sword Sect. Only a select few individuals have the ability to utilize more than 10 tricks. Fong is shocked to see that Ling Sha, as a painter, has managed to demonstrate 10 tricks after observing the formation for only a few days. He calls this incredible. Meanwhile, Zhang He thinks that both Ling Sha and Zhu are total monsters. Zhu comments that Ling Sha was only able to use 4 tricks the first time but now she can use 12 at a time. He says that it seems she won't have a problem reaching any divine realm. Ling Sha says that Xu has lost. Xu nervously asks what. He wonders whether it is about the challenge that who gets to the top first. He admits his defeat but clarifies that it was due to him accidentally entering the sword burial to devour the sword's spirits. Xu thinks that it isn't shameful to lose to Ling Sha, Besides, as her power grows, she will be a great help in future. The disciples declare that it is now their turn to showcase their sex swordsmanship. As the sun begins to set, Consort Wen tells Xu and the others that they have benefited a lot from their swordsmanship. 
She adds that they will send some of their disciples to learn from their sect and thanks them for coming to exchange views. Zhu says that it is getting dark and they know about their sex rule, so it is best for them to head down. Consort Wen responds that her sect has indeed been somewhat isolated these years. However, some things have changed ever since she became in charge. Zhu realizes that she is suggesting they stay tonight. He sweats nervously, thinking that he can't stay since he just stole the lamp jade. He feels that it would be better for him to run away now. A disciple argues that they never let anyone stay over. Consort Wen points out that it is getting dark and they must be tired after performing swordsmanship all day. She says that it is unreasonable to send them down the mountain now. Zhu thinks that Consort Wen is quite different compared to these straight-laced sword fairies. He decides to act the opposite. Zhu inappropriately says that it is great that she wants them to spend the night, since he has heard the girls over there are fragrant. He creepily says that the fragrance is still intoxicating, even if they sit quietly, and not to mention after bathing as well. He laughs in an evil manner that the greatest dream of his life is about to come true. The disciples immediately begin to protest. They call him a scumbag and a hooligan, saying that this must be his idea in the first place, and how can they let him stay? He must leave right this instant. Fong tries to clarify that the men of their country are extremely gentlemanly. He says that of course, they won't break the rule and tells Consort Wen that she is welcome as a get in his sect. Consort Wen responds that if most sword cultivators in his sect were like him, only in thought would they be much better than the proud sword fairies in her sect. Zhu stays in character and tells Fong that he doesn't need to pretend to be a gentleman anymore. He says that if Fong tells the others that he spent a night over there, they will envy him. He asks Consort Wen to keep persuading Fong and says that they'd really like to spend the night. Xiaoing tells him that even if that is what he really thinks, he shouldn't say it out loud and embarrass them. Xu asks why and says that the men from other faraway kingdoms have come here to pursue the beautiful girls they desire. Consort Wen finally becomes enraged and says that they will let the spirit birds they keep send them down the mountains. Fong says that they won't bother them anymore and bids them farewell. Suddenly, a disciple whispers something in Consort Wen's ear, prompting her to call out Zhu's name. As she tells him to stay, Zhu wonders whether they find out that the jade is missing so soon. He asks the consort if she has changed her mind. He says that it's great since he plans to exchange views with the girls into the night. Consort Wen ignores his dirty comments and tells him that Master Meng wants to see him. Xu is taken aback to hear this, he wonders whether his mom has finally remembered him. Meng Bingxi, Xu's mother and the leader of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains is seen beside her adopted daughter, Meng Hanwu. Bingxi asks him why he stole the lamp jade. Xu realizes that his mom has noticed the disappearance of the jade. He informs her that he took it to save someone. Bingxi surprises him by saying that he can keep it. However, she says that he has to do something for her in return. Xu asks what is it. Bingxi reveals that she needs him to pursue Princess Lul Shui and become her husband. Zhu is shocked to hear this. He cannot fathom why he would do an arranged marriage when he has such a handsome face. Zhu grabs his mom's hand and tells her that the one he is going to save is actually his wife and Bingxi's daughter-in-law. His mom responds that she just wants him to be her husband and she doesn't care about him staying with her. Xu thinks that marrying someone and running away sounds like something his mom would do. He tells her that he does not think that it is a good idea and calls it unethical. Bingxi sweats his hand away, saying that he can cultivate for 10 years as his punishment and she will be watching him. Xu thinks that his mom is so heartless, it is no wonder his dad failed to handle her. He peeks at the window, thinking that he should just escape since he already got the jade dot he says bye to his mom as he jumps out of the window. However, she shocks him by creating a sword made of water. Shu gasps in amazement at the high level his mom has reached. He realizes that he can't escape. He goes back inside and nervously tells Bingxi that he is back. Bingxi sips her drink and says if he becomes the princess's husband, the jade will belong to him and they will let it slide. Shu asks if he can run away after he becomes her nominal husband. Bingxi says sure and Zhu decides to accept her decision. 
His mom adds that she will tell him about the location of another jade lamp after the marriage. Hearing this, Xu excitedly says that it is a deal that he thinks that his mom always leads a secluded life. So why did she pay so much attention to Princess Luo Shui? He wonders if there is anything special about her. Bingxi tells Hanwu to send Zhu down the mountain and Hanwu says OK.AT the capital of the Miao kingdom. Zhu sees that Hanwu keeps following him around. He asks her why is she not going back. Hanwu says that she will keep a watch on him. They are a family after all. She asks if he doesn't trust her. Xu tells a woman that he wants to rent a room and the woman says sure. Xinghua says that Zhu is back. While Yusuo asks him why he looks so unhappy. Xu tells them that his mom wants him to be Princess Luoshui's husband, but he can become one in name only. If he succeeds, she will not only let what he did slide but also tell him the location of another lamp jade. Yusuo says isn't that a good thing? Xu says that they need at least four jades to cure Yunzi. He asks Xinghua if the jade is working. Xinghua responds that it is very effective. Yunzi seems to be recovering and her cultivation seems to have greatly improved. She says that maybe this is the reason why grandmother asked them to look for the jade. Chu says that he will go to the princess's mansion tomorrow, but they will have to back him up. He says that he is only going there for the lamp jade, not to marry Princess Luo Shui. Yusuo tells him that he must give his best shot since the girls there are quite hard to please that he tells Yusuo not to worry and boasts that no matter how excellent other men are, they won't be better than him. He confidently says that he is the most eye-catching man, like every maiden's fantasy. He says that she should control herself, and tells her not to fall for him. After all, they will be seeing each other often, and he will feel sorry to turn her down. Yusu exclaims that she has never seen a man as impudent as him. She says if he even dared to look at her one more time, she will gouge his eyes out. Xu playfully says that he just mises Yunzi when he sees Yusuo. Hearing this, Yusuo calls him a bastard and tries to punch him. As Xinghua observes all this, she realizes that she has seen this happening before. She feels that a certain prophecy is going to come true and it is out of her control. She wonders whether it is going to be a good or a bad thing. At the princess's mansion, the host requests the gentlemen to stay calm and thanks them for coming there today. She instructs them to hand in their visiting cards one by one before entering. Suddenly, Zhu appears on Qingzhua and tells the men to get out of his way. Seeing this, a blue-haired woman asks where he is from. She is furious by his audacity to assume an air of superiority over there. She wonders if Xu isn't aware that Princess Luo Shui hates this kind of person the most. Another woman beside her says that she heard that Chu belongs to the capital. However, she says that it doesn't matter, every man who comes to their kingdom should be in awe of the princess. Chu introduces himself and announces that he has come to visit. A man angrily asks Chu if he does not know the rules. He exclaims that he and his master Su Gongshan arrived first and tells Chu to get in line. Chu turns around and asks who even is Su Gongshan. He tells Hanwu to throw out the guy and his guard out of the mansion. Hanwu stares dagger at him, thinking that Zhu sees her as his guard. Zhu whispers to her that he is trying hard to win. He asks her to help him out and says that if they screw this up, how will she explain it to mom? Hanwu takes her sword out and attacks the two men. A man recognizes Hanwu as a cultivator of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains. He wonders why she is helping a man from the Zhu clan. Another man beside him compliments her cultivating skills. He feels pity for Gongshan since he was kicked out before he could even enter. Xu asks the men in a threatening manner whether any of them are going to stop him. As the men remain silent, Xu begins to enter the mansion. He tells Hanwu to wait for him and commands her to kick out the contestants who enter after him. The blue-haired woman stops Xu in his tracks as she says that Princess Lu Shui won't be pleased by his behavior. Zhu asks if she is the princess. As the blue-haired woman says of course not, he asks then why is she telling him what to do. He says that wouldn't the princess want some peace and quiet. He will make this place less crowded for her. He says that if there is someone who can defeat his guard, they can enter inside and compete with him. 
The blue-haired woman says that she will talk to her highness and tells the others to help him take his seat. She thinks that Zhu is an idiot from the capital. He pushes people far with his noble status and will be in great trouble when the princess arrives. I in the competition hall. A woman reveals that her highness likes poems, so they can write poems to impress her while they wait. Chu thinks that the princess is trying to test how literary they are to eliminate some rich but illiterate clouds. He thinks that even though he isn't good at writing poems, he can still write one. He notices a man writing beside him. He thinks even though all of them got white paper and black ink, the things the man wrote look imposing. It looks like something that has a special power. He wonders if it is some kind of divine power. He turns around to look at the man on his left and notices that even his guard is a powerful dragon tamer. He feels that this man's power is unfathomable and decides to check him out. He greets the man and says that he does not look very young. So why is he here to compete with the young people for the princess? The man responds that he doesn't feel proud, but he has been busy with state affairs and hasn't married yet. He says that now he has increased the security in his kingdom and heard about the competition in the Miao kingdom, so he wants to give it a try. Xu introduces himself and asks if he can know the man's name. The man introduces himself as Tu Wenhe from the Tu Kingdom. Xu says that he hasn't heard about his kingdom. Tu Wenhe responds that it is normal for him to not hear about it since he just changed its name. He says that his scholarship is superficial, so he decided to simply name it after him. Xu acts calm while feeling shocked inside. He thinks the man is incredibly relentless and believes him to be the conqueror among the dragon tamers. It is said that there are some top teams of dragon tamers in the Jiting Imperial Kingdom. These top teams travel from country to country, attacking cities and occupying territories. They plan a coup and take a whole country as their own. The usurper becomes the emperor and some conquerors bring order to the occupied countries. However, some leave after obtaining all the resources and leave the countries to fail. He thinks that it is no wonder that even Tu Wayne's guard gives people an overwhelming feeling. He thinks that even the conqueror came to pursue the princess and wonders whether it is really so competitive. Suddenly, a man named Yen Yuan from the Punch Clan appears. He angrily asks who is the one from the Zhu Clan. Zhu responds that he belongs to the Zhu Clan. Yuan begins to enter the mansion, saying that he should get himself a powerful guard to watch the door next time. However, Hanwu appears behind Yuan and demands that he leaves the mansion. She declares that they are due for another fight. Xu realizes that Yuan was able to defeat Hanwu. He thinks that Yuan is indeed powerful and the competition is getting fiercer. Xu tells Hanwu to let him in since he is powerful. Hearing this, Hanwu angrily shouts that it is none of his business. Yuan says that Hanwu still isn't good at swordsmanship, so she should go back to the mountains and cultivate for a few more years. However, he changes his mind and suggests that she cease practicing altogether, as she's already become cold and unwomanly. He fears that she won't be humane in a few years. Chu suppresses his laughter, thinking that Yuan's words make sense. Hanwu becomes enraged and steps forward to punch Yuan. However, Zhu stops her and points out that although she thinks of Yuan as a rival, he doesn't even acknowledge her as a person. He says what's the point of her still being entangled with him. Hanwu realizes that Zhu is right and decides that they should just ignore him. Yuan introduces himself and proposes to Zhu that if he writes a poem for him, he will overlook the fact that Zhu had a guard attempt to stop him at the door. Zhu is surprised to learn that they can do that, and wonders what is the point of the competition then. As Zhu begins to write, he jokes that the guy from the Punch Clan can only punch but not write. Yuan menacingly asks whether he will do it or not. Zhu finishes writing and shows him the paper with fuck off written on it. Yuan shouts that he will kill him, while Zhu casually says that turns out he can read. The blue-haired woman tells them to remain silent. She says that no fighting will be tolerated in the princess's mansion. She takes away Yuan's paper, saying that it is time to hand it in point two hours later. The blue-haired woman says that she will now announce who can stay and meet with the princess, while others can go back and wait for the final chance to be the first. As she announces the results, Zhu feels relieved that the conqueror didn't get in. 
but he believes that the urban man probably got in due to his excellent writing. The blue-haired woman announces that Ju can stay. Ju thinks that he only wrote doggerel and was chosen. He wonders what is going on. The blue-haired woman announces that the princess is coming and requests the gentleman to wait silently. She slides open the divider, revealing Princess Lil Shui who is pouring tea. The blue-haired woman presents everyone with tea and the princess requests them to have it. The princess compliments Zhu, saying that both his swordsmanship and his writing are good. Zhu questions if she is talking about him. He asks how she knows that he can use a sword. The princess reveals that she saw him at the pavilion in the Miao Mountains. She repeats Zhu's phrase that the weak are humble and the strong are respected and says that it was impressive. Zhu is shocked to learn that she was present that day. Princess Lu Shui says that the sects in Yao Mountains and Miao Mountains rarely exchange views so she couldn't miss it. The princess points out that he has such a stunning woman around him, so why did he come to her small mansion? Zhu believes that she's most likely referring to Lin Xia. He feels that he is in big trouble and is being seen as a player. He knows that the women in the Miao Kingdom will never allow men to have multiple partners and such jerks will be spitted on. He nervously clarifies that Her Highness has misunderstood. Lin Xia is just a painter and a divine mortal of his team. He informs the princess that he isn't in a relationship with Lin Xia. The princess remembers that several female city lords told her that they were obsessed with the painter. She says that Ling Sha must have a particularly beautiful face under her veil. She asks Zhu if he never fell for her, despite traveling with her. Zhu says that why would he come to the mansion if he indeed fell for Ling Sha? Hearing this, the princess believes him and says that he does have a point. She informs Zhu that she will see him on the day of coming out on top and dismisses everyone. Zhu questions what is the day of coming out on top. The princess explains that it is also called the day of buying a son-in-law. All men competing to be the son-in-law go up on the stage and the man will belong to the girl who offers to pay the most. Zhu says that isn't it just like selling men. Hanwu says that he can also opt out of it. Zhu says that he can't do that. He says that he made a promise to his mom and claims to be an honest man.at the stage in front of the palace. It is announced that the flower gathering festival officially begins today. Yao Yao, the hostess tells the girls to cheer for the ideal son-in-laws to come on the stage and show their charm. As the girls immediately start cheering, the hostess tells them to welcome the high-profile son-in-law, Zhu Minglang, to the stage. As Zhu steps onto the stage, he notices that there are a lot of people present. Nian Nian jokes that Zhu will get a good price and tells him to relax. Suddenly, a woman in a red dress says that she will buy Zhu. Another woman beside her in a white dress says that girls just have eyes for young guys like Zhu, while she only has eyes for easygoing and sophisticated. She really wants to win her and does not want anyone to compete with her when he's on the stage. Another woman bids on Zhu saying that she will buy him with a city that can produce thousands of jars of honey, which generates at least 100,000 golden grits every year. She says that Zhu is her beloved and requests the ladies to let her win. The Martianist says that she is being stingy. She offers a red diamond mine to buy Zhu and reveals that it is worth 500,000 golden grits. The woman in the red dress says that Zhu visited the Dragon Lady Palace first. She questions who will be able to compete with the Hua family, and says that no matter who makes an offer, she will bid 200,000 golden grits more. As they continue to bid, Xu thinks that it is very easy for men to get rich in the Miao kingdom if they drop their useless moral integrity. Suddenly, Princess Liu Shui shows them a moonstone. She reveals that a bishop of the court wanted to buy it for 3 million golden grits half a year ago, but she didn't sell it. She wonders if Xu is interested in it. Zhu feels the moonstone is a good thing. It is not only versatile but can also improve the level of Bai Qi's mystic arts and bloodline. A woman says that the princess has made an offer. She didn't expect that Princess Liu Shui would prefer an arrogant man like Zhu. Another woman beside her wonders whether she also saw the force he has in the capital and wants to have closer ties with them. Yu Su excitedly tells Xinghua that the princess is on the hook. She says that there is hope that they can get the second lamp jade. But Zhu will boast about this for a long time. As Xinghua remains silent, 
Yusua calls out her name. She realizes that something is wrong. The woman in the red dress requests her highness not to hate her for what she is about to say. She says that Ju is powerful in the capital and is Master Meng's son. They must let him marry into the Hua family. Suddenly, Yunzi speaks up, bidding five million. Ju breaks into a sweat, realizing that the divine lamp jade has awakened Yunzi. Yunzi demands to know why is Ju on the stage. The woman in the dress wonders whether she is crazy. She acknowledges that while Zhu is brilliant, he isn't worth spending five million golden grits. The princess and Yunzi stare at each other in silence. Princess Lul Shui remembers Zhu saying that he isn't in a relationship. She wonders why Yunzi bid five million then. The princess counter offers 5.5 million golden grits. As Yunzi begins to offer 7 million, she suddenly starts to lose consciousness. Zhu feels concerned for Yunzi. Yusua reassures Yunzi that Zhu is only doing this to obtain the lamp jade to save her. The hostess asks if anyone is willing to bid more than 5.5 million. Yunzi says that she is okay now. Yusua feels relieved that Yunzi's actions aroused the princess's competitiveness, or there might have gone wrong. The hostess congratulates Zhu for being sold for 5.5 million golden grits and becoming the princess's husband. She reveals that this bid has broken the record in the history of their country. She hopes that he can reach a new high next time. Zhu thinks that there won't be a next time unless Yunzi is the highest bidder. He is determined to find all the lamp jades as quickly as he can and save Yunzi's life. Zhu asks the princess if it is true that no one has seen her face. Princess Lul Shui asks whether he wants to see it. She pulls him close and tells him to take off her mask. Zhu thinks that after taking the mask off, he will knock her out with his apologetic smile and leave with Ling Sha and Yusuo. He finally takes her mask off and laughs that he has got the lamp jade. However, he is left shocked to see her. Meanwhile, Feng tells Yusuo and Xinghua not to worry. He says that something tricky must have happened to Xu. Yusuo scoffs that the princess must be very beautiful and sexy, so it must be hard for him to leave her bed. She says that it is near dawn and suggests that they head back to have some rest. She suggests that Yusuo can prepare some soup tomorrow morning and send it to Zhu since he would be exhausted after the night. Feng tells them to wait for a while, claiming that Zhu would never turn his back on them. Yusuo angrily says that they have no relation with Zhu. No matter what he does with the princess is none of their business. She exclaims that they can also look for the ancient divine lamp jade. Zhu is shocked to see Consort Wen. Consort Wen says that it seems his mother did not tell him about this. Zhu wonders how could he ever knock out a woman like Consort Wen. He remains in denial, thinking that his mom won't screw him up like this. Consort Wen must have hidden the real princess. Zhu says that he didn't expect her to be so vicious. He asks why, as the master of the sword sect in the Miao Mountains, she is looking to become a princess in a mortal kingdom and where did she hide the princess? Consort Wen retorts, saying that if he can give up the sword cultivation to tame dragons, then why can't she stop being the princess and focus on sword cultivation? Zhu nervously says that a bad custom like an arranged marriage is something that open-minded young people should resist. He says that he will give her the money back and they can forget that this ever happened. Consort Wen says that this isn't a game. She asks whether he cares for Ling Sha or the girl who raised the price. Zhu thinks that it is no wonder his mom didn't mind him running away, cause how would he even be able to run? Zhu tells the consort that they are not right for each other. Besides, she has never considered him to be her equal. It would be painful for her to spend a lifetime with a mediocre man like him. Consort Wen says that as a woman, she is supposed to be better than him. Zhu curses, thinking that he forgot she is the princess of the Miao Kingdom. He wonders what is all this for. He feels that both his parents are perfect for each other to screw their son. He sulks in a corner, thinking that he can't run away. Consort Wen asks if he is alright. Zhu sighs and thinks that it is time to be honest with her. He puts his hand against the wall and says that if this is the case, he also needs to tell her something. He reveals that he never thought of becoming her husband. 
He only did this to obtain the lamp jade on her mast to save his beloved and didn't expect that Consort One would be the princess. Consort One asks if she is not good as his beloved. She says that the princess can inherit the throne in the Miao kingdom and her country is much richer and more powerful than those small kingdoms. Also, their kinship is powerful in the capital. Besides, she is the master of the sword sect in the Miao mountains. She exclaims that no one is comparable to her in this world except for Zhu Xiuhan. She adds that he has also seen her face and the woman he likes is only a few years younger than her. She says that she doesn't think she is any less beautiful than her. Xu says that she can have better choices and excuses himself. As he begins to leave, the consort stops him. Xu says that they don't have any feelings for each other, so why do they even need to be together? He thanks her for the lamp jade, saying that he owes her a favor. He says that he will help her when she is in need one day. Consort Wen asks how many people sincerely love each other. She says that she never expected to develop feelings for a man. She only hopes that they won't hate each other, and it is okay to develop feelings later on. She mentions that he used to be a sword cultivator. He once got to the top and stood the world on its head. She questions how many women would he appreciate then. Zhu nervously says that she should get out more, and she will find a good husband in the end. Consort Wen says what if she persists in choosing him. Xu says that he can only apologize to her since someone else resides in his heart. The consort reminds him that he is already her rightful husband. Xu asks whether he looks like a conformist. Hearing this, consort Wen also asks whether she looks like a woman who would give her husband to others. She threatens him that Ling Xia won't be able to leave the Miao kingdom alive if he steps out of the palace. Xu asks if she is serious. Consort Wen says that if she still has to concede to others after giving up her rich life, royal power, and cultivation of 20 years, then what would be the point of everything she did? Zhu begins to summon his sword or a dragon and says that he agrees with her to some extent. However, she is wrong about one thing. The consort replies that they just have different ideas, there is no right or wrong. Zhu reminds her that she said that no one in this world is comparable to her except for Zhu Xuan. He grabs his sword and the fire burns his sleeve. He awakens the fire mark sword and tells her to take it then. The consort wonders what is that and leaps into the air. Zhu unleashes the sword attacking the 15th sword and reveals the vermilion bird sword. Consort Wen stares at the vermilion bird as it screeches at her. The maids and the guards stare at the fire in shock as the place rumbles. The consort realizes that although she can survive the attack, the palace below would disappear instantly, and all the nobles, guards, and maids would perish. She thinks that Zhu is indeed a vicious man. Zhu disperses the swords and fire begins to ring. Zhu warns her not to threaten him with the love of his life, or her palace, her sword sect, and she herself will be crushed to dust by him. Consort Wen says that he can run away, but he can never escape their fate. Shortly afterwards, Feng says that Zhu is always a legend in their sect, no matter whether it is about love or sword cultivation. Zhu bids him farewell and tells him to send his best wishes to the Grand Master. Feng waves him goodbye and wishes for him to have a baby soon. As the leaves beneath their feet rustle, Zhu suddenly notices someone. He realizes that it is his mom. Zhu asks if she is taking him back to marry Consort Wen. Bingxi noticing Xinghua and Yusuo says that the girls are good but Consort Wen is better. Xu says that his dad is also better and she can get back together with him. Hearing this, his mother stares daggers at him silently. She reveals that she came here to tell him the location of the jade. However, since he likes to talk excessively, he can find it himself. Xu immediately grabs her and admits that he is wrong. Bingxi informs him that a place called the Rain City is in the direction of Nihai and the city's seal is made of the lamp jade. Zhu remembers that he has the title deed of Rain City. As long as he hands the deed to the city's king, he will become the city lord. Bingxi throws the moonstone at him and says that she gave this to consort Wen when she became the master. Zhu realizes that his mom still worries about him and knows that it is hard for him to keep dragons. He thinks that with the Moonstone, Baichi will be able to improve further. 
His mother says that if the painter is able to defeat Consort within two years, she will personally go to the palace and get him out of his marriage. However, if she is unable to do so, Consort One will remain his nominal wife. Zhu says that she misunderstood and clarifies that the painter is Lin Sha. She responds that she will do it if either of the two women is able to defeat the consort and leaves. Zhu accepts her offer and thinks who makes a promise so casually. At the end, Nian Nian waves at him to grab his attention. Zhu says that didn't Hao Yi come with her? He asks where Hao Yi is. Nian Nian responds that Feng told them that Zhu would go to the rain city, so Hao Yi went to collect information about it. Zhu suggests they get in the carriage first. He informs them that he has something to deal with and will be back soon. Xinghua says okay, while Yusuo asks him if he is going to meet a girl. Zhu asks whether he looks like that kind of person and the three of them immediately say yes. Hao Yi from the sword sect in the Yao Mountains asks Nian Nian if Xu and the others are there. Nian Nian says that they are in the carriage. Xinghua asks who he is. Hao Yi addresses her as Miss Nan and introduces himself. Xinghua clarifies that she isn't Miss Nan but Miss Li. Hao Yi remembers that he heard Zhu had a powerful painter whose last name was Nan. Miss Nan even defeated Miao Zhu. He wonders why Xinghua said her last name is Li, and if Xu has more than one girl whose last name is Nan. He believes Xu has a lot of charm and it is no wonder that Princess Lu Shui likes him. Hao Yi asks her where Zhu is. He reveals that he heard from some traders that the situation in Rain City is a bit complicated and he needs to discuss it with Zhu. Xinghua points in a direction and informs him that Zhu went over there. Zhu is seen sitting on the grass. He realizes that he was so immersed in enjoying the view that he almost didn't notice that Haya is about to advance. He looks at a sleeping Haya inside the spirit domain. As Haya finishes advancing, Zhu wakes him up. Haya observes himself in shock and wonders what happened to him. Xu playfully calls Haya an idiot and informs him that he has advanced. Haya growls, saying that it seems he can grow more powerful while sleeping. Xu responds that the spiritual domain may have worked. He suggests Haya finds a way to awaken the inscription on the molten heavy armor after stabilizing his cultivation. By doing so, he can even fend off the attack of a dragon at the monarch level. He adds that the next time, it will be time to use the Moonstone to restore Baichi's bloodline. He exits the spirit domain and asks Mr. Koi why they had to come to the top of the mountain. Mr. Koi responds that only on a sunny day like this, they can stimulate Baichi's Moonstone so that she can restore his bloodline. However, he reveals that while restoring, Baichi won't be able to use her bloodline and will most likely be at the low level monarch. Zhu questions how much will Baichi improve after restoring her bloodline. Mr. Koi says that after restoring and with the dragon armor Zhu has made for Baichi, she will be strong among the dragons who are at the high monarch level. Hearing this, Zhu says that he will help Baichi absorb the Qi and asks Mo Yi and Mr. Koi to guard him. Mr. Koi tells him not to worry and boasts that he was the first ancestor of all dragons. He became so powerful that he transformed into a fish which is the earliest form of a dragon. Zhu closes his eyes as he enters the spirit domain again. However, suddenly Hao Yi appears and calls out Zhu's name. Mr. Koi asks Hao Yi who he is. Hao Yi wonders whether the fish is also a dragon of Zhu. He introduces himself as a traveling cultivator from the sword sect in the Yao Mountains. He says that Wu Feng asked him to escort them out of the kingdom. Mr. Koi is surprised to hear that he is from the sword sect in Yao Mountains. He tells Hao Yi that he has a question for him. Hao Yi tells him to go ahead. The fish asks what his sect feeds its members and says that all of them look really grown. Hao Yi says that perhaps he is the only one who looks old. The dementia fish forgets Hao Yi and asks him again who he is. Hao Yi thinks that hasn't he just introduced himself to the fish but introduces himself again anyway. Mr. Koi again says that he has a question for him, leaving Hao Yi at a loss of words. Shortly afterwards, Hao Yi arrives back at the inn. He sighs in relief that he finally got rid of Zhu's dementia fish. He suddenly notices Yusuo, addressing her as Miss Li. He tells her that Zhu is cultivating so it wouldn't be okay to disturb him. Yusuo asks him who he is. Hearing this, 
How Yi thinks that hasn't he already introduced himself. He thinks that even if he isn't as outstanding as you, it doesn't mean he is so ordinary as to make no impression on others. He clenches his fist, thinking that he can't be discouraged. He reassures himself that he is perfectly capable and excellent. He introduces himself again and informs her that Fong asked him to show Zhu and Miss Li the way. Yu Su clarifies that she is Miss Nan and Miss Li is actually inside the carriage. Xing Hua removes the curtain, revealing herself. She asks Hao Yi what's happening. Hao Yi finally realizes that they are twins and thinks that Zhu is such a field-playing juggler. Hao Yi informs them about the complicated situation in the Rain City. He informs them that the city is the meeting point of four kingdoms and it is in the center of a battlefield. He says that it is possible that the flag of a kingdom hangs above the gate in the morning and the city becomes the domain of another kingdom in the evening. Xinghua asks if it is dangerous. Hao Yi says that there is a path strictly guarded by soldiers after they pass the inn. He fears that, at that time, Zhu and the ladies will have to hide in the carriage. Yu Suo and Xinghua acknowledge the information. Shortly afterwards, they arrive at the Rain City. Zhu says that this is the appointment of the Han Kingdom and the title of the deed. He tells the guard that he was already offered the post of the city lord of the Rain City. The guard tells him to go away and informs Xu that the Rain City now belongs to the two kingdom. He says that Xu must show him the appointment of their new king. Xu comments that this city belonged to the Han Kingdom just two days ago. He says that they went there to ask for an appointment, and the city suddenly has a new owner within just two days. Hao Yi asks Zhu what should they do now, he says that it is hard to get into the Rain City. Zhu responds that he doesn't know either. Now, the city seal is in the hands of the Divine Mortal Academy on this land, but they have a rule that the seal will only be given to the ruler who has ruled the city for more than a month. Zhu realizes that if he can't be the city lord, he can only look for the seal in the Divine Mortal Academy. However, he doesn't know exactly where it is. He sighs, thinking that he can't just turn the academy upside down. Xu says that they should enter the city and have some rest first, he will think of something else. Inside the rain city, Xu says that they could only find this shabby courtyard as shelter. He says that it seems they need to make a fire and cook their meals themselves. Hao Yi calls the courtyard a desolate place and says that it would have become a ghost town if it hadn't been for its strategic location and the caravans. Xu says that just because of the courtyard's strategic location, many forces contested with each other to obtain the city and destroyed it in the end. It is also the reason why no one wanted to buy its title deed. As they cook food on the fire, Xu asks Hao Yi if they give the title deed directly to the Divine Mortal Academy. Will they get the city seal rightfully? Hao Yi responds that the other forces stationed in the city might not agree. They don't want a city lord either. Xu says that they are a bunch of parasites, and she will kick them out of here when she gets the chance. Suddenly, a woman named Hu Bailing appears with some men. She angrily calls Xu and the others bums and asks where they think they are. She immediately demands that they get the hell out of the courtyard. The group looks at them in awkward silence. A man named Hu Chongming apologizes, saying that they didn't mean to chase them out, but this house used to be their residence, and was deserted because of the war. He informs them that they now plan on restoring it. Nian Nian says that they didn't see anyone since they arrived at the courtyard. However, she says that Hu Chongming's group showed up very conveniently just after they got done cleaning up the place. Hu Bailing throws a bag on the ground. She says that this is the money for their hard work. She tells them to take it and get the fuck out. An offended Nian Nian asks who wants their money. She reveals that they have the title deed of the city, and says they own every inch of it. She exclaims that they are the ones who should get out. Bailing and Chongming are shocked to hear about the title deed. Bailing says that they have must be kidding. She exclaims that the deed was sold a long time ago, and demands they stop lying. Xu says that they are from the capital and they indeed have the title deed. He asks whether they are the citizens of the city and if this house is theirs. Chongming says that this city was built by his father's generation. His father eradicated a decedent dragon that settled in the city for many years. He also built the first watchtower with the army and the battle was sensational in ten kingdoms. 
Hao Yi says that he heard the Rain City was first founded by a man whose family name was Hu. He asks whether they are his clansmen. H. Yi Chongming says yes and introduces himself and Bailing as his sister. He says that they were supposed to be the successors of the city. But due to many reasons, his father's generation was forced to sell the city to the Divine Mortal Academy. He says that the Academy should have the title deed and asks why is it in their hands. He asks if he can see it to check if it is real, claiming that his father's signature should be on it. Xu says that it is no problem and shows him the deed. Bailing says that it is indeed her father's signature and their handprints are on it. Chongming says that there is also a seal of the capital. He can't believe that they were actually sent by the Imperial Kingdom. Nian Nian makes a face at them, saying that she told them that they are the ones who need to get out. Xu says that there are a lot of old houses next to this courtyard. He advises that they live there after cleaning them up if they don't mind. Chongming hands the deed back to Xu and says that the title deed doesn't matter much now. He warns Xu that this place is far more dangerous than he thinks and says that he will die as the city lord even if he has a team of guards. Furthermore, he says that Xu only has a few people with him. Xu asks him to get straight to the point. Chongming suggests that Xu sell him the deed. He says that his father's generation was silly to sell the city back then and that was the reason why it was trampled by many kingdoms. He reveals that he and Bailing have been recruiting men for years to regain control of the city and rebuild it. Nian Nian asks whether they plan to capture the city by fighting with just one or two hundred men. Chongming says that they are elites, they have high provisions and good plans. Their plan consists of gaining a foothold in the city first, and then slowly driving out the evil forces. Xu asks him how they plan to get the city seal back. Chongming says that of course he is going to take it back after becoming the city lord. As long as he can defend the city for a month without any outbreaks, he can rightfully ask the Divine Mortal Academy for it. Chu thinks that since these people can find the city seal, he can cooperate with them since he is not interested in becoming the city lord anyway. Chu says that they won't sell the title deed, however, he offers to exchange it for the city seal. Chongming responds that the city seal is just a status symbol and asks Chu if he could hand over the deed first. With the deed, they might rebuild the city and recruits more men quickly. Xu says that they need it for use. He says that it won't take long with their help. He reveals that he is a dragon tamer, and while pointing behind, he says that they are all a part of his team. Chongming says but there are only five of them. Xu exclaims that there are seven of them. He changes the subject, saying that he has the deed and is the rightful city lord. He says that the Hu clan was the builder of this city, and since Chongming wants to take everything back, why don't they cooperate with each other and kick the evil forces out? Chongming thinks for a moment, and says that as long as Zhu can drive out the villains dominating the Rain City or the decadent dragons, he is willing to cooperate with him. They shake hands on this and Zhu hopes that together they can work well. As night arrives, the meat sizzles as they barbecue it. Xu tells everyone to enjoy themselves as they eat. Xu asks why is he depressed and whether he is still worried about the rain city. Bailing says yes. She says that the city is very chaotic and even the bandits dared to seize the territory brazenly. Chongming adds that half of the money taken by them was given to the armies of those kingdoms, and the armies became stronger. Thus, the situation in rain city was getting worse and worse. Hearing this, Zhu responds that he isn't very good at it in this respect, and he doesn't know how to handle it either. As he begins to suggest something, he stops, wishing that Jing Yu were there. Jing Yu was the one who found a shortcut that led to the capital of the Rui Kingdom with an army silently. This was the reason Yunzi was able to win the great victory back then. However, Xing Yu is now back in the capital of Lichuan. Suddenly, Yunzi speaks up, saying that they can order to eradicate all the armed forces that should be treated as rebels in the city, except for the Hu army. Xu recognizes the shift in tone and realizes that it is Yunzi. Yunzi continues that after giving the order, they can kill all the bandits seizing places in the Rain City. After this, they can follow up on the clue to get rid of the Dark Warlords, creating the illusion of killing all rebels. By doing so, the armed forces that don't want to mess with them will leave. Chongming and Bailing exclaim it is a good idea. 
Xu puts his hands around Yunzi's shoulders and calls her darling. He exclaims that she is awake and asks how she is feeling. Yunzi says that she is okay, just a little tired. Meanwhile, Chong Ming and Bei Ling look at them in shock. Xu suggests that she takes some rest, and Yunzi agrees with him. Chong Ming wonders whether she is his wife and why he didn't mention it just now. The next morning, Zhu says that he hasn't been out for a while. He says that although this place is desolate, there will be beautiful scenery after it is rebuilt, and it would be nice to make it a part of the Lichuan Kingdom. Zhu tells her to take it as an expedition mark. He hands her a map while telling her to mark the places she would like to go to. He says that he will accompany her. Yunzi ponders for a second and marks the Miao Kingdom on the map. Seeing this, Xu thinks that it seems Yunzi is still not fine with him striving to be the princess's husband. He apologizes to Yunzi for becoming someone else's husband. Yunzi responds that things change and always make people helpless. She says that she doesn't like this kind of feeling. Yunzi says that she doesn't care at all. Hearing this, Xu wonders why she doesn't care about it. Yunzi says that this happened due to her being too weak. Xu calls out her name in concern. Yunzi thinks if she becomes strong enough, she won't get hurt in the battle with the Rui Kingdom, and they won't be worried about him. Furthermore, she won't let Xu become the husband of the Miao Kingdom's princess. Xu says that he knows she doesn't like to fail and doesn't want the ones she cares about to make any sacrifices. He says that whatever happens next, he will be there for her. Yunzi responds that things always change. She nearly died for just a small kingdom like the Rei Kingdom. She says that in the future, she can't let up before understanding how the world is formed. Xu calls her darling as he touches her hand. He tells her not to think about the future and says that it is the present that matters. Yunzi snaps at him for calling her darling. She says that he married someone else and taunts him to call the princess darling. Zhu grabs Yunzi's hand and embraces her, saying that he doesn't care and she is his wife. He realizes that Yunzi still cares about him getting married to the princess. He again tells her to stop worrying about the future. He asks whether she likes the rain city. If it is so, they will take it. Yunzi says that they shall see what Hu Beiling and Hu Chongming are capable of. If they fail to defend the city, they will obtain the city seal and leave this place. Zhu agrees with her and thinks that she is so ambitious, so he must work harder. He remembers that he has so many dragons and girls to feed now. He really needs to work together with Yunzi. Xu walks around the rain city to check it out while Yunzi is napping. Although the city is very chaotic, it is quite small. The mercenaries, guards, armies, hunters, and merchants all depend on each other for their livelihood. Xu looks at a board surrounded by many people. He decides to see what bounties are there first thinking that perhaps he could make some money. He looks at the missions, one of them being to collect dragon claws to make weapons, while another says that the renegade dragon tamer is wanted. He suddenly notices an image of himself and sees that there is a bounty on his head. He thinks that the portrait and him are very much alike. He can't believe that they were able to draw his masculine face so unreservedly, and thinks that he will likely be recognized right away. He wonders what is wrong with consort when thinking that wouldn't she be embarrassed to offer a bounty on his runaway husband's head. Suddenly, some people from the crowd begin to recognize Xu. A bald man says that Xu looks familiar and asks if he is the princess's husband. Another man says it is indeed him. He says that Xu ran away after becoming her husband and exclaims that it is unforgivable. Meanwhile, a man in a purple robe reveals that the bounty is of three million golden grits. He tells everyone to get out of his way and says that he will catch Xu alive. Hearing this, Xu thinks that it is ridiculous that consort when bid 2,750,000 million, but the bounty is for 3 million. He tells everyone to calm down and says that he has a bounty of 3 million on his head because he is a dangerous person. He suggests that they quit. The men call him arrogant. They reveal that they are professional mercenaries and bounty hunters and exclaim how dare he threaten them. Someone from the crowd says that they can take him down together and split the bounty. Zhu says that they won't give up so easily unless they face death. He summons Haya from the spirit domain and tells them to taste the wrath of his thunderstorm black dragon that has reached the level of the dragon lord. 
Haya strikes them with his hand, sending the men flying in the air. Another group of people begin to charge at Xu as they tell each other to kill him. Xu summons Qinghua and Mo Yi and commands them to fight. Meanwhile, Nian Nian notices Qinghua in the sky and realizes that it is Xu. As Yunzi comes out, Hao Yi calls out for her and says that Marshal Uncle asked him to tell her if she wakes up that he went to check out the city. Yunzi asks her who is his Marshal Uncle and who he is. Hearing this, Hao Yi lets go of his sword. He thinks that it has been a whole month since he has been with them. Why don't they remember him? Is he that invisible? Nian Nian informs them that something terrible is happening. She says that Zhu Ming Lang got in a fight with a group of giant guys at the city's market. Hao Yi says while crying that they'll go and check it out. Yunzi steps on a flying sword. Seeing this, Hao Yi thinks she looks so vulnerable but she is very powerful. Back in the market, Zhu sits on top of the defeated men. He says that he would like to inform them that he is the new city lord from today onwards. He warns that if they wish to make a living in the city, they better behave themselves or he is going to be rude. Yunzi appears on her flying sword and the crowd exclaims that a powerful woman is coming. They say that they shall see if Xu is still arrogant. A man from the crowd offers to share the bounty with her if she helps them take Xu down. Yunzi says that the ones who will be taken down are them and attacks the men. Xu asks Yunzi to show mercy on them. He turns to the men and says that from now on, there won't be any armed forces stationed in the city that aren't authorized by him, and those who won't leave tonight will be regarded as rebels and killed. Yunzi asks Xu what's happening here. Xu says that it is nothing, he just had a spat with them. Yunzi looks at the poster and questions whether the princess of the Miao kingdom offered a bounty of three million golden grits on him. Zhu reassures her that they won't be able to get him back to marry the princess. He says that she knows he is faithful to her and he won't agree to the marriage. Yunzi tears down the poster from the wall and angrily says that she doesn't think that the princess will give up. She thinks that she must meet with the princess one day. Suddenly, a man named Zhu Wei Kai from the Brass Saber Army asks what he just said. He asks that Zhu wants to get the armed forces out of Rain City. He sarcastically begs his pardon and says that he didn't quite catch that. Zhu shows him the title deed and says that he is the city lord and orders him to get out before tonight. Weikai says that he can't boss them around with merely a piece of paper. He exclaims that Zhu can see if their brass saber army moves tonight. Yunzi says the brass saber army. Zhu explains that it is one of the strong forces in Rain City. Bailing and Chongming mentioned this. He says that this army is far more powerful than these local bad guys and it looks like they aren't gonna leave so easily. Weikai says that there are 3,000 soldiers in their army that are skillful with their sabers. Even the military of the city is afraid to confront them. In a threatening manner, he tells Xu to leave with his wife and don't even think about becoming the city lord. Xu says that they are just a private army headed by some saber masters. He says that since Weikai thinks his army is so great, why doesn't he take a city and station himself over there? Weikai responds that it is easier to take a city than to defend it, and they know nothing except killing shit. Xu says that this city isn't rich, so why he wants to stay here? Weikai says that hasn't he heard that the decadent dragons appeared again, they are here to catch them. He says that a complete dead dragon can be sold for thousands of golden grits and even 10,000 grits if it is of a high level. Xu wonders about the decadent dragons, while Yunzi asks Weikai to take them to his camp. Weikai motions for them to follow him and says that he will show them what they can do. At the camp of the Brass Saber City, some soldiers are seen wielding their swords, while some soldiers levitate in the air and display their powers. Xu says that there are saber masters and divine mortals in his camp, but there seem to be no dragon tamers. Weikai says that dragon's tamers are proud and arrogant, why would he hire them? He might as well save money for his men. A soldier comes running to Weikai and says that he saw the dragon tamers of the Hu army. It looks like they are up to something big. Weikai wonders what Chongming and Bailing want to achieve, he asks the soldier to keep an eye on them. He turns to Zhu and says that since he is going to expel all armed forces, why doesn't he drive away the Hu army first? They were the first ones to come to the city. Xu says that they are in league with the Hu army. 
Wake Eye curses and angrily says that means he is a spy. Zhu nervously responds that he was the one who invited them here. Wake Eye exclaims that he did that so they can clearly see what the Saber army is capable of, and then they won't provoke them. Yunzi asks how much would he want if they hire his army. Wake Eye says that their business is to attack cities, exterminate clans, and destroy dragon lairs and monster dens. They aren't going to be guards of some frail boys and girls. Yunzi again asks how much he wants. Chu thinks whether she is trying to recruit members and hire them here. Wakai says that it depends, they need a deposit of 1.5 million if they are going to attack cities, join the war between kingdoms or eliminate some stubborn forces. Furthermore, additional fees will be charged according to danger levels and their losses. Chu thinks that the Hu's are just cooperating with them, they aren't completely obeying them. If they don't have an army of their own, it will be really hard to root out the mixed forces in the city. Xu thinks that Yunzi's idea is great. Yunzi says that it only cost her 1 million grits to hire the Hu army, and that dragon tamers are easier to be mobilized. Weikai exclaims that how can those young guys be compared with them who have experienced many battles? Yunzi says that they will only give them a million. If he agrees, he can continue to be stationed here and follow her command. However, if he doesn't, he must pack up his bags and leave. In a threatening manner, she says that when the night falls, everything in this city is at their disposal, including their lives. Wake Eye thinks that the price is a little low but they can't kill a dragon within one or two days, and it may not be profitable. So it is better for him to accept the deal, and there is also a fixed commission. He exclaims that they have a deal. Chu can't believe he agreed and thinks that she is indeed Yunzi. Shortly afterwards, a crowd is seen gathered around the notice board. Someone from the clown exclaims that the city lord wants to drive away the armed forces by issuing a decree. Another person calls the city lord a blockhead, saying that he will get himself killed for doing that, and they shall just wait and see. Zhu is also seen among them. Hearing their words, Xu thinks that they will be surprised that a person says that the new lord will die tonight, and those armed forces are going to treat him like dirt. Someone else says that he has heard the Hu family is back. He wonders if it has to do anything with them. Another voice yells out that the city was ruined by the Hu family. He exclaims that the rain city used to be beautiful but it is full of bandits now. While all of this is happening, a man pushes a cart forward with a dead pig on it. Shu asks the man how much is the pig meat for. The man responds that the meat isn't for sale, it is for the soldiers and the Lu battalion. Shu says then they don't need to deliver it. The man asks Zhu if he is a newcomer. Shu asks how did he know that. The man named Mr. Huang tells him that the people in the rain city don't spend a penny on meat. Some fierce men even snatch it directly. Mr. Huang says that the Lu battalion is barbaric, so they need to send him the meat, or else they'll be killed. Xu says that he isn't joking, the Lu battalion has been rooted out by him for colliding with gangsters and raking in illicit money. He adds that in the evening, they will be beheaded publicly at the fair. A man accompanying Mr. Huang warns Xu not to talk big on this matter or he will be killed. Meanwhile, Mr. Huang asks Xu's name. Xu introduces himself as Xu Minglang, the Lord of Rain City. He reveals that he is the one who made the decree. Hearing this, Mr. Huang wonders if Xu really thinks he is going to believe his bullshit. Suddenly, Mr. Huang's companion exclaims that all the soldiers of the Lu battalion have died. Mr. Huang falls to his knees and asks for forgiveness, saying that Zhu was true and they didn't realize he was the real city lord. Xu tells him to rise and asks him if he can now sell the meat to him. Mr. Huang says that it seems it is the first time Xu has become an official. He informs Xu that officials don't buy meat from ordinary people and gives Xu the meat as a present. Xu thinks that Mr. Huang is indeed a seasoned middle-aged man. Fairness prevails as Xu says that there is no need for him to do that. He asks how much is it, and if Mr. Huang doesn't want his life to go back in order. He says that the new rain city will start with a rule-based market. Mr. Huang says that if that's the case, he will give Zhu a 50% discount and asks for 80 golden grits for the meat. He asks Zhu what does he think about it. Hearing the price, Zhu thinks that he did not see that coming and calls him a cunning old man. Back in the courtyard, 
Nian Nian scolds Zhu for spending 80 golden grits on the meat. She asks if he burned a hole in his pocket and exclaims that she can buy him a whole farm with this sum in the ancestral dragon city. Zhu nervously says that the daily necessities over here are very expensive and meat is even rarer than gold or silver. He tells her that the old man gave him a discount due to his title. Nian Nian says that the meat isn't enough for Haya even for a single meal. Zhu scratched his head and clarifies that the meat is actually for them. Nian Nian asks him what will they do about Haya. She says that he will starve as it eats thrice as much ever since he reached the Dragon Lord level and ordinary pork doesn't offer much energy. As she scolds Zhu, his attention is drawn to how Yi Hu is wielding his sword. Zhu calls out Hao Ye's name. Hao Ye grabs his hand and cries in happiness that Zhu remembers his name. Zhu asks Nian Nian what happened to him and if he is out of his mind. Nian Nian says that she has no idea. Zhu tells Hao Ye that his swordsmanship needs improvement. He tells him to go kill some demonic beasts or demons with good meat and bring back the lean meat. He says the more he brings the better it is. Hao Ye enthusiastically says yes while Nian Nian tells Zhu that she will go with Hao Yi since she knows what Haya likes to eat. She says that she will also check if there are any other resources. Zhu orders Hao Yi to take Nian Nian along, saying that she will tell him what parts to cut off. He exclaims that Hao Yi must cut with pinpoint accuracy. Hao Yi says that it won't be a problem, thinking that he will practice according to Zhu's instructions and make a name for himself as a sword cultivator. Shortly afterwards, the meat sizzles and Zhu offers Yunzi to have a taste. Suddenly, some soldiers arrive on horses, breaking the wall. A man named Su Tong, the general of the Longma Battalion, orders his soldiers to tear the place down and kill anything that moves. Yunzi wonders what is happening. She had sent Bailing, Chongli, and the Brass Saber Army to wipe out the disobedient forces, so how could a troop surround them? Meanwhile, Zhu asks who they are. Su Tong says that Zhu doesn't deserve to stay here if he doesn't even know the Longma Battalion. He says that they control the city and Zhu is only a lord in name. He furiously says how dare Zhu order his men to kill them. Zhu shows him a document and says that he has been appointed by the kingdom. He says that he has the certificate of the appointment and killing him means revolting against the kingdom. Su Tong raises his hand while telling Zhu not to threaten him with the kingdom. He exclaims that he has killed all the former officials in the city. Seeing Su Tong's hand, the soldiers take it as a signal and begin to shoot flaming arrows at them. Zhu curses at this and tells Yunzi to watch out. However, Yunzi steps forward and stops the flaming arrows with a bright yellow light. Zhu is surprised by this and asks if she doesn't need a sword. Using the light, Yunzi causes the arrows to fall onto the ground, averting the attack. The general and a soldier look at her in shock. Zhu summons Mo Yi and unleashes a flying sword. An explosion occurs as the flying sword attacks the soldiers. Zhu motions for Mo Yi to do a flyback and it attacks more soldiers. Zhu exclaims that he should wipe out these soldiers who killed the people like flies at once. He raises his hand and motions for the swords to attack the battalion. The firefly swords begin to descend and pierce through the soldiers' bodies. General Su Tong tells his battalion to not get flustered. He says that Zhu cannot kill all of them with one sword and orders the archers to riddle Zhu with their arrows. He shoots a purple arrow and it transforms into a black dragon's roar. Zhu realizes that the leader of the Longma battalion has a strong cultivation base. He thinks that it is no wonder he is cocky enough to intrude into the residence of the new city head and shoot flaming arrows. He summons Haya and Qinghua from the spirit domain and orders them to kill all the soldiers. Hearing this, Qinghua howls while Haya roars. Haya faces the black dragon's roar and successfully attacks it with his claw. After this, he roars at the soldiers and begins to attack them. Qinghua also howls while attacking the soldiers. Xu encourages his dragons to kill them all. He thinks that only violence works when one wants to build a well-organized society and it is of no use to talk about virtue and kindness with these hooligan soldiers. The general orders his soldiers to kill them. He turns around to see his soldiers running. He curses at them and demands that they don't run away. He begins to chase the soldiers to stop them and orders them to come back. 
Yunzi tells Zhu to not go after them and let the Brass Saber army tear down their camps. Zhu says that it is a good idea, they shall let the Brass Saber army deal with the rest. He has already killed the elite soldiers of the Longma battalion anyway. Yunzi apologizes to Shu for the situation and says that she didn't expect these soldiers would come here. She looks at the ruined herbs, saying they were planted by Xinghua, and she will be sad when she wakes up. Shu says that it seems they are too lenient with the armed forces. Suddenly, the place begins to rumble again. Shu questions if someone else is here to get themselves killed. Bailing arrives at the courtyard on an elephant. She informs Zhu and Yunzi that they ran back when they heard the news, but he has already killed them all. Zhu says no and tells her that some of them managed to escape. Bailing tells her army that they shall go and exterminate the Longma battalion. They are vulnerable right now. Meanwhile, Chongming addresses all the rebels and says that the city lord's decree stipulates that they are allowed to leave in the daytime. He says that they will continue to hunt down all the rebels at night and hopes that they all will choose the right path. The next day, Weikai informs Zhu that after last night's battle, there still remain three tough and diehard forces in the city. Zhu asks him who are these three forces. He explains that the first one is the Red Blade Corps of the Two Kingdom, which consists of 50,000 soldiers, and the decree doesn't work on them. They are the strongest regular forces in the city. Expelling them is quite tricky and it'll hurt national interests. The second one is the Grey Wolf Cavalry, a local faction that does both legal and illegal business. The organization is comprised of residents, businessmen, gangsters, and soldiers here. It is also powerful. The last one is the D Family, which is a big family engaging in the jewelry business on the Brown Continent. The family manipulates the Rain City with enormous financial firepower and has its own armed forces, so Zhu shouldn't look down upon it. Chongming says that it is safe to say that the Red Blade Corps is the mastermind behind the operation of the Longma Battalion. They eradicated most of the corps and bandits, therefore, the interests of the Grey Wolf Cavalry were harmed. He says that the D family is so ambitious that they want to control the entire Rain City, so it can profit from collecting road tolls. Yunzi says that none of these threats should stay in the city and they can join another kingdom. Chongming questions don't they need to occupy a kingdom before that. Bailing says that it deserves consideration. If Rain City joins one of the three kingdoms, the Red Blade core of the two kingdom will have to leave. Weikai asks which kingdom should they join, considering they don't have any solid connections with those kingdoms. Yunzi says that they shall join the Lichuan kingdom since she is the Grand Counselor over there. Weikai asks in surprise that isn't the Lichuan the new kingdom that recently merged with the Jitting continent. Bailing exclaims what a surprise and says that they have heard a lot about her. Meanwhile, Chongming asks if she is the Grand Counselor who captured the Rui Kingdom's capital. Xu says that he remembers the Jitting Imperial having a decree that the Lichuan Kingdom is protected until the Spring Festival. He says that any country waging war against Lichuan will be sanctioned by Jitting. He asks Yunzi if she wants to use that and she says yes. Weikai says that in that case, the Red Corps must unconditionally withdraw from Rain City, otherwise it will be considered an invasion. Chongming agrees with him and says that although the kingdom is too far to be able to help, the Divine Mortal Academy is on this continent, and it won't just sit back and watch. Meanwhile, Bailing says that they still have three months before the Spring Festival, so they have enough time to hire seasoned soldiers to stabilize Rain City. The flag of the two kingdom flutters as their army arrives at Zhu's place with their dragons. Zhu introduces himself as Zhu Minglang, the new lord of the Rain City. He says that it is majestic to see 100,000 soldiers of the two kingdom here. A man named Su Tai realizes that he has heard Zhu's name before. Zhu says that he believes they have received an order from the Order Sustainer of the Divine Mortal Academy, and announces that Rain City now belongs to the kingdom of Lichuan. Su Tai says that he has indeed received the order, however, they can continue to stay here if Xu grants them permission. He says that he has come to Xu to ask him to reconsider his decision. He says that after all, he, Su Tai is a ruthless conqueror. Xu is surprised to hear that there is another conqueror. Tuwenha, the king of Tu he met, is also a conqueror. 
Shu turns to Bailing and asks what titles the ruling class have for dragon tamers. Bailing explains that in a city or state war, they are often given titles like War Shadow, War Hero, War Vanquard, and the most famous aka Conqueror. She says that Su Tai must be a dragon tamer who earned the title of a conqueror. She reveals that a single conqueror is as powerful as an army. Ju acknowledges the information and tells Su Tai that he isn't allowed to stay here. Su Tai says that the armistice can only protect him for three months and gives him another chance to reconsider it. He says that otherwise, Ju and the Lichuan kingdom will be destroyed when it expires. Ju responds that he should be grateful for the armistice, or he wouldn't have been able to leave alive. He demands that Su Tai leave with his army, or else they will die by nightfall. Hearing this, an annoyed Su Tai orders his army to go back. As they begin to leave, Xu suddenly tells them to wait. He says that they can go but Su Tong has to stay. Su Tong says that he is free to come and go. What can Zhu even do to him? Zhu unlashes Mo Yi who beheads Su Tong. Holding a spear, a soldier exclaims that Zhu is courting death and how dare he kill someone in his army. Xu tells the man to put his spear down and reminds him that he is still on his territory. Su Tai turns to Zhu and says that he will pay for this. Shortly afterwards, Cho Ming says that seeing that they successfully drove away the Two Kingdoms army, the Di family is offering tons of money to stay in Rain City. He exclaims that the family is indeed very cunning. He adds that at the same time, the Di family have also demobilized their armed forces under Zhu's pressure while retaining some of the strongest soldiers to protect themselves. Zhu says that although it isn't easy to expel the Di family, they can use the family's funds to maintain current economic activities. He says that only the Grey Wolf Cavalry has not taken any action. Just as Zhu says that Wei Kai informs him that the leader of the Grey Wolf Cavalry is here to see him. Zhu tells him to let him I and Dot Wai Yu Gaojie, leader of the Grey Wolf Cavalry, enters the room. He says that he is ashamed that he didn't know Zhu had arrived in the city. He says that he is here to ask for forgiveness and present his humble gift. Zhu says that he thought Gaojie has come to seek revenge. After all, they have hurt his interests. Gaojie says that isn't the case, rather he is elated and impressed by his elimination of the bandits. He says that some people call them the protectors of bandits and gangsters, however, he swears to God that he never wanted to seek illegal money. Xu asks if he is suggesting they have misunderstood his organization. Gaojie says that perhaps not, there is still a small gang that helped those bandits for ill-gotten gains. He says that he has ordered to eradicate that gang before he came. He says that rotten flesh should be cast away and asks what Xu thinks. Xu knows that Gaojie is a willy fox, but since the city needs manpower, he needs to keep him under control and use his faction. Xu says that he did a good job, however, he should make another plan as soon as possible since the order has already been issued. Gaojie says that he made some mistakes when he was young and although he wants to change himself, no one really believes him. He says that he later found out that the Grey Wolf Cavalry was composed mainly of homeless people who have criminal marks on them. He says that they are from different states, but they can hardly find shelter for themselves in any state. Xu says that they don't have many places to stay except Rain City, right? Gaojie confirms this and says that he knows Xu doesn't allow any bandits or gangsters to live here. He says that can wipe them out across the brown continent, and they won't hesitate even if Xu asks them to slaughter dragons. He says that they just hope to stay here. Xu says that it depends on what Gaojie does next. He says that he will see if they'll cut off evildoers or just play tricks. Xu puts his hand on Gaojie's shoulder and says that the residents of Rain City will also wait and see. Gaojie responds that he will prove it to him. As Gaojie leaves, Zhu says that they have managed to wipe out almost all armed forces and they'll get the city seal in a month. Yusuo says that it is good to have a place to stay, and the weather is also pleasant. Zhu suggests that when they are free, they can go and check the wooden billboard with Yunzi to see if there are any good bounties. Yusuo says that his suggestion sounds good. She says that there is the smell of blood everywhere, so they might as well go on an outing.at the wooden billboard. 
As Zhu sees the board, someone from the crowd says that he didn't expect such a thing to happen in the Pear Blossom City, and it is really miserable. Another person says that no one expected that and many people might die. A man in a green robe says that not everyone dares to accept this task. Xu asks what they are talking about and whether there is someone with a higher bounty on his head than him. The men look behind and exclaim in shock that it is the city lord. A man covered in bandages tells Xu that someone found many zombie dragons in Pear Blossom City and they eat anyone they see. He says that although the task has been issued, no one dares to accept it because those dragons are fierce and always stay together. Nian Nian tells Zhu that when she went out, she heard Bailing and Chongming quarreling. Zhu asks what were they arguing over. Nian Nian says that she thinks Bailing wanted to take their men to kill those zombies while her brother insisted on fortifying the city first. Zhu says that Bailing must be very familiar with those dragons. He says that there isn't a bounty written on the paper, but it must be their level since no one dares to take it. With a smug expression, Zhu announces that he accepts the task, causing the crowd to praise him. Meanwhile, Xinghua and Yusuo stare at him in awkward silence. Zhu says to tell Chongming to stay here and Bailing will take them there. The next day, Qingzhua is seen flying in the air. Nian Nian looks angrily at Yusuo who is grabbing onto Zhu while Xinghua looks at them in surprise. Bailing angrily asks if he is here to kill dragons or have fun. Zhu apologizes and asks if she could tell them something about the zombie dragons. Bailing says that the zombie dragons hid in the Pear Blossom Valley when they tried to mop up dragons across the brown continent. After years of recovery and cultivation, they have grown more powerful. Zhu asks if there is anything special about the Pear Blossom Valley which made the dragons hide in there. Bailing says that the place is filled with aquatic gems and is home to an ancient tribe in seclusion. There are many hidden rivers, caves, demons, and monsters. So only a few outsiders go over there. Zhu asks how many people the tribe has. Bailing responds that there are around 20,000 to 30,000 people. They have seven large villages and hundreds of smaller ones. Although their overall strength isn't weak, Ordinary villagers can't protect themselves in the face of zombie dragons. Bailing fears that thousands of people have been killed. Shortly afterwards, Nian Yan asks how long will it take for them to reach. Bailing says that it is right ahead. Nian Yan responds that she has already heard that for the fourth time. Yusuo tells Xinghua to be careful, while Zhu says that it is no wonder it is still untouched despite being surrounded by four nearby kingdoms. The roads are too complicated and people are likely to fall into bottomless caves, valleys full of poison or undercurrents if they are careless. Bailing says that here they are. As they arrive at the first village of the Peach Blossom Valley, Nian Nian sighs in relief that they have finally arrived and claims that she almost walked her feet off. The gatekeeper of the village aka Song Luo stops them and asks who they are. Bailing informs him that they are from the Rain City. She says that they have accepted their request for help and have come to wipe out the zombie dragons. A villager says that he will open a crack, so they shall hop and come in because the zombie dragons are spying on them from somewhere. As he opens the wooden gate, she notices that he didn't feel any dragons along the way. Even demons and evil spirits didn't show up, it is too quiet. Shu suddenly realizes that it means the demons and evil spirits didn't show up because they were aware that some even more dangerous creatures are nearby. Suddenly, a zombie dragon purple eyes shine in the dark. Seeing this, the villager curses and tells them to immediately come I and as they enter inside, they close the door. However, Xinghua and Yusuo realize that Zhu is still outside. Nian Nian says that one of them is still outside. San Luo says that he will go and save him, however, they cannot open the gate. Yusu exclaims why not, the dragon hasn't gotten close yet. San Luo informs them that although the odor of these dragons is harmless to humans, it pollutes the water. The walls and the gates are made of a special type of wood that can block its odor. If the odor seeps into the crack of the gate, the whole village will die without water. Zhu reassures them, saying that he shall test his strength. Bailing tells Song Luo to not go down. She says that Xu is their city lord and is pretty strong. Song Luo says that it seems they don't know anything about zombie dragons. 
Zhu casually says will you look at that as the zombie dragon roars at him. Zhu immediately summons Qingzhua. The zombie dragon roars and unleashes a demon shadow at them. Qingzhua retaliates by attacking the dragon with the power of plant flourishing. The zombie dragon leaps on a branch and tries to attack Qingzhua as it howls. Zhu realizes that the zombie dragon is too fast. If Qingzhuo soars now, the decadent dragon would bite him and Qingzhua wouldn't be able to get rid of it until he died. He warns Qingzhua to not let the zombie dragon get close to him. Qingzhua tries to get away from the dragon, but the decadent dragon quickly catches up and attacks him. Zhu calls the decadent dragon ferocious as it is targeting Qingzhua's vulnerable parts such as his eyes, throat, and wings. However, he feels fortunate that Qingzhua has the bloodline of the giant forest dragon, so he isn't afraid of close combat. His attention is suddenly drawn to another decadent dragon. He realizes that the one fighting with Qingzhua is just trying to distract him and that he was very careless. He thinks that if one decadent dragon can manage to escape his perception, then there might be more. This turns out to be true as more decadent dragons come charging behind him. Zhu knows that now he can only summon one dragon from his spirit domain. Even if he summons the sword spirit dragon, he will only manage to block one decadent dragon's attack instantly. He anxiously contemplates what he should do. Suddenly, Zhu realizes that Bai Qi has awakened. He immediately summons Bai Qi as her bloodline awakens. Bai Qi attacks a dragon with shooting eyes. She notices that another dragon is charging towards Zhu. Zhu curses, realizing that the decadent dragons are too fast. Bai Qi chirps as she creates rings of blue light. She freezes a dragon, while another dragon gets dangerously close to Zhu. Zhu feels that something is wrong. The demon shadow made the decadent dragons bite the living crazily like zombies even if they are reduced to skeletons. Bai Qi successfully pierces the dragon's skull with ice and saves Xu. She chirps as the dragon freezes. Zhu feels fortunate that he summoned Bai Qi instead of a sword spirit dragon, otherwise that decadent dragon would have bitten his head off. Xu notices the purple goo in Qingzhuo's branches and wonders whether he has also killed the decadent dragon. The gate of the Peach Blossom Valley finally opens. San Luo and a villager stare at Xu in amazement and think that he is so powerful. The villager announces that Xu has killed three decadent dragons. Hearing this, other villagers begin to come out of their huts to see who managed to kill the dragons. Balin introduces Zhu Mingland as the new city lord of Rain City. She announces that Zhu has come to help them after reading the rescue letter from the Pear Blossom Valley. Sang Xuanshan, the head of the first village, grabs Zhu's hand and expresses his gratitude. He says that they didn't know three decadent dragons were ambushed in front of the gate. He says if Zhu hadn't come, he fears that the patrol would have been killed tomorrow. Xu says that these decadent dragons are meticulous and work really well together, they are very scary. Xu and Chan says that the decadent dragons are natural killers and according to religious institutions, they used to be death's servants. They possess the bloodline of slaughters and were born to kill. Any living creature is their prey and they pounce on them without any hesitation even if means they'll die. Zhu recalls the dragon that was about to rip his head off. He thinks that Xuanshan is saying the truth. Bailing says that the decadent dragons in the past weren't so terrible. Xuanshan says that they seem to have evolved. He asks if she has seen the demon shadow and says that it didn't exist before. Bailing says that Xuanshan had told them that the aura of decadent dragons was toxic and polluted the water. She asks if these are their new abilities. Luo confirms her suspicions and reveals that it is the Dirty Knight Decadent Dragon. He explains that once people drink the contaminated water, they are bewitched by the dragons and then help them kill. Nian Yan questions pollute the water and bewitch the people. Luo says that they are only aware of these abilities. He says that some decadent dragons are more terrifying and have a strong killing talent. Xuanshan says that it is said that they not only appeared in Pear Blossom Valley but also in some towns and villages on the Brown Continent. Xu asks if they know the approximate number of decadent dragons. Luo says that he has no idea. He adds that the situation here isn't so bad, they have guarded the water and have enough food. As for the other villagers, they are unable to help them. Suddenly, 
A panicked man informs Xuanshan that something has happened to the guys who sent water to the second village. Only the eagle flew back and it is covered in blood. Xuanshan exclaims what? Xu asks what is going on. Luo informs him that the water in the second village was contaminated a week ago and all of the villagers there can only get water from a few old wells. They sent a team to deliver water yesterday and now it seems that they have been killed by the decadent dragons. Xuanshan requests Xu, saying that if he is willing to help, he can send some water to the second village, otherwise many people will die from dehydration even if they kill the dragons. Xu asks him to prepare some water bags that are convenient to carry. He says that they will go there overnight. Xuanshan thanks Zhu and hands him a pouch as a token of appreciation. Bailing whispers to Zhu that the Pear Blossom Valley is rich in gems. The D family has always wanted to engage in long-term business with the valley, but they failed. She says that they will go all out this time, and in the future, if Rain City can take charge of the gem business here, it will add a substantial income to their city's revenue every year. Zhu exclaims that saving lives is the will of an upright person like him and gems are nothing important. However, he does not want to refuse their kindness. Xu feels the pouch and thinks that there are at least 200,000 golden grits in it. He can buy food for his dragons from this money. Shortly afterwards, they are seen on a cow going to the second village along with water. Xu asks Xinghua if she is tired. He suggests that she go back with Yusua and wait for him there as he delivers the water alone. Xinghua says that she feels more relieved by his side. Xu asks if she has made a prediction. Xinghua says yes and reveals that many people are going to die. Xu reassures her that they'll try their best and tells her not to worry. A voice calls out for help from below. Hearing this, Xu says that he will go down and take a look. However, Xinghua grabs his shoulder and asks him to stay. Xu thinks that the astrologer has always been kind, so why is she stopping him from helping the guy? Xu asks if it is dangerous and Xinghua says yes. Xu notices that the cries for help are getting weaker. Even if they go down there, he is afraid that the man will die anyway. He decides to stay there and says all right. As they arrive at the gate of the second village, Luo introduces himself and says that he is here to deliver drinking water. He asks them to open the door. A guard from the second village exclaims that they shouldn't believe them and orders them to be killed. The guards from the second village begin to shoot arrows at them. Luo asks if they are crazy and why are they shooting them when they have brought them water overnight. Yusuo dodges an arrow. She summons Chiwen and calls them a bunch of ingrates. The guard commands to shoot Chiwen. Chiwen creates a mysterious qi door, and using its tail, he bangs it on the village gate. Xinghua asks Yusua to be gentle with them, but Yusua exclaims that they were the ones who started the fight. Yusua leaps over the gate. The guards tell her to stop and exclaim that they were wrong as Yusua hits them. The door finally opens and a beaten up guard asks Xu to come inside. At the square of the stone valley, Xu looks at the guards with swollen faces and thinks that Yusua is so cruel. A guard moans that his belly hurts, while another says that his waist hurts. One of them says that his head hurts and exclaims that he has a concussion. Luo introduces himself to a bruised up Huang Lu from the second village. He asks why they attacked them. Huang Lu says that before they arrived, a group of people who also claimed to bring water attacked them with many decadent dragons after entering. He says that many people died and the last few wells were completely destroyed. Luo says that is impossible, the previous teams were most likely eradicated, so how could they send them water? He asks if they seem to be bewitched. This theory solidifies in his mind and he exclaims that the first team members must have been bewitched. Bailing suggests that they move out, saying that the wells have been contaminated and they can't live here. Huang Lu asks if she thinks that they haven't already tried. Once they leave the village, the decadent dragons appear. He says that there is no way for them to get out. Luo says that they can't just hide in here and await death. He tells him to look at the state of the walls and says that can't resist the dragons at all. Meanwhile, Zhu looks behind and says there seems to be a sound coming from there. He informs Yu Saw that he feels something is wrong and says that he'll go check it out. He tells her to stay here and protect everyone. 
Yu Su acknowledges this and tells him not to worry. Zhu begins to walk in the direction where cries of help are coming from. He reaches a well and a voice cries for help, while another tells him to run. He wonders if the sounds are coming from the well. He feels unsure if they are asking for help or warning him. He opens the well and is shocked to see gray bodies covered in blood and a girl named Shermiru. One of them tells Zhu to run, while another asks for help. A creature smirks while calling out for help. Suddenly Zhu hears evil laughter from behind. A decadent dragon comes out and cries for help. Zhu realizes that it is imitating human cries and it is no wonder Xinghua stopped him from saving people during their journey. Now knowing that these decadent dragons are using human cries to attract people to fall into their trap, Zhu shouts for Yusuo to protect Xinghua and Yan Yan. He exclaims that this village is a trap. Hearing Zhu's voice, she wonders what he is shouting. Luo asks Wang Lu if he is alright. As Wang Lu begins to turn purple, Luo asks if he is also controlled by the decadent dragons. Yusuo curses and tells everyone to run. As they start running, Bailing asks how could this be, while Nian Yan exclaims if they are crazy. Yusuo tells Xinghua that it was actually the stone villagers that have been bewitched instead of the people who delivered the water. Xinghua looks back and says that this place has become a nest of decadent dragons. Yusuo says that it is no wonder they didn't see any decadent dragons along the way. They were waiting for them to fall into their nest. Xinghua asks what about Xu. Bailing says that they shall get out of here first. She will close the door and lock the monsters inside. She exclaims that Zhu is so powerful and will manage to escape. Yen Yan shouts that they are leaving and tells Zhu to take care of himself. Meanwhile, Zhu sneezes and rubs his nose, saying that he knows he needs to run. However, it is too late as he has already been surrounded. He summons Bai Chi and commands her to stop them. As Bai Chi shoots ice at the dragons, Xu tells Shermira to come with him. He extends his hand, saying that he is a dragon tamer and he can protect her. He exclaims that she will die if she stays here. Xu says that she was the one who reminded him to run. He asks her to trust him, saying that he isn't bewitched by the decadent dragons. Myra decides to come with him and reaches for his hand. While carrying Myra on his back, Xu tells her that his friends are waiting for him outside the village. He says that it isn't safe here and he will take her out. Myra looks at Bai Chi and asks if she is Zhu's dragon. Zhu says yes. He tells her that her name is Bai Chi and she has reached the middle monarch level. Suddenly, he notices more decadent dragons coming their way. He hears some rustling as the dragons also appear behind them. He says that they are being attacked from the front and the back. Zhu leaps as he summons Moe and says how dare the dragon besiege him. He slashes their heads off and exclaims that he isn't a pushover. Myra asks if Moe is also his dragon. Zhu confirms this and says that with Moe and Baichi, they will both survive. Myra says but they all died and she should go accompany them. She says that she just doesn't know how to end her life. She was lying next to them and whispering. They told her to be quiet, but she didn't see anyone else end up like those who brought the water. Zhu makes it out of the village riding Baichi. Bailing says that Yusua is too slow and tells her to blaze the trail. Zhu says that Baichi is resisting the decadent dragons behind them. He decides that they'll charge out. Zhu begins to summon Qinghua out of the spirit domain and tells him to come out. He tells Xinghua to come up. Yusua says that she will deal with the decadent dragons on the ground and tells Zhu to take care of the badwing dragons in the sky. Xu says no problem and Yusuo summons a fire Kailin dragon. Seeing this, Xu realizes that it is the same dragon that Ling Xia often drew, so it is Yusuo's dragon pet dot he tells Bei Ling to protect Nian Yan and Luo. He says that they'll take care of the rest. Bei Ling says okay and summons her giant elephant dragon. She tells Nian Yan to come up. Nian Yan acknowledges her and says that she needs to prepare some drinking water for future use. They sit on top of the elephant and observe Bai Chi fighting. Luo says that they need to run instantly. He exclaims that there are many decadent dragons behind them. Nian Yan reassures him and says that since Bai Chi is here, they won't rush over in a short time. Meanwhile, 
Bailing wonders if Bai Qi is Zhu's dragon pet and thinks that she is so powerful. Qingzhua, the giant elephant dragon, and the fire Kailin head forward. Yu Sua tells them to stay close to her and exclaims for them to charge. Qingzhua notices some bewitched people crawling on top of the wall. Qingzhua attacks them and they start to fall. Suddenly, a decadent dragon charges at them from behind. Xinghua tells Myra to not be afraid and tells Qingzhua to land. Qingzhua attacks the dragon while landing. The decadent dragon crashes into the wall and purple blood starts to spurt out of it. Myra wonders if it is a coincidence. Why does she feel that Xinghua is controlling all of this? She wonders if Xinghua is sad for the dead villagers. She tries to comfort Xinghua, saying that she doesn't need to be sad since they died when they were bewitched. She says that she can't see their souls anymore. Xinghua asks if she is a spiritualist. Myra asks what's that. Xinghua asks if she could see their souls. Myra confirms this and says that their souls would linger for a while after they die, but their souls have long been missing. She says that she told the villagers that the people on patrol had lost their souls after they came back. However, they just scolded her for talking nonsense. After this, she was afraid of being scolded, so she could only watch more and more people losing souls without saying anything. She cries asking Xinghua that she shouldn't be so cowardly, right? She regretfully says that if only she had told all the villagers earlier, the village wouldn't have ended up in this state. Xinghua comforts her, saying that it isn't her fault. Meanwhile, Xu tries to attack the decadent dragons. He realizes that something is wrong. It is weird that he didn't hit even a single batwing dragon after slashing so many times in a row. He contemplates whether they are better at dodging than ordinary creatures. Or can they predict his actions or do they have some kind of group aura? He wonders whether could it be. The team looks at the batwing dragons squeaking. Yusua calls out Zhu's name. Zhu knew it. The dragons fly too neatly, or rather, exactly the same. If he is right, there should be a leader among the batwing dragons that is guiding them all. He must kill their leader first to break the formation. He wonders which one is their leader. He finds it weird that these dragons have only been hovering over him instead of attacking. He contemplates whether the dragons are trying to stall him so that other dragons can kill Yusuo. He realizes that if he pretends to support Yusuo, the dragons will surely come after him, and the one who responds the quickest must be their leader. Xu says to the dragons that he won't play with them anymore and bids them farewell. His plan works as the leader of the Batwing dragons immediately begins to chase him. He thinks that they're beasts after all, and as smart as they might be, they aren't a match for humans. He turns around, saying that a beast is always a beast. He slashes the leader with his sword, killing it instantly. Zhu says to the dragons that they have lost their leader, and it is so easy for him to kill them now. He points his sword up in the air and thanks the dragons for letting him acquire an amazing swordsmanship. Zhu unleashes a fire sword coiled dragon at the Badwing dragons which kills them all. As the Badwing dragons fall to the ground, Bailing says that she thought Zhu would die for sure, she didn't expect him to be so powerful. Shortly afterwards, Zhu says that they shouldn't go back to the first village now in order to avoid leading the chasing dragons back. They need to make a detour, but the streams in the valley are all polluted. Nian Nian boasts that she was so smart to bring a few more water bags with her, or they would all die from thirst. Luo didn't expect that the entire second village would be bewitched. He sighs and curses at the dawn decadent dragons. Bailing comforts him saying that he shouldn't be so sad and that they will solve this problem. Yusuo looks at the elephant dragon's wound and says that it is corrosive, so it is a little tricky to cure them. Shu feels lucky that after restoring the bloodline, Baichi became powerful and if the dirty knight decadent dragon had broken in, they would all be dead. He thinks that now, they need to wait until dawn. The dragon's stealth ability will be greatly reduced by then. The next day, Yen Yen says that they have run out of water and many of their dragon pets haven't drunk it. She says if the dragons are thirsty, their strength will be greatly damaged. Xu tells them to rest, while he goes to check if there are any clean streams. Xinghua asks Xu to let her go with him. Xu tells Xinghua that there is no need and says that she can sleep a little longer. Yusuo interjects, 
saying that he has no sense of direction, she asks how can he find water. She says that he'd better let Xinghua guide him. Ju questions who said that he has no sense of direction. Xinghua points in some direction and tells Zhu that they should go that way. Zhu thinks that he indeed has no goal and can only walk around in the valley. He realizes that it will be much better to have an astrologer with him. As they make their way, Xinghua informs Zhu that there are ancient relics in the Pear Blossom Valley. In the past, there may have been a group of decadent dragons hiding in the valley that accidentally entered the ancient relics. Therefore, the whole dragon clan evolved into such a terrible form. Xinghua reveals that while observing the stars last night, she found that the relics are deep in this valley. If they can find the relics, perhaps they can also find a way to deal with these decadent dragons. She adds that the existence of the relics indicates that there is a piece of ancient lamp jade in it, and there may also be many other rare spiritual resources. Hearing this, Zhu exclaims that is great, and tells her to hurry up so that they can go and find the relics. Zhu sneezes as the wind howls as the wind swirls around them. He says that this wind is very weird. It is coming from the valley, but it is more piercing than the wind inside the valley. Zhu wonders if it is coming from the relics. Xinghua says that perhaps it is. She explains that the energy in the ancient relics is disordered, therefore it may break the restriction and create space cracks. That is where the wind comes from. She says that with this wind, they should be able to find the cracks and get into the relics. Zhu asks if the relics are a separate place. Xinghua denies this and explains that there is just a restriction that can isolate time. It was usually because of the collision between a huge floating continent and an ancient star. The huge shock caused by the collision disturbed the order of time and because of this, some spiritual creatures ma grow against time. In their world, it may take tens of thousands of years to become a sacred creature, but in the relics, it may take only a few years. Hearing this information, Shu thinks that it takes 100 years to be a demon, 1000 years to be a fiend, and 10,000 years to be a saint. In the relics, there may be 10,000-year-old spiritual resources as well as 10,000-year-old sacred spirits. He thinks that maybe he will get slapped by the death god when he goes to look for the ancient lamp jade. Zhu coughs, asking if she can predict what will happen to them this time. Xinghua questions if he is afraid. Zhu says that isn't the case at all. He is just worried that no one will take care of her. Xinghua says that the decadent dragons aren't extinct inside, which means that the relics aren't murderous places. She says that they will be fine. Xu grabs her arm, saying how could she deduce it when she is an astrologer. He insists that she makes a prediction and exclaims that he believes in her metaphysics. Xinghua stares at the coin in her hand, thinking that it took up a lot of her energy to observe the stars last night and that the restriction will also interfere with the power of prophecy. She decides that it'd be better for her to use the coin. As she throws the coin in the air, Zhu asks what is she doing. Xinghua says that she is predicting their fortune. She asks him which side he wants while covering the coin that has landed on her hand. Zhu asks if she can't be more professional. He says that she looks like a naive girl who predicts her love with petals. Xinghua asks him to just choose one. Zhu finally chooses the side of the coin which has petals. As Xinghua takes her hand away, Xu sees that it has flowers on it. He realizes that they will be lucky here. Xinghua plucks a flower and says that if a person really loves you, no matter how dull you are, you can also feel it from their words and actions. But if you hold the petals with doubt, it means that the one you love doesn't care about you at all, and their answer will be no. Xu thinks that he didn't expect her to be an unpredictable emotional master. Suddenly, Zhu's attention is drawn to a crack and he points at it. As they get close to it, Zhu exclaims in amazement and calls that it a wonderland. He says that the coldness seems to be coming from the stone rocks and that the relics are right here. He examines the crack and says that it is too narrow. How will they get in? Xinghua grabs his shoulder and tells him to let her do it. She touches the crack and rings of yellow light begin to widen the crack. Some rocks start to fall as she successfully creates an opening. Zhu says that they are indeed the ancient relics. He exclaims that they have finally found it. 
Xinghua reveals that there is usually more than one entrance to the ancient relics. Luckily, the dragons didn't find this crack, which leaves them a chance. Xu says let's go in and figure it out. Xinghua agrees with him as they head inside. In the secret path of the ancient relics, Xu asks that could it be that this path is one way. He wonders if they can get out later. Xinghua tells him not to worry and says that some cracks may change and vanish, but it'll take decades or even a century. They come across an ancient long-necked dragon. Xinghua says that they are now in the relics and there is a clean stream ahead. Xu says that's great. He exclaims that he will drink enough water this time and bring back three days worth of water for everyone. Suddenly, he hears something buzzing and sees venomous flies. He exclaims that the flies are attacking the ancient long-necked dragon. A fly stings the dragon, causing it to collapse. As the water becomes polluted by the venom, Xu looks at the scene speechless. Suddenly, a venomous fly dragon appears beside the long-necked dragon. Xu tells Xinghua to watch out. As the venomous fly dragon begins to eat the dead long-necked dragon, Xu notices that there is also a translucent venomous sac in the tail belly of the venomous fly dragon which is the same as the Dirty Knight Decadent Dragon. Just as they had expected, the Decadent Dragons in the Pear Blossom Valley were indeed coming from the relics. Zhu informs Xinghua that the water has been polluted. He suggests that they go upstream. However, Xinghua tells him to look at the stream again. She calls it amazing as she observes the polluted stream becoming clear again and mentions that it has a strong self-purifying ability. Xu comments that nature has the ability to circulate and purify. He says that the reason why the poison of the Dirty Knight Decadent Dragon cannot be purified is because it comes from ancient times. In today's environment, it is difficult to find the antidote for it. Xinghua questions whether he means there is something that can detoxify the poison in the relics. Xu confirms this and says that something like the resin of this tree can be the antidote. He summons Bai Qi and tells her to scratch the bark of the tree. Bai Qi listens to Zhu's instructions and scratches the bark. He collects the resin in his pot and says that with this resin, the water in the Pear Blossom Valley can be purified. He tells Xinghua that they should get ready to leave. As they begin to leave, Xu notices the dragon squeaking in the sky. He is surprised to see that there are also ordinary decadent dragons in the relic. He still can't figure out where the powerful shadow of the demon shadow decadent dragons came from. As they continue to run, Xu tells Xinghua to keep up with the dragons and find their nest. He says that perhaps they can figure out the secrets of the evolution of the decadent dragons. Shortly afterwards, Xinghua asks if this is the place. Xu confirms this and tells her to look at the decadent dragons. He notices that they are biting the fruits of the vine. He finds this weird since dragons are known to only eat living creatures. He wonders how come they are eating fruits and could it be that their demon energy is coming from these fruits. Suddenly, Mr. Koi says that it is the demon awakening fruit. He exclaims that he thought it had long been extinct. Shu asks Mr. Koi if he knows about this. Mr. Koi explains that the demon awakening fruit can summon the power of the demon god. However, this effect can only last for a short period. Additionally, the fruit is only effective for special dragons such as decadent dragons and sacred cyan forest dragons. Chu's suspicions are confirmed by the fish. He realizes that their demon shadow powers were indeed coming from the fruits. Mr. Koi asks what is he waiting for. He urges Xu to pack all the fruits and says that he'd rather give them to Qinghua than leave them to these dragons. Xu listens to the fish and says that he will go now. He tells Xinghua that his sword spirit dragon can protect her, but Xinghua says there is no need for it. Mr. Koi tells Xu not to hesitate. He says that Xinghua is an astrologer, and even if he dies a thousand times, she won't get hurt at all. However, Zhu remains adamant and leaves Haya and Xinghua to protect Xinghua. Zhu rides on top of Bai Qi and says that since the fruits are good, he'll take all of them. He urges Mo Yi and Bai Qi to move forward. Baichi flies above as the decadent dragons squeak. Suddenly, the decadent dragons start charging towards Baichi. Shu tells Baichi that it isn't a big deal and the dragons are simply inviting death upon themselves. Baichi shoots ice at the dragons and they begin to fall. 
Zhu notices that the decadent dragons are helping their companions to eat the fruits on the sly. As long as one of them evolves into a demon shadow decadent dragon, with their large amount, they can easily fight against Baichi. Zhu tells Baichi to stop wasting time on the batwing dragons. As Baichi heads over to the sly, Zhu cockily asks if they want to play cat and mouse. He exclaims that they chose the wrong opponent, and in terms of flexibility and agility, Baichi is much better than them. He finds a spot where there are a lot of fruits and a few dragons. He decides that they shall pick one of them. As Baichi smells the fruit, suddenly a decadent dragon comes behind them. Baichi pierces the dragon with her frozen tail, and Emoyi also slashes the dragon. Following this, Baichi freezes the fruit. However, she chirps in confusion, saying that she is unable to pick it off. Zhu says that it is no wonder only a few of those dragons got the fruits for so long if even Baichi is unable to pick off the vine ball by freezing it. Baichi chirps, saying that she'll deal with the other dragons, and tells Zhu to find a way to pick the fruits himself. Zhu acknowledges this and tells Baichi to kill all the decadent dragons who haven't gotten the demon shadow. He tells Baichi to not let go of any of them and says that he will get Qingzhua. Baichi chirps in response and says no problem. As Zhu climbs, he hears a voice crying for help. Zhu says that it is a voice transforming decadent dragon that can imitate a call for help. He calls the dragon very evil and scheming and says that he must kill it first. ASBMOE heads towards the decadent dragon, Zhu orders him to kill it. However, before MOE can do anything, Qingzhua appears and bites the dragon. Zhu asks Xinghua why is she here with Qingzhua. He warns her that it is dangerous and says that she better stay away. Xinghua says that she heard the sound of the voice transforming decadent dragon. She points at something and says that it was calling for that thing. As the leaves begin to rustle, Zhu stares intensely. Suddenly, an ancient venomous fly dragon appears from the leaves. Shu wonders how many years has the dragon lived. He notices that it has even evolved horns on its head. He realizes that Qingzhua and Haya are no match for it. Shu tells Moe to kill the ancient venomous fly dragon, saying that they're a team. Moe immediately springs into action, while the ancient dragon begins to spray poison in his direction. Xu tells Xinghua to avoid the dragon and instructs her to run to the floating cliff. Xinghua says okay as she leaves with Xinghua. Suddenly, the ancient venomous fly dragon begins to fall. It buzzes, saying that there is no escape as it falls towards Moe. Moe slices a few of the ancient venomous fly dragon legs, which buzzes in pain. Moe continues to attack the dragon from all directions, causing its blood to spurt out. The ancient fly dragon retaliates by shooting its venom in Moe's direction. But Moe remains unharmed and launches another attack against the buzzing fly dragon. Xinghua tells Zhu that they should pick the fruits since Moe has drawn the ancient venomous fly dragon away. Zhu says that the vines are too strong and even magic is useless against them. He says that to get the fruits, the decadent dragons use their claws and teeth to rub the fruits little by little. Xinghua points at Qingzhua and tells Zhu to look. Kinzguo performs a dragon whisper. Seeing this, Zhu wonders if Qingzhua is communicating with the fruit. The vine retracts, revealing the fruit. Zhu is shocked to learn that it was so simple, the fruit can be opened by saying just a few words. As he plucks the fruit, he suddenly becomes hypnotized. His mouth starts watering and exclaims he wants to eat it. Just as he is about to take a bite, Mr. Koi slaps his head, causing Zhu to snap out of the trance. Mr. Koi tells Zhu that if a human eats the fruit, a sky vine will grow out of his belly. Zhu says that he didn't expect the fruit to have such a strong delusion effect. Mr. Koi says that it can even tempt creatures who can't digest them. Once they are eaten, they desperately absorb the nutrients, and when the time comes, they germinate and break people's stomachs. Zhu acknowledges the information and says that he will get Haya to pick the fruits nearby, and then they'll find a place to wait for Baichi. Zhu asks Qingzhua if he can eat these fruits. Qingzhua cheeps, saying that he'll be okay even if he eats 100 fruits. Haya says that he will also be fine if he eats it and asks Zhu to give him one. Zhu boinks Haya, saying that he is just greedy. 
He tells Haya that he can't eat them on the sly and reminds him that once he lowers his head, he will hit his head. Suddenly, Mr. Koi urgently calls out Zhu's name. Zhu sees a group of dragons heading towards their way. He calls it annoying, however, he says luckily, the place is spacious enough for Haya to fight. He exclaims that before Baichi comes back, they need to protect these fruits. Holding Mo Yi in his hand, Xu commands Haya to follow him and tells Qingzhui to protect Xinghua and the fruits. Haya attacks the venomous dragons with his claw. He roars as two dragons surround him. Seeing this, Xu tells Haya to watch out and slashes the dragon with the sword. Haya gives him a thumbs up and cheeps, calling Xu cool. Xu notices that there are way too many decadent dragons and they are way too fast. Haya cannot deal with so many of them at the same time. Suddenly, his attention is drawn to Qingzhuo. Qingzhuo swallows the fruits and cheeps as its energy courses through him. Xu questions whether Qingzhuo is demonized as he sees Qingzhuo's left side has turned purple. Mr. Koi says that after eating the demon awakening fruit, Qingzhuo has obtained the sacred qi and the demonic power. As Mr. Koi had said, the fruit is of great help to a sacred cyan forest dragon. Zhu can tell that Qingzhuo is making huge progress and is becoming more powerful. With his newfound demonic powers, Qingzhuo takes control of the sky vine, and Zhu is shocked to see him controlling the vines. The vines begin to charge at the badwing dragons and plunge through them. Qingzhuo's eyes release a weird green and purple light which creates monsters made up of purple leaves. As the monsters feast on the batwing dragons, Xu exclaims that Qingzhuo has gotten way stronger than before and it feels like most deities or demons are no match for him. Qingzhuo once again cheeps loudly. Controlling the vines, he plunges through the rest of the batwing dragons and massacres them all. Xu remembers that due to his damaged constitution, Qingzhuo had failed to enter the maturation stage. However, the demon awakening fruit has fixed this problem. With the power of the demon god, Qingzhuo is nearly as powerful as Baichi and Moe. Xu asks Mr. Koi when will the demon fruit stop taking effect. Mr. Koi says that it will soon stop, but it will last long enough until the fight ends. Xu asks if the fruit has any side effects and will the fruit be useless if Qingzhuo consumes too many of them. Mr. Koi says that won't happen, and if that was the case, he wouldn't have seen those decadent dragons going crazy. Xu says that he has got a point. The power of the demon fruit will be gone soon enough, but Xu has a pile of demon awakening fruits. He happily exclaims that Qingzhuo will become a mighty dragon monarch once he consumes a demon fruit before any battles. Xinghua giggles at Xu's antics. She notes that Xu has found a new way to level up from the relics. Xu notices that there are almost no demon shadow decadent dragons left. He wonders how are things going with Baichi. Meanwhile, a voice transforming decadent dragon with two heads roars is seen running. The dragon head exclaims that they need to run. The other head with a green eye responds that the sky wine is under Qingzhuo's control and they have nowhere to go. Suddenly, Baichi appears in front of the dragon and chirps that she has finally found it. The green-eyed head exclaims that it is time for them to end it. The dragon head releases a whirlwind of purple energy to attack Baichi. However, Baichi successfully dodges it. She shoots ice at the dragon and uses her destructive power to create cracks in the ground. She uses the destructive power to electrocute the voice transforming dragon. The green-eyed head realizes that Baichi is using some unknown energy to dissolve his body, and he needs to run away ASAP.MOE also arrives at the scene. The green-eyed head sees Baichi getting in his way. However, it can't step back or the sky vine will kill it. It decides to rush into the forest. Zhu smirks seeing the dragon running into the forest. He thinks that the forest will be its grave. Qingzhuo cheeps as he entangles the voice transforming decadent dragon into his branches. He shoots a purple and green light at the dragon, instantly killing it. Zhu praises Baichi and Qingzhuo for a job well done. He extracts the dragon's soul core, saying that the soul cores of the voice transforming decadent dragon and the ancient venomous dragon belong to him. He celebrates the fact that he'll make at least 200,000 golden grits by selling them. He suggests to Xinghua that they should go to the floating cliff, 
saying that maybe there are some treasures they haven't discovered yet. Xinghua agrees with him and they head to the floating cliff. Xu says that it is merely a tiny island without any treasures and they came to a dead end thanks to this cliff. He asks if they should climb over it. Xinghua says that they'd better not do that. She points at the ancient worm nemesis under the cliff and asks if Xu has seen them. She says that none of them is a pushover. Hearing this, Xu decides that they'll come back. He says that there must be another access to the relic and they can ask some elders from the Pear Blossom Valley about it. Perhaps they are aware of it. Xinghua agrees with him. Chu says that maybe they can ask Hu Jiaru about the decadent dragons since his ancestors had fought against them for ages. He says that those dragons used to rule the brown continent, but their origins remain unknown. He adds that perhaps they are from the ancient relics, and they kept coming out of the cracks of the relics, destroying the land around them. Xinghua says that he raises a good point, however, without the demon awakening fruits, those dragons do not stand a chance to continue their sabotage. She says that it's also a huge relief to the villagers in the Pear Blossom Valley. Chu says she is right. He says that he will head to their nest in a while to deal with all of them. As they arrive back, Yusua says that they are back. Chu feels something is odd. Isn't Yusua supposed to ask what they did before coming back? She always used to think that Chu might take advantage of Yusua and always used to investigate after seeing them coming back together. He wonders what is going on with her. Yusuo, who is sitting beside Mairu, asks why did they return here again. Xinghua notices Zhu's confused expression. She informs him that she and Zhu were only gone for a short while in their eyes. Hearing this, Zhu says that explains a lot. Time in the relics isn't the same as the world they live in. Zhu calls it amazing and says that they shall pay another visit after purifying the wells. He thinks that although he has obtained a lot of treasures from the relics, there must be something they haven't discovered. Yusuo asks Mairu her name, saying that she hasn't introduced herself to them yet. Mairu introduces herself as Shirmairu. Yusuo says she has a good name and asks who came up with it. Before she can answer, Luo asks the girl if Shirhua is her grandmother, and Mairu says yes. Luo asks if she lived alone in the village since Miss Shir got injured while easing the tension among the villages. He calls Miss Shur the hero of Pear Blossom Valley and Mairu agrees with him. He says that if it hadn't been for Miss Shur, the Pear Blossom Valley might have not existed. Zhu interrupts him, asking where the stream in this valley coming from. Luo reveals that it is coming from an underground cave which is strewn with crystals. The water from there is mixed with mud and gem pieces, and it sustains their life. Hearing about the stream with gems, Zhu calls the place incredibly rich. However, he realizes that no matter how rich they are, living a peaceful life is like daydreaming for them. Ju says that he has brought some resins that are able to purify the water. He asks if anyone can take him to the cave. Luo responds that the cave is dark actually, and it is easy to get lost because of the watercourses in all directions. He reveals that even they have no idea where exactly the water comes from. Myra volunteers to go with Ju. She says that she might know the exact location of it. Luo tells her to not be ridiculous. He says that even the best patrol in their village stands the slightest chance of finding it, let alone a little girl. Myra says that a person, who fell over the rift valley, told her a dark lake in that underground cave was filled with gems, and that is the place Chu most likely needs to visit. Chu asks her where that person is now. She says that person is at the grave back in the village, the person had told her that he hated water because it ruined everything he had. He was trapped in the cave until the storm washed him away, after which he managed to get out. She tells them that she buried him properly, and in return, he told her this secret. Luo says in disbelief that it wasn't a dead corpse that fell into the river. Myra says that it indeed was. She reveals that she has been able to communicate with the dead since she grew up. Hearing this, Xu asks how does that work. Xinghua takes Myra's side and reveals that she is a spiritualist. She explains that the soul of the deceased lingers in the world for a long time, and spiritualists are capable of seeing these souls. They can talk to the souls and even control them. Nian Nian asks if souls are what they call spirits. She exclaims that's horrifying. 
Zhu asks Mairu if she knows where to find that dark lake in the underground cave. She confirms this, claiming that she walked along that way once. However, she says that she stopped and didn't go down there when she saw the rift the person told her about. Zhu says that they should split up. He instructs Bailing to stay back to protect Nian Nian and Luo. The rest of them will head to the dark lake with Mairu and take all the treasures. He tells them to pour the rest of the resins into the lake, while he kills the decadent dragons in the stone village. Yusua says alright, while Luo asks if he is going to kill the dragons on his own. He asks if he is sure about it. Zhu reassures him, saying that he might have needed some help earlier, but this time he can handle it. That he says that Qingzhua is nearly a dragon monarch with his demonic power, and since the demon awakening fruits now belong to him, those dragons have lost the demon shadow. He can deal with all of them in the right way. Xinghua asks Yusuo to let little Changi go with Zhu and offer him some help. Yusuo reluctantly agrees, thinking that if it weren't for Xinghua, she'd have come back to the village and dealt with the dragons. Zhu sits on top of Haya and sees Bai Qi and Qinghua take the rest of them away. Little Changi exclaims that he wants to travel instead of fighting. Zhu asks Changi if he knows some magic that can help them return to being their best since they just fought in the ancient relics. Changi says nope, he isn't as omnipresent as Zhu thinks of him. Zhu realizes there is only one way for him. He needs to find their leader and kill them all. As Zhu arrives at the stone village, he is taken aback to see the decadent dragons guarding the gate. He wonders how shall he get inside and find their leader. He wishes that an observant dragon that is skilled in hiding itself would sneak in there. Disappointed, he realizes that he needs more dragons. Mr. Koi agrees with him, saying that even though he only has four dragons, he doesn't raise any young spiritlings. Mr. Koi begs him for God's sake to get some spiritlings. He slaps Zhu on the head, saying that he is the only one he can share with all he has got. Zhu tries to defend himself, saying that he just hasn't found a young spiritling that he wants to raise. Mr. Koi tells him to just search for one. He suggests that Zhu come to some sacred mountains and look for the supreme dragon. If Zhu keeps a supreme dragon under his control, it will save Zhu a lot of golden grits to tame it. Zhu thinks about hunting a dragon. However, he thinks that an adult dragon is too mature to respect people like them. Signing the soul contract with it is generally not an easy thing, let alone with a rookie like him. Zhu asks if the fish has any recommendations for him. Mr. Koi says that it will take Zhu a long time to find a rare one. He suggests a purple dragon for Zhu, saying that it will be a good choice for him. Hearing about a purple dragon, Zhu thinks that it's incredible, and it is just a matter of time before he obtains dragons with all kinds of colors. He remembers that Shout Song has a goat-like purple dragon and asks if he needs to find another one in the purple forest sect. Mr. Koi confirms this saying that the Purple Forest Sect is the leader of the four sects in the Jiting continent. The Purple Forest Sect can discover the Purple Dragon's descendants from common young spirits and help creatures transform into dragons. Zhu acknowledges this and says that once all of this is finished, he will get one. He devises a plan to make up an excuse to start a competition in the Purple Forest Sect. As long as he wins the contest, he will demand them to give him a purple dragon as a reward. Mr. Koi says that there are various purple dragons. Some of them have less pure bloodline than Haya, therefore, he needs to find a supreme one. Hearing this, Haya roars in disbelief, asking if his bloodline is not pure. Mr. Koi tells Haya to shut up. He says that among those ancient crocodiles in ancient times, Haya is the only one making such huge progress. He says they often call this a miracle. Following this, Mr. Koi says that Haya only focuses on food and wastes his tongue. He tells Haya that he will be the first one to fight decadent dragons. Zhu says never mind and tells Haya that he will get better with the molten heavy armor inscription as long as he manages to awaken it. Zhu points out that the dragons are still guarding the gate. He asks Mr. Koi how will they get in. Mr. Koi says that he knows a way to get inside. A rock shakes as Zhu comes out of the secret tunnel. He sarcastically says that this is the way Mr. Koi had found. He asks how he got to know about this secret place. Mr. Koi tells Xu to thank his instincts. 
Zhu says that back when they came to the second village, the bewitched people were just like anyone else, and they even pretended to defend themselves against the dragons. Shu remembers that Myra had said they lost their souls. He wonders if they are dead, why are they acting as if they're alive and who is controlling them? Chu says that if they believe the decadent dragons constitute a hierarchical tribe, which kind of dragon is responsible for controlling these people's minds? He thinks that despite their awareness, the ancient venomous fly dragon and the dirty knight decadent dragon are incapable of bewitching people unless they are guided by a clever one who is also aware of everything about the people. However, even if there is one who matches Zhu's description, it is only able to control the living, the dead are not included. He realizes that the only one who can talk to the dead is the spiritualist aka Myra. Zhu realizes that it is no wonder he found Myra's words a bit strange. He rushes over to check the grave of the drowned spirit Myra had mentioned. He arrives at a place, thinking that this is supposed to be the grave she told them. He looks at a tombstone in confusion and notices Elder Sherhua's name is written on it. He realizes Myra had lied to them, this is not the grave of the drowned person. He thought Myra had survived by hiding among the dead in the well, which had kept the decadent dragons from smelling her. However, the reason she hid there was probably that she didn't want people to realize she was the one controlling the corpses. Realization dawns upon Zhu as he becomes certain that she is the leader of those decadent dragons. They have been deceived by her. He thinks that Xinghua and Yusuo might get in danger. Myra could tell them to head to the nest of the decadent dragons. Zhu asks Changyi to find his master, saying that they need to catch up with them ASAP. Changyi says sure. He tells Zhu to follow his lead and calls him an idiot. Zhu hopes that it is not too late as he rushes. Meanwhile, Myra says that this is the rift she had told them about. Yusuo tells Xinghua to stay with Myra, saying that they will go down to the rift. Xinghua says alright and looks at Myra, while Yusuo makes her way down. Xinghua thinks that it seems Xu has also realized something isn't right. Changyi guides Zhu, telling him to go that way. As they arrive at the rift, Changyi says that thanks to him, Xu was able to find them so soon. Xu remembers that Xinghua had told Changyi to go with him. He wonders if she had already found out about this fraud and wanted him to come back in time. Xu says that it is a complex terrain. The dark lake in that underground cave could be the place where decadent dragons live. He thinks that he needs to speed up since Yusuo is not powerful enough to protect everyone. Meanwhile, Myra asks Xinghua whether the ladies outside are as pretty as her. Xinghua asks if she has never been out of Pear Blossom Valley. Myra says that her didn't allow her to step out of the valley, and she blamed her for even walking out of their village. Hearing this, Xinghua asks whether her grandma was hard on her. Myra says not really, her grandmother kept her from telling everyone that she can see spirits, and she always used to say that what she saw were not spirits. Xinghua points out that she could have left after her grandmother's death. She asks why she is still here then. Myra says that she hasn't left because her grandma said there was no way she could get out until every villager was dead. Xinghua asks if this was the reason she attempted to kill everyone in the village. She says that the decadent dragons are just an excuse Myra made up, right? Myra says that she is confused. Xu finally appears on MOE and sees Xinghua and Myra alone. He curses in frustration, seeing that there are only two of them. He thinks that Xinghua might get in danger. Xinghua shakes her finger as Xu nears them. Seeing this, he stops in his tracks, wondering whether she is signaling for him to stay put. Xinghua says that she will put it simply. She asks Myra if she controlled the dead villagers. Myra hesitantly says that she did. Xinghua says that those people also lived in the Pear Blossom Valley and asks Myra why she killed them. Myra says that she didn't get them killed. She only wanted to drive Zhu and the team away, but they were way more powerful than she had imagined. Xinghua asks if that means the decadent dragons ended their lives. Myra says that they didn't do it either. Emoyi swishes through the air and passes Myra's neck. Shu exclaims that Myra slaughtered every single villager. He calls her way more ruthless than the decadent dragons. Myra exclaims that they didn't kill them. Shu summons Haya and Baichi, 
saying that he checked the grave she had told them about, and it wasn't of the drowning spirit. He exclaims that he doesn't want any tricks from those dragons or she will regret this. Mairu remains silent. Suddenly Yusuo comes back up, asking who will regret what. They are shocked to see her safe and sound. Shu asks Yusuo if she hadn't seen anything. He is surprised to see her come up just like that. Yusuo says that she sure did. She found numerous gems and poured the resins into the lake. She exclaims that the people in Pear Blossom Valley will have clean water in some time. Shu asks if there was no sign of decadent dragons down there. Yusuo says that she wished to find some, but the dirty night decadent dragons didn't find this place yet. Additionally, there were no traces left by decadent dragons in the dark lake. Xu and Xinghua wonder whether they were wrong about Myra, but she did admit it. Yusuo tells Xu to get his eyes off Myra, saying that he still hasn't answered her question yet. Xu nervously says that Yusuo got him wrong. He was just asking Myra if she had ever met any clever decadent dragons. He says that in his view, he thought there was a mastermind behind all this. If they know its features and capabilities, they may have a chance of getting it. Hearing this, Myra sighs in relief. Xu changes the subject and tells Baichi to take a look down. He tells Baichi that there are a lot of gems down there as Myra had said. Hearing this, Baichi immediately begins to head down. Xu asks Baichi if there are any nests of decadent dragons. Baichi chirps, saying there aren't any nests and no decadent dragons have come here. Shu asks her about the gems. Baichi chirps, saying that she has put them in her tail. Shu says that they are unlikely to find decadent dragons even if they search every corner of the Pear Blossom Valley. And that is it. Xinghua says that they should come back and join Nian Yan. Shortly afterwards, as they arrive back, the wooden door rises open. Bailing acknowledges their arrival and asks Zhu how did it go. Zhu informs her that the water has been purified, and the decadent dragons outside the stone village have gone, with a few of them hiding far away from here. Luo questions if that's really the case, and exclaims that it's brilliant. He apologizes to Myra for underestimating her, saying that he didn't expect her to find the place the water was coming from. As Myra remains silent, Yusuo places her hand on her shoulder. She appreciates Myra for playing a great role in repelling the decadent dragons outside the village. She declares Myra a hero just like her grandmother. Myra nervously says that it was the right thing to do. As they sit at the dinner table, Xu and Shan thanks them for purifying the water and getting rid of the decadent dragons. He says here is to them, indicating that they shall dig in. While they eat, Nian Nian comments that Zhu is barely eating. Xu thinks that something is weird with the Pear Blossom Valley, and they'd better leave ASAP. Bailing says that her childhood friend fell ill last year and was sent away for proper treatment. However, she hasn't heard from that friend since then. Xu and Shan sighs and says that he is sorry to hear that. However, he informs them that everyone is meant to die. Zhu agrees with Xu and Shan. He says that he heard Xu and Shan knows the secret to extending his life expectancy. He asks if it is true. Luo is shocked to hear this. Xu says that no one is allowed to leave the valley because they want to isolate themselves from the fights, which is the best way to stay safe. Luo nervously laughs, saying that does make sense. Following this, they cheer as they continue eating their feast. After eating, Xu says that they will leave now. He says that in the days to come, they will need to fight the decadent dragons on their own. Xu and Chan acknowledges this. He hands over a bag of gems to Zhu, appreciating what he has done for them. Zhu accepts the bag and thanks Sun Han. As they head back, Yusu remarks that Zhu seems different. She asks if they are really leaving without dealing with all the decadent dragons. Zhu says that he doesn't want to stay here anymore. Bailing questions what is going on. Nian Nian asks if they have found everyone in the valley a bit weird. She points out that they have only talked to a handful of people since they arrived, and the people they met didn't even show them around. Furthermore, when they expressed their intention to leave, they simply walked them out. Nian Nian asks if she has anything else to add. Nian Nian says that despite the light in their houses, none of them felt like they were homes. She says that a house in an isolated place isn't like that. She looks back at the valley, 
saying that no kids were seen hanging out nor the women were seen chattering. There weren't any vendors selling stuff and she didn't even hear clucks or barks. Hearing this, Bailing says that is very creepy. Xinghua speaks up, saying that there is something they don't know about why the Pear Blossom Valley is an isolated place. Chu says precisely it is supposed to be a village controlled by spiritualists. Yusuo asks in shock what he means. Xinghua says that more specifically it is a village full of dead people. It is said about 30,000 people lived here. But the only people they have come across are alive and they are all spiritualists. Xu says that the dead people they encountered in the stone village weren't bewitched by decadent dragons. They were controlled by Shermairu instead. Yusuo asks if Myra guided those dragons to laughter the whole village. Xu says no, they were dead from the outset. Nian Nian asks if those people are really ghosts. Xinghua says that not every spiritualist is able to control the soul except the powerful ones. She adds that they can even make the soul look alive. Bailing presents her theory, saying that the spiritualists reside in the Pear Blossom Valley. They manage each village by controlling souls, and that is why people outside think it is merely an isolated place. She exclaims in shock, wondering if the girl she hangs out with is a spiritualist, or just dead. Yusua says but what about those decadent dragons? Suddenly, all of them realize that those decadent dragons are under their control and are basically their pets. Luo appears with the decadent dragons. Xu exclaims that it is him. Xu Enchan says that they prefer to be called gods of death instead of spiritualists. Bailing remembers the saying that decadent dragons are servants of gods of death. She exclaims that it is them. It is no wonder the dragons aren't extinct yet, turns out they are all behind this. Xu Enchan says that since they have figured out their secret, there is no way they can leave the valley. His hand starts glowing as a star symbol forms on it. He places his hand on the ground and the star symbol creates a field around him. Zhu exclaims if he is controlling corpses. The corpses begin to howl and start heading towards them. Zhu realizes that this place is a trap strewn with graves, and that's why they didn't ask them to stay longer. Luo looks from above as the army of corpses charges forward. He whistles and the decadent dragons also come to fight. Seeing this, Xu summons Mo Yi, Bai Qi, and Qingzhua. Giving Qingzhua a demon fruit, Xu tells him to eat it and deal with those decadent dragons. Qingzhua eats the fruit, and his left side turns purple. He extends branches towards the decadent dragons. He entangles the dragons into the branches and crushes them to death. Bai Qi chirps as she gets ready to attack the corpses. As Xu commands her to freeze them, Bai Qi unleashes a chilly frost on the corpses. Xu Chan curses in frustration. He knew Zhu was rather powerful, but he didn't expect his ghouls to be so weak fighting Bai Qi. He turns to Myru and asks if she has asked the third and fourth villages for help. Myru nervously says that she has. Xu Chan creates another star symbol. He says that they shouldn't have disrespected them, and once their reinforcements are here, they have no way out. Following this, he slams the star symbol on the ground. Due to this, the corpses Bai Chi had frozen break through the ice and form a ghoul formation. Seeing this, Xinghua says that the corpses have improvised in defense. Yusua says that fire might work on them. She says that she can give it a go. She claps her hands and exclaims that she shall burn them to ashes. Her Kailan dragon emerges from the spirit domain and lets out a mighty roar. Yusua orders it to incinerate the corpses and their graves. Zhu is surprised by this and thinks that Yusua is such a violent woman. As Kailin burns the corpses, Xu Enchan cries for his ghouls and calls Yusua a wicked woman. He turns to Myru and demands to know where her reinforcements are. Myru says that they are probably still on their way here. Xu Enchan asks what she means by probably. He questions whether she has informed them or not. As Myru nervously begins to say something. Xu Enchan clenches his fist in anger. He strikes her hand, exclaiming that she has double-crossed them. He says that she lied to them about forgetting where the demon cave locations, and she didn't deliberately take Xinghua and Yusua to the wrong place. Myro falls to the ground. Xu Enchan begins to strangle her, saying that she is a shameless traitor just like her grandmother, and they should have just killed her. 
Xinghua pleads with Zhu to save Myra since, unlike the others, she has been helping them to leave this place. Xu tells her not to worry and says that Myra will be fine. He sends Mo Yi flying towards Xuanshan. Luo warns his father Xuanshan that a sword is coming his way. However, before Xuanshan can do anything, the sword pierces through his body and blood begins to pour out. Myra coughs as she is finally able to breathe again. Luo cries for his father. Filled with rage, he exclaims that he will kill them all and turn them into his puppets. The decadent dragons begin to charge at them. Chu says that he has brought this upon himself and unleashes his fire sword coiled dragon. Luo, riding on a decadent dragon and charging towards Zhu, shouts that he will need to pay for ending his father's life. Zhu screams flying sword and the sword flashes as it pierces Luo's body. Luo falls off the dragon and lands on the ground. As the decadent dragons begin to consume Luo's body, Xu says that those decadent dragons took advantage of him to kill more people, instead of acting as his pets. Meanwhile, Mo Yi soars and continues to attack the decadent dragons. Xu commands Baichi to use destructive eye. He thinks that Baichi has mastered an unknown mystic art after restoring his bloodline. Bailing points at the decadent dragons in the sky and exclaims that they are fleeing. Myra says that she can tell them to come back. Xu looks at Xuanshan standing upright. He wonders whether Myru is controlling Xuanshan's dead body. Myru, controlling Xuanshan's body, forces the decadent dragons to come back. Xu says that they are flying back. He asks Yusuo if they should leave them to her Kailin. Yusuo says all right and commands her Kailin dragon to send them to hell. The Kailin dragon burns the decadent dragons to ashes. Shu asks Myru if those decadent dragons were raised by her clansmen. Myru says no and reveals that they used to learn how to be a spiritualist. Some spiritualists who had the ability to communicate with the decadent dragons appeared out of nowhere. She says that the songs were merely the gatekeepers of their village and there are more professional spiritualists. She suggests they get out of the valley before they come after them. Xinghua asks what is she going to do then? Myru stutters that she doesn't know. Xinghua says that staying here seems unlikely for her and asks if they could take Myru along with them. Zhu agrees with Xinghua and says that they should go now. As they leave, Bailing wonders why she didn't find anything out of the ordinary in the valley. Myru says that the Pear Blossom Valley used to be a peaceful shelter and rich in resources for the spiritualists. But one day, the deceased was transferred to spiritualists instead of being buried properly and it looked like they were still alive. He granny was killed for disapproving their doings. She tried to leave, but those elders grounded her in the stone village in case she would reveal their secret. Xu asks if the request for help was also one of their traps. Myra says that's exactly it. As the gatekeepers of the first village, the Sangs wanted more people to feed the decadent dragons, so they asked for help. She says that before they arrived, a few groups of people died. Although she led those souls to stop Shu and his team from getting in, they still managed to come in. Since that, Luo had kept an eye on her, and she was also afraid to speak the truth. Shu says that explains a lot. He didn't expect Luo and his father to be so vicious. They arrive at the Rain City and Myra thinks this place outside their village is very lively. Xinghua says that Myra's clansmen might look for her when they are unable to find her body, so she needs a new name. Myra says that's great. As they continue walking, Xinghua asks what she thinks of the name Jiro. Myra says that she loves it and thanks Xinghua. Xinghua ruffles her hair and tells her to not lie to them anymore. They have forgiven her since she is still a kid. She says that Myra managed to fool everyone except her. Myra listens to Xinghua and says that she won't lie to them anymore. Inside the Lord's mansion, Xu exclaims that he is super rich now. He has obtained 700,000 golden grits from the D family. Nian Nian opens the door, saying that he shouldn't be so smug. She says that his dragons aren't gonna have anything to eat. Zhu exclaims in shock, asking if their food is running out again. Nian Nian confirms this and says that how Yi can hunt demonic beasts for Haya, but he has to buy some juice for Qingzhua. She shows Xu a bill and says that the money spent on Bai Qi's food for two months is about 150,000 golden grits. 
She chose moon crystals for Baichi this time since she prefers them and it helps with her bloodline. Zhu exclaims 75,000 golden grits for a month. He realizes that this line of work really needs a lot of golden grits. He says that he got some decadent dragon soul cores which could be valuable. Perhaps they should sell them. Nian Nian says that if specific channels are allowed in Rain City, the freight charge will decrease by 40%. Zhu adds that apart from this, he can also collect taxes as the city lord. Nian Nian calls this incredible. She says that she heard the Grey Wolf Cavalry had put an end to their terrible past. They not only take care of bandits, but also escort trade caravans on the Brown Continent. Zhu says that they have applied to use the city seal, and with that seal, they will carry out their plan. One month later, Lien Feiling, an administrator of the Divine Mortal Academy, asks who is the city lord. Judging their attire, Zhu thinks that they seem to be from the Divine Mortal Academy. Zhu says that it's been a month. He asks whether they are here to return the city seal. Failing says no. He reveals that they covered for the order sustainer and have come here to conduct an investigation. Confused, Shu asks what they mean by covered for the order sustainer. Failing says that a while ago, Zhu declared the rain city to be under Lichuan Kingdom's management. He reveals that Zhu is suspected of staying out of the war between kingdoms and occupying a city without a leader on behalf of the Divine Mortal Academy by using the loophole in the law. Bailing thinks that can't be true, they have done everything legally. Zhu says that it seems they have come here to cause trouble for them. Fan Lu, a teacher of the Divine Mortal Academy, tells Zhu to not be ridiculous. She says that they are just obeying the order. Zhu extends his hand and asks if they have his city seal. Failing says that if they find any problem, they won't give him the city seal. Zhu says that he is the city lord, and if he can't have it, then who else will? Failing tells him to cut the crap and says that they need to ask some questions from the Grand Counselor. Zhu says that the Grand Counselor is sleeping. Fan Lu points out that it is daylight now. Zhu says that he and his wife stayed on the roof to watch the moon and have drinks. They didn't go to bed until this morning. Fan Lu tells him to stop speaking nonsense. She says that she won't buy his story about watching the moon all night long. A an old man from the crowd laughs, saying that of course they didn't watch the moon all night. He suggestively says what else would they do at night. Another man beside him jokes that they obviously had a fun night regardless. Fan Lu blushes and calls Zhu shameless. Zhu face palms thinking why the old man had to say that. He looks more like a horny thanks to his words. Failing asks if he is Xu Minglang. He says that during the competition, Xu had defeated royals and first disciples from the Purple Forest sect, the Haochi Martial Arts sect, and the Sword sect in the Miao Mountains. He calls this rather impressive. Xu says that he feels flattered. However, besides them, he says that he has also beaten hundreds of powerful disciples from the Black Dragon Palace, the Pu family, and their divine mortal academy. He boasts that he doesn't pick on the weak and prefers to handle his enemies on his own. Fan Lu says that was a competition for disciples, so what is the big deal? Zhu says that he is only stating the truth. He says that he has done many incredible things over the years, and not to mention, he won first place in that competition. The jaws of the people in the crowd drop upon hearing this. Failing tells him to stop bragging, saying that there is no way he will obtain the city seal without passing their test. He says that they won't let Rain City be managed by a kingdom where a bunch of lowlives live. He says that the city seal belongs to the academy, and asks Xu for two million golden grits, otherwise, he can't be the city lord. Xu asks if they are picking on him. He says that the city seal is his, he just needed them to keep it for a moment, but now they are refusing to give it back. He threatens them saying that they have a week's time to give him the seal, or he will come to their academy and he isn't sure what he will do then. Failing exclaims how dare he order them. Chu says that since they are reluctant to protect the city, they shall get out. He says that he is thinking about who will have the authority over Rain City. The people from the crowd wonder if they are mistaken or he really just told them to get out. They call this a bold move on Zhu's part. Failing laughs and calls Zhu an idiot. He says that without their academy, 
the four kingdoms and the brown kingdoms will no longer exist, and there will be no authority in the city. He says that there is no way Zhu could be the owner of Rain City, claiming that they won't let that happen. He demands Zhu do as he says or piss off. He says Zhu will also lose everything he has got. Fan Lu presents a scroll to the crowd and says that starting today, the Rain City is no longer under the Divine Mortal Academy's protection, and it is a sinful city now. She says that they shall leave this city, or they will be regarded as criminals. Any clans unwilling to move out will be viewed as evil gangs. She throws the scroll in front of Zhu's feet, informing him that it is the note written by the Order Sustainer. She tells him to read it word by word. Xu asks who is the Order Sustainer. Failing says that it is Mr. Yan Guan, the headmaster of their academy. Xu asks what is his name then. Failing introduces his name and says that he is the administrator of the Divine Mortal Academy. He says that from today onwards, all spiritual energy in the Rain City will be withdrawn, and if they don't leave ASAP, the Divine Mortal Academy shall wipe him out as they did to those bandits. He exclaims that he shouldn't dare. However, before he can finish, Zhu asks him whether Failing knows why he left the capital. He asks him if the names of Prince Ang and Zhao Ying ring a bell. Failing asks what he is trying to say. Zhu reminds him that Zhao Ying lost his limbs and reveals that he was the one who cut them off. Zhu tells Failing to inform the Order Sustainer about how petty he is and let him wait for him. He tells Failing to piss off. Appalled by Zhu's behavior, Failing questions what the hell did he say. He begins to leave with Fan Lu and his other men, saying that there is nothing they can do to an idiot and that this isn't over for Zhu. Yu Soa says that it is too kind of Xu to say such words and he shouldn't have let them go. Xu thinks there Yu Soa is and she is still cranky and bad-tempered as ever. I in the Lord's Mansion. Bailing says that as Rain City is viewed as a sinful city right now, the clans craving the resources here are surely accepting to loot the city. Chongming says that with this order, the Rain City will be put into hell by the greedy bastards of the Brown Continent, and the people of the Academy won't even get involved. How Yu mentions that there are at least two order sustainers on the continent. He suggests that if they gain approval from another order sustainer, they could avoid this crisis. Bailing adds that they could only proceed with this if they have differences on this kind of matter or if they don't get along. Xu asks if any of them know who the order sustainer is. Bailing, Chongming, and how Yu say no in unison. Xu says that if even Bailing is unaware of another order sustainer, that is surely a mysterious person. Bailing says that she doesn't even have an idea who Yan Guang is. Yan Yan asks how could that be, don't the two of them work in the same place? Mairu raises her hand and says that maybe she knows something about another order sustainer. She begins to explain that her grandmother came back one day and said the order sustainer found out the secret of their village and he meant to wipe them out. Xinghua asks if she has any leads about that order sustainer. Myra says that he resides right in the Green Cattle Mount. Hearing this, Zhu wonders if she is talking about the Green Cattle Mount in Two Kingdom. He thinks it's not far away from here. Mr. Koi appears and says that a dark purple dragon with a gray tail sounds familiar to him. He remembers that it is the first choice among the dragons he recommended to Shu. He tells Shu to get the dragon and keep it under his control. Shu says that dragon belongs to the Order Sustainer. Chongming says that he and his sister are heading towards the Green Cattle Mount. He hopes the Order Sustainer cancels the punishment on Rain City. Xu says all right, but they only have one week. If they fail, people here will be viewed as criminals and their lives will be on the line. Meanwhile, a herd of cattle moves standing near a stream. On the other side of the stream, a group of hunters are seen staring at them. A bearded hunter in the group says that this strong cattle will fall asleep by the sleeping adder they have on them, and then they will take it away. Suddenly, an eagle dragon catches a cow from the herd. The cows moo in panic and begin to run away from the eagle dragons chasing them. The hunters begin to run as the cows come in their direction. They exclaim that the cows have been startled and they need to get out of their way. They hide behind a rock as the herd passes. The bearded hunter sighs in relief. He calls it dangerous and exclaims that they were almost trampled to death by the cattle. Suddenly, a man asks the bearded hunter who he is. 
The bearded hunter responds that they are a group of hunters from the Rain City, and they make a living through hunting. The man's name is Bei Yenshan, and he is the young master of Bei's manor. Hearing about their occupation, Bei Yenshan says that it means they are just a bunch of criminals. He orders the eagle dragons to kill them. The bearded man tries to clarify that it isn't like that and that they used to live in the Rain City. Yenshan asks his companions if they want to have some fun. One of his companions wearing a pastel blue robe says sure. He asks Yenshan what he plans to do. Yenshan lets out an evil laugh and tells his eagle dragon to get the bearded man. The eagle dragon immediately grabs the bearded man who cries out for help. They take him high in the sky and Yenshan says that if the bearded man falls at this height, he bets 1000 golden grits that he will die. He asks what he thinks. The bearded begs Yenshan to spare him. However, the eagle dragon drops the bearded man who screams in terror. As he falls, Yenshan's companions bet that he will be seriously injured and partly paralyzed. One of them laughs wickedly and says that if his head touches the ground, the paralyzed part would be his head. However, he realizes that in that case, the bearded man would leave this world right away. Meanwhile, another one of them also bets 1000 golden grits. The bearded man crashes to the ground with a bam and blood spurts out of his body. His fellow hunters call him Mr. Huang, screaming his name in terror. The hunters rush towards Mr. Huang who is surrounded by a pool of his own blood. Yen Shang checks that Mr. Huang is still breathing. His companions say that Yen Shang has lost the bet and it is time for him to keep his word. Yen Shang says that Mr. Huang is a tough guy. He thought he would be dead. He throws the grits at them, saying that they have one. The pastel blue robed man catches some of the golden grits and says that they just got lucky. Yen Shang says that they need more cases to prove that. The pastel blue robed man asks if killing Mr. Huang isn't enough for him. Yen Shang turns to the hunters and says that there are still four of them left. The hunters become terrified as they hear this. Yen Shang chuckles wickedly, saying that they may not be as lucky as Mr. Huang if the way they fall down is a bit different. The hunters begin to run as one of them exclaims to get away from them. However, they meet the same fate as Mr. Huang as the eagles also drop them from a significant height. The next day, a few hunters arrive at the rain city. They bring the bodies of their fellow hunters to Shu. One of them sighs, explaining that they were tortured while they were hunting, and he can't even imagine what they went through. Another hunter, full of hope, says that Zhu will bring those bastards to justice, wouldn't he? Another one of them agrees and says that some of them were tied up to horses and dragged to death. He says that as the Rain City is regarded as a sinful city, they will end up being labeled as criminals, and they could lose their lives at any moment. Xu looks at Mr. Huang's lifeless eyes and closes them with his hand. He tells Nian Nian to take down what they did. Nian Nian says that they were indeed ruthless and calls them monsters. She says that there are still three days left before Rain City is viewed as a sinful city, but its residents have already been abused like animals. Gaojia tells Zhu that those eagle-clawed half-dragons are clearly from Bei's manor where they raise dragons for armies. The man they call Bei is supposed to be Bei Yenchang, the young master of the manor. Zhu repeats the word Bei's manor in a curious tone. Gaojia says that the Rain City is more important than Zhu thinks. Each kingdom tries to hold it, and it is also where the academy obtains its golden grits from. Chu realizes that the Divine Mortal Academy is behind the plot of putting the Rain City through hell. Suddenly, a man arrives. He informs Chu that the people escorting the caravans were taken away, and the kidnappers want 4,000 golden grits for each of them. Gaojia tells him to give them the ransom. The man tries to protest, but Gaojia says that they must keep them safe. He tells the man to go and raise the ransom. Xu tells Nian Nian to also write this down. Gao Jia says that Xu has a pile of things to deal with, and as for what happened to the Grey Wolf Cavalry, they can handle it. Xu says that watching them suffer isn't something a city lord does. He says that he will bring them to justice. Gao Jia thanks Xu for saying that. However, he says that he thinks it is better if Xu leaves ASAP. He says that people outside the city have known what they will end up with, and whatever those bastards did, people won't blame them. Furthermore, no one can even do that after three days. Chu says but he will do it. 
he asks Gao Jie to tell him the location of Bei's manor. He will start by making them pay for the most horrible thing they did. Gao Jie informs him that it is located on the bamboo hill where a huge meadow is centered in. Meanwhile, at Bei's manor, Yenshang tells a person to look at their purebred eagle clawed half dragons and see how they keep and tame them. That person is the master of the red eyebrow manor. Yenshang says that believe it or not, their dragons are even stronger than some dragon masters. Suddenly, a servant informs Yenshang that Xu has come from the capital to see him. Yenshang screams at him, asking if he can't see that he is talking to their honored guest. Xu appears and asks if his guest is as honored as his majesty. Yenshang asks Xu who the hell he is. Xu says that it doesn't matter. He summons Mo Yi and says that he is here for fun. He says that he is going to attack him with his sword, and if he survives, he will give him 1,000 golden grits. However, if he doesn't, he will also spend 1,000 golden grits buying a coffin for him. Hearing this, Yenshang begins to laugh. He says he can't believe that a moron is standing up for those suckers. He calls this ridiculous and says that he will give Zhu 1,000 golden grits so that he can find a doctor for them. Xu says suckers, huh? He asks Yenshang if he is ready, saying that his sword is pointing at him. Yenshang tells him not to even dare. He asks if Xu doesn't know where he is. Xu introduces himself as the city lord of Rain City. He presents two choices for Yenshang. Either he comes back with him to be punished for his actions or he bets on his life. Yenshang calls Xu a lunatic and orders his servants to get rid of him. However, Zhu attacks the servants with his sword. Yenshang curses and thinks Zhu is crazy. Someone tells him to watch out. Yenshang activates his spirit domain and says that Zhu brought this upon himself. He stands back as his guards and golden eagle dragons stand in front of him. And Mo Yi plunges through the golden eagle dragon who roars in pain. Yenshang thinks that it is so close to him as the golden eagle dragon's blood splatters on him. Zhu takes his sword back and mocks that Yenshang's safety is at the cost of a bunch of people and one golden eagle dragon. He makes a snarky comment that he is indeed very crucial in their eyes. He drops a bag and tells him to receive his 1000 golden grits. He says that he lost this time, but who knows who will be the winner in the next round. Yenshang tells his servants to hurry and give all the golden grits in the manor to Xu. Zhu says that he hasn't come to rob them but to bring him justice as a city lord. The master asks if she can know what Yenshang has done. Zhu sarcastically says that he did nothing, it was the hunters who did wrong. He continues that the hunters were tossed by Yenshang's eagle dragons into the sky, and as they crawled back and accused Yenshang, they completely forgot that they made Yenshang lose the bet. The master asks Yenshang if he abused them for fun. Yenshang tries to reason with her, saying that the rain city has been known as a sinful city, and people in there are disgusting mobs. Hearing this, Xu says that he wants more rounds, doesn't he? He says that they shall have a fascinating one. He tells Yenshang to stand up and take his sword for his faster. He reassures him that it won't move around him, claiming that he is aware of the rule. Yenshang cries for the master to help him. The master requests Zhu to spare him this time. She says that Bei's manor is rather renowned, and his family is also probably the reason for his horrible behavior. As the master of the Red Eyebrow Manor, she begs Zhu to forgive him. Zhu tells her to either stand up and protect Yenshang or keep her mouth shut and go pick her dragon. He says that the ones who survived with broken bones are the ones aware of what Yenshang did and not her. So he tells the master to save her mercy. The master tells her maids let's go. As she begins to leave, Yenshan grabs her robe, saying that he knows she is powerful enough to save him. He says that in return, he will provide her with a batch of tamed golden eagle half-dragons for free. The master pushes him away and tells him to piss off. Xu tells Yenshan that here they go. Yenshan tells his servants to take this for him and offers 1,000 golden grits to each of them. However, the servants begin to flee the scene. Yenshang kneels and bows in front of Zhu, saying that he won't do this again. He begs Zhu to spare him. However, Zhu remains undeterred as he brings his sword down on Yenshang and tells him to take it.
Zhu sighs, saying that he lost again. He drops another bag of 1,000 golden grits beside Yan Shang's head. Yan Shang says that he wants to win, doesn't he? He asks Zhu to just kill him then. He says that torturing Yan Shang is exactly what he wants. He chops Yan Shang's limbs off and leaves the manor, saying that he shall move on to them. At the herb hill, Bai Qi freezes the ground beneath her. Fan Lu opens the door and asks who's there. Xu asks her if they are parasites. Fan Lu tells him to shut up. She reminds him that they are from the Divine Mortal Academy, and this is the forbidden place where they plant herbs. She exclaims that Xu has no access to it. Xu says that it is in the rain city which belongs to him. He asks since when did it become their forbidden place. Fan Lu finally recognizes him and says that it is him. Xu tells her to get out before dawn since she knows who he is, or else she will regret it. Fan Lu tells the people to get back to work. She says that if this batch of herbs isn't ripe in seven days, she will chop them off and fertilize the land. Out a woman named Liang Sifin who is a member of the Divine Mortal Academy, asks Fan Lu what's happening. Fan Lu tells her that it is just a mob from the Rain City. Xu tells them to listen up. He says that the herb hill is still under their management by dawn, so they shall pack up their things and leave. He says that until then, everyone in his herb hill will be regarded as bandits. Fan Lu says that will happen in his dreams. She exclaims that Rain City is the sinful one, and all energies belong to the Divine Mortal Academy. She demands that he stop twisting the truth. Sifin says that there are still three days left, so they still belong to the Rain City. Fan Lu asks if that even makes a difference, he merely has three days left. Xu laughs and says that she is the only one he can get reasonable with. He says that he is looking for a place to rest tonight, and he tells them to remember that they need to leave by dawn. As Xu sits on a bench, Sifin points at Bai Qi and says that Xu's white dragon is rather powerful. Therefore, they better not go against him. Fan Lu says that they can't let him grab away their herb will. A member of the academy suggests that perhaps they could bring their back up here, and if they do, he says that Fan Lu must stall that man till then. Sifin says that she is actually thinking that they should leave as members of the academy. Fan Lu tells him to ignore Sifin's words. She tells him to get back up from the punishment department by dawn. The member asks Sifin what the hell she is doing. Sifin says that she is reaping the spiritual herb as much as she can before dawn since this place won't be under their control then. The member says that it is Shu who means to hold their herb still. He says that once their backup is here, there is no way he can continue his plot. Sifin reminds him that they once held his herb hill. She says that aren't they the same as those villains? Fan Lu crosses her arms, asking asks if she is questioning the decisions of Mr. Yen Guang and the Order Sustainer. Sifin says that if Rain City isn't under their control anymore, they should return all the spiritual energy. She says that is what a decent person does. As the sun goes up, Sifin says that returning the herb hill is the way to support his decision. She says that they still use their spiritual energy and mislead people to think that they still protect the rain city. She tells Fan Lu that she is the one making things difficult for Mr. Yen. Meanwhile, Zhu, now awake from his slumber, stretches and yawns. Zhu says that here she is. He teases Fan Lu, asking if she is visiting his herb hill. Fan Lu exclaims that this place belongs to them. Zhu says that if she dies here today, it is surely her grave. He orders Bai Qi to ice the world. Bai Qi immediately does as he says and begins to ice everything. Meanwhile, the member tells Fan Lu to run. However, they are too late as Bai Qi freezes her from bottom to top. She thinks in disbelief that this can't be true. She wonders how he became so powerful. As the members of the Divine Mortal Academy stand frozen in ice, Sifin exclaims that this can't be true. As she stares at Shu and the frozen figures, bird dragons arrive at the scene. Sifin realizes Uncle Liang is here. The bird dragons land on top of the hill and Liang Quan from the punishment department asks what is going on. Sifin tells her uncle that Shu is the city lord of the Rain City. She explains everything and says that is all. Liang Quan acknowledges the information and asks Zhu if he could let them go. 
Xu apologizes to him and says that he already informed them about the consequences. He says that he is sure that they also know what's coming for them if they keep holding his place. He says that they deserve it. Liang Quan says that even if they made a mistake, he shouldn't have bullied them. He requests Xu to come to the academy and assures him that the dean will handle his conflict. Xu tells Sifin that it seems her uncle is also being ridiculous. He asks her to come back after fetching a person who is able to beat him, or he can reason with. He says that those guys will stay here for a while, however, he assures that he won't kill them. Sifin informs her uncle that it was Fan Lu who did wrong. Liang Quan tells her to shut up. He says that no one from their academy can be insulted. Liang Quan raises his hand, signaling his men to unleash a dragon imprisoning spell on Zhu. Seeing this, Zhu says that it seems they are all spell masters. His men send the spells flying. The spells stick to Bai Qi and tie her up in chains. Xu tells Bai Qi not to panic and instructs her to use the chili withering to take away the power of the spells. Bai Qi, doing as Xu says, closes her eyes and frees herself from the chains. Lian Quan tells his men to keep trapping Bai Qi while he deals with Xu. As his men begin to send more spells, an explosion occurs as Xu summons Qinghua. He tells Qinghua that it is his time and tells him to have fun. Qinghua cheap says it traps the men in his branches. The men exclaim in terror, wondering what is happening. One of them says that he feels itchy. Another one of them coughs and curses, saying that the poison in the lantern herbs is coming out. Meanwhile, someone else wonders what's happening to him. He exclaims that he is covered in poison marks and screams for help. Sifin creates a field of energy around her, protecting herself from the poison. She thinks how miserable those men are and being trapped in ice like Fan Lu is better than this. Her aunt's Liang Quan has also created a circle of defensive energy around him. Xu asks if that is all they are capable of. Hearing this, Liang Quan calls Xu Kaki. Sifin tells Xu to might as well freeze them and that she is going back to find reasonable masters. Hearing this, Liang Quan angrily asks Sifin why she is begging in front of this devil Xu. Sifin tells her uncle that he cannot defeat him. Besides, if Xu is a devil, all of them would have been killed. Liang Quan, unwilling to admit defeat, says that Xu must have set up poison traps before they arrived, otherwise, he wouldn't be able to do anything. Suddenly, as Liang Quan begins to freeze, he realizes that he forgot about Bai Qi. He wonders how could the punishment department be defeated by such a young dragon tamer. Xu says to Sifin that he doesn't expect that there are many reasonable people in her divine mortal academy. He tells her to bring her administrator Lian failing over, claiming that he will smash all of his teeth. A scared Sifin nervously agrees and says she will bring him. Xu says that he will be waiting for failing in the cabin. Inside the cabin, Zhu, looking at the fruits, says that there are many fruits from Nihai, including his favorite carol grapes. He exclaims that they all belong to him now. Qingzhua makes noise, saying that he also wants to eat. Zhu, holding a grape, tells Qingzhua that if he can't peel the skin, he can eat it with the skin. Qingzhua says fine and exclaims that they aren't enough for him at all. Mr. Koi tells Zhu that fruits like grapes have little nutritional value for sacred cyan forest dragons, and they can only satisfy the dragon's appetite. However, Zhu's dragons have already reached the limit of their cultivation base. Therefore, no matter what Zhu feeds them, it won't have much effect on them. Zhu says that it seems he can only visit the ancient relics again this time. Suddenly, Zhu hears failing demanding that he get the hell out. Sifin informs Zhu that she has explained to the academy what happened in the Rain City. The academy will issue an announcement, and if anyone hurts residents of Rain City again, they will severely punish them. Failing says that Zhu has challenged the authority of the Divine Mortal Academy, and he must pay for it. He says that even though Zhu is the city lord, it doesn't mean he can lynch the people of their academy. With a smirk on his face, Xu says that he thought he could do that since he defeated them. He reminds him that the Divine Mortal Academy has always followed the principle that might is right, hasn't it? He cracks his knuckle and sarcastically says that everything their academy does is right and proper, and whoever disobeys them will be eliminated immediately. 
He teasingly asks Failing that he must have enjoyed a comfortable life, right? Failing says that it was decided by their academy and the order sustainer. Furthermore, as a mere city lord, he is in no position to judge them. Shu furiously questions when the order sustainer became the ruler and who the hell Failing thinks he is. He says that in terms of status, Failing is just a lackey, and in terms of cultivation and character, he is the worst. Failing calls Zhu stubborn like a savage. Zhu extends his hand, saying that they should cut the crap. He demands that Failing hand over the city seal and get out of his territory with his people. Failing vehemently says there is no way he will do that. Zhu summons Moe and says that then he will smash all his joints and ask him again. Sifin remembers that Chu said he would smash the administrator's teeth and not his joints. She thinks that he didn't keep his word. As Chu signals for Moe to ascend in the sky, Failing is confused and wonders if he is a sword cultivator. He thinks that isn't Chu a dragon tamer, so why he has a flying sword. As Moe roars, Failing realizes that it isn't just a flying sword, but a dragon that transformed from a sword spirit. He thinks that it is no wonder Zhu possesses strong power that is even comparable to a sword cultivator. He knows that if he fends him off passively, he will definitely lose. Therefore, he must turn into an attacker. Failing uses his rushing bird power and dodges Moe. As he hides behind a rock, Zhu says that he wants close combat with the dragon tamer, right? He grants Failing's wish and summons Bai Qi and Qingzhua, telling them to attack him together. Zhu says that Bai Qi is on his right and Qingzhua is on his left. He taunts Failing, saying that it is a good arrangement for him. Failing stares at the dragons in shock, wondering what to do next. As Bai Qi attacks Failing with an icy tornado, Failing falls to the ground with a thud. He groans and curses, thinking that the brat should have told him about Zhu's strength in advance. Zhu sarcastically asks Moe Bai Qi, and Qingzhua to make sure the administrator has a good time. Hearing this, Moe, Bai Qi, and Qingzhua begin to attack Failing. However, Failing leaps into the sky, getting away from them. Failing tells Zhu not to look down upon their divine mortal academy and summons his peacock dragon. Zhu looks at his peacock dragon and calls it interesting. However, he exclaims what a pity. Qingzhua says that whatever the peacock dragon is, he will punch a hole in it. He sprouts vines out of the ground and attacks the peacock dragon. Failing realizes that there are thorny vines all over the ground. It seems he can only fly up and hide in the clouds. Then he can get a chance to catch a break. However, he wonders why it is colder than ever in the air. He bumps into an ice wall created by Bai Qi and groans. He asks himself why there is a wall here as he begins to fall. Bai Qi chirps, saying that the clouds are her territory so Failing better get down. Failing realizes that it is the mystic arts performed by Bai Qi. He screams as he continues to fall. Qingzhua roars and entangles Failing with his vines. Failing realizes that his bones have been broken by the glacier and now his whole body is frozen. He thinks that he is doomed. As Failing's pants start to come off, Xu fakes an apology on behalf of Qingzhua for taking his pants off. He taunts him saying that he is really powerful. An enraged failing says that Shu has gone too far. Shu turns to Sifin and says that it seems she needs to go back to the Divine Mortal Academy again and find someone who can defeat him. He says that her administrator didn't even satisfy his dragons. Failing thinks in disbelief that how could he, the administrator of the Divine Mortal Academy, be defeated by a mere disciple. Sifin informs him that the administrator is already very powerful and only headmasters are better than him. However, she says that the senior headmaster doesn't care about this. The second headmaster is the order sustainer and is out. As she begins to say something about the junior headmaster, Failing says that it is enough. He asks Sifin if she is not embarrassed and exclaims that the dignity of the Divine Mortal Academy is inviolable. Sifin reminds him that she isn't the one who lost. She says that judging from what he has done, their divine mortal academy has long been without dignity. Failing begins to scold her again, however, he coughs up blood. He notices that Sifin is not only siding with their enemy, but also seems to be joining him. 
Sifin tells Zhu that those who can defeat him in their academy won't be able to come. She suggests that she brings her father over, claiming that he is a reasonable man, and Zhu agrees with her suggestion. She says that the round trip will take her a lot of time. She asks if Zhu could unfreeze her masters and classmates first. Zhu says no problem, however, he will keep them detained. Hearing this, Sifin says that she is going then, and Zhu tells Baichi to unfreeze them. Baichi flies over to them and melts the ice. Fan Lu shivers as she calls Zhu a scoundrel. She exclaims that once people from the punishment department arrive, he will be hacked to pieces. Zhu says so oh, and smugly asks if that is really the case. A member informs Fan Lu that people from the punishment department are over there, and they were just unfrozen. Fan Lu sees Lian Quan. She wonders if even he and his spell masters lost to Zhu. Fan Lu says so what if he defeated the people from the punishment department? She tells him not to be so arrogant. Saying that their head administrator has heard about this, she exclaims that he won't let Xu off. Xu tells the members of the Divine Mortal Academy to put Fei Ling's body over there. Seeing this, Fan Lu's jaw drops as she realizes that it is the administrator. She asks Fei Ling if he also lost to this devil. However, an injured Fei Ling does not respond. Shortly afterwards, a member of the Divine Mortal Academy says that even the administrator was no match for Zhu, so it wasn't a shame that the entire punishment department was defeated by him. Someone tells him to stop it. Meanwhile, Sifin arrives with her father. She tells Zhu that her father retired from the Divine Mortal Academy. As she begins to tell Zhu about his position, her father interrupts, saying that his position is nothing to speak of. He says that although the academy has declined these years, it is still powerful. However, he commends Xu for defeating them all by himself and gives him a thumbs up. Following this, he shames Quan. Lian Quan defends himself, saying that so many people have been defeated, he asks Sifin's father not to only criticize him. A member says that he doesn't know why he is feeling that Sifin's father is just here to gloat. Fan Lu tells Sifin's father that Zhu is so unreasonable that he doesn't take their academy's authority seriously. She says that he even attacked them viciously and acted like a member of the evil sect. Sifin's father says that he still thinks Zhu is a reasonable person. If he were really a member of the evil sect, he would have killed her and wouldn't even give her a chance to talk. He asks Zhu if he is from the Zhu clan. Zhu confirms this and introduces himself as Zhu Minglang. Upon hearing his name, Sifin's father's ears perk up and he asks if he knows Zhu Tianguan. Zhu reveals that Tianguan is his father. Sifin's father is surprised to learn that Tianguan has a son. He wonders why he didn't ever tell him this. Zhu thinks that when he wasn't in the capital, his father used to pretend that he didn't have a son, and he barely mentioned Zhu's affairs to others. His father is always indifferent to him, anyway. However, he didn't expect Sifin's father to know his dad. Zhu says to Liang Quan that, as the city lord of Rain City, he understands that their academy is not willing to protect them. But he says that he won't show mercy if the academy grabs the spiritual energy by using its reputation. Liang Quan asks Zhu who does he think he is and how dare he challenge their divine mortal academy. Sifin's father tells Liang Quan that the Zhu clan is among the six great clans now, and they aren't any worse to them. He says that Quan is embarrassing himself by talking about the academy's reputation. He tells him to look at Zhu, saying that he is younger than Quan, but he never says anything about his power. He says that Quan was defeated and even wanted him, a retiree, to intercede. Sifin's father says that he would be ashamed in front of the kings and sect leaders if the capital knew this, and he would have to make a detour if he came across Zhu's father. He turns to Zhu saying that since he has already beaten them and vented his anger, could he let them go back to recuperate? Xu says that the students can leave, but the people from the punishment department and the administrator must stay. He won't let them go until he gets the city seal of Rain City. Upon hearing this, Sifin's father turns to Failing and asks him why he wants to keep the seal. Failing says that there is something he doesn't know. He whispers something in his ear, after which Sifin's father tells Zhu that the city seal is in Yan Guang's hands. He asks Zhu if he wants to make any other demands. 
Chu wonders if Yan Guang is refusing to hand over the city seal because he also found the ancient divine lamp jade in it. He didn't expect that it would be so complicated to get this piece of lamp jade. Rather, he thought it was the easiest one to get. Chu says that without the city seal, it is difficult for Rain City to revive. Therefore, he won't change his demand. Sifin's father sighs, saying that he will negotiate with Yan Guang about this in person. He says that Zhu doesn't need to go since Yan Guang is cold, and Zhu is prone to come into conflict with him. Zhu says that indeed Yan Guang's style is really disgusting. Sifin's father says that the brown continent is in chaos now, and it is really difficult for Yan Guang to take care of everything. He presents Zhu with a deal, promising that he will try his best to get the city seal of him, and in exchange, he lets them go. Zhu says that they can leave except for Lian failing. He says that failing has to go to the city with him. Sifin's father asks him why he wants to take failing. Xu says how about he comes along with them, claiming that he will then know the reason. Sifin's father accepts his suggestion and says that he is going with them. As they make their way to the city, Sifin's father says to failing that he thinks he sides with Zhu, right? Failing, who is being carried on a stretcher, says to Sifin's father that he does, doesn't he? He wonders how he, as the administrator, could be punished by that brat. He thinks that as a member of the Divine Mortal Academy, Sifin's father doesn't assert the dignity of the Academy at all. Sifin's father whispers to Failing that he has been on the Brown Continent for too long and that he should come outside. He tells Failing that everyone in the capital knows Tian Guan is a man of uncertain temper and that he exterminated a lot of sects just because of some trivial things. He asks Failing how dare he hurt Tian Guan's son. Failing is taken aback to learn this and exclaims what? Sifin's father suggests he apologize to Zhu immediately if he wants to survive, or else he might end up dead without rhyme or reason. Shortly afterwards, they finally arrive at the Rain City. The city's residents begin to gossip as they see Zhu and the academy members arrive. One of them exclaims in shock, saying that Zhu really brought the administrator of the Divine Mortal Academy here. Another one says that it is incredible that the Academy would yield to Zhu. Failing apologizes for the previous announcement, saying that they mishandled it and failed in their duty. Sifin's father says that the Divine Mortal Academy has issued another announcement to punish those who hurt the residents of Rain City. He says that rest assured, he shall still suggest that they move out of the city as soon as possible. As for the spiritual energy, he says that the academy will pay compensation. He tells Xu that he can distribute it to the residents who are suffering. Now that the matter is settled, he says that he shall leave. Xu thanks Sifin's father for it and leaves. Inside the Lord's mansion, Gao Jie says that the Divine Mortal Academy has just sent the compensation. He expresses his gratitude, saying that it is all thanks to Zhu this time. Wei Kai says that unfortunately, if it wasn't for the Order Sustainer, Rain City might have revived under Zhu's leadership. Zhu says that Bailing and Chongming have gone to discuss with the Order Sustainer. It is about time for them to come back. Just as he says that, Bailing and Chongming arrive and tell Zhu that they still have a chance. She shows Zhu a feather and tells him to look at it. Zhu grabs the feather and asks her what it is. He thinks that he just touched it, and now he is even finding it a little hard to breathe. He thinks that this feather has such overwhelming force, its owner must be very powerful and terrifying. Chong Ming reveals that it is the feather of the Devil Star Dragon. As a variant of decadent dragons, the Devil Star Dragon is said to be the most evil one. He says that where there is a Devil Star Dragon, there is always a disaster and it is said that the persistent conflicts on the brown continent are related to this kind of dragon. Zhu says that he has never heard about the Devil Star Dragon. Bailing says that the Order Sustainer discovered the Devil Star Dragon just a month ago. He intended to kill the dragon, but he only managed to injure it, and it fled. The Order Sustainer's dark purple dragon with a gray tail was also injured, but he didn't want to give up. Chong Ming continues, saying that the Order Sustainer said if they help him hunt the Devil Star Dragon, he will help them protect the Rain City. Xu asks that is it. Mr. Koi asks if they are kidding him. He asks how could it be so easy. Xu asks Mr. Koi if he knows something about the Devil Star Dragon. 
Mr. Koi says of course he knows. He says that the Devil Star Dragon is related to disasters. The plague is raging where it exists, and the land where it inhabits is even more chaotic. He says that the Devil Star Dragon is definitely more trouble than Zhu can imagine, and if already people like them want to hunt it, they are living in a dream world. Chongming says but the order sustainer told of the green cattle mount said that it is seriously injured. He argues that its strength must have been greatly reduced. Mr. Koi says then if a dragon god is injured, would he dare to hunt it? Shu asks him if the devil star dragon is a dragon god. Bailing says that he wouldn't dare to hunt a dragon god no matter how bold he is. Mr. Koi says that it is more than 1000 years old, therefore, it must be a dragon god. He says that for the sake of this city, it would be easier to kill the order sustainer Yan Guang than to hunt a devil star dragon which could be a dragon god. Besides, he asks how could a mere order sustainer seriously injure a devil star dragon on his own. He doesn't think the order sustainer is sure if he hurt the devil star dragon, and he just wants them to risk their lives to check it. Xinghua says that the order sustainer might have concealed some information, but he wouldn't just let them risk their lives. Zhu wonders if Xinghua saw something. Xinghua reveals that recently she always saw a picture where countless rats get out of the barn and locusts cover the sky. She says that this vision seems to be related to the Devil Star Dragon. She remembers her vision in which a few days later, Xu holds the feather in his hand and stands in front of something with blood gushing out of it. However, she does not tell Zhu about this. She says that she thinks it is true that the Devil Star Dragon has been hurt seriously. Bailing says that perhaps they should investigate first before deciding to go hunting or not. To show his sincerity, she says that the Order Sustainer of the Green Mount managed to buy Rain City more time, so they have one month. Ju acknowledges this information. Meanwhile, Mr. Koi says that if it is an underage Devil Star Dragon they might defeat it, and if that's not the case, they will never make it. Xu tells Chongming that they found an ancient relic cave in the Pear Blossom Valley, and most secret abilities of the decadent dragons come from there. He is afraid that the Devil Star Dragons also have something to do with it. Unfortunately, the valley is sealed and no one can get in. He asks Chongming if he has any clues about where the other entrances of the valley are. Chongming says that his grandpa's brother once told them about a story of the decadent dragons, and as for the clues to the entrance, he needs to go back to ask him about it. Xu thanks Chongming for this. He thinks that if he enters the relics again, he may be able to improve his dragon's cultivation bases again. After some time, Xinghua is seen requesting the commander to take some elite soldiers to the north to investigate the villages that have suffered from ice. The commander acknowledges this, saying that he got it and leaves. Xinghua then turns to Zhu and says that she personally wants to go to the places suffering from plagues of rats and locusts. She says that both these disasters shouldn't have happened in winter, and she feels that it is probably due to the Devil Star Dragon. Zhu agrees with Xinghua and says that he will go with her. However, Xinghua says that there is no need for him to come. She says that she will go with Ling Xia and he should go with Zhu Ro aka Myra to the capital of the Yao Kingdom. She says that something stranger has happened in the Prime Minister's mansion over there, but she can only see some blurry pictures now. Confused, Zhu repeats the words blurry pictures. Xinghua says that the Devil Star Dragon is a rare dragon prophecy, and its arrival is a warning from God. But astrologers like her can only see information fragments, and by resolving them one by one can they make the connections clear. Zhu acknowledges this and sighs. Gaojia says to Zhu that the Grey Wolf Cavalry also wants to help. Xinghua tells Gaojia that he can look for the fingerprints of avaricious dragons near Rain City. Both Zhu and Gaojia ask her what are avaricious dragons. Xinghua says that avaricious dragons take the opportunity to make trouble when disaster comes. Their saliva is poisonous and can make peaceful farmers restless and greedy. Xinghua thinks that their appearance is also probably related to the Devil Star Dragon. Gaojia says that they will handle it and Zhu thinks that Xinghua is getting more decisive. Zhu arrives at the capital of the Yao Kingdom with Mairu. He thinks that the Yao Kingdom is small. It has survived by squeezing its inhabitants, and now it is dying. Mairu points at something and tells Zhu to look. 
She says that there is a strong evil aura surrounding the Prime Minister's mansion. Xu thinks that it is no wonder Xinghua let Myra follow him. It seems that he will need Myra's help since she is a spiritualist. Xu says how about they pretend to be exorcists and get in to ask about the situation. He asks her to tell him something that he can use to bluff them. Myra thinks for a moment and says that three cocks died here within a month. Xu asks her how she knows that. Myra says that she can see the spirits of the three cocks right here at the door. Scared, Xu thinks that he was asking her to tell him something that he can use to bluff, and not something so terrifying. Xu changes his attire, thinking that he is such an extraordinary man, and it is just a piece of cake for him to bluff those ordinary people. Point one of the guards shouts at Xu and Myra not to hang around in front of the Prime Minister's mansions. He demands that they get out of there. Xu thinks that as expected, he is an ordinary man and isn't observant at all. He thinks that it is no wonder he is just a doorkeeper. Xu lies about being an exorcist, saying that when he traveled here, he saw a strong evil aura around their mansion. Xu asks them if they feel an evil aura around the threshold or if they feel something invisible entering and leaving the mansion. The shocked guards admit that they do feel it. Xu says that many people have died in their mansions and especially in the kitchen, right? Upon hearing this, the guards are left speechless. One of them runs inside the mansion, telling Zhu to wait while he gets the butler. The butler of the Prime Minister's mansion comes out. He asks Zhu if he could tell him more details, so he can see whether he really has the ability to exorcise or not. Myra asks if he could take them to the backyard. As the butler takes them to the backyard, Myra points at the tree and says that there are several dead kittens buried underneath it. The butler calls this impressive. He requests them to come in and take a seat, while he brings his lady over. As they sit inside, Myra tells Zhu that she only said half the truth just now. In addition to the kittens, there is also a man buried under the tree. As Myra stares at the man's spirit, Zhu asks if she knows who the man is. Myra says that it is the butler they met just now. Hearing this, Zhu spits out the water he was drinking and calls this very creepy. He asks her if there is also a spiritualist who is manipulating the butler's body. Myra says no. She reveals that someone killed the butler and pretended to be him, and the spirit looks exactly like the young butler they met. Shu asks if the spirit of the butler can tell her the whole story. Myra again denies this and says that not all spirits can communicate. Shu thinks that it seems he is here to be a detective rather than an exorcist. But he wonders what all of this has got to do with the Devil Star Dragon. The lady arrives and greets Zhu and Myru. This lady is the daughter of the Prime Minister of the Yao Kingdom. She asks them to keep everything that she is about to say a secret, or else she will kill both of them at all costs. Zhu assures her that he always forgets earthly things right after hearing them. Hearing this, the Prime Minister's daughter reveals that the butler found out about her affair with his younger brother and he threatened to make it public unless she slept with him. Therefore, she wanted to poison that greedy butler. Zhu acts calmly and acknowledges the information. However, he is freaking out internally, thinking that it is absolutely crazy and sounds very immoral. Zhu, piecing everything together, says that she put poison in the kitchen, and it was first eaten by the kitten. Then the poison spread around and killed three roosters by accident. The Prime Minister's daughter confirms this. Xu says that in that case, how did the butler die? The Prime Minister's daughter says the butler is still alive and asks if he hadn't just seen him now. She says that her plan failed due to kittens. Xu says that she doesn't need to hide it. He says that they know the real butler is dead and the incumbent butler must be her lover, which is the original butler's younger brother. As the lady remains silent, Xu pauses thinking does she not know about it. If not, he wonders if the current butler is the younger brother or the older brother. Xu says that since the butler isn't dead, where her lover is now. The prime minister's daughter says that her lover had drowned. Xu asks if it was an accident or if it was planned. The prime minister's daughter reveals that she sent someone to do it. She couldn't let people know about their affair, so she killed him. Xu thinks that this lady is very cruel. To keep her reputation, 
She not only poisoned the butler who knew about their affair, but also murdered her own lover. He notes that she did it so neatly that she didn't need their help at all. Therefore, she must have some other reason for letting them in. Shu calls Myra by her fake name and asks what she thinks about it. Myra asks the Prime Minister's daughter that if recently, she is always hearing a cat meowing and light footsteps by the bed when she is sleeping. The Prime Minister's daughter confirms this, saying that she woke up in the middle of the night and even saw a pair of green cat eyes. She also felt something licking her cheeks and palms, so she always has trouble sleeping these days. She wonders how could she sleep well after committing so many immoral acts anyway. Myra asks if she would mind showing them her room. The Prime Minister's daughter says of course not. As she takes them to her dwelling, Shu notices a faint smell of a demon emanating from the place. Shu asks the Prime Minister's daughter if she has a cat. He says that perhaps it is the cat playing at night. The lady replies that there is no way that can happen. Her cat is dark-eyed and it never meows. Shu says that her cat has turned into a demon. The Prime Minister's daughter exclaims in shock, asking how that is possible. Myra backs up Zhu, saying that he is right. She says that the cat knows that her children were poisoned by her therefore, it has been torturing her. Hearing this, the Prime Minister's daughter is left speechless. Zhu says that they will help her get rid of the cat and her problem will be solved. The Prime Minister's daughter immediately says no. Zhu asks her why. She says that the cat has been with her for years and she already said no. She tells her servants to see them off and says that the two of them can now leave. As the servant requests them to leave, Shu finds it strange that the young lady could even kill her lover but feels for a demon cat. Thinking that her mind is twisted, he wonders whether it is her original personality or if she is affected by something. Myru interrupts his thoughts, saying that they have been kicked out. She asks what they should do now. Shu says they will deal with the demon cat first. Since it has a tendency to hurt people, they can't leave it on the loose. Zhu and Myra sneak into the backyard of the Prime Minister's mansion. Zhu says that the smell of the demon is very strong and it should be right around here. Suddenly, the cat demon appears and meows at them. Zhu says to the demon cat that no one would have noticed that it was special if it kept being a pet. But, it showed demon arts and revealed its true nature. Myra hides behind Zhu, saying that something is wrong with this cat. The demon cat meows loudly as it gets ready to attack. Zhu summons Haya who charges towards the tiny cat. The demon cat jumps into the air and tries to scratch Haya. Zhu realizes that this demon cat is very powerful. But without a 10,000-year-old cultivation base, it would never be able to fight a sacred beast like Baichi. His thoughts are interrupted by Mr. Koi who exclaims that this cat is a sin beast and is the same type as little Changi. Hearing this, Shu orders Haya to catch it alive. Haya electrocutes the demon cat, causing it to fall unconscious. Myru picks up the cat and carries it in her arms. Shu says that they should take the cat back first. Myra asks what will they do about the Prime Minister's daughter that has done so many bad things. Zhu says that she will pay the price afterwards. He asks if she has seen the spirit of her lover. Myra denies this, saying that the Prime Minister's daughter didn't mention where he had drowned. Zhu says that the butler they saw just now is probably her lover. The poison hadn't killed the original butler, so the lady and her lover drowned him together. He says that he first thought she didn't know about it. However, he realized that she was just lying. Myru agrees, remembering that the hair of the butler's spirit was wet. Shu asks Mr. Koi what is the sin beast that he just mentioned. Mr. Koi explains that there are several kinds of omen beasts that can bring misfortune to people. They include the bluffing beast, sin beast, avarice beast, doom beast, sorrow beast, and disaster beast. The bluffing beast is the least harmful ancient beast and people that are in contact with it are usually cunning and good at sophistry. The bluffing beast looks like a rabbit. The sin beast looks like a cat, which makes people become sinful and even commit crimes. There are other omen beasts that look like livestock, and they can hardly be recognized as they usually hide among people. Mr. Koi remarks that since the small omen beast has appeared, 
It won't be long before the big one reveals itself. It seems that the Devil Star Dragon has truly appeared. Shu asks Mr. Koi what are the small and big omen beasts. Mr. Koi responds that generally, only one omen beast appears in a certain area, and its impact is very limited. However, if two or more beasts appear at the same time, this indicates that a big omen beast is about to appear. Once the big omen beast appears, it will cause a big disaster that will be a true catastrophe with deaths and destruction. Zhu questions if it means that the recent ice disaster and the plague of locusts and rats are all related to small omen beasts. Mr. Koi confirms this, saying that one beast stands for one omen. If they can manage to find the omen beast and kill it as a sacrifice before the disaster that the bad omen indicates, the disaster can be avoided. He exclaims that the Devil Star Dragon is very likely to be the big omen beast and it heralds the extremely bad supreme omen this time. He says to Zhu that his second wife is an astrologer, so she should have seen many sporadic signs. Zhu fakes a cough and blushes, saying that Xinghua is her sister-in-law, not his second wife. Mr. Koi says that if they count his fourth wife Yusuo's bluffing beast, there are way too many small omen beasts this time. Nevertheless, he says that Zhu can ask his second wife to seal the omen power of this sin beast, claiming that astrologers have the ability to change the future. Zhu continues to blush, saying that he can accept Mr. Koi misunderstanding his relationship with Xinghua, but he has nothing to do with Lin Sha and Yusuo. Shortly afterwards, Zhu and Mairu arrive in Rain City and announce that they are back. Zhu says that they got a beast and asks Xinghua and Yusuo what they found. As Xinghua begins to tell him something, how Yi comes running. He exclaims that the Two Kingdom has declared war on the Yao Kingdom just now. Xu asks him what is going on. How Yi reveals that it is said that the administrator witnessed the Prime Minister's daughter committing adultery with her butler at night. She was supposed to marry into the loyal family of the Two Kingdom. However, the loyal family of the Two Kingdom felt insulted by this, so they declared war on the Yao Kingdom. Hearing this, Zhu realizes that it is no wonder she lied to them. She doesn't want anyone to know about this. Zhu's suspicions are confirmed that the incumbent butler is not the original butler, but her lover instead. Hua grabs the cat, saying that she is afraid that the cat Zhu caught isn't a sin beast. She reveals that it is a hate beast standing for war. Hearing this, Xu thinks that he never expected Mr. Koi could even make a mistake. Xinghua says that it was exactly this cat that caused the war between the two countries. Myra says that this cat only kept disturbing the lady's sleep and it didn't cause any other trouble. Therefore, she asks why this cat caused the war between the two countries. Xinghua says that this beast just made the prime minister's daughter have a nightmare with its demon arts, which made her unable to fall asleep so she wanted to sleep with her lover. However, the cat's existence means that whatever the lady did would be discovered for sure and would endanger the relations between the two countries. Xu asks Xinghua if she made him go to the Yao Kingdom just because she wanted him to find this omen beast and keep it from causing wars. Xinghua confirms this by saying yes. Dispersing something onto the cat, Xinghua tells the beast that she has sealed its omer power. From now on, the cat isn't an abominable beast, but a likable and ordinary creature. Hearing this, the cat meows happily in response. Inside the Lord's mansion at night, Gaojie informs Xu that they have killed a few Everest beasts, but the farmers of the village, where the beasts didn't appear, don't want to hand in food. He says that the officers are preparing to send troops to suppress them. Xinghua says that the Everest beast made the farmers greedy. However, she wonders how can they resist soldiers. It seems to her that there will be bloodshed again. Wakei tells Zhu that the ice disaster is really serious, so the demonic beasts and the devil spirits have come down the mountain to find water, and they have eaten a lot of livestock and even living people. Xinghua says that the ice disaster led to the beast disaster. She says that this is another big omen. After seven big omens like this happen, the devil star dragon will appear. She is afraid that this land will really turn into a living hell. Xu asks if there are any other big bad omens. Xinghua says that there is war, civil commotion, plague, ice disaster, pest disaster, and meteorite fire. 
she says that the first six bad omens have already appeared, and the last omen should be the meteorite fire heralded by the Devil Star Dragon. Xu asks if she has a way to find the Devil Star Dragon. Xinghua says that she sealed the magic power of these bad omen beasts, and turned their omen power into her own power to foresee something farther in the future. Therefore, it seems to her that the Devil Star Dragon is hiding in the ancient relics. Chongming says that her speculation is right. He says that the decadent dragons are indeed from the ancient relics, and they couldn't find any clues to the Devil Star Dragon because it is hiding in an unknown relic. Xu asks him if there is any clue to another entrance of ancient relics. Chongming confirms this, saying there is a clue. He says that the other entrance of the relics is probably in the Rain City. Chongming's ancestors had exterminated the decadent dragons, and in memory of the victory of that great battle, they used the bones of decadent dragons as the cornerstone and built Rain City on the dragon's nest. Bailing says that Rain City has been coveted just because of the nourishment of the dragon bones. These bones can make everything prosper and create spiritual earth and auras. If the ancient crack is in the Rain City, Shu asks if that means the Devil Star Dragon may be hiding right under their feet. Bailing confirms this, saying that is exactly it. Suddenly, a soldier comes running, exclaiming that he has bad news. He informs them that the Brown Flag Ar Army of the Two Kingdom is heading here, and they are going to attack the Rain City. Nian Nian curses in frustration, exclaiming that they just found the clue to the Devil Star Dragon, and it took them so much effort. Chong Ming says that the army of the Two Kingdom will reach Rain City in a day. They need to discuss the countermeasures quickly. Bei Ling says that if they find the Devil Star Dragon in the ancient relic and inform the Order Sustainer of the Green Cattle Mountain time, she believes that he will not allow the army of the Two Kingdom to enter Rain City. Zhu says that one day should be enough. He says that they will go and find the Devil Star Dragon, while Chong Ming and Bei Ling stay in the city. He tells them that if they cannot find the Devil Star Dragon, the two of them can abandon the Rain City. As long as all of them are safe, there is still hope. Chong Ming agrees with Zhu's plan and tells him to be careful. Zhu, Xinghua, and Ling Xia arrive at the Rain City's deserted forest. Xinghua says that the ancient relic should be here. She places her hand on the wall and uses her magic to find the crack. Xinghua suggests that they go inside and check. Ling Xia says that she will go first. Xu says to Xinghua that they should follow her in. As they enter the ancient relic crack, Xinghua comments that it is a little dark in here. Xu tells her not to worry and says that he is with her. Xu realizes that he can't hear Ling Xia's footsteps. He calls out Ling Xia's name, however as she doesn't respond, Xu begins to panic. He tells Xinghua that he is going to take a look wondering if something bad happened to Ling Xia. However, Xinghua asks him not to go, and Zhu asks why. Xinghua says that Ling Xia probably went into another crack due to the space fork. Zhu asks whether he will lose her too if he walks a few more steps. Xinghua says yes. She says that Ling Xia may have already been in the relic. Zhu sighs, saying that he hopes that is the case. He didn't expect there would be such a trick in the small crack. They arrive at the ancient relic and see butterflies and birds in the sky. Xu says that they are finally here. He notices that this place is like the relic valley they entered before, and everything here is bigger than it is in the ordinary environment. Suddenly, Xinghua hears rumbling. Pointing at an explosion, she says that there seems to be a fight over there, and it should be Ling Xia. As Ling Xia attacks a decadent dragon with a bright purple light, Zhu and Xinghua call out her name. Zhu and Xinghua head in her direction as they ride Qinghua. Zhu says that they were worried that she might be in danger. Getting off of Qinghua, he says that it seems their worries were unnecessary. Ling Xia presents shows Zhu something and says that she found this. Zhu grabs it and says that it is the scale of the Devil Star Dragon. He exclaims that it means the dragon is really hiding in this relic. Ling Xia says that this dragon is very strong. Suddenly, the decadent dragon from before regains consciousness. Ling Xia notices the decadent dragon trying to flee. She asks the decadent dragon if it wants to run and attacks its brain with her paintbrush. The decadent dragon dies due to her attack and starlight marrow oozes out of its brain. 
Mr. Koi tells Shu to collect the brain marrow of the decadent dragon. Shu asks him what he needs to collect it for. Mr. Koi says that it can be used to strengthen Baichi, claiming that the marrow is a good thing. It can absorb the power of stars and turn it into magic power for some special creatures. He says that such a good thing can't be found outside. Hearing this, Shu asks in amazement if that is really the case. He takes out a tube and begins to fill it with marrow, saying that he should collect as much as he can then. Mr. Koi says that there seems to be a small nest of black decadent dragons in the tree in front of them. Xu says that he will go deal with them now. However, Li Xiao says that there is no need. She shows them the tube full of marrow and says that it is all in here. Xu grabs the tube and exclaims that turns out she has already collected all of it. He thanks her, thinking that Ling Xia is so capable. He laughs inside, thinking that it feels so good to gain things without working hard. He feels like he is being kept by a rich woman. Ling Xia hands Xinghua the scale of the Devil Star Dragon, saying that she found it in that nest. She asks her to see if she can find the dragon. Xinghua agrees and takes the scale. She closes her eyes and focuses on the scale. She sees a vision of the dragon's footprint in the dark star grass and another vision of a mountaintop with a waterfall and a crescent moon. She opens her eyes and realizes that it is the crescent moon. It seems that these scales have just fallen off the devil star dragon. She declares that she thinks she has figured out where the devil star dragon is. Xu says that is great and tells her to take them there now. Xinghua takes them to an ancient relic deep in the jungle, they exclaim that it is the Devil Star Dragon. As they observe the Devil Star Dragon sleeping on top of the mountain, Xu says that even if this Devil Star Dragon is not a dragon god, it isn't far from that level. He says that the dragon doesn't look injured and the order sustainer of the green cattle mount really tricked them. Ling Xia notices something shining on Xinghua, and asks what is that light on her. Xinghua says that it is the ancient divine lamp jade. She notices that there is also a lamp jade on the tail of the devil star dragon. Ling Xia says that it is called the lamp jade glow. If the ancient divine lamp jade is broken, there will be a lamp jade glow when the pieces of the jade approach each other. Xu calls this great. He says that as long as they obtain the piece of lamp jade from the devil star dragon and the city seal, they will have four pieces of the lamp jade in total. By that time, Yunzi will be awakened. Suddenly, the Devil Star Dragon wakes up and opens its eyes. It growls as it begins to fly in the sky. Chu tells Xinghua to be careful to not be found by the Devil Star Dragon and accidentally touches Xinghua's chest as he motions for her to hide. Xinghua begins to blush and Ling Xia scolds Zhu to watch where his hand is. As the Devil Star Dragon continues to fly, Zhu says that its power is immeasurable. He is afraid that they are no match for it, and for now, they'd better leave the place and come up with another plan. As they arrive at the gate tower of the Rain City, Xu says that it took so long for them to enter the relic this time, and the Two Kingdoms Brown Flag Army is about to arrive. Ling Xia suddenly tells them to wait. Xu asks her what's wrong. Ling Xia responds that there is an overwhelming aura around. As they stand outside the assembly hall, Ling Xia says that there's a man inside that is at the high monarch level at least. They enter the hall and Zhu tells Nian Nian that they are back. However, he is met by the sight of all his teammates quietly sitting around a man who has his leg on top of the table. He looks at Bei Ling and Nian Nian sitting quietly and looking scared. He realizes something is weird as Nian Nian and Bei Ling always love to chat, but today they are very quiet. Zhu asks the mysterious man if he may know his name. The man introduces himself as Chang Hong from the Green Cattle Mount. He reveals that he is an order sustainer of the Brown Capital. Xu says to Chang Hong that he has heard a lot about him. It looks like his teammates are now under Chang Hong's control. He thinks that he needs to wait and see what Chang Hong is up to. Chang Hong asks him if he saw the Devil Star Dragon. Nian Nian wishes that Zhu notices that they are being held hostage. However, Zhu Nian Nian her if she has a cramp in her eye. Hearing this, Nian Nian thinks that Zhu is a fool. Zhu tells Chan Hong that he found the Devil Star Dragon, and says that he is impressed with how well informed he is. Chan Hong asks him where is the clue. 
he exclaims that Shu better not let him repeat his words. Shu presents him with the dragon's feather and says here it is. Chang Hong grabs the feather and says Xu did a good job. He says that when Chong Ming and Bei Ling came to him, he knew Xu would find him the clue about the dragon. Seeing Xu acting nicely with Chang Hong, Nian Nian thinks that he is such a traitor. As Chang Hong summons his dark purple dragon back into its spirit domain, Xu wonders whether this is the purple dragon Mr. Koi had mentioned. He notices that the dragon looks very extraordinary, and he realizes that it is no wonder his teammates have done nothing to fight Chang Hong. Zhu respectfully requests Chang Hong to protect Rain City from the Two Kingdoms Brown Flag Army since he has given him the clue as promised. But he internally thinks that this order sustainer from the Green Cattle Mount is also a bad guy. Chang Hong asks if Zhu really thinks that the Two Kingdoms started a war just for this deserted city. Hearing this, Zhu wonders if it could be something else. Suddenly, they hear a banging noise. Zhu and Chong Ming exclaim that what is going on. They see from above that the brown flag army of the two kingdom has arrived. Xu finally realizes that these forces came to Rain City for the Devil Star Dragon. Chong Ming says that he should have thought about it, and it is all his fault for being so eager to revitalize the Rain City. A man enters the assembly hall and asks Chang Hong about how it went. He asks whether their young and promising city lord found the thing they want. Chang Hong shows him the feather and says that Xu found it. Therefore, he thinks Xu must have seen the Devil Star Dragon. Chong Ming whispers to Xu that the man talking to Chang Hong is Yen Guang, the director of the Divine Mortal Academy. Xu thinks that it is quite a ceremony that the two order sustainers of the Brown Continent and the Two Kingdoms Brown Flag Army have come here. Xu pleasantly greets Yen Guang and asks for forgiveness for his previous offense. Yen Guang thinks that Zhu is being so obedient now. He wonders whether the rumor of him being an arrogant guy isn't true. Yen Guang says to Zhu that since he has the clue now, he should hurry up and show them where to find the Devil Star Dragon. Chang Hong asks what is the rush, and says that they need another person to join them. Su Tai asks Zhu if he still remembers him, and says that they meet again. Xu realizes that beside him is Tu Wenha, the one who competed with him to be the son-in-law in the Miao Kingdom. He wonders whether Chang Hong and Yan Guang are waiting for Wenha. As Xu remains silent, Su Tai thinks that Zhu indeed ignored him. He tells Wenha that Zhu is the jerk who got the damn appointment. However, Wenha glares at him, causing Tai to immediately apologize. Wenha steps forward and apologizes to Zhu in case Tai got on his bad side. Chan Hong asks Zhu to show them the way since all of them have arrived. Zhu agrees to it and asks them to follow him. He thinks that now that they all want the Devil Star Dragon, he can use them to test the dragon's strength. He just has trouble finding someone to help him deal with it. Bei Ling and Chong Ming offer to come with Zhu, but Zhu says that it won't be necessary. He says that with these two powerful masters, he will be just fine. Xing Hua tells Zhu not to worry saying that she will make arrangements to help people evacuate the city. Zhu responds that they are on their own now and leaves. As they arrive at the ancient relics, one of them says that it blew his mind when he learned that the Devil Star Dragon was hiding in the rain city all this time. Yen Guang says that the Devil Star Dragon is hard to deal with, but their academy can trap it. He asks Wenha how his deployment is, when he responds that everything is already put in place, and they are just waiting for him to lead the dragon out of the relics. Zhu interrupts their conversation, saying that the Devil Star Dragon is a clever top ancient dragon, and it isn't a pushover. Guang shows Zhu a box, saying that is the reason they will use this. Zhu exclaims as he recognizes that it is the city seal. Guang says that back when the decadent dragons were raging in the brown continent, some ancestors from the Hu family killed the female star dragon. After this, they scraped the female star dragon's jade scale from its tail and turned it into this seal. However, they weren't aware that the female dragon was pregnant, and its son is this devil star dragon. He says that there is also a jade on the devil star dragon's tail, and as far as he knows, it didn't grow on the dragon. This means that the dragons probably got it from the ancient relics, put it on their tails, and obtained some special powers. Hearing Guang's explanation, 
Zhu realizes that he is aware of the connection between the jade scales. He thinks that Guang isn't that stupid and that he just needs to wait for them to make a move. He hopes that they will consume the dragon's energy as much as they can. Guan says that the Devil Star Dragon doesn't know that its mother is dead, therefore, it will come to them once the Jade Scale lights up and will fall into their trap. When Ha asks whether they should figure out how strong the dragon is, Guan takes the Lamp Jade out of the box, exclaiming that as long as the dragon hasn't become a dragon god, there is no way out for it. Meanwhile, Zhu is stunned to see the seal flashing so rapidly. Their plan works as the Devil Star Dragon wakes up and comes charging towards them. Feeling the terrifying aura, Guan says that the rumors were right. He exclaims that the Devil Star Dragon has the potential to be a dragon god. When Ha says off they go as the four of them begin to run from the dragon. Zhu exclaims that the dragon is running too fast. He tells Guan to cast a gravity spell on it. Guan casts the spell and an explosion occurs. Chu says that here is the exit. He hopes that they have evacuated everyone from the rain city. Meanwhile, someone informs Xinghua and Ling Xiao that the city has been evacuated, and Xinghua says that is good. She tells Ling Xiao that they shall go to the stone tablet to help Chu, and Ling Xiao agrees by saying all right. Back in the rain city, the place rumbles as the Devil Star Dragon creates a powerful black tornado filled with purple-colored energy. Su Tai, standing at the exit, commands the army to shoot their scaled hearing arrows when he tells them to. However, a voice tells them to hold on. Zhu exclaims it is them as they make it out of the relics. The Devil Star Dragon also comes behind them. Staring at the enraged dragon, Zhu exclaims that the Devil Star Dragon has been completely infuriated. The dragon roars and attacks the members of the Divine Mortal Academy. Guan initiates a dragon trapping formation and orders his academy members to do the same. But as the dragon remains unaffected, someone exclaims that the dragon trapping formation isn't fully effective and urges them to be careful. However, it is too late as the dragon attacks them. They scream for help as their flesh melts off their bones, revealing their bones. Sutai exclaims that the dragon will step back. He summons his giant fierce dragon, who is a high-level dragon god. He tells his dragon to go and fight the Devil Star Dragon. The giant fierce dragon immediately charges towards the Devil Star Dragon and tries to attack it, but the Devil Star Dragon dodges the attack as it flies above. Suddenly, the giant fierce dragon is taken aback to see the Devil Star Dragon shooting beams of bright blue light at it. The light injures the giant fierce dragon and it lies on the ground defeated, with blood covering its body. Su Tai exclaims in shock, wondering how that is possible. Wen Ha instructs him to not let his dragon out now and let the army tucker the devil star dragon out. Observing the dragon, Xu calls it ridiculous, thinking that a low-level monarch dragon stands no chance of overmatching one who is nearly a dragon god. He believes the strong ones are always in charge. Suddenly, he hears someone calling his name. He turns to see that it is Ling Xia and Xinghua. He asks Xinghua why she is here, to which Xinghua says that she feels there is something weird. She reveals that she isn't feeling any bad omen power on the Devil Star Dragon, therefore, it is not the seventh bad omen. Xu exclaims in shock and says what? Xinghua says that this means there could be an even more horrible one. Meanwhile, Chan Hong says that it is time to let the dragons out. He summons his dark purple dragon at the high monarch level and orders him to go fight. Wen He also commands his skeleton dragon to come out of its spirit domain. His ghost skeleton dragon lets out a mighty roar as it is summoned. Chu stares at Wen He's skeleton ghost dragon and says that it looks so familiar. He says that it looks exactly like the devil star dragon. Xinghua says that when his skeleton ghost dragon is a skeletonized devil star dragon. She exclaims that she got it, it is that female devil star dragon. She says that someone cast a spell on the female devil star dragon skeleton and turned it into a ghost skeleton dragon. Xu says that it costs tremendous death chi to maintain a ghost demon power. He realizes that this is the reason the two kingdoms started wars over and over again to expand its territory. Xinghua tells Zhu that she feels the bad omen from that female dragon. Zhu is taken aback by this news and says what? 
He wonders could a dragon tamer's dragon become the omen beast or was the way Wenha controls his dragon is not used by a dragon tamer, and if that is the reason that it has a bad omen on it. The ghost skeleton dragon releases ghost heavenly fire and shoots it at the devil star dragon. The devil star dragon barely escapes the attack. Wenha thinks that his female ghost star dragon can reach the top level monarch at most, but the devil star dragon is likely to become a dragon god. He thinks that if he can control the Devil Star Dragon, he will own the world. He mockingly asks the Devil Star Dragon that it isn't arrogant anymore, is it? He says that it is still in its mother's shadow even after growing up. Hearing his snarky remarks, the Devil Star Dragon becomes enraged and growls at him. Wenha says to the Devil Star Dragon that death is coming to it. The ghost skeleton dragon growls and the ground begins to shatter. Xinghua asks what is happening. Xu says that something is coming out from the deep earth. Something comes out of the earth and begins to levitate in the sky. Seeing the mysterious thing, Xinghua says that the rain city was built on the nest of decadent dragons, with their bones as the cornerstone. She exclaims that the mysterious thing is the ghost Qi. However, seeing the mysterious thing entering the ghost skeleton dragon's ribs, she realizes that she was wrong. It is the ghost skeleton dragon's soul. As the ghost skeleton dragon soul successfully enters inside, one says that Wenha has such an amazing power. He tells Wenha to go kill that devil star dragon. Wenha listens to him and orders his dragon to kill the devil star dragon. However, his ghost skeleton dragon does obey him. Wenha realizes something is wrong. His dragon isn't listening to him. He exclaims that it betrayed him. Guan exclaims what? The ghost skeleton dragon shoots fire in Wayne's direction. Wenha says that his bastard dragon wants to kill him. He tells his dragon that it will come back. The fire lands on him, breaking the ground into pieces, and blood starts to spurt out from Wenha's mouth. The ghost skeleton dragon attacks Guang next, causing him to crash onto the ground with a bang. Wenha curses, realizing that the bond of their soul contract is breaking. He curses again thinking that this isn't what he wants. The ghost skeleton dragon flies above with bright red flames coming out of it. As it shoots the fire down on them, Xinghua exclaims that the meteorite fire is falling and it is the seventh bad omen. As golden patterns begin to appear on the devil star dragon's body, Guan says that it going through the dragon tribulation. The devil star dragon continues to fly through the meteorite fire. Xinghua says realizes that the female devil star dragon turned its soul into the heavenly fire and led to a heavenly fire tribulation so that her son can go through the tribulation and become a dragon god. A dragon god is supposed to show up on the brown continent, but it holds a deep grudge against the people, including the rulers here. Therefore, she says that its appearance could be a crisis for the continent. She says that the seven bad omens have now all turned up. Meanwhile, Someone screams for help as the meteorite fire falls on them. Xu summons Moe and commands him to go absorb the meteorite fire. Moe immediately springs into action and begins to absorb it. Guan exclaims that they must stop the dragon's tribulation. He initiates a divine thunder spell on the devil star dragon. However, nothing happens to the dragon and it retaliated by shooting purple fire at him. Guan uses a divine shield spell and creates a protective shield around himself. But the Devil Star Dragon's purple fire breaks the shield and successfully attacks Guan. As the smoke dissipates, Guan lies there defeated. He coughs on blood and says Zhu is laughing to see him end up so badly, right? He says that it is normal to go against God's will to pursue what one wants. Zhu says that Guan's dragons are the most promising ones to become dragon gods on this continent but no one will survive tonight except for the Devil Star Dragon. However, he says the point is that once the Devil Star Dragon becomes a Dragon God, innocent people will lose their lives. As Xu takes the city seal out of Guang's robe, Guang says that he just wanted the city seal and led them to this dragon on purpose. Xu asserts that the city seal belongs to him, and it was Guang himself who intended to find the Devil Star Dragon. He stares at the city seal in his hand, thinking that Yunzi can wake up only after he obtains the last lamp jade. The place rumbles as meteorite fire falls everywhere. 
Xinghua apologizes to Zhu, saying that they could have prevented this if she had anticipated this scene, but she was way too weak. Ling Xia extends her hand and asks Zhu to give her the jade. She says that there is only one way for them to win. She will use soul-burning power to fight the dragon. Zhu immediately says no to this. He says that she will also fall asleep like Yunzi if she does that. However, Ling Xia doesn't listen to him and demands that he give her the jade. Zhu says that they have been looking for the ancient divine lamp jade at great cost to wake Yunzi up, and if she ends up like her, what will he do then? He reassures her that he won't take action until the dragon's power is weakened. Besides, the fire inscription of his sword is absorbing the flames to refine itself, and at the right time, his fire mark sword will reach its best state. Ling Xia thinks that Zhu is way stronger after his sword has awakened, and half of the ghost fire has been extinguished by him. He asks Ling Xia to protect Xinghua, saying that he will take care of the rest. Ling Xia argues that he could lose his life if he goes on his own. She begins to say something about her soul burning power. But Zhu interrupts her, saying that she hasn't dealt with the dragon god, has she? Ling Xia angrily throws back Zhu's own question at him and asks if he has fought with the dragon god. Zhu says that he has fought with the dragon god but it was at a great cost. He says that luckily, he met them people. Ling Xia is at a loss for words after hearing this. She wonders when he fought a dragon god, and was it in the last fight before the falling of the sword cultivator? Zhu recounts that back then, he even slashed the earth vein in exchange for just an arm of that person. With the barbaric land falling down, he slipped into the void sea vortex that he finds it fortunate that the devil star dragon is going through its tribulation this time. With his swordsmanship and top-leveled monarch dragon, he stands a chance of beating it. Zhu calls out for his sword spirit dragon. As his sword descends to the ground, Zhu grabs it and sees the fire mark soul. Feeling the sword awakening power, he thinks that it is stronger than ever, and maybe he will manage to kill the devil star dragon in the middle of its tribulation. He orders Moe to kill the dragon. Meanwhile, Bailing observes the sky, wondering if it is Zhu Minglang. She says that he is just a dragon tamer, so how is he as powerful as a sword cultivator? Zhu remembers that when he was at the mountain grave of the Nine Armies, he had the sword cultivation base but his body wasn't good as ever. However, now he has a stronger bond with the sword spirit dragon. Moreover, with the fire mark, his body feels as if it has been rebuilt. He now also has a more comprehensive sword awakening power. He uses the glisten sword technique, thinking that he can kill the devil star dragon once he stabs the devil star dragon in its tribulation, restrains its movement, and uses the vermilion bird sword based on the tricks of sword attacking. The Devil Star Dragon growls as Zhu's glistening sword attacks it. It begins to gather purple energy in its mouth and unleashes its slight swallowing power. Zhu curses, realizing that he can't see anything. He decides that he shall find the way out through a wide range attack. He uses a fire fly sword and unleashes the coiled dragon. As the coiled dragon attacks the Devil Star Dragon, the Devil Star Dragon gets an idea and gets closer to it. Zhu thinks that the Devil Star Dragon is such a cunning beast, realizing that it wants to use the Coiled Dragon's power to go through the Tribulation Vortex. He uses the sword attacking tricks and summons the Vermilion Bird Sword while exclaiming that there is no way he will let that happen. The Vermilion Bird Sword Dragon screeches as it gets ready to attack. Seeing the Vermilion Bird, Haoyi exclaims in shock, saying it is the 15th move of the sword attacking. He remembers Zhu once using this trick in the palace of the Miao Kingdom. Amazed by Zhu's incredible power, how Yu wonders if he is even human or not. The Vermilion Bird Sword Dragon attacks the Devil Star Dragon by breathing fire at it. Chan Hong laughs, saying that here comes his chance. Riding his dark purple dragon, he commands it to kill the Devil Star Dragon with optical balls. As the dark purple dragon begins to create a purple fireball, Chan Hong exclaims that there is no way the Devil Star Dragon can avoid this attack as it is already seriously injured. However, before his Dark Purple Dragon can attack it, the Devil Star Dragon attacks it instead. As the Devil Star Dragon begins to move forward, Zhu tells Baichi to go after it, 
and exclaims that they need to stop it. He realizes that the meteorite fire is very powerful and without the protection of Emoye's fire mark, they would have been burned to ashes. Baichi moves forward and protects herself from the fire by creating a shield around her. As the shield is broken by the meteorite fire, Shu thinks that since she isn't powerful like a dragon god, she can't defend herself. He thinks that Baichi has done a good job and that he will take care of the rest. As leaps into the air and moves forward with Emoyi in his hand, Baichi chirps and tells Zhu to go for it. The Devil Star Dragon continues to ascend, ready to go through the Dragon Tribulation. Zhu says to the dragon that he is coming for it. Noticing the dragon's wounds, he realizes that it is seriously injured and only has small hope of succeeding now. He tells Emoyi that they need to stop the dragon. He says that from this distance, he can manage to cut off the divine lamp jade from the dragon's tail suddenly, he exclaims oh no. He fears that the devil star dragon can't defend itself against the meteorite fire, and he will also be burned to ashes if he doesn't try his best to defend himself from the fire. He commands his sword to come out. Meanwhile, the devil star dragon creates a devil star flame. Xu swishes his sword to defend himself from the meteorite fire and the Devil Star Dragon also unleashes his Devil Star Flame at it. Because of this, the meteorite fire explodes before it can hit them. As the smoke dissipates, Chu sees the Devil Star Dragon continue to fly. He says that since the dragon is already badly injured, it will die instead of becoming a dragon god if it keeps flying upwards. However, the dragon is still not giving up. Chu exclaims that it is indeed a stubborn creature. He tells the Devil Star Dragon to wait, saying that he will help it go through its tribulation if it signs the soul contract with him. The Devil Star Dragon growls and looks at Zhu with skepticism. Zhu realizes that the dragon doesn't want that, and it even thinks that it is a great shame to sign the contract. However, without Zhu's help, the dragon will certainly be burnt to ashes. Zhu thinks that he can still get the Jade Lamp after the dragon dies, therefore, he won't suffer any losses. Zhu tells the dragon that if it signs the soul contract with him, he will lend the ancient divine lamp jade to it. He asks if the dragon wants to die a humble death or become a dragon god, saying, saying that it is all up to him. Zhu realizes that since the devil star dragon's mother was turned into a skeleton and used by humans, it doesn't trust humans anymore and is afraid of being enslaved. Zhu asks the dragon if it is afraid of being enslaved. He says to the Devil Star Dragon that it represents rebellion and asks if it has no confidence in itself. Zhu tells the dragon if he holds it back, it can just break the soul contract and that he won't beg it to stay. He tells the dragon to hurry up, saying that they can negotiate the rules, preferences, and welfare later. He exclaims that the next meteorite fire will kill them both. Zhu sees his soul contract ring shining and realizes that the dragon has agreed to sign the contract. A yellow ring forms as they begin to sign the soul contract. Shu begins to feel the dragon's pain as their souls become connected. He rubs the dragon's head, realizing that ever since its mother died, it has been drifting into this cruel world and has never felt safe. The dragon is just a kid for his age. He tells the Devil Star Dragon that they shall look after each other from now and that he is going to help it go through the dragon tribulation. Shu takes out the Jade Lamp which begins to heal the dragon's wounds. He says to the Devil Star Dragon that now that the Jade Lamp has healed its wounds, it has very strong vitality. He tells the dragon to rise up to face the meteorite together, and exclaims that he is sure they will be able to go through the tribulation. He swishes his sword and encourages the dragon, saying that they are going to reach the top soon. The strike defends them both from the meteorite fire. As the Devil Star Dragon continues to fly up, its wing catches fire. Zhu encourages the dragon, saying that after it goes through the fire, it will be able to reach the powerful Holy Land where it can embrace a brand new life. The Devil Star finally goes through the meteorite fire and comes out as a Heavenly Devil Dragon. Zhu exclaims that it has now turned into a Heavenly Devil Star Dragon and the Seven Supreme Omens have now all come true. He says that since the dragon is his partner now, he will be the one to decide if the omen is a good or a bad one. As they make it back on the ground, Zhu dashes forward. He calls out for Baichi, 
saying that he is back and asking where she is. Baichi, hiding beneath the rocks, opens her eyes. Chu picks her up, exclaiming that he has finally found her. Baichi chirps, saying that she looks ugly, and she doesn't want anyone to see her in such a condition. Chu reassures her, saying that it is alright. He informs her that they have a new friend now. Hearing this, Baichi chirps happily. Suddenly, Guan laughs and says that he thought Chu would have the ability to stop the Supreme Omen. However, he failed just like the rest of them. He exclaims that they are all going to die here and all of them are just pathetic worms. Wenha apologetically says that it is all his fault and that he shouldn't have been so greedy. Xinghua suggests to Zhu that they can hide in the relics, while Hao Yi asks him if he is alright. As the heavenly devil star dragon comes near them, Su Tai tells everyone to run. Xu tells everyone that they should calm down. In response, Su Tai calls him useless and a loser. He asks Xu that didn't he go to kill the dragon and why he let it go through the tribulation, saying that he is a loser. However, he is confused as Xu announces that he now possesses a dragon god. Xu asks if they have any names in mind for his heavenly devil dragon. Unable to believe what he just said, how he asks Xu to stop pulling his leg. He asks what he means by asking for a name for his dragon. However, he tells him to wait and asks if Xu just said that he has a dragon god now. Xu says that if he hadn't tamed the heavenly devil dragon, they would have all been killed by now. He reveals that he has signed the soul contract with it, and now it is his fifth dragon. Hearing this news, Wenha is unable to believe that Xu actually has a dragon god now. Su Tai thinks that he is screwed, remembering that he cursed a dragon tamer who has a dragon god. Full of hope and with tears in his eyes, Hao Yi asks if this means they will survive. Xu confirms this, saying sure. He says that although the heavenly devil dragon destroyed the city before he tamed it, he's still going to apologize on its behalf. He exclaims that since he is their protector, the rain city will stage a comeback and all of its residents will live peacefully from now on. He swears in the name of the city lord that he will never let anyone trample on this land ever again, and whoever dares to attack them will have to survive the attacks of his dragon first. Hearing this, the crowd says hail to my lord. Guan apologizes to Zhu for misunderstanding him before. He says that they are willing to help rebuild the rain city to express their apology. Wenha says that the two kingdom will have friendly relations with them from now on, and will be always loyal to them. He says that they are willing to help build a trade route to Nihai. As Xu thanks them, Nian Nian calls them shameless, saying that they are just playing him up since he obtained a dragon god. Xu calls this normal, saying that only the strong are respected in this world. Inside Xu Minglang's spirit domain, Haya and Qingzhua look scared as Xu introduces them to the heavenly devil dragon, saying that they have a new friend. As the heavenly devil dragon growls, Haya howls, saying that it looks even fiercer than Baichi. Qingzhua signals for him to be quiet, saying that Baichi is right next to them. Chu says that since the heavenly devil dragon just got here, it doesn't know them that well, and it will be nicer to them after a few days. Following this, he asks where Baichi is. Haya howls, saying that she is sleeping now. Chu thanks Baichi for what she did. He hopes that she is just a little tired and it isn't what he thinks. Shortly afterwards, Xu sees the rain city being rebuilt. Su Tai asks Xu how he likes the new gate tower. Xu says that it is good. He requests him to repair the houses in the back of the city as well so that people can settle over there. Su Tai exclaims that he is on it. Bailing tells Xu that the Divine Mortal Academy has said that they will take care of the spiritual chi for them and will only take 20% to cover the costs and the maintenance fee. She adds that they will deliver the remaining 80% to them in person. Xu tells her to use these spiritual resources to strengthen their dragon tamer team. Bailing thanks him for this. Chongming tells him that Bei's manor sent some eagle-clawed half-dragons to the city. He asks Xu what he wants to do with them. Xu tells him to give them to the Grey Wolf Cavalry and the Brass Saber Army saying that he needs their help to protect the rain city, so they must become powerful. Bailing says that the Red Eyebrow Manor, Lone City, Eagle Peak, Chen's Palace, the Di family, 
and all other forces around them have also sent them some precious gifts. Xu says that he will leave this matter to her and her brother, so she doesn't need to report anything to him. Chongming tells Xu not to worry, saying that they will help him manage the city well. Xu says that he believes them and begins to leave. However, Bailing asks him to wait, saying that they have three 1,000-year-old lucid Ganoderma. She says that Lady Yunzi can eat them to improve her health. Xu takes the lucid Ganoderma and says that it is good. Xu stares at the night sky, thinking that everything is going smoothly at the moment. He has gathered the four fragments of the ancient divine lamp jade, and as long as Xinghua wears it every day, Yunzi will recover little by little and even become stronger. He thinks that he will be able to watch the moon with her happily again then. But inside the spirit domain, as he feels the heavenly devil dragon roaring, he thinks that a dragon god is indeed different and the soul contract cannot fully suppress it. Haya and Qingzhua squirm in fear as the heavenly devil dragon towers over them. Xu wonders what he should do about the heavenly devil dragon. Suddenly, he realizes that he can ask Mr. Koi for advice. Mr. Koi exclaims in shock, asking if Xu said that he signed the soul contract with the heavenly devil dragon. He says that he asked Xu to tame a purple dragon with a gray tail. So why did he tame this heavenly devil dragon with a bad tamer? He reminds Xu that he just reached the high-level monarch and says that there is no way he can suppress a dragon god. Mr. Koi asks him to free it right this instant. Xu scratches his head, saying that what's done is done. Besides, he says that he helped the heavenly devil dragon to become a dragon god. Mr. Koi says that it might betray Xu one day. He sarcastically asks if Xu wants it to thank him for helping and exclaims that it is only possible in his dreams. He says that the only thing the heavenly devil dragon will remind him is to not eat too much garlic. Xu asks Mr. Koi why would it remind him of that. Mr. Koi says that decadent dragons do not like the smell of garlic. He says that the heavenly devil dragon will spit Xu out if it tastes garlic when it chews him, and then it will trample him to death in anger. Mr. Koi says that it is a dragon god, not a fool. If it had no confidence to defeat Xu, it wouldn't have signed the contract with him. Xu says that he knows that. He says that the heavenly devil dragon is much younger than he thought. The heavenly devil dragon is indeed angry and hostile towards him, but he knows that it doesn't want to kill him at the moment. Xu asks Mr. Koi if there is a way to stop the heavenly devil dragon from betraying him. Mr. Koi says that Xu will have to become more powerful. He says that the heavenly devil dragon needs one or two years to recover from the injuries from the tribulation. Xu asks if that means he needs to reach the dragon god level in that time. He exclaims that it is virtually impossible. Mr. Koi thinks for a moment and says that there is another way. He needs to have a dragon that can subdue it. Given the current situation, he says that only the sword spirit dragon and Baichi might have a chance to become a dragon god in such a short time. As Baichi is mentioned, Xu suddenly remembers something. He tells Mr. Koi that he is afraid for Baichi. Mr. Koi asks him what is wrong with Baichi. Xu says that she has been sleeping for two days and he can't wake her up no matter what he does. Mr. Koi says isn't that a good thing? He asks why Zhu is worried about that. Zhu says that she was hurt by the meteorite fire before. He tells Mr. Koi that he is going to check on her in the spiritual domain first. He enters the spirit domain and stares at Baichi, thinking that he has seen something like this before. He remembers that right after he signed the soul contract with Baichi, she turned into an ice pura from a white dragon. At that time, the whole spiritual domain was almost covered in ice produced by her, and it didn't melt until the second day. That was when he started to wonder. According to Mr. Koi, Baichi shouldn't have another metamorphosis through reincarnation so soon. Xu wonders if it is happening due to the heavenly devil dragon and feels empty at the thought of not being able to see Baichi for a while. Xu caresses Baichi as he calls out to her. He calls her name again and Baichi finally cheeps in response. She whimpers while Xu tells her not to worry and just go back to sleep. He reassures her, saying that Mo Yi, Haya, and Qingzhua are here keeping him company. He informs Baichi that the heavenly devil dragon won't betray him for a year or two. However, when it does, 
He will need her help. Ju pats her on the head and a tear slips from Bai Chi's eye. She sleeps again and begins to release the ice. As she encases herself in a cocoon of ice, Chu thinks that he doesn't know what kind of dragon Bai Chi is. Unlike other dragons, she keeps regenerating again and again. He touches the ice cocoon, feeling thankful that his spirit domain is at a high level now. Sleeping for a day in his spirit domain is equivalent to sleeping 100 days outside. Chu exits the spirit domain and tells Mr. Koi that Bai Chi has started her degeneration. Mr. Koi is shocked by this news. He asks if that is really the case. Chu confirms it, saying that he can feel her breath becoming faint. Mr. Koi says that it is very dangerous to go through a degeneration, but his soul contract with Bai Chi can always keep her alive. He says that when she wakes up, she might become a dragon god and even become stronger than the heavenly devil dragon. Zhu says that his spirit domain can help Baichi finish the degeneration 100 times faster. He says to Mr. Koi that it wouldn't take her too long to wake up, right? However, Mr. Koi says that isn't the case. He says that if Zhu is still worried, he can use a phoenix's nest to accelerate her degeneration. The phoenix's nest is made by an over 10,000-year-old phoenix, and it uses its saliva and some other materials to make it. Mr. Koi says that since it is a treasure for them, it is made for young phoenixes. Hearing this, Chu says that Mr. Koi has overestimated him, but he says that he will try his best to get it for Baichi. Chu remembers that he grew up with Baichi. They always stick together and help each other in difficulties. He will feel prouder of Baichi if she becomes a dragon god. He remembers that she became an icy white dragon from just a white dragon last time. He really wants to know what kind of dragon she will become this time. Xu suddenly remembers that the whole spiritual domain is covered with Baichi's snow and ice. He wonders if his other dragons are affected by it. As he enters the spirit domain again, he sees Haya also has ice threads on him. He wonders if Haya is also going through his degeneration. He turns to Qingzhua and realizes that he is also going through a metamorphosis through reincarnation. He wonders if this is like an infection or something. He is shocked to see that Emoyi is also encased in ice. He thinks that since Emoyi is a sword, why is he generating threads too? Xu hastily runs to check on the heavenly devil dragon. He sighs in relief and feels thankful that the heavenly devil dragon is still awake. Otherwise, he would have no dragons left. He thinks that it is probably still awake since it just went through the tribulation. Suddenly, the heavenly devil dragon stares at Xu and begins sniffing him. Xu nervously asks the dragon if it is hungry. He suggests that it should go look for food for itself. The heavenly devil dragon growls in anger asking why Zhu isn't providing food for it. It exclaims that it will betray Zhu right this instant. Zhu nervously says that he was just kidding. He asks the dragon to tell him first what kind of food it likes. As the dragon growls, Zhu asks if it means its favorite food is the blood of a 10,000-year-old sacred spirit. He thinks that it looks like he will need to go hunting himself since four of his dragons are sleeping now, and the heavenly devil dragon is not capable of tracking spirits. Chu tells the Heavenly Devil Dragon that he first needs to find out the location of 10,000-year-old spirits. After he finds it, they can go there and kill them to get some fresh blood. The Heavenly Devil Dragon roars as it flies. Chu tells it to be patient, saying that he is looking for food for it. Seeing something similar to a tornado in the distance, Chu wonders what is happening over there. He tells the heavenly devil dragons that they shall take a look, and the dragon roars in agreement. Some people are seen running away from the place, exclaiming that it is a river ghost. Someone says that two women are trapped inside the river ghost, and they need to help them. A man holding a sword exclaims that they can defeat the ghost if they fight it together. A scared man with a mustache says that it is the reincarnation of a river god, and if they piss it off, they will be punished. Suddenly, Zhu asks who is causing the trouble here. He says to the heavenly devil dragon that it must be hungry. He asks if it wants to eat the river ghost. The heavenly devil dragon growls, saying no. As the river ghost roars at the heavenly devil dragon and tries to attack it, Zhu says that it looks like the river ghost wants to eat it instead. 
The heavenly devil dragon creates purple light in its mouth and growls, saying that the river ghost must have a death wish. The heavenly devil dragon attacks the river ghost with the purple light, creating a hole in its body. As the heavenly devil dragon inhales it, the two women that were trapped inside the river ghost begin falling into the river. Zhu realizes that these two women are Bai Qinan and Wen Myra from the sword sect of Miao Mountains. He commands his heavenly devil dragon to catch them. After some time, the two of them are seen sleeping in Zhu's bed. As Qinan wakes up, Zhu asks what happened to her. Qinan tells him that they encountered some ghosts. Zhu says that he heard some people shouting that it was a river ghost. However, he didn't think that the ghost was really a threat. Shinan says that Zhu is wrong and he doesn't know what it can do. She explains that they received a ghost sealing order and went to a branch of the purple sect on Mount Guang to discuss how to kill those ghosts. But unexpectedly, they were ambushed by a mountain ghost and the whole branch was destroyed by it, and everyone was killed. She says that only the two of them escaped alive, and then they encountered the river ghost and ran for their lives. Xu asks if that means the mountain ghost is much stronger than the river ghost. Chinan says yes and explains that every ghost possesses a unique ability. They can attach themselves to mountains, rivers, and stones. River ghosts and earth ghosts are at the least monarch level, but mountain ghosts can tear apart a master in the purple forest sect with ease. Chinan requests Xu to send their sect leader Meng a message on behalf of them and inform her about the situation. Xu tells her not to worry, saying that he will be heading there right away. As Zhu begins to leave, he thinks that he didn't expect those ghosts to be so powerful, and feels thankful that he has a dragon god now. As he opens the door, he accidentally bumps into a woman's breasts. He blushes as he looks at the woman, recognizing her as Master Xuehan. Master Xuehan tells the man accompanying her, whose name is Pu Shiming, that she needs to talk with Zhu Minglang alone. She suggests that he goes to look for traces of the ghost by the river, signaling for him to leave. Shiming acknowledges her and leaves the two of them alone. Xu apologizes to Master Xuehan for what happened earlier, saying that he didn't mean to do that. He hopes that she doesn't mad at him. Master Xuehan asks Zhu if he knows where Ling Xia and Yunzi are from. Zhu informs her that they are from the Nen family in the ancestral dragon city-state. He questions Xuehan, asking why she wants to know about it, and wondering why she asked him that question so suddenly. Master Xuehan says that there are some forbidden places around the Lichuan continent, and those places are probably the lost lands of some unknown continents. Xu asks if she means that continents are splitting up and getting closer to each other. He says that he also thought about that. Master Xuehan says that they found some important clues that can prove Ling Xia and Yunzi are extraterrestrials from one of those forbidden places. Xu asks what is wrong with them being extraterrestrials. He points out that for the people of the Jiding continent, everyone on the Lichuan continent is an extraterrestrial and vice versa. Master Xuehan says that if she keeps practicing for three years at most, no more than ten people will be able to defeat her in this world. Zhu says that she is in the primary grade of level god and he is sure that she can achieve that in three years. He thinks that his master is just as arrogant as him. Master Xuehan tells him that Ling Xia and Yunzi are also capable of doing the same thing. She says that they are just like her and tells Zhu that he needs to stay away from them. Zhu asks what she means by them being just like her. Master Xuehan responds that he doesn't deserve to ask her this question until he can see her true cultivation base. Hearing this, Xu thinks that she is way too arrogant. He wonders if Ling Xia and Yunzi have another identity or something. Xu continues to speculate, wondering if they belong to a powerful family and have a great mission to finish or if they are fairies from above. Meanwhile, Shiming looks at Xu from afar, thinking that it is him again. Shiming has never seen Master Xuehan show concern for anyone except for Zhu. He tells Master Xuehan that he has found the ghost. He informs her that it is heading to the forest in the west, and it is most likely a river or forest ghost. Master Xuehan says that she will leave it to him then, claiming that only mountain ghosts deserve to see her swords. Shiming is left speechless after hearing this, while Master Xuehan keeps walking. 
He turns to Xu and says that he heard Zhu kill the river ghost. Shiming bitterly says that he didn't expect him to become so powerful in such a short period of time. Zhu smugly replies that he is a fast learner. Shiming shows him a ghost's fur and says that they are tracking it. He says that judging from its fur, he thinks that the ghost is at least 13,000 years old. Xu asks Shiming if he is suggesting that he wants to cooperate with him. Zhu agrees to it, however, he says that after they kill the ghost, he wants its blood and then they can equally split the rest. He remembers that the heavenly devil dragon will betray him if he doesn't find food for it ASAP. Shiming says that they have a deal. As they fly on Shiming's divine purple dragon, Shiming asks Zhu what did the master talk to him about, claiming that she looked a little worried. Zhu says that it was nothing, she just showed concern for him and asked him to take good care of himself. He says that Master Xiuhen might look indifferent, but she is actually warm-hearted. Hearing this, Shiming thinks that Master Xiuhen always acts cold to others. He wonders if she and Zhu are really just relatives. He asks Zhu if he is really related to her by blood. Zhu says why he is asking that. Shiming says that he heard some rumors that Master Xiuhen is a natural daughter of His Majesty, and she was placed into foster care in the Zhu clan. Zhu says that he doesn't go back home often, so he doesn't know about this. However, he thinks that his majesty and the imperial concubine value Master Xuehen a lot. He wonders if that has anything to do with her identity. As they arrive at a temple, Zhu says that the leaves around the temple have fallen which clearly means something is hiding inside it. Shiming says that it might be a ghost. He suggests that they should take a look inside. As they enter the temple. They see a feast and candles on the table. They tell the ghost to come out, saying that they know it is hiding here. They exclaim that the people come here to worship it but it keeps causing trouble for them, and sarcastically say that it must be living a good life here. Suddenly, they hear something rumbling. Shu exclaims that the door is going to close and they need to get out now. He runs out of the temple and sees a ghost emerging from beneath the temple. Shiming asks what the creature is. Xu says that it is probably one of the ghosts. He says that it has lived for 13,000 years and is the ghost they are looking for. Shiming orders his divine purple dragon to kill the ghost. The divine purple dragon leaps into the air and bites the ghost's tentacle. However, the ghost frees itself and smacks the divine purple dragon, sending it flying in the air. Seeing this, Shiming tells Xu to hang in there, saying that he is going to call for help. Xu is confused by this. He is sure that Shiming is capable of killing a ghost at the top monarch level, so why is he running away now? He wonders if Shiming is trying to get him killed or did he offend him before. He decides to stop thinking about it and begins to summon his heavenly devil dragon, saying that he has found food for it. He begins to say something about the dragon not coming out. However, before he can complete his sentence, he sees a sword attacking the temple ghost. He is surprised to see that the helper came so soon. As the ghost is defeated, the sword continues to split the earth into pieces and blood spreads all over the ground. Zhu wonders if the earth is bleeding and if anyone just killed the ghost. The sword goes back to its owner, which is Master Xuehen. Zhu commends Master Xuehen, saying that she has done well. Shiming nervously says that it turns out the master was near them. He says thankfully, she just came in time. Otherwise, they would have to take great pains to kill it. Master Xuehen asks Shiming if he just tried to get Zhu killed. Shiming nervously rubs his head, asking how that is possible. He says that he only wanted to see how powerful Zhu has become now. He says that as she can see, he didn't go too far, and if Zhu were in danger, he would have come out to save him. Suddenly, Master Xuehen points her sword at Shiming's neck and Shiming exclaims in shock at this. She tells Shiming that she will kill him if he dared to do that again. Shiming nervously vows that he will never do it again. He thinks that she nearly killed him. Even though he has been working with her for years, she threatened him with her sword for Zhu Minglang. Zhu's suspicions turn out to be correct. He thinks that Shiming clearly wanted to kill him, but he has never offended him before. He wonders if it is because of Master Xuehen. He tells Master Xuehen that it seems Shiming was just being curious. 
he says that Ximing used to be a talented cultivator who was more powerful than all the people in the capital. Therefore, it is normal for Ximing to want to know how powerful he is. He requests Master Xuehen to forgive Ximing. Master Xuehen accepts his request and says that it is dangerous here. She tells him to better get out of here now. Chu tells Master Xuehen to also be careful, saying that everyone isn't as kind as him. He tells her to be wary of those around her and grabs her hand. Seeing the two of them holding hands, Shiming fumes in anger, thinking that they have no shame. He thinks that Master Xuehen has ignored him for years but she is caring so much about this loser Zhu Ming Lang. He thinks that she will pay for this. Shiming says that he will leave the two of them alone and will go to look for other ghosts now. As Shiming leaves, Zhu realizes that he was correct. Shiming is in love with Master Xuehen but can have her. That is the reason he got jealous of Zhu. He says that it looks like Shiming has lost his mind. Master Xuehen says that it is probably because he has been living in grief all the time since his relatives were killed in the branch of the Purple Forest sect on Mount Guang. Zhu sighs, thinking that she doesn't know anything about love. Master Xuehen says that she is going look for other ghosts now, and tells Zhu that she should get out of here ASAP. As she leaves, Zhu says that he will leave after he gets what he wants. He summons his heavenly devil dragon and says that it is time for a meal. As the heavenly devil dragon drinks blood, Zhu wonders how Shiming will feel if he finds out he has a dragon god. Zhu tells the heavenly devil dragon that it has eaten its fill and asks if it can help him with something. He tells it that someone wants to kill him and asks if it isn't going to do anything about that. He reminds it that if he dies, the soul contract will break and then the dragon will most likely return to its original form because it is a new dragon god. The heavenly devil dragon howls, saying that it will think about it. Zhu says that it is settled then. He tells the dragon that it can have a good sleep after killing Shimmy. The heavenly devil dragon growls in confusion, saying that it hasn't said yes yet. Zhu laughs at it and tells it to come on. Meanwhile, Shiming exclaims how shameless Zhu and Master Xuehen are. A man asks Shiming why he called him here and did he find something important. Shiming responds that he needs the man to deal with someone for him. This man is the leader of the Black Hand Hall of the Purple Forest sect. The Black Hand Hall's leader asks how powerful is the person and if he wants him to deal with him right now. Shiming says that he is just a loser and he needs the leader to leave no traces of him. He says that it is best for them to make a ghost of their scapegoat. He tells him not to kill the person, but make him completely useless. The Black Hand Hall's leader agrees to it, saying that it isn't the first time he has done something like this. Shiming reveals to the leader that he is talking about Zhu Minglang, the son of Zhu Tianguan. The leader says that so it is Zhu again. He tells Shiming that Prince Am once asked them to kill him, but they refused. After this, the prince asked the Cell's Word sect to do the job. However, the Cell's Word sect failed and Prince An was exposed. Shiming calls the members of the Cell's Word sect losers. He says there is no way Zhu will be able to compare with their hall, and if the leader manages to kill Zhu, they will be able to rebuild a relationship with Prince An. The leader says that Shiming has a point. Prince An has always wanted to suppress the Zhu clan. He is sure that the prince has always wanted to join hands with Shiming's family, but never had the chance. If Shiming gets rid of Zhu for Prince An, he will surely lower his guard and treat Shiming as family. Shiming says that isn't Prince An in the Snow Peak City right now. He says that they need to deal with Zhu first if they want to build a relationship with him. The leader smirks, saying that Zhu is just a dragon tamer, and they have hundreds of ways to make his life a living hell. Besides, he says that it is getting dark earlier today and they can do their job better at night. Hearing this, Shiming looks at the sky in confusion. He wonders if it is already dark. He says that something is wrong. The sun hasn't set yet and no one in the town has lit lanterns. He realizes that it is only dark in this area. Suddenly, the heavenly devil dragon appears, charging at them. Horrified, Shiming wonders what the creature is. The leader screams as the heavenly devil dragon grabs him with his mouth. Shiming immediately summons the divine purple dragon and the dark purple dragon. 
He tells them that the creature is heading into the bamboo forest, and orders them to find IT.AS Shiming enters the bamboo forest. He wonders if his dragons have found it. Suddenly, the leader falls from the sky. Shiming asks the leader if he is alright. He is unable to believe that the leader's body has been terribly contorted. He wonders if there is a ghost in the darkness. He asks his dragon why he hasn't caught the creature yet, and what's wrong with it. Suddenly, as the heavenly devil dragon appears again, Shiming asks it a wild dragon and asks how dare it try to attack him. The offended heavenly devil dragon growls, saying that it is going to kill Shiming for calling him a wild dragon. As it attacks Shiming's dark purple dragon, Shiming exclaims in disbelief. He tells his dragon to use mystic art. The dark purple dragon listens to him and begins to use mystic art. However, the heavenly devil dragon attacks it again. The dark purple dragon falls to the ground, defeated. Shiming gets on his knees and bows in front of the heavenly devil dragon. He refers to it as a ghost and begs it to forgive him. He says that he can offer anything to it as long as it spares his life. Shu walks up to him and says that he didn't expect Shiming to believe there is a ghost since he is such a powerful cultivator in the Jiting continent. Shiming stutters, asking if it was Shu. With a smug expression, Shu asks Shiming if he is happy that he isn't a ghost. In response, Shiming asks why he pretended to be a ghost. Shu says that he wasn't pretending to be a ghost. He was just taking his dragon out to look for food over here. The heavenly devil dragon growls, saying that the stone ghost's blood was just for filling its stomach, but Shiming's dragons are tasty. Shiming exclaims in shock, realizing Zhu has a dragon god. Zhu teases Shiming, asking if he wishes it'd be better if he really was a ghost. Shiming is unable to comprehend this. He is the one who always wanted a dragon god, and by obtaining it, the Piyu family and the Purple Forest sect would give him as many resources as he wanted. He thinks how could this be, such a dragon god is supposed to belong to him. Chu says that anything is possible. He says that he gave Shiming a chance, but he didn't cherish it. Shiming exclaims that Chu can't kill him. If he does, he will start a war between the Pu family and the Zhu clan, and the kingdom won't let him off so easily. The heavenly devil dragon roars as it gets ready to kill Shiming. Meanwhile, Shu tells him not to worry, saying that he will make a ghost his scapegoat. He says that many people of the Purple Forest sect have died here and Shiming is going to join them soon. However, Zhu tells his dragon to wait, saying that he forgot to ask Shiming something. He says that he knows Shiming has a crush on Master Shuahen, but why does he want to kill him? Shiming says that Shu already knows the reason. Shu says that Shiming thinks too much. He tells him to try to be a broad-minded person in his next life. However, Zhu says if he can't do that, he should stop messing with him, claiming that he himself is also a narrow-minded person. Everything turns black and red as the heavenly devil dragon finally kills Shiming. Shortly afterwards, Master Shuahen looks at the blood on the ground and says that it was from the ghost she killed. Shu asks her if she is angry with him. She says that she said to give him a chance. Shu responds that he was worried about her and hated to see Shiming keep bothering her. She dismisses him, saying that he can go now, and Shu tells her to take care of herself. As Shuahen leaves, she wonders how Shu was able to kill Shiming and his powerful fighter. She doesn't think Zhu is that powerful at the moment, and wonders what he is hiding from her. Inside the spirit domain, Zhu tells his heavenly devil dragon that he helped it to get the food and it has eaten its fill. He says that it can't just sleep right after eating and asks if it can take him back to the rain city first. As the heavenly devil dragon ignores him, he sighs, thinking what a disobedient creature it is. He turns to Baichi, Moe, and Qingzhua and sees that they are still sleeping. He sighs, thinking that it is very hard to lead these dragons. Looks like Shu will have to get to the Snow Peak City, the nearest city from here, and hire a dragon there to fly back to the Rain City. Shu arrives at the Snow Peak City. He can't believe that he had to walk for so long and now has to hire a dragon even though he already has plenty of them. If he had known this would happen, he would have asked Master Shuahen to give him a ride on her sword. Suddenly, his eye catches the sign saying, 
the branch of the outer court of the Zhu clan in the Snow Peak City. Zhu realizes that he forgot that they have a branch here and enters the outer court. He takes a bath with two ladies rubbing his shoulders. Zhu exclaims that this is great. A purple-haired man informs Zhu that they have prepared a dragon for him. He apologetically says that since he needs to meet Prince Am later, he can escort him back in person. Xu asks him about meeting Prince Am. The purple-haired man tells him that Prince Ang asked him to forge gold ox shoes for a divine ox the other day. The prince said that it is for an honorable extraterrestrial being. He says that today is the deadline, so he needs to send them to the prince immediately. Hearing the purple-haired man mention extraterrestrial beings, he remembers Master Xuehen's words, thinking whether they are the beings that she had mentioned. Xu says that he hasn't seen any extraterrestrial beings. He asks the purple-haired man to take him along, saying that he intended to broaden his horizon anyway. He says that he is in no hurry to get back to the Rain City. The purple-haired man agrees, saying that they shall meet him together after Zhu gets dressed. At Prince Eng's mansion, concubines are seen dancing in front of the prince and a man beside him. The purple-haired man presents the gold ox shoes to the prince. He says that they finish making them overnight and asks his highness to check them. The prince addresses the man beside him as Mr. Bai and presents gold ox shoes to him, saying that he prepared a small gift for him. He requests Mr. Bai to accept his gift, saying that the Zhu clan has the best forging technology on the Jiting continent, and things forged by them are of the finest quality. Zhu, disguising himself wearing a masquerade, thinks that Mr. Bai looks familiar to him. As Mr. Bai doesn't respond, Prince An calls out to him again. Mr. Bai finally replies, thanking the prince for his kind gesture. He apologizes, saying that he actually came here to find an enemy of his and he was thinking about him, so his mind wandered. Xu sees that Mr. Bai only has one arm and realizes that it is him. Mr. Bai tells his story, saying that when he was young and impulsive, he came here alone for adventures, but that despicable man attacked him sneakily and hurt one of his arms. He has become more powerful now, and he wants to kill that person. Otherwise, he will always have a scar on his heart which will affect his cultivation in the future. Prince Ang says that as far as he knows, when Mr. Bai first came here, he had already reached the god level. He's afraid that only someone from the four major sects, or the leader of some ancient sect could hurt him. The prince asks what that man looked like. Mr. Bai says that he looked very young, less than 20 years old. He adds that since the man used a sword on him, he must be from a sect focusing on swords over here. Mr. Bai says that if he hadn't let his guard down and didn't give the chance to attack him sneakily, he would have ripped that man's head off. Zhu says to himself what a shameless man Mr. Bai is, thinking that he was no match for him, and just lied that he attacked him sneakily. What had happened was, Zhu saw Mr. Bai one day and wondered if he was absorbing the spiritual energy. As the spiritual energy was being sucked out of the people, he told the man that he should have told the people to leave before absorbing the spiritual energy here. He said that they are all innocent and don't deserve it. Mr. Bai had told him that the people who live on this continent are just like rats to him. He said that since they live in this spirit land but don't even know how to utilize these resources, it doesn't matter if they are dead or alive. He had told Zhu to stay out of it and don't disturb him. Otherwise, he would also kill him. At that time, he thought that Mr. Bai doesn't care about other people's lives at all. Moreover, he was also draining away Bai Chi's spiritual energy. He decided that he needed to stop the man. He took his sword out and said to Mr. Bai that he would have to stop him then. Mr. Bai had exclaimed how dare he say that. He had said that Zhu is just a sword cultivator and asked how dare he try to fight him. Zhu remembers that he thought the man was so powerful and he was afraid that he had reached the god level. He knew that he wouldn't be able to beat Mr. Bai if he fought him ordinarily. He attacked Mr. Bai back then, telling him to take his most powerful attack, and that was when he cut off the man's arm. He realized that since Mr. Bai had absorbed the spiritual energy of this island, it became a barbaric land. He felt afraid that his attack would destroy it. The man cursed for him to go to hell. His attack had destroyed his cultivation base as a sword cultivator, and then he fell into a swirl. 
That is how he came to the Lichuan continent. I and the present, the purple haired man told Prince Ang that he will take his leave now. Meanwhile, Zhu was thinking that he didn't expect to see Mr. Bai here again. Since four of his dragons are sleeping now, he can't do anything. However, Zhu decides that after they wake up, he will ask them to tear Mr. Bai apart. Twelve days later, Zhu finally arrived back at the rain city. Zhu looks at the market, thinking that he didn't expect this place to become so prosperous in such a short period of time. He thinks that he can finally have a good time with his wives. However, he immediately corrects himself, thinking that he can have a good time with his wife and her sisters. As he arrives at the autumn yard, Bailing bumps into him. She angrily tells Zhu to watch where he is going, not knowing that it is him. As she realizes that it is Zhu, she nervously says that he is back. Zhu tells her to be careful and asks why was she in such a hurry. He asks her where her wife and sisters are. Bailing says that they left to deal with something urgent. She hands him a letter, saying that they left this for him. Zhu reads the letter in which they are informing him that their grandmother is very ill. Their grandmother sent them a letter in which she said that she has something important to tell them. They waited three days for Zhu to arrive so that they could go to Lichuan together with him. But they were worried that their grandmother might not have many days left. Therefore, they left without him. They hope that Zhu can catch up with them soon and meet them at the east border ASAP. As he finishes reading it, he wonders if the important thing is about the extraterrestrials. He remembers that four of his dragons are sleeping now and the heavenly devil dragon doesn't want him to ride it. It will take months for him to catch up to them if he rides a horse or something. Bailing says that she has something for him. Shu asks her what is this. Bailing says that it is Phoenix's nest. She informs him that someone picked it up at the mountain. She heard that it was a precious treasure so she bought it for a high price from those unscrupulous merchants for Zhu. Zhu remembers hearing that the nest can be used to accelerate the dragon's degeneration and realizes that it is incredibly useful. Bailing says that it is said the nest is from a 30,000-year-old phoenix that lives on a mysterious island in Nihai. She says that it is a pity that some big families and nobles in Nihai have gotten the other nests, or she could have gotten him a bigger one. Zhu thinks that the resources in Nihai are very rich, and it is a good place for his dragons to recover. He knows that it will take him a lot of time to catch up to Ling Shai and Yunzi, so he decides that he shall take Bai Qi and the others to recover in Nihai first. After they wake up, he will ask them to take him to catch up with Yunzi. Zhu thanks her for the nest and asks if she has gotten the blood of the sacred spirits, as he had asked. Bailing says that they have ordered it from all the forces in the brown continent, but they can only get a little each month. She suggests he come back here to get it termly. Zhu acknowledges this and says that he won't be going to meet Yunzi and the others now. He says that he will write a letter and he needs Bailing to send it to them ASAP. Bailing agrees to it, saying okay. Shortly afterwards, Mr. Koi suggests why doesn't Zhu just capture the whole continent with his wives, claiming that it would be much more efficient if he has all the people of this continent to help collect the treasures for him. He says that Zhu just needs to have fun with his four wives every day, and then he will become the strongest person in the world. Hearing all this, Zhu feels embarrassed and is left speechless. Zhu says that they need to take it slow. He asks Mr. Koi to tell him how to use the nest first. He asks if it is for internal or external use and if he or his dragons need to eat it. Mr. Koi says that of course he will eat it, asking how are those dragon pupae supposed to eat it. As Zhu eats the nest, Mr. Koi says that he needs to figure out what kind of element the energy is. If it is ice, wind, star, or something like that, it will flow to Bai Qi. And if it is wood, light, and the like, Qingzhua will absorb it. Mou will absorb a metal or rare stone element, while Haya will absorb a water, beast, or blood element. Inside the spirit domain, Zhu sees that it is the wood element which is one of the natural elements. He thinks that it looks like Qingzhua is going to wake up first. As he exits, Mr. Koi asks how it is going. He asks if Xu absorbed the energy, and what kind of element it is. Xu tells him that it is the wood element, and Qingzhua will absorb it. He says that his cultivation base has improved a lot, 
and he has gotten a new soul contract. Mr. Koi urges him to use the soul contract to tame a purple dragon this time. Zhu agrees, saying that he will do it. He thinks that Mr. Koi is indeed very persistent. Inside the spirit domain, as the heavenly devil dragon sees Zhu placing his hand on Qingzhuo's ice cocoon, it says that Zhu didn't want it in the first place. Zhu thinks that the heavenly devil dragon has been planning to betray him all this time, so why does it suddenly care about what Zhu thinks of it? He hears Qingzhuo cheeping and thinks that it looks like he will get to see the new Qingzhuo soon. He tells Qingzhuo to go back to sleep and grow up quickly.10 days later, Zhu arrives at the Xianxiao Inn, which connects to Nihai. He decides to take a rest over there. Suddenly, he hears someone laughing, saying that it is the first time he has seen someone ride a horse here. This person is Luo Xiaoyan from the Great Mountain Sect. Xiaoyan teases Zhu, asking if he is one of the so-called bards who came here to look for an inbred sugar mommy. Zhu wonders who this chatterbox is, thinking that he has a really foul mouth. However, he thinks that Xiaoyan must think he is handsome or he wouldn't have thought Zhu is here to get a sugar mommy. Zhu informs him that he is a dragon tamer. Xiaoyan laughs, asking why would a dragon tamer ride a horse here. He asks if Xu is perhaps a worm tamer or something, saying that many worm tamers also think that they are dragon tamers. Xu sighs, thinking that Xiaoyan is just a dumbass, and it is better that he stays away from him. Suddenly, he hears Qingzhuo cheep and stops in his tracks. Zhu enters the spirit domain and sees that Qingzhuo is awake. As Qingzhuo yawns, Xu exclaims that he has woken up so early. Shortly afterwards, Zhu arrives at the SFX motel. He sighs, saying that he needs to feed his dragons since it is the only way he can find his wife. Suddenly, he turns around as he hears someone laughing. Xiaoyan asks Zhu not to try to fool him that he is feeding his worm. He exclaims that he knows Zhu is trying to seduce women. He calls Zhu his friend, saying that he knows life is hard, he offers to buy Zhu a drink. Zhu thinks that it looks like Xiaoyan is stupid but still has respect for him. With this in mind, he decides that he will leave Xiaoyan alone. Zhu grabs a leaf to feed Qingzhuo, saying that he is an azure dragon which is going to transform soon. Hearing this, Xiaoyan says that every living creature has a chance to become a dragon, but that chance is even lower than the possibility of getting hit by a shooting star. He tells Zhu to stop dreaming, saying that Qingzhuo is just a cute caterpillar and is perfect for sugar mummies. Zhu asks Xiaoyan his name. Xiaoyan introduces himself and asks Zhu's name in return. As Zhu tells him his name, Xiaoyan tells him to stop staring and eat with him. He says that judging by Zhu's clothes, he isn't that poor. He says that it must be because of the dragon transformations he is chasing that he has bought so many expensive books, but still got nothing in the end. He says that learning about dragons is important, claiming that you can't just see a creature full of vitality and think that it's going to become a dragon. He says that it could be an elf in disguise or maybe a really old animal. Xu asks if he studies dragon awakening. Xiaoyan says of course, claiming that his Luoshan sect was once a glorious clan and that some of Zi Zonglin's seniors even came to their place to learn about dragons. He slams his hand on the table, claiming that Zi Zonglin's esoteric dragon technique was actually stolen from them and they were just too humble and kind to say anything about it. Xu says alright and asks him to predict when his sweet boy Qingzhuo is going to transform into a dragon. Xiaoyan asks if Xu is kidding. He promises that if that Qingzhuo transforms, he will drink up the entire Nihai Sea. Xu says that it seems, Xiaoyan's dragon knowledge isn't that great after all. Xiaoyan calls this nonsense, saying that he came here to enroll at the most prestigious dragon academy. He says that when he becomes famous in the academy, Xu will still be a boy trying to get women to love him. He exclaims that when that happens, Xu can't call him his old friend and can't tell people that they sat together for a drink. Hearing about the Nihai Dragon Academy, he thinks that he doesn't know if a student of Li Chuan's Dragon Academy could get accepted. He decides that he should visit Li Chuan's Academy, thinking that maybe he can meet the headmaster there. Xiaoyan belches and tells Xu to be realistic. He suggests if Xu still has some savings left, he should buy a baby dragon replica, 
claiming that it would be more trustworthy than his caterpillar. He tells you not to believe the words of those merchants, saying that their medicines and herbs that are supposed to be good for cultivation are mostly useless. He says that knowledge is the key. It can take a person through every dragon gate and even far beyond. He exclaims that one can never go wrong with it and leaves. Suddenly, Qingzhua stops eating the leaf and begins to glow. Surprised, Xu realizes that Qingzhua is going through the process of rebirth. He says that it is way too fast for him to already be reborn, claiming that it took years for him and Bai Qi to be reborn. Mr. Koi appears, saying that of course the 30,000-year-old phoenix nest is effective. He says that since you put it inside the spirit realm, his cultivation speed increased by 100 times, and that is the reason the cocoon broke open in a few days. Xu says that he is now looking forward to seeing what Qingzhuo will become after the rebirth. As night arrives, Xu is seen with his eyes closed. He opens his eyes as he enters the spirit domain and sees Qingzhuo's new form. He didn't expect that it would only take a day in the spirit domain, but Qingzhuo's transformation has succeeded. He thinks that it is just that Qingzhuo's appearance has changed. As the heavenly devil dragon looks at the new Qingzhuo, he roars wondering why his vitality feels so intimidating. Zhu summons Qingzhua out of the spirit domain and says that he has turned into an Azure Eagle Dragon. Mr. Koi clarifies that he is not an Azure Eagle Dragon, but an Azure Tsung One Sacred Dragon, and he possesses the blood of the Azure Phoenix. He says that he told Zhu long ago that he stumbled upon a treasure. Every time Qingzhua is reborn, the bloodline will become even more divine. He reveals that an Azure Tsung Wan sacred dragon can rival Tianchilong, and after some training, he can easily step into the Dragon King level. Zhu remembers that Qingzhui used to drink lime juice, but now he can eat leaves. Mr. Koi says that is right. The flaws of Qingzhui's bloodline have disappeared. He says that thanks to the combination of the Azure Phoenix and Azure Sacred Wood bloodlines, Qingzhua has become the true king of nature. Hearing this, Xu says that he will consider Qingzhuo's hard times to be over. He suggests that they should go and get some more phoenix spiritual dew since Qingzhua will be able to control many powerful racial abilities soon. Mr. Koi says that they will have to go to Nihai City for that, and they can pay a visit to the academy while they are there. After some time, Xu arrives at the Nihai Man City. He wonders if he has come to the wrong place thinking that the place looks as if it has been contaminated by something. Sellers in the city are seen advertising their goods. A seller tells everyone to come and get the best young spirits, claiming that their dragon is right around the corner, and they shouldn't miss this chance. The second seller yells for everyone to buy his Millennium Ice Blooms for only 2,000 gold. The third seller asks everyone to buy a dragon egg for just 1,500 gold, claiming that they can become a respected dragon master by doing so. Another seller exclaims that his neon coral fruit strengthens their dragons. He says that the price can be negotiated as long as they actually want to buy his stuff. Shuas grabs a bottle of Phoenix Spiritual Dew and asks how much it costs. The seller responds that it is for 900 gold per bottle. Shu tosses a gold at him and says that he will buy all of his Phoenix Spiritual Dew. In response, the seller excitedly says that it is all his. As Qingzhua drinks the phoenix's spiritual dew, Xu laughs, saying that they have time. He asks for him to slow down. As Qingzhua finishes drinking, Xu says that they will now go and visit the Dragon Master Academy. As he arrives at the academy, Xu asks if Master Duan Changqing is here. The guard asks him for his name. Xu tells him his name, and the guard requests him to wait. Suddenly, Duan Lan appears. As she sees Zhu, she exclaims that it is him. Zhu recognizes that it is Madame Duan Lan. Duan Lan says that they don't get much news from the Imperial City here, so she and her father couldn't find out anything about him. She asks if everything is alright. Zhu says that it is going well. He says of course it is Yunzi's doing, but Zulong City finally has peace. Hearing Yunzi's name, Duan Lan remembers that she is the woman who helped Li Chuan, and wonders how she is doing. Following this, she says that Xu has arrived at the perfect time. Xu asks what she means. 
Duan Lan reveals that the Lichuan Dragon Academy has been cut off, and although its students were taken in by the Jiting continent, the Nihai Dragon Academy is quite reluctant to accept them. She and her father have been running back and forth, and they have finally managed to win a chance. However, she says that her father has been away too long and doesn't hold enough power to stop them. As she begins to say something about their old enemy still being in the Nihai court, Xu interrupts her, asking if she wants to challenge them. Duan Lan confirms it, saying that they have to make the challenge a harsh one so that they can be completely satisfied. She says that Zhu is still their student, and this is his chance to teach those arrogant men a lesson. Zhu says that he doesn't want to scare them, but it isn't impossible. Duan Lan calls this good. She says that the Lichuan Dragon Master Academy could be considered a foreign force, so it is very unfair for the students there that they can't obtain more resources. She says now that Zhu is here, they won't have to worry about those people pulling any tricks. Duan Lan takes Zhu to a place, and says that he can stay here for now. She asks him to tell her if he needs anything. Zhu acknowledges this and says that he will get out of her hair now. Mr. Koi appears and tells Zhu that he can start honing the essence. He says that he will remove the impure elements left in Qingzhua's body and guide him to stronger powers. Zhu says that isn't Qingzhua too young for that. Mr. Koi says that humans and dragons are very similar. Their ability to learn new things is extremely good at young and growing stages. Therefore, Zhu must take advantage of it. He exclaims that now is the best time to awaken his legendary techniques. He tells Zhu to go find a training field, saying that they will decide what to hone according to Qingzhua's abilities. Zhu says that makes sense and goes to the Dragon Master Academy's training field. As Zhu tells Qingzhua that he has grown so fast, someone asks to be excused. The person is a woman named Lu Fang, a student of the Dragon Master Academy. Lu Fang asks Zhu what is the breed of his dragon, claiming that she has never seen anything like it before. Zhu informs her that he is an Azure Sengwan sacred dragon. Zheng Liang, a graduate of the Dragon Master Academy, calls this nonsense. He asks what sort of a dragon has the word sacred in its name claiming that a sacred dragon must be at least of the monarch level. He says that Zhu's azure dragon indeed looks beautiful, but calling it a sacred dragon is ridiculous. Fang tells Zhu to screw him, saying that his azure dragon is gorgeous. A jealous Liang thinks that it took him a month to find his goddess Fang at the training field, and now she is more interested in Zhu's dragon. Fang asks Zhu's name and where he is from. Zhu tells her his name, and says that he is from Lichuan. Fang says that she has never heard of Lichuan before. Liang interjects, saying that isn't it that crappy private school on the Lichuan continent. He accuses Zhu, saying that he is now trying to get validation from their academy. He exclaims that Xu must be from the circus, saying that his dragon looks only like a chicken after all. Xu says that since he thinks Qingzhua looks like a chicken, how about they let their dragons have a little match? Liang asks what makes Xu think that his little chicken dragon is worthy of his eagle dragon's attention. Xu provokes him, saying how embarrassing it is that a student of the Dragon Master Academy is afraid to fight his chicken. He says that he can't believe it. Liang asks who said that he is afraid, he just doesn't want his dragon's claws to get dirty. Fang giggles, asking Liang if he is scared. Liang vehemently denies being scared. He curses thinking that he can embarrass himself in front of her. He summons his eagle dragon of the upper dragon god level. He tells Xu to be careful with Qingzhua, saying that his dragon is not forgiving. Xu tells Qingzhua to go play with the eagle dragon, but don't hit him too hard. Qingzhua soars through the air, causing red tree-like things to sprout out of the ground, which pierces through the eagle dragon's claw. Seeing this, Liang curses and orders his dragon to attack using its claws. He thinks Qingzhua is just a tiny dragon, so how is he so strong? He wonders if he is actually a sacred dragon. Qingzhua shoots his hardened feathers at the eagle dragon, causing it to bleed. Fang realizes that Qingzhua is not normal, he is too strong for his age. Zhu sarcastically says that is all he could do and that they are just some pricks from the crappy private school. Fang says to Liang that Zhu beat his eagle dragon with an infant dragon. 
She says that he used his own strength to prove his words. She says that Qing Zhuo is really an azure Sangwan's sacred dragon and Liang should apologize to him. Liang reluctantly agrees with her, thinking that he can't her think he is a rude blind man. Liang apologizes to Zhu for being too arrogant. Zhu forgives him, saying he is a generous man that doesn't hold grudges against those weaker than him. Liang tells him not to be too confident, claiming that his master designated him to deal with Lichuan peasants like Zhu. He says that he will use even stronger dragons than his eagle dragon against Zhu. Zhu says that he will wait for it. Liang grabs Fang's wrist. He tells her to ignore Zhu as he takes her away. Suddenly, someone exclaims that Zhu is here too. Zhu turns around to see that it is Xiao Yan. He thinks that Xiao Yan is a bit of a loudmouth, but compared to Liang, he is much more pleasant. Seeing Qingzhua, Xiao Yan asks whose sacred dragon is it, and why is it with Zhu? Zhu says that it belongs to him, and Xiao Yan has already met it. Xiao Yan is confused for a moment. He asks in shock if it is that caterpillar from earlier, and calls it nonsense. He wonders where Xu found such luck, baffled by the thought that his caterpillar turned into a sacred dragon. Xu confirms it, saying that his caterpillar has indeed turned into a dragon. He says that he remembers Xiaoyan saying that he would drink the entire Nihai Sea if Qingzhua became a dragon. He points at the sea, saying that Xiaoyan should start here right now. Xiaoyan wasn't thinking when he said that. He thinks that it isn't entirely his fault since no one would have thought that a caterpillar would actually become a dragon. Xiaoyan offers to buy another drink for Zhu, saying that they can forget that sea thing then. Zhu accepts his offer, saying that his wine wasn't bad at all and that they are going to meet a lot in this academy anyway. Xiaoyan says that they better not. He says that Zhu has humbled him and that he should have bought some beautiful worms back in the daylily garden. If he had done so, they would have become phoenixes by now. Zhu feels dumbfounded about the fact that Xiaoyan really thinks that he picked up Xu by accident. Shortly afterwards, Zhu arrives at Duan Changqing's residence. Changqing says to Zhu that it's been a long time since he hasn't seen him. He says that he heard about his actions in the Imperial City, and now that he is here, he feels so much more relieved. Xu tells him not to worry at all, saying that he is going to make the Nyaman court accept Leech One. Suddenly, someone calls out Zhu's name. He turns around to see teacher Bai Xu with his old academy mates Li Xiaoying, Nan Yi, and Hong Hao. Nan Yi asks Zhu why he is here. Zhu says that he was just passing by. He heard from Duan Lan that some people were messing with them and wanted to help them. Chan Qing says that everything is fine here. He asks Bai Xu if something bad happened on his journey here. Ishu assures him that they are fine. He says that since Li Chuan is now a part of the Jiting dynasty, as long as they carry their travel documents, those guards won't cause them any problems. Chan Qing says very well and informs them that their rooms have been arranged. He says that the test is in seven days, and they need to be careful around those people from the other side. He says that there was a lot of conflict when he and Lan came here. Xu tells Chan Qing that a man named Zing Liang claimed to be a student of the Supreme Academy, and since he was rude to him, he defeated him in a fight. Chan Qing says that now that Xu mentions it, he needs to pay attention. He says their first move against the Academy must be made by one of their former students. The people from the Supreme Academy are the most talented young dragon masters. He says that he will buy them all some materials to make sure that the strength of their dragons has improved. Following this, he tells them to go rest, saying that they will start training tomorrow. He exclaims that the fate of the Lichuan Academy now lies in their hands. The students thank Chang Qing and leave. Nan Yi asks Zhu where Sister Ling Xia is, saying that he hasn't seen her since she left with him. Zhu informs him that her grandmother is very sick, so she is on her way back to Lichuan. Xiaoying says that he heard Zhu was already a general when he left school. He asks what his rank is now and if his little sacred dragon has reached the monarch level. Zhu says that he is a king-level dragon master now, but Qingzhua's situation is a bit unique. He isn't a dragon monarch yet. Suddenly, hearing about Zhu being a king-level dragon master, a student of the Lichuan Dragon Master Academy named Fei Song calls Zhu a shameless liar. 
Shu asks Nan Yi who he is. Nan Yi informs him that Fei Song is new to the Dragon Academy and is always practicing inside. He tells him that Fei Song is stronger than all of them. Fei Song claims that he can single-handedly fight all the Supreme Academy students and that everyone else is just here to look pretty. He says that Zhu looks sleek, and that is very fitting for a male wife, but he should forget about being a dragon master. Zhu Tiesges, asking if it is his fault that he looks this handsome. At the barren wetlands near the sea, Mr. Koi says that aside from having nature powers, the Azure Tsungwan's sacred dragon has another ability called light control. His body can produce sacred azure light. This is the Azure Phoenix's Nine Skies, an extremely powerful ability that lets Qingzhuo's feathers absorb sunlight. Xu asks if Mr. Koi told him to find the origin of nature and sacred light to strengthen those bloodlines to their extremes. Mr. Koi says that is right, however, he says that Qingzhuo also needs to fight other monsters to accumulate power for his next breakthrough. As Qingzhuo flies, Xu notices a pair of red eyes hiding in the grass. He warns Qingzhuo to not go there, saying that there is a 1,000-year-old water lizard. He thinks that in the past two days, Qingzhuo has killed hundreds of water lizards over 500 years old, but a thousand-year-old monster is still too much for a dragon like him. Qingzhuo chirps, saying that he isn't afraid. The thousand-year-old water lizard stops hiding and reveals itself. Xu feels concerned as he notices that the water lizard has scales and thorns. He thinks that it looks so much like a dragon that he is afraid it is only a step away from becoming one. Xu asks if Qingzhuo is sure that he wants to fight it. He suggests that if he really wants to kick its ass, he can wait till he is a bit older to slap it around. However, Qingzhuo remains adamant and exclaims that he wants to fight it now. As the water lizard jumps into the water, Mr. Koi says that a thousand-year-old water lizard can create tides. He says that this place is sinking and urges Zhu to find another place to stand. Zhu says that he knows as he runs, while Mr. Koi tells Qingzhuo to be careful. Qingzhuo successfully avoids the tides and heads over to the water lizard. He uses his powers to make the trees create a wall, trapping the water lizard in the tides. Following this, he attacks the water lizard using his light ability. Seeing this, Zhu is shocked that Qingzhuo is already this strong. As the water lizard doesn't move, he wonders if it is dead. Qingzhuo happily flies over the water lizard when suddenly it shoots water in his direction. Seeing this, Zhu screams Qingzhuo's name in concern. He tells Qingzhuo to watch out and stay away from the lizard. Qingzhuo flies away as the injured water lizard jumps into the sand. Zhu thinks that the water lizard's blood is vicious and has touched a lot of sand. This is going to slow down its movements. He commands Qingzhuo to get to the dune as the water lizard chases him. Qingzhuo turns around and entangles the lizard using vines. Xu says not bad, they couldn't kill it, but the challenge was successful. He tells Qingzhuo to drink some spiritual phoenix dew. But before Qingzhuo can drink it, he begins to level up. Xu thought it would take three to four days to reach adulthood, however, it is happening way sooner. It looks like fighting overpowering enemies can help with Qingzhuo's strength. Xu gives Qingzhuo a phoenix spiritual leaf, saying that it can boost his magical abilities. He tells him to take it and go back to the spirit domain. They enter the spirit domain along with the tied up water lizard. As Qingzhuo still emits light, Xu thinks that he is still growing up, but his strength is amazing, and his vitality is also much better than before. He thinks that it seems he can count on Qingzhuo during the test. His heavenly devil dragon roars, saying that Qingzhuo's light is going to blind him. He tells Zhu to let him out of the spirit realm, saying that he wants to stretch his limbs. Zhu agrees to his request, saying that they can take a stroll since they are in Nihai. The heavenly devil dragon roars, saying that the beach is beautiful and that he has never seen one before. Xu tells him to go farther out, saying that he heard there is a spiritual island out there, and perhaps they can see a phoenix. Xu notices an island with sharks surrounding it. He says that it looks like someone is there. Noticing the people wearing the academy's hats, he says that they must be from the Dragon Master Academy. He says that they should take a look, saying that it looks like they are fighting 
the heavenly devil dragon roars, saying all right, and they arrive at the island. A woman named Han Wan, who is the superintendent of the Manching Dragon Master Academy, is seen sitting on the ground injured, with a man beside her. Shu asks them why they are here. Saying that he saw lots of bloody dragons while flying past the island, Zhu advises them not to stay here too long. A man named Yu Lin Zhao says that they are from the Manching Dragon Master Academy. He introduces himself and informs them that the woman and the man are their superintendents. He says that they were investigating the pollution here in Nihai, and a thousand-year-old great sea eagle attacked them. His friend was wounded by the attack. They tried to stop the bleeding, but the eagle is still able to detect them. Xu asks if that's the reason they can't leave. Lin Zhao confirms this and says that great sea eagles are extremely good at detecting their prey. Therefore, their dragons have been marked. If they call them, it will know their location even from thousands of miles away and will come to kill them. He requests Xu to take them back to Manching, saying that they will return the favor. Xu says that he needs to talk to his dragon first. The three of them are confused by this. Lin Zhao thinks that he has never seen a dragon master like Zhu, who even needs to ask his dragon's permission to help them. After talking to the heavenly devil dragon, Zhu says that he and his dragon were going hunting. His dragon only drinks the blood of over 15 thousand year old spirits. He says if they help them, they might miss their chance to find food. Lin Zhao calls this easy, saying that their academy still has some in storage. He says as long as Xu helps them, they will give all of it to him. Xu whispers to the heavenly devil dragon that if he gives them a ride, he can get the blood of a 15 thousand year old spirit. He entices the dragon, calling it a steel deal. The heavenly devil dragon roars, saying that he will give them a ride just this once. He tells them to come and Lin Xiao thanks him. As they ride the heavenly devil dragon, Lin Zhao says that they are lucky to meet Xu. If they weren't able to leave, he is afraid Han Wan might have died. Xu says that it's alright. He says that his dragon isn't easy to push around either. The heavenly devil dragon roars, saying that they are being followed. Xu can feel it too. He thinks that it is like something is staring down at them from the sky. It must be that great sea eagle. The crowd begins to say that the test is completely fair and no one could say otherwise unless they are scared of them. They tell them to get out of here if they aren't any better than a bunch of chickens. The crowd laughs, telling them stop embarrassing themselves. They finally arrive in Manching. Zhu thinks that it looks like the great sea eagle is afraid of Tianchilong since it stopped chasing them. Lin Zhao thanks Zhu for taking them back home. He says they would have died without Zhu's help and requests Zhu to follow him to the treasure house for the Holy Spirit blood. Zhu says welcome and they make their way to the Supreme Dragon Master Academy's treasure house. Lin Zhao says that although the Holy Spirit blood is really hard to collect, their Manching Supreme Dragon Academy has a tradition of finding the rarest treasures to gift to the best students and elders. He adds that of course, they also gift the blood to return the favors of guests like Zhu. Xu asks if they can exchange credits for Holy Spirit blood. Lin Zhao says absolutely, but only a few students can afford it, and it is usually the elders that have spent years accumulating their wealth. Xu presents him with his credit, saying that he wants the night dragon blood and the thousand-year-old beast blood then. He asks if that's fine. Lin Zhao says yes, however, he is afraid that there is a limit to these treasures. He informs Xu that he is only allowed to give him two portions of them. He says if that wasn't the case, he would have given Zhu all of their thousand-year-old blood. Xu says that two should be enough. He begins to leave, saying that if there isn't anything else then goodbye. Lin Zhao bids him farewell, saying that if he needs anything, he can come find him. He calls Zhu a kind man and feels that it is an honor to be friends with him. Zhu thanks him and says that he can't tell him his name, but he will need Lin Zhao's help in a few days. Lin Zhao calls Zhu their savior. He exclaims that whatever he needs, he will do anything to help him. As Zhu leaves the place, Han Wan asks Lin Zhao who he thinks Zhu is. Lin Zhao says that he is a dragon master with a dragon king. He exclaims that he hasn't seen anyone as extraordinary before. 
He can't tell what Zhu's identity is either. He says that he seemed interested in exchanging credits for Holy Spirit blood, so that mysterious man, Zhu, could be one of their students. Han Wan asks if he is implying that Zhu is a dragon master in disguise. Lin Zhao confirms it and says that it seems he has things to prepare. He says to Han Wan that they shall get her bandaged up first. On his way, Zhu notices Duan Lan. Lan says Zhu's name as she recognizes him. Zhu asks her what is wrong, saying that she looks upset. S. Lan says that it is nothing and that she is fine. She says since the Supreme Academy's test is starting soon, she should get going. Zhu asks her if that is true. He says that he will come with her then. As they continue to walk, Lan says that her father loves this academy, and he has done everything he could for it. But she doesn't know what she should do for him. Xu tells her not to think so hard. He tells her to calm down, saying that he is here with her, and they will get through this. Lan says that she heard that Xu and the monarch were really close. Xu finds this weird. He wonders why she is asking him about his relationship with Yunzi and whether she is trying to tell him something. He wonders why so many people are in love with him and if he is actually a legend. He reminds himself that he is a righteous man, with the deepest respect for his teacher, and his wife and her sisters are his one and only. Lan reveals that she admires Yunzi a lot, saying that she can barely keep a small academy running properly, while Yunzi can protect the enormous Lichuan with many states with just her own strength. She says that every time she compares herself to Yunzi, she feels so useless. She asks Zhu to tell her more about Yunzi and how she could face an entire army or nation without any fear. Zhu nervously says so that is what she meant. He wonders why he feels a bit hurt. He says talking about Yunzi makes him both in awe and pain. Shortly afterwards, Chan Qing exclaims why there is such a large audience when it is only a test. He says that this is supposed to be the Supreme Academy's test for them, so why are they turning it into a public commotion? He asks what they are trying to do. Suddenly, a superintendent of the Supreme Dragon Master Academy says if they want to become a part of the Supreme Academy, they need more than just the approval of the teachers and the students' opinions matter just as much. He says that he is the superintendent now, so whatever he wants the test to be is how they are going to do it. Chang Qing shouts, telling him to keep their bad blood out of others' business. Sun Li tells Chang Qing to look around himself, saying that everyone thinks it is fair. He tells him if he doesn't want to fight because he is afraid of losing, he can admit it before it's too late. He tells him not to waste their time. Chang Qing asks him what the rules are. Sun Li responds that it is very simple, they will take turns. Each side has seven people and will send one person to fight in each round. The winner continues fighting in the second round while the loser leaves and is replaced by another student. They will stop the test when one of the sides runs out of people. Chang Qing realizes that with this format, he wants to test the strength of both sides, and there could be a chance that all seven of them can't defeat one person. He thinks if that happens, their dignity will be destroyed and they will become the laughing stock for everyone. Suddenly asks if they are scared. He recalls that Chan Qing took away his chance to stay in the academy without even looking back and just disappeared. He shouts that he took his only chance to become an instructor. He begged for Chan Qing's mercy but he never even looked at him. At that moment, Sun Li swore to make him suffer the same things that he went through. He exclaims that now that he is here, Chan Qing and his stupid school will never be accepted. Nan Yi exclaims that they aren't scared and today they will show him the true strength of their academy. He requests Chang Qing to let him be the first fighter. Meanwhile, Sun Li tells their member Jiang Ziyu to go first. Jiang Ziyu tells him not to worry, saying that he won't disappoint their friends. Chang Qing instructs Nan Yi to do his best and not to hold back. He says that even if Li Chuan stops existing after this, they have to make everyone remember their name. He adds that of course, he and his dragon's safety always comes first and tells him not to risk it. Nan Yi tells him that he can count on him. The referee tells them to summon all their dragons. He explains the rules, saying that let the dragons fight one another and don't attack the dragon masters. With that said, he says that round one begins. 
Jiu summons his ancient ape dragon, while Nen Yi summons his green forest dragon, earth dragon, and sickle dragon. He exclaims that the Lichuan Academy isn't theirs to push around and commands his dragons to go. The green forest dragon attacks the ape dragon with vines, entangling it. It roars as it charges forward and the ape also gets ready to punch it. However, the earth dragon suddenly comes between the two of them. Noticing the spikes on the earth dragon's back, Jiang Ji realizes that it is trying to injure the ape dragon. With a smirk on his face, he asks if they think they can rely on those tricks to beat him. He exclaims that their tricks are hilariously underwhelming and that he will show them what true strength looks like. The ape dragon punches the earth dragon's back and breaks off its spikes. Nin Yi orders his sickle dragon to step in now. The sickle dragon uses its claws to injure the ape dragon's feet which roars in pain. The ape dragon tries to grab the sickle dragon. Jiang Ji smugly says that Nan Ye's sickle dragon is just a youngster. He says its most powerful weapon is its claws, which can only get through the ancient dragon's bare and unarmed feet. He claims that his ancient ape dragon can annihilate Nan Ye's sickle dragon with just a punch. Nan Ye commands his sickle dragon to slash, saying that it needs to wear the ape dragon out. As the sickle dragon begins to repeatedly slash the ape dragon's feet, Jiang Ji asks Nan Yi if he really thinks he can defeat him by being a smartass. He angrily exclaims that his dragon won't get away with this. The ape dragon breaks free from the vines and Jiang Ji commands it to kill them now. The ancient ape dragon roars and bangs its fists on the ground, creating an explosion and sending the three dragons flying. Nan Yi says to Jiang Ji that he doesn't plan on defeating him, he is only trying to make his dragon tired. He announces that he surrenders. Sunli says damn it. He announces that the Supreme Academy wins this round and asks the Lichuan Academy to send in their next student. Zhu thinks that the arrogant boy inside Nan Yi who wanted to fight everyone has changed. He feels that it is too good to see that they've grown up. Chan Qing appreciates Nan Yi, saying that he now knows when to back off at the right time. He turns to Li Xiaoying and says that it is now his turn. Meanwhile, a person from the crowd acknowledges that Li Chuan's students aren't weak at all. He points out that the ancient ape dragon should have had the upper hand, but it has now been wounded by three lower-ranked dragons. He says that Jiang Jiu underestimated them. Another person agrees with him, saying that Nan Yi knew the strength of his three dragons and used them to his advantage. He says that his strategy was very good. Someone wonders if there is anyone stronger than Nan Yi on the Li Chuan team. He says that he expected this to be boring, but now it looks like there is hope. A man points at Xiaoying, telling everyone that the second Li Chuan student is here. As Xiaoying's snake dragon strangles the ancient ape dragon, Xiaoying says that the ancient ape dragon is too stubborn and that he can't keep up anymore. He apologizes to Chang Qing, saying that he couldn't keep up anymore. Chang Qing tells him that it is all right, the second test is a draw. He says that they shall send in their next student. Jiang Jiu apologizes to Sun Li, saying that it was a mistake. He begins to say something about next time, but Sun Li angrily tells him to shut up. He calls the Li Chuan team losers and says that they won't be so lucky in the next round. He tells Zeng Liang that it is now his turn. Zeng Liang tells him not to worry saying that he will teach those peasants a lesson on behalf of their great Supreme Academy. A student named Fei Song says to Chang Qing that the Supreme Academy's team is disrespecting them, and exclaims that they can't let them do it. Saying that he needs to stop them, he requests Chang Qing to let him fight next. Thinking that Fei Song has reached the Dragon Monarch level and perhaps he could put an end to their attitude, Chang Qing allows him to fight this round and reminds him to be careful. Fei Song says that he will be the one teaching them a lesson and that Chang Qing can take his word for it. Zeng Liang says that it is always easier said than done. He says that Fei Song is rubbish to him. Fei Song summons Zing Shanlong, his lower dragon monarch, and yells for Zeng Liang to burn in hell. Zeng Liang also summons his storm blood shark dragon of the lower dragon monarch level. He calls Fei Song trash. He tells him to open his eyes and see what the Supreme Academy's strength looks like. As the two dragons begin to fight each other, Fei Song says that the Supreme Dragon Academy doesn't seem so strong. 
In response, Sing Liang says that he will show them all what true despair is. He summons another dragon called the Yellow Sand Demon Dragon of the Lower Dragon Monarch level. The Yellow Sand Demon Dragon joins the fight, and both of Zeng Liang's dragons overpower Ying Shanlong. Ying Shanlong roars as it begins to fall with blood spurting out of its mouth and body. Fei Song screams his dragon's name in concern, while Chang Qing demands suddenly stop it. The Storm Blood Shark Dragon bites Ying Shanlong. Fei Song exclaims no and blood begins to pour out of his mouth. Chang Qing asks Sun Li if he is really allowing his students to do this. He exclaims that it is not fair. Sun Li laughs, saying that the dragons are allowed to fight however they want to, and the injuries are inevitable. He says that Sing Liang didn't attack his student directly, nor did he break any of the rules. Therefore, he asks him how this is unfair. He says that Changqing's students are just losers and he should accept it. Changqing begins to respond, but Xu interrupts him. He asks Changqing to let him fight the next round. Changqing says that he won't let Sun Li get away with this. He requests Xu to teach Sing Liang a lesson for him. As the round begins, Sing Liang says that it is him. Xu says that they meet again. Xu asks if this is his true strength. While Zeng Liang asks if he prefers his storm blood shark dragon or his yellow sand demon dragon. He wonders what Chu is doing. Chu says that he will fight his yellow sand demon dragon and summons Qingzhua, telling him to come out and play. The crowd is shocked by Qingzhua's appearance. Someone exclaims that he is so beautiful, while others wonder if he is the Azure Sun One sacred dragon. A person says that he didn't expect a Li Chuan student to have a sacred dragon. He exclaims that this is going to be fun. Zeng Liang nervously wonders why Zhu's young dragon is so huge. Zhu says that he is feeling carnivorous today, and tells Qingzhua to kill the yellow sand demon dragon. Qingzhua chirps, saying not a problem. As he begins to use his light ability, Zeng Liang says that he is a crappy dragon and that he isn't a vegetarian either. Qingzhua shoots the light at both the blood shark dragon and the yellow sand demon dragon. The blood shark dragon begins to vomit blood due to Qingzhua's powerful attack. Qingzhua again shoots light at the yellow sand demon dragon. The yellow sand demon dragon lies unconscious on the ground, covered in blood. Blood starts to pour out of Xing Liang's mouth while he says how could you do it. Xu says that what goes around also comes around. However, he says that it's not yet painful enough. Suddenly demands Chang Qing stop Xu right now. He turns to Zeng Liang and orders him to recall his dragons. He calls him a stupid bastard and asks what he is waiting for. Zeng Liang listens to Sun Li and commands his yellow sand demon dragon to come back. However, Xu tells him that if he opens his spirit domain now, the azure sacred light will burn his soul. Xu says that he better thinks this through and asks if he really wants to save his yellow sand demon dragon. Zeng Liang curses. Realizing that if he allows his yellow sand demon dragon inside the spirit domain, the azure sacred light will damage his soul directly and the consequences would be devastating. He decides to screw it, thinking that it is just a dragon. He thinks why he should care, he will just get another one. The yellow sand demon dragon moves as it begins to regain consciousness. Sung Liang apologizes to the yellow sand demon dragon inside his mind as he decides to give up on it. However, Zhu suddenly tells Qingzhua to stop. He heads over to the yellow sand demon dragon and says that a man like Sing Liang is not worth dying for. He pours Xianchelong's saliva into the dragon's mouth, saying that it will help with its wounds. The saliva immediately works and the yellow sand demon dragon recovers from its wounds. Sing Liang calls out for the yellow sand demon dragon, but it does not listen and walks away from him. Sing Liang asks where it is going. As he asks it to come back to him, he begins to cough up blood as their soul contract breaks. Chu says to Zeng Liang that if he tried to open his spirit realm for it, he would have stopped and spared his life. He says that it is a shame that he is too selfish to think about anyone but himself. A woman from the crowd says that Zhu is such a gentleman and that she thought that he would kill the yellow sand demon dragon. A man feels bad that Zeng Liang's dragon left him while another man says that he deserves it and that ruthless men like him should be punished. 
Sun Li calls Zeng Liang a failure and demands that he get down right now. Su Huan, another student of the Supreme Academy, requests Sun Li to let him fight. As the round begins, Su Huan says to Zhu that if he only has one little Azure Dragon, it isn't too late to surrender. He admits that he isn't a benevolent man, but he still has some sympathy for others. He says that since Zhu's Azure Dragon is still growing, he doesn't want to make it a cripple, calling it cruel. Jingzhua angrily chirps, saying that he is not a cripple. Xu tells him that his dragon doesn't like the word cripple, so he better watch his mouth. Su Huan continues to repeat the word cripple. He asks what is wrong and if he is satisfied. Xu says that it has been so long since he has met anyone as stupid as Su Huan. He exclaims that he really doesn't have a thought behind those eyes and that he will be perfect for target practice. Su Huan summons his Black Dragon, Snow Dragon, and Carol Dragon. He exclaims that Xu and his dragon will be the ones who will be target practice. Xu says that he is too ignorant. Su Huan says that Qingzhua is just a crippled dragon that isn't worth anything. With that said, he commands his dragon to go fight. Qingzhua chirps, saying that they are dead to him. He uses his azure light to attack the three dragons and also attacks them using vines. Seeing this, Su Huan curses and tells his snow dragon to attack Qingzhua. His snow dragon attacks Qingzhua. However, its attack remains unsuccessful as Qingzhua creates a protective shield around himself. Xu says that he told Su Huan that his dragon does not like the word cripple. He exclaims that he brought this upon himself. Qingzhua angrily chirps, exclaiming that they are all pathetic cripples, he entangles the snow dragon in his vines. Su Huan curses and asks what kind of dark magic is he using. Zhu responds, saying that Su Huan is just too weak and that he isn't using any dark magic. He tells him to feel free to use it if he can. Xiaoying exclaims in amazement, saying that Zhu's azure Sun Luan's sacred dragon is so great and can deal with three different powerful dragons. Changqing says that Qingzhua's bloodline is extraordinary and he has mastered a lot of skills. He explains that a dragon's bloodline can be divided into many categories. There is bloodline heritage, racial gifts, learned skills, spiritual material awakening, and elemental honing. He says that dragons with elite bloodlines are born with some legendary mystic arts, and after years of training, they cultivate more and more valuable combat knowledge that suits them. This gives them an advantage even when fighting against enemies that are on the same level as them. As Qingzhua unleashes a light vortex against the dragons, Chan Qing says that he looks like he is still in the adolescent stage. Hearing this, Xiaoying asks if he is kidding. Nan Yu wonders if Xu's dragon isn't some random dragon that got lucky and became a dragon monarch. Noticing his team staring at Qingzhua in amazement, Xu sighs, thinking that they have been living under a rock. He smirks thinking that Qingzhua is just a dragon monarch, and he even has a dragon king. Unable to withstand it any longer, Su Huan surrenders. Zhu teases him, saying that he didn't hear him, he asks what he just said. Suddenly tells them to stop fighting and says that they surrender. He calls Su Huan a useless brat. He sends Guan Wenqi next, telling him to go up there and destroy those peasants for him. Guan Wenqi tells him not to worry and promises to bring victory to their supreme academy. He exclaims that he won't make any mistakes. A man exclaims in amazement, saying that it is Guan Wenqi. He says that he heard that Wenqi's dragon reached the peak monarch level. A woman beside her says that he is right. She says that none of the academy freshmen are able to beat him, and now that he is fighting, there is no way Li Chuan can win. As Zhu and Guan Wenqi face each other, Xu asks if he is the last one. Wenqi says confirms this, and says that he is the strongest one as well. He says if Xu beats him, there is no need for any further testing. He says that his dragon is at the peak monarch level, and they are really close to having a breakthrough. He suggests Xu surrenders before it is too late. Xu thinks that Qingzhua is only a lower level dragon. Now that they are fighting a high level monarch, the gap is too big for him. Qingzhua flies towards him and sits on his shoulder. He chirps, saying that he isn't afraid of a dragon at any level. Xu asks if he wants this challenge. Xu thinks that he got it. 
It wasn't easy to bring him back to life, and now he is no longer broken. He can feel Qingzhuo's desire to grow stronger. He tells Qingzhuo to go on then, when she tells Zhu not to blame him since this is his own decision. He says no matter how bright his sun and moon shine, everything will be covered by clouds, and summons his Nimbus Dragon of the Peak Dragon Monarch level. He says that it is a shame that his Nimbus Dragon just happens to be Zhu's Azure Sacred Dragon's nemesis. As the Nimbus Dragon gets ready to attack, Zhu realizes that this is bad. Not only is Qingzhuo overwhelmed by the Nimbus Dragon's level, but its elements are also a huge disadvantage as well. He tells Qingzhuo to be careful, telling him not to underestimate the Nimbus Dragon. As Qingzhuo evades the Nimbus Dragon's attack, when she calls him a little bird and says that he managed to dodge his two attacks. Suddenly, Qingzhuo chirps as he is unable to dodge the attack this time. Xu tells Qingzhuo that he tried his best. However, Qingzhuo chirps, saying no he can do it. He shoots the azure light at the Nimbus Dragon. As Qingzhuo begins to transform, when she wonders what is going on and why he is transforming, Xu says that his dragon finished warming up. He asks Wen Qi how his dragon is. Qingzhuo soars again towards the Nimbus Dragon. Wen Qi tells his dragon not to be scared, saying that he is a peak level monarch and Qingzhuo's transformation won't be enough to defeat it. Qingzhuo unleashes the power of the fallen daylight, while the Nimbus Dragon stares nervously at him. The Nimbus Dragon shoots water in Qingzhuo's direction, but Qingzhuo remains unaffected and attacks the Nimbus Dragon. Zhu says that it is just a dead wolfish dragon. As the Nimbus Dragon crashes to the ground behind Zhu, he mockingly asks how can it still call itself a Nimbus Dragon. When she is left speechless at this, Sunli exclaims that all of them are useless losers. He curses and calls Zhu a degenerate, wondering where Chang Qing found him. Xu asks if their Lichuan Academy has passed the Supreme Academy's test. Unable to believe his defeat, Sun Li turns to Chang Qing and accuses him of making an outsider pretend that he is his student. He exclaims that this is shameless. Chang Qing says that he knew Sun Li would say that and calls him an old despicable man. He shows him Zhu's official documents, saying that he started school last autumn and there are records of his performance in the academy. Sun Li reads the documents, realizing that Zhu really is a Li Chuan student. He wonders how a freshman could be so strong, believing that they must be hiding something. A member of the academy says in disbelief that their Supreme Academy lost to those peasants. Another member beside him says how can he still call them peasants, exclaiming that the Li Chuan Academy is now going to become an institute soon. A female member exclaims in amazement at Zhu's strength. She feels that he is going to become the strongest student in their academy too. Meanwhile, a male member beside her sighs, saying that people are going to find out soon. He wonders how big of a laughing stock they will become then. Sunli pokes Changqing's chest in anger. He tells him not to be so smug about it, and that he doesn't care if his students win. He exclaims that his stupid school will never receive their approval. Changqing asks Sunli if he really thinks he is that easy to push around. Sunli asks if he is implying that he can fight the entire Supreme Academy. He says that he may have lost this time, but he won't make it any easier for him. He tells him to just wait and see as he leaves. Xu says to Chan Qing that they did it, but they still don't want to accept their Lichuan Academy as an official institute. Chan Qing says that the test was just the preliminary part of an examination. The Supreme Academy will give them a much harder time in the final test. The Academy has four inspectors in their final test. Out of the four inspectors, Inspector Han Wan and Inspector Lin are more likely to support them, while Sun Li and the other inspector seem to be on the opposite side. Xu realizes that this means they need one more inspector to get on their side. Mentioning that the last inspector is on Sun Li's side, Xu asks if they can really do it. Chang Qing says that Sun Li will probably try to persuade Inspectors Han Wan and Lin. If he succeeds, then there won't be any chance left for them. At the Dragon Master Academy's beach, Xu thinks that in today's match, they managed to prove their strength to the Supreme Academy and the decision to make them an institute belongs to other people. He wonders what if he finds a trainer to help Li Chuan. Meanwhile, 
two female members of the Supreme Academy are seen chatting. The brown-haired female member exclaims that the Lichuan student from today is so powerful and even defeated Guan Wenqi. The blue-haired female member beside her says that he even broke one of Zeng Liang's soul bonds too. She says that Zeng Liang is such a bully and he is always trying to get their sister's attention. Xu really taught him a lesson. Suddenly, Xiaoyan creeps up on them, asking if they are talking about Xu Minglang and says that everyone is talking about him now. He giggles and lies, saying that he and Zhu are brothers, and they usually drink together in the Daylily Mountains. He puts his hands around their shoulders, asking if they want to talk to Xu. He says that he can give them some help. The two ladies get angrier by the second and beat him up, causing his nose to bleed. Suddenly Zhu appears and Xiaoyan calls his name. Zhu says that Xiaoyan is such a poet and asks if he is stargazing too. Xiaoyan gets up, realizing that it is really Zhu. Suddenly, two women call out Zhu's name and step on Xiaoyan's head while running towards Zhu. Xiaoyan lies with his head swollen, while the two women fawn over him. They call him handsome while asking for his autograph and requesting to see his azure dragon. Due to the commotion, more women begin to realize that Zhu is here. They also come running after him, while he grabs Xiaoyan and runs. He curses and tells Xiaoyan to shut up next time. Xiaoyan responds that he didn't expect them to go crazy for him. As they hide behind some bushes, the women wonder where Zhu went and tell each other not to let him get away. Xiaoyan apologizes to Zhu and offers to buy him dinner to make up for what happened. Zhu denies his offer, saying that he needs to find an instructor tomorrow and they have to discuss some things. Xiaoyan asks if he means instructor Lin Zhao. He exclaims how convenient and reveals that the dinner he was talking about is at Lin Zhao's place. He says that his father and instructor Lin are just like brothers. Also, he and Lin Kuang, instructor Lin's son, are quite fond of each other. He says that he was on his way to his house for some good wine. Zhu thinks Xiaoyan is a liar, remembering that he said he would pay for the dinner. As they arrive at Lin Zhao's palace, people are serving themselves food from the tables. Xiaoyan tells Zhu that he has no idea how arrogant Lin Kuang is. He says that this is actually a betrothal party where the man and the woman are supposed to be engaged, and they are hosting it in advance for the family members and guests. Xu says that if it is just a betrothal party, then what does that have to do with Lin Kuang being arrogant? Xiaoyan says that it is because the girl is not interested in Lin Kuang at all. She is actually disgusted by him. He reveals that Lin Kuang told her that he would host an engagement party anyway and invited guests over. He adds that if she doesn't come tonight, Lin Kuang will be humiliating himself in front of the entire Manching city. Xu is surprised that someone as delusional as Lin Kuang really exists. He says that Lin Kuang is just outright forcing her. Xiaoyan says exactly. He says that he came here for the wine, but he is also curious to see whether the girl will show up or not. Xu says that it has been so long, and he doesn't think she is coming. Suddenly, Lin Kuang appears and asks Xiaoyan to come with him, saying that he needs his help. Xiaoyan asks that he isn't planning to the girl, is he? He says that is too evil and that he isn't going to do it. He says if she is not here, then that's it. She is not interested. Lin Kuang asks what he is talking about and if he is trying to humiliate him too. He tells Xiaoyan to calm down, saying that they are just going to talk to her. Even if she doesn't want to marry him, they still need to talk about the matter. Xiaoyan asks if he is not afraid that his father is going to find out. Lin Kuang says that he is busy working in the office, he isn't going to care about these things. He asks Xiaoyan if he is with him or not. Xiaoyan says alright. He tells Zhu that he can stay here to drink and that he will be back soon. Zhu asks if he is going to kidnap a woman with Lin Kuang. Xiaoyan whispers, asking what Zhu thinks about him. He says that he is going with Lin Kuang to stop him from doing that. He tells Xu not to worry, claiming that he is a righteous man and that his grandma can vouch for him. Xu decides to let it go, thinking now that he knows Instructor Lin in his office, he should go to him first. Xu arrives at Lin Zhao's office. He introduces himself as someone from Lichuan Academy and says that he'd like to speak with Instructor Lin Zhao. 
Hearing that he is from the Lichuan Academy, Lin De Hu is Lin Zhao's daughter, asks if he wants to get into the Supreme Academy. She says that greasing her father's palms won't work because he only cares about competence. Zhu ignores her and shouts for Lin Zhao, asking if he remembers the island. Lin De laughs, asking if he is trying to befriend him. She says that will be useless and tells him to go back. Suddenly, Lin Zhao comes out. Surprised, he realizes that Zhu is already here. He apologizes for not greeting him and requests him to come inside. Linda is left shocked at this. Zhu says that he just came for the banquet and requests Lin Zhao to just treat him as one of his guests. Lin Zhao turns to his daughter and scolds her, asking what he told her about their important guests. He reminds her that didn't he tell her to prepare for everything. He asks why she didn't recognize Zhu. Linda says that she never met him before, so how would she be able to recognize him? Xu tells Lin Zhao that it is okay and reveals that he actually came here for his help. Lin Zhao tells him not to worry, saying that if he needs his help for anything, he will gladly do everything he can. Xu says that he will introduce himself to Lin Zhao. He reveals his name and says that he is from the Lichuan Academy. He says that the Supreme Academy gave the Lichuan Academy a test recently and they passed. But some of the people of the Supreme Academy don't want to accept that they passed. Lin Zhao is shocked by this revelation. He asks if Xu is the same Zhu Minglang that defeated Guan Wenqi. Zhu says that it is true that he defeated Wenqi. Lin Zhao laughs, saying that he thought Xu was hiding somewhere in the Academy, and it seems he was right. He says that a man like Xu got stuck in some fool's game. Xu clarifies that he isn't asking him to favor them. He just wants him to give a fair judgment to everyone, including the Lichuan Academy. Lin Zhao asks what is wrong, is someone trying to obstruct him? Linda interrupts him, saying that speaking of Lichuan, she isn't sure if she should tell him this. Lin Zhao asks what is it? She says that Lin Kuang is hosting a banquet tonight, and he said it was a betrothal party for some girl he wants to introduce to their relatives. Hearing this, Lin Zhao says that he doesn't care about what that brat is up to. Linda reveals that the girl seems to be a teacher at the Lichuan Academy, and he is his disciple. She says that Quan knows about Lichuan Academy's situation. She begins to say something, but Zhu cuts her off, saying that is why Lin Kuang is using it to coerce her. Enraged, Lin Zhao calls Quan a goddamn bastard. Zhu asks Linda if the teacher's name is Duan Lan. Linda confirms this, saying yes. He recalls Lan's expression and realizes that it makes sense now. Xu tells instructor Lin that Duan Lan is his teacher. Lin Zhao calls Quan a pig of a son, saying that he will drag him home right now for trying to force Xu's teacher to marry him. Xu says that Quan must be on his way to Lan's now. He asks Lin Zhao to let him come with him. But Lin Zhao tells him not to worry saying that if that bastard dares to do anything lousy, he will get his worst punishment. Meanwhile, Lan, Quang, and some of his men are seen standing on a bridge by a river. Quang to her that the bell is going to toll and the party he is hosting is going to end soon. He says if Lan doesn't show up, they are going to laugh at him. He gives her a veiled threat, saying that if that happens, it will be impossible for Li Chuan to survive, let alone be recognized. He tells her to think this through, saying that there is no one else on this earth that can help her accept him. Lan tells Quang to be reasonable. Xiaoyan tells Quang that a lady deserves a gentleman. He says Lan is a talented woman and should be treated with respect. He advises him to just go back and explain everything to his guests instead of harassing her. Quang asks him whose side is he on. He says he shouldn't have asked for his help. That way, he could have taken her home much sooner. Quan exclaims that he wants her to be his woman and nothing can stop him now. Suddenly, he hears Lin Zhao's voice, saying that he is very confident, isn't he? Lin Zhao asks what would be the case if his father is the one who stops him. Quan nervously asks his father why he is here. Lin Zhao slaps Quan across his face, calling him a bastard. He orders him to get on his knees and apologize to Lan right now. Quan grabs his swollen face, saying that he was just trying to talk to her, and he didn't force her. Lin Zhao kicks him in the face and knocks his teeth out, 
exclaiming that now he is looking for excuses. He asks if Kuang thinks that he knows nothing. He says he, Lin Zhao, has lived his whole life with dignity and has never done anything to be ashamed of. He wonders why on earth he has a son like him. Xiao En and his men stare as Lin Zhao continues to beat his son up. Kuang begs his father to stop, exclaiming that he is sorry. He begs Lin Zhao to let him keep his handsome face and asks him not to hit his face. Lin Zhao asks if he thinks that being his son would allow him to do this. He exclaims in anger, saying that he forced Lan to get married and even hosted a banquet. He asks Kuang what the hell was going on in his head. Chu asks Lan that they didn't hurt her, right? He asks why she didn't tell him about this. Lan says that she has been here for so long, so she is used to this kind of stuff. She didn't say anything bad to Lin Kuang since he and instructor he were friends. She didn't expect Kuang to be this shameless. Lin Zhao forces Kuang on his knees and yells for him to apologize. Kuang sniffs as he cries, saying that he shouldn't have lost his mind over her beauty. He begs Lan and His Excellency for forgiveness. Lin Zhao smacks him again, demanding that he apologize to them until they are satisfied. Kuang bows down in front of them and apologizes. Lan shows mercy, telling instructor Lin that he has done enough teaching Kuang and says Lin Kuang hasn't done to her anything yet. Xu also tells Lin Zhao that it is alright, he can see his son's remorse now. But he tells Kuang to always remember that the Lichuan Academy isn't for him to mess with. Lin Zhao says that it is his fault. He was too busy working and worrying about the Supreme Academy. He didn't pay enough attention to his son. He says that he will take Kuang back now and check on instructor he as well. Once everything is over, he says he will give him a formal apology. He tells Xu to take Lan back and go rest. Lan turns to Xiao En and thanks him for helping her today. Xiao En says that he is a dignified man, so of course he wouldn't condone such things. He then turns to Zhu, saying that he is full of secrets and that he even got Lin Zhao to beat his son for him. Zhu says that he didn't have a choice and he did what he had to do. At the Manchin Supreme Academy, Kwam begs Sister Han to help him. He accepts that he was wrong, but he says that he is still his father's son. He claims that he didn't do anything to hurt Lan and begs again for help. Sister Han asks Kwam what he did to get beaten like this, while instructor He Shou stands beside them. Lin Zhao screams at He Shou, saying that he knows what he and Kwam did. He tells He Shou to never call him his teacher again and says that he is going to tell the council to reevaluate his instructor title. He Shou tries to clarify that he didn't abuse his position for anything and Li Chuan isn't qualified to be an academy institute. Lin Zhao throws a book at him and calls it nonsense. He tells him to piss off and demands everyone gets out now. Shortly afterwards, a meeting is seen being held to decide Li Chuan Academy's fate. Sun Li tells the headmaster of the Manching Dragon Master Academy that Li Chuan has passed their test but their teachers aren't qualified for their jobs. The headmaster tells Changqing that his academy has many unqualified teachers and that they are hoping to make some changes. Hearing this, Changqing scrunches his eyebrows in anger but remains silent. Suddenly, the door slams open and Lin Zhao requests the headmaster to withhold his judgment. Everyone stands up and bows in respect for instructor Lin as walks towards the headmaster. The headmaster recognizes instructor Lina and motions for him to take a seat. But Lin Zhao says that there is no need and that he just needs to tell him something. He whispers something to the headmaster, who says okay. The headmaster says that he is now going to give them his final decision on the Lichuan matter. He says that the Lichuan Academy has been strictly following the ethics of the Dragon Master Academy for several years. Their curriculum is well prepared, the students are good, and the teachers are highly respected. Therefore, he announces that from now on, Li Chuan is officially the 142nd member of their Dragon Master Academy. Sun Li wonders how could this be, didn't the headmaster just say earlier that Li Chuan's teachers are unqualified? He wonders what is going on. He addresses the headmaster and begins to remind him about the problems they were addressing. But the headmaster interrupts him, saying that those problems are nothing. He says that they will tell the Lichuan Academy to send in their teachers for training every year. 
Sun Li is shocked to hear this. He wonders how can they have the right to be trained. Lin Zhao steps forward and asks if he is Sun Li. Sun Li confirms it and nervously asks how he may help him. Lin Zhao says that the public fight he arranged really opened their eyes. He says that Sun Li let a student like Guan when she fight them, and even he couldn't win and lost pathetically. He asks him since when their Supreme Academy's test became a joke for him. He shouts at Sun Li, saying that it is fine if he wants to fight people in public. He can have anyone join his team. He doesn't care about that, but he says that the test was not the place to get his personal revenge. Sun Li begins to defend himself, but Lin Zhao ignores him and leaves, saying that people like him shouldn't be in charge of anything. He tells him to go and look for another position in the academy. After some time, at Mei Lin's tea room, Lin Zhao presents Lan with a gift, saying that he is here to apologize for his son's actions. Lan begins to protest, but Zhu interrupts her, saying that Lin Zhao wants to apologize since he feels guilty for what Quang did. He asks Lan that she doesn't want to make it any more awkward for everyone, right? Hearing this, Lan decides to accept the gift and thanks Lin Zhao. Han Wan says that Lan has been traveling a lot lately, but she supposes that she hasn't been to their Supreme Academy yet. She asks Lan if she wants her to show her around. Lan agrees and the two of them leave the tea room. Xu asks Lin Zhao if there is something else he wants to tell him about. Lin Zhao confirms this and reveals that back when they were being followed by the Great Sea Eagle, it was because they were looking for an artifact called an Oceanic Seal. A man offered to help them, but then got injured, and he still hasn't recovered yet. He says that he doesn't want to miss this chance, so he asks Zhu for his help. He requests him to help them obtain the artifact, saying that he will definitely return his favor. He says that Zhu can tell them if he needs anything, and they will do their best to satisfy him. Zhu says if that's what he is asking for, he is more than willing to help. He says that he needs a phoenix nest, and if they can provide it, he will go with him. Lin Zhao says that they have an old phoenix nest in their storage. He says that he has accumulated some over the past years and he can get it for Zhu. Zhu thanks the instructor and leaves. He thinks that it looks like he doesn't need to do anything else for now, so he should go find a decent young dragon spirit. Suddenly, Xiaoyan places his hand around Zhu's shoulder and laughs, saying what a coincidence. He asks Zhu if he is going somewhere. Zhu realizes that it is him again. He tells him that he was about to go look for a young dragon spirit. Xiaoyan says that is what he is best at. He asks Zhu if he wants to play some extreme games with him. As the two of them arrive at the Dragon Hatcher camp, Xu asks if the extreme sport Xiaoyan was talking about dragon gambling. He says that he has heard of it before, but it isn't for everyone. Xiaoyan laughs, saying that he is here with him. He asks Xu to let him take him through round one and says that he will love it. He says that places like this can make people go bankrupt after just a night. He laughs, saying that he has seen many aristocrats leave here naked. Xu says okay and asks Xiaoyan to enlighten him then. He thinks that it is time for him to give these noblemen's pleasure a try. Someone thanks everyone for coming here today. She says that they will show them their dragon eggs later tonight, and for now, he can give them some spoilers. She reveals that there is one thunder dragon egg that was taken from the top of the demonic mountain not long ago. This woman is the queen of Xiaoyu. She continues, explaining that the thunder dragon was a dragon king and its offspring will either be a mixed thunder dragon or an orthodox one. They can't be sure, so it is going to be their mission to figure it out. She says that they can take turns coming up here for a closer look, and then decide whether they want to place their bets or not. Following this, she grabs the first dragon egg, saying that it came from the Daylily Garden and was found by a dragon master when he was passing by. She says that some dragons like to eat highly nutritious monster eggs and this egg was initially bought at the same price as those. After being examined by many scholars, it has been confirmed to have a very high chance of being a young dragon egg, and it also has a great reputation in the halls of Batian Street. However, she says that there is no way to know its race or bloodline. Zhu and Xiaoyan listen intently as she announces that they are going to have five observation rounds. 
They can look closely at it for one minute in this round and the price for it is 5,000 gold. Xiaoyan hands one of the workers 5,000 gold, while Xu looks at the egg closely. He wonders whether someone can really see things by just staring at it like this. The worker says that their time is up. Xu asks in shock if that is all he gets for the price of 5,000 gold. The worker again repeats that his time is up. He asks Xiaoyan if they want to keep examining the egg, it will cost them another 20,000 gold. Xiaoyan says yes. Xu asks Xiaoyan why he did that and says that he spent 25,000 gold just for looking. He says that he doesn't think there is anything rare about this egg and one can't tell anything by just staring at it. Xiaoyan says this is why Zhu should learn eggying. It is one of the dragon awakening techniques. Zhu repeats the word eggying in confusion. Xiaoyan says that there is also egg touching in the third and fourth rounds. Zhu says okay and asks Xiaoyan what he thinks. Xiaoyan says that this egg may look normal, but it is actually very unique. The eggshell looks thin but it has absorbed a certain amount of the earth's essence. The patterns on this egg are messy, but that is mostly because it was placed in an area with an unstable aura. Shu asks if now they are going to advance to the next round and use their spiritual sense to check it. Xiaoyan confirms this, saying that it is a spiritual egg, so there is a chance it will give them a beast. That beast might turn into a dragon, which is no worse than a dragon egg. Dragon eggs only have a slightly higher chance of hatching a newborn dragon anyway. Many of them just ended up being beasts. Hearing Xiaoyan's explanation, Zhu says that it makes sense. Xiaoyan exclaims that this is the charm of dragon gambling. He chuckles inside, thinking that Zhu will be the one paying 20,000 gold since he gave him the first 5,000. The worker tells Zhu that the second round is starting, and he can now use his spiritual sense to check inside the egg. Zhu uses his spiritual sense and realizes that this egg has spiritual froth inside it. Therefore, it must have been born in a place with a strong aura. He notes that the egg has absorbed lots of essences and decides that it is worth the risk. The worker says that the price is now 100,000. She asks if he wants to keep going. Surprised, Zhu says that it has reached 100,000 already. She reveals that a man named Mr. Han raised his best. He wants this egg and has offered to pay more so that the others will stop trying. She says that since it is Zhu's first time coming here, she will pay for this round. Xiaoyan screams, asking why she would do that. The worker reveals that when she visited Miyagwe in the fall, many nobles' daughters were charmed by Zhu's face. She feels it is worth paying 100,000 gold for Zhu to look at her. Xiaoyan looks in a mirror and exclaims that he is done gambling. He wonders why he wasn't born with a handsome face and what is wrong with his parents. Xu teases him, saying that it is his parents' fault after all. Xiaoyan didn't expect Mr. Han to raise his bet. He tells Xu that they are going to need 200,000 gold for the next round. He says that he doesn't have that money, so he asks Xu if he is sure that he wants to keep going. Xu says that it is fine, he is just here to have fun. Xiaoyan gives him a thumbs up and calls him generous. He says that he will tell him something first if he wants to keep playing. He reveals that this egg is either going to be worthless or a real treasure. Not all creatures can absorb essence before they are born, and some even grow too old and die before they can absorb any. Xu says that he could feel the spiritual frost on the inside of its shell. Hearing this, Xiaoyan exclaims in shock. He asks how Xu could do that, saying that he couldn't see anything. He asks Zhu if he really is that strong, and if he has any dragons even more powerful than the Sacred One. He asks Zhu if he has a dragon monarch. Xu tells Xiaoyan to be humble and keep it down. Xiaoyan again looks in the mirror and cries, saying that he isn't as handsome or rich as Zhu, and now he is weaker than him too. He wonders how he could say such things to him back in the Daylily Garden, Hansu asks a prophet he hired if someone else is really entering this round. The prophet informs him that a man entered this round, but he still hasn't decided. He reveals that the egg is surrounded by the earth's essence. That is probably because it was put in a place with a strong aura and not because it has the ability to absorb energy. He asks if they are giving up. 
However, he adds that if this creature has the ability to absorb essence even before it is born, then the 200,000 gold is worth it. He suggests that they wait and see what the others think. As Xiaoyan closes his eyes and senses something, Xu asks what is it. Xiaoyan says that he can feel it absorbing energy, but its pulse isn't as strong as he expected. He tells Xu that the creature isn't transforming the energy into vitality, and is like a sick person who eats without digesting anything. Hearing about the creature not transforming the energy into vitality, Xu says that is really sad. Xiaoyan agrees with him, but he suggests that it might be able to do so after hatching. They can't be sure. He says that they should give up and save some money. As he says that there is still a thunder dragon egg waiting, Xu tells the worker that he would like to pay 150,000 more. Xiaoyan is baffled to hear this. He tells Xu that he can't just throw away his money like that and asks why he is still trying. Xu says that he is gambling just because he can. He exclaims that this is nothing and that he is willing to pay more. Hearing this, Xiaoyan sighs in disapproval. The queen requests everyone to be quiet. She reveals that the third round has commenced and only Zhu is left. She offers Zhu to buy the egg for 275,000 gold. She says that they are going to remove the seal. She asks everyone to watch closely. Xiaoyan says so now the egg is Zhu's. Han Su appears and says to Zhu that he is the last one remaining, huh? He says that this egg was just brought here to attract people's attention, and if one looks at it carefully, Everyone can see clearly see it is just a scam made by some merchants. He says that he didn't expect there would be someone stupid enough to fall for it. Zhu tells him that he paid for it, and it is his now. Whereas, Han Su lost his money and got nothing in return. Han Su responds that as a nobleman, this is just a game, and seeing others get fooled is the peak entertainment. He says that he can't wait to see Zhu's face after finding out how trashy it is. Suddenly, the queen interrupts their conversation by calling out Zhu's name. She asks him to drop some of his blood on the egg so that he and the creature can have a connection before it is born. By doing so, the creature will be more loyal to him. Xiaoyan whispers to Zhu that the drops of blood will only give him a connection. It is not a soul bond, so he won't use a spirit contract. Zhu drops his blood from his finger on the egg. He and Xiaoyan stare at the egg in anticipation as it begins to hatch. The egg finally hatches and an azure glowing firefly comes out of it. Xu asks if the firefly is a young spirit. The people from the crowd exclaim that the firefly is so cute. Someone wonders what it is. He notices that it doesn't look like a dragon, so it can't be a young one. He wonders if it is a spirit with some magic. Han Su laughs at Zhu saying that he spent 200,000 gold on a fur ball. The queen informs Zhu that the creature is an azure glowing firefly spirit, and it is considered to be a lucky charm in their Xiaoyu kingdom. Zhu says that it looks adorable and he loves it. However, he wonders what the firefly actually does. He decides to try giving it some energy. He is disappointed to see that the glowing firefly absorbed the energy but nothing changed. He thinks that this isn't right and is weird that the energy disappeared into its body. Han Su laughs again, saying that if he were Zhu, he would have smashed that thing on the ground and stepped on it. He says that at least the sound of it being crushed would have eased his anger and he wouldn't have to be pissed off every time he is reminded of the money he wasted. The azure glowing firefly makes a clucking sound, exclaiming that he isn't useless. Zhu tells the firefly not to listen to Han Su saying that it is alright and that he doesn't believe that he is useless. Suddenly, Zhu feels a shift in his energy. He realizes what it is. The azure glowing firefly can not only absorb the energy but cleanse it as well. He wonders if he can also return the purified energy to him. He thinks that the azure glowing fireball is a mobile well. He realizes he didn't waste his money at all and exclaims that it was a steal. Xiaoyan nervously apologizes to Zhu saying that he will find a way to make some money so that he can make up for half of his loss. Chu coughs, saying that there is no need. He loves the little azure glowing fireball. Not believing him, Xiaoyan says that he can cry if he wants to. He offers to help Chu pay some more, saying that he paid so much and only got this cute but useless fur ball. 
He says that he would have bawled his eyes out right on the spot if he was in his place. He tells Xu to come outside and go get some fresh air. Xu says okay, and as they begin to leave, he thinks that he should give the glowing firefly's ability some more testing. As they arrive by a stream, Xiaoyan sighs, saying that it is his fault and that he shouldn't have taken Zhu there. He sighs again, saying that Zhu has lost his mind because of the azure glowing firefly. As the azure firefly tries to give Zhu the energy back, Zhu tells him to keep it, saying that he needs it to develop his body. Hearing this, the azure glowing firefly absorbs the energy back. Zhu is surprised to see that he can also absorb the energy. Realizing that the firefly was keeping the energy in his fire just for him, he calls him a generous boy. In response, the firefly happily calls Zhu daddy. As the firefly closes his eyes, Zhu says that he knows he is tired. He tells him to sleep well, assuring him that he is here to protect him. Xiaoan tells him to stop brooding and offers him a drink, saying that he will take him to the best tavern in Manchin and that they will have fun over there. Zhu nervously says that he really is fine. Suddenly, the two of them are shocked to hear someone curse and stop someone. They see Han Su kick the prophet and call him a terrible predictor. He says to the prophet that his eyes should be fed to livestock and tells him to rot in hell. The prophet requests Han Su to calm down, saying that he did tell him to stop bidding, but he wouldn't listen. Xiaoan says that it seems there is someone even more unlucky than Zhu. Han Su must have gotten a trash egg. As the queen appears with her workers, Han Su exclaims that she scammed him. He exclaims that the thunder egg she told him about was bullshit, and it is just a snake egg. He claims that the Xiaoyu people deceived them. He throws the snake in the queen's direction and tells her to soak it in wine. He demands that she returns his money. The queen catches the snake and reminds him that dragon gambling is risky in its nature. She says to Han Su that he must have known this well and requests him to stop disturbing their peace. She bids him farewell and her guards begin to drag Han Su away. Han Su demands the guards let go of him, saying that Xiaoyu is full of scammers. He exclaims that they are all snakes and nothing more as he gets dragged away. Following this, the queen asks Zhu if he is leaving now. Zhu confirms this and says that he had a lot of fun today. The queen tells him that the firefly spirit is going to bring him a lot of luck, so she hopes he takes good care of him. She presents Zhu with the snake Han Su threw at her, telling him to take it with him and release it when he is outside. She says in this way, he can do a favor for everyone. Zhu decides to accept the snake and thinks that the queen was smart. She pretended as if she pitted the snake, but she actually didn't care about the whole thing for even one moment. He feels bad for the snake, thinking that the poor thing was abandoned right after it was born. Shortly afterwards, Xiaoyan and Zhu arrive at the seaside. Xiaoyan asks the snake why it wasn't a thunder dragon and calls its fate cruel. If he had been born as a thunder dragon, the entire mansion would have lost its mind over it. He says that it is just a tiny snake, and it almost got soaked in a bottle of wine. Xiaoyan asks Zhu he is washing the snake instead of releasing it. He says not to tell him that he is going to skin the snake and eat it. Zhu denies this, saying that he isn't gonna do that. He asks if Xiaoyan really thinks a newborn snake could survive in the wild for long. Xiaoyan says that it is a matter of luck. It could grow up if it is lucky enough, and if it is not, it will become some other creature's meal, with nothing left. Zhu says that a newborn is a newborn. He says that if he has to release it, he has to wait for it to grow up a bit more and that he doesn't want it to get eaten alive by the sea. Xiaoyan points out that the snake doesn't have any magic and is even weaker than the furball. He exclaims in surprise, saying despite that Xu is still taking it in. At Zhu Minglang's house, Zhu drops his blood on the snake and says that they now have a connection. He says to the snake that he will protect it from now on and it has to learn and train so that it can also protect him in the future. As the snake nods, Zhu gives it some leaves, telling it to eat and not to be sad. He comforts the snake, saying that not all creatures are born as dragons and he has many friends that were even weaker than it when they were born. He says that as long as it doesn't give up, there is still a chance that it will make a name for itself in the world. 
As he is about to say something else, Mr. Koi appears out of nowhere and interrupts him, asking where his purple dragon is. Zhu nervously says that he hasn't found a suitable one yet. He shows him the snake and the firefly, saying that they should just take care of these first, as their spares. He tells Mr. Koi to look at the snake's skin, saying that it has some purple on it. So maybe it is a purple dragon. Mr. Koi says that he is right. He says that they should keep some young spirits, and that those two aren't too bad. He suggests that perhaps if they take care of them, they will lose their wildness over time and start gaining consciousness. Zhu agrees with him and asks why he insists on him getting a purple dragon anyway. Mr. Koi explains that there is an elemental chain among dragons. Their elements complement one another and give them an advantage when fighting enemies. A purple dragon is the most fundamental combination of the dragon's elements, and it includes metal, wood, water, fire, and earth. He explains that they are linked by soul bonds to create the five elemental seal. Shu asks if the fish has been nagging him to get a purple dragon because it has elements that can complement his other dragons. Mr. Koi confirms this and says that having a five elemental seal is like putting on gold armor for his dragons. He adds that of course, apart from the compatible elements, there are other effects caused by bloodlines, races, and many other things. That is why he needs to get a purple dragon and the final result of a dragon chain is greater than the sum of their parts. Hearing constantly about the purple dragon, Xu says that he will have to get one next time. By the seaside, the clouds are seen thundering and lightning. Someone exclaims that it is a white witch moth and that they have hit the jackpot. Zhu sees the people fighting over the moth, claiming that the moth is theirs and telling their dragons to catch them all. Zhu asks why they are risking their lives like that over some white witch moths. Mr. Koi explains that the white witch moth is a unique nocturnal species in Nihai. Their wings can absorb the moonlight when there is a full moon, causing them to grow a stamen for their tails. He says that every white witch moth is equivalent to a moon blossom stamen, and that Baichi will need their energy. Shu says that if they are that valuable, then he should go and catch some as well. Suddenly, the azure glowing firefly calls Zhu daddy. Shu asks him what is wrong. As the firefly makes a clucking noise and bounces away, Zhu runs after him and tells him to slow down, while Mr. Koi tells Zhu to wait for him and asks if he is really going to let him get soaked in the rain like this. They arrive at a place called the Little Saints Peninsula. Surprised, Mr. Koi says that the aura is much stronger here and that there could be a spiritual pond inside. Shu finds it strange that no one is guarding this place. The firefly clucks again and bounces away. Shu asks the firefly where it is going. They arrive at a spiritual pond and the firefly jumps inside. Shu says to Mr. Koi that he was right, there is indeed a spiritual pond here. He says that it is a pity that he has a river in his spirit realm and that his cultivating power is already 120 times faster than an ordinary person's. Hence, the spiritual pond won't help much. Mr. Koi says that although it doesn't help him, it is perfect for his little furball. The azure glowing firefly happily swims and absorbs the energy from the pond. Shu wonders if the little firefly is really going to drain the entire pond. The firefly continues to absorb the energy. Zhu is shocked to see that he really drained it so fast. The firefly happily jumps into Zhu's arms and Zhu thinks that he did good, thinking that the power that he is storing should be enough for a 9,000-year-old spirit to break through to the saint stage. Mr. Koi asks Zhu if he is sure that he can afford to pay for what his firefly did. As Zhu nervously says that he can't, Mr. Koi screams at him, asking why he is still here then. He says that no one is near them and tells him to run. Zhu says that he is right, realizing that this won't end well. He runs, saying that he is leaving. Mr. Koi calls him a bastard, telling him to slow down and to take him along. As they arrive back at the sea, Zhu summons Qingzhua who begins to catch the white witch moths. Zhu thinks that it has been so long, and no one has suspected anything. He finds this great thinking that what happened to the pond stays at the pond. Suddenly, he is taken aback to see that the rain stopped. The people realize that the rain has stopped and wonder why the white moths are flying up into the sky. As the white witch moths continue to fly, 
they realize that there is a white phoenix in the sky. Zhu stares at the white phoenix in shock, thinking that a creature that big and strong actually exists. It looks like the white phoenix is protecting the white witch moths from the rain. He realizes that what he thought was colossal was actually just the tip of the iceberg. He turns to the fur ball in his hand, saying that he will take him to a safe place now and that he can stay there for a while. He arrives at Duan Lan's house and calls out her name, asking if she is home. Lan, taking a bath, recognizes Zhu's voice. Zhu tells his snake and the firefly to stop running around. As Lan opens the door, Zhu falls to her feet as he grabs his young spirits and says that he got them. Lan looks at Zhu and blushes while saying his name. Zhu nervously explains that these two are quite a handful. He gets a nosebleed as he continues to explain himself. Lan asks if he came to her place because he needed her help. Zhu shows him his two young spirits and says that he needs to be away for the next couple of days. Therefore, he was wondering if she could take care of them. Lan says of course she will take care of them and tells Zhu not to worry. As the spirits bounce into Lan's arms, Zhu says to the spirits that he will be back soon and that Lan will take care of them. He tells them not to forget to train while he is gone and leaves the place. Zhu arrives at Nihai Carol Island. Han Wan notices that there is a strange plant growing there. The leaves of this plant give off a strange fragrance after absorbing sunlight and covers the entire island, making it unable for anyone to breathe. She says that only people who have lived here for thousands of years are unaffected, while everyone else can stay here for an hour at most. Lin Zhao, holding grass beads in his hand, says that they can reduce the effect of the fragrance, and if they run out of these beads, they won't be able to leave this place. He says that they don't have much time, so make it quick. Another official accompanying them adds that the effect of this fragrance doesn't depend on the cultivation level. Therefore, if they are stuck here, all of them will die. Xu thinks that apart from these things, there could still be other threats on this island. It looks like finding the oceanic seal won't be an easy task. As they make their way inside the forest, Lin Zhao says that the oceanic seal is hung on a jade bronze devil tree in here. Zhu says if the ocean seal is an artifact, then it could be related to one of the ancestors. He asks how did it end up on this island like this. Lin Zhao says that he doesn't know the details, but the fragrance on this island seems to have something to do with that seal. Suddenly, Zhu becomes alert. They realize that it is the Great Sea Eagle. The official says that they are running out of grass beads, so they can't waste time on it. Lin Zhao insists that they need to get rid of the Great Sea Eagle, but the official argues that if Xu goes after the eagle, it will know that they are trying to lure it away. He reminds Lin Zhao that they have encountered the eagle before and it definitely remembers them. He says that this is the reason he is suggesting that they distract the eagle while Xu finds the oceanic seal. Xu agrees with his plan, saying okay. Lin Zhao tells Xu to be careful, saying that they weren't able to go near the jade bronze devil tree last time, so he can't tell him if there is going to be any danger. He adds that of course Zhu is the only one capable of possibly succeeding in this mission. He says that since Zhu's heavenly devil dragon aka Tianchilong is a dragon king, he is sure that those threats won't be a huge problem. Zhu steps deeper into the forest with Qingzhua. He feels fortunate that Qingzhua's azure sacred light has the ability to keep the ghosts away. However, he thinks that Qingzhua can't get rid of the fragrance, or else he could have run free around this island. He arrives in front of a huge tree, wondering if this is the jade bronze devil tree, and could the oceanic seals be the bells hanging from it. He thinks that perhaps this isn't the case since beasts usually guard such treasures, but there isn't even a bird around this jade bronze devil tree. He feels something is wrong and thinks that he needs to find a way back. He coughs and calls Tianchilong, saying that he has delicious food for it, and asks if it wants some. Tianchilong roars, saying that Zhu can't fool him and that he knows that he just wants it to come out and protect his ass. As Tianchilong emerges, Zhu says that it has been staying in the spirit realm for too long and asks if it doesn't want to stretch its limbs. Zhu asks Tianchilong if it is sure that these bells are edible as it takes him near the jade bronze devil tree's top. 
Tianchilong roars, saying that isn't it just fruit. It asks Xu if he thinks it can't eat fruit. As Tianchilong takes a bite, it roars, saying that Xu lied to him. He cries for his teeth and says that the fruit is made of steel. Realizing that they are real bells, Xu wonders how he is going to find the oceanic seal if there are so many of them. Suddenly, he stares at two particular seals and notices that they look different from the rest. He thinks that they must be a thousand years old, and that they could be the ones Instructor Lin was talking about. He thinks that if the oceanic seals are here, there must be beasts surrounding this place or it could be cursed. Therefore, he can't let his guard down. He cautiously plucks the steel bell and is surprised to see that nothing came after him. He thinks that he was prepared to start a fight but this is it. He decides that he should go back and instruct Lin. He gets out of the forest and asks Han Wan where Lin Zhao is. Han Wan says that he is busy dealing with the great sea eagle. Following this, she says that she should take him to the shore first. Ju shows him the oceanic seal and asks if this is the right one. Han Wan confirms it, saying that since it has three colors, it is the perfect seal. The official says that Ju was gone for so long, and it must have been treacherous there since that tree had beasts guarding it. Ju lies, saying that those beasts were quite difficult to get past and that he had to struggle a bit to collect the seals. He thinks that he can't tell them the truth or they will think that they shouldn't have asked for his help. He justifies it to himself, thinking that it is for the sake of his phoenix nest. Suddenly, the great sea eagle appears and screeches. The three of them cover their ears, wondering why it is here again. As the great sea eagle tries to attack them, Shu tells Tianchilong to fight. Tianchilong roars, saying that the eagle is so noisy. He tells it to shut its mouth and releases a bright blue flame to attack it. The eagle evades the attack and squeaks, realizing that there is a dragon king here. As the two of them continue to fight, Shu says that the eagle has gone. He asks where Instructor Lin is. The official nervously says that the great sea eagle must have sensed that they took the seal and came back to kill them, and that perhaps Instructor Lin hasn't caught up yet. He changes the subject, saying that they should leave this place since his grass beads are withering. Xu tells them to go first, saying that he will get there later. Han Wan tells him not to waste too much time with the eagle, saying that it knows this place well so killing it won't be easy. Xu feels something strange. He wonders why he keeps getting a feeling that something is wrong. He stares above as Tianchilong and the eagle fight. The eagle falls to the ground and Tianchilong drinks its blood. The eagle squeaks at it, saying so what if it is a dragon king? It exclaims that it isn't a chicken either. Seeing this, Xu feels proud that Tianchilong is drinking its blood while fighting it. The great sea eagle flies upwards to attack Tianchilong, but Tianchilong attacks it first causing it to fall again to the ground. Determined, the eagle again flies back. Tianchilong angrily asks the eagle if it is going to let it finish or not. It punches the great sea eagle and kicks it. Zhu realizes that the eagle has been wounded, but its stamina still remains intact. He wonders if Tianchilong is running out of strength. He suddenly realizes that this whole thing isn't normal and wonders how could he forget it. He tells Tianchilong that the great sea eagle is trying to keep it on the island, and once it has inhaled too much fragrance, it won't have any strength left to fight. He rides on top of Tianchilong, exclaiming that they can't stay here to fight and that they need to leave. Shortly afterwards, Chu realizes what was happening. The great sea eagle took advantage of the fragrance to fight Tianchilong. Tianchilong says that it will let the eagle live this time. It roars, telling Zhu to look in front of him. Zhu sees an injured dragon with an injured man on top of it. He says that they should go take a look. As he gets close, he recognizes the man as instructor Lin Zhao. Lin Zhao tells Zhu to be careful. He gives him the phoenix nest and tells him to run. After giving the phoenix nest, Lin Dao's hand falls. Xu shouts Lin Zhao's name as the instructor dies. Tianchilong roars, saying that there is someone watching them. Xu thinks that it seems they aren't the only ones hunting for the oceanic seal, and whoever killed Lin Zhao must be extremely dangerous. 
He realizes that this isn't good, thinking that Han Wan and the others are still on the island. He commands Tian Shilong to take them back to the island. As he steps onto the island again, he tells Tian Shilong that the air on this island isn't good for it. He tells it to stay high above the poisonous air, and warns it to watch out for the great seagull, saying that it is a cunning one. Tian Shilong roars, claiming that it isn't scared and that it can kill it with just a slap. Suddenly, he hears someone call his name. He turns around to see that it is the official. The official informs him that Lin Zhao has died. Xu feigns ignorance and asks what is going on. He feels something is off. How could the official aka Lu Yuanxuan know what happened to Instructor Lin, and did he also leave the island and come back? He wonders where Han Wan is and whether she has also gone. Lu Yuanxuan exclaims that it is Han Wan, she is the one who betrayed Lin Zhao, and there is no way anyone else knows that they are on this island. He says that everyone in the Han family is the same and calls Han Wan a traitor full of greed. Xu asks him where the seal is. Yuan Xuan says that Han Wan took it and that he managed to escape back to this island, but an assassin followed him and he couldn't see their face. He says that if Xu wasn't here with Tian Shilong to scare the assassin away, he would have been killed. Xu tells him that Tian Shilong was hurt while fighting the great sea eagle, and the fragrance also weakened it. Therefore, it cannot fight anymore. He says that without Tian Shilong, he is just a normal man who can't do anything about this. Yuan Xuan puts his hand on Zhu's shoulder and says that he is going to be in charge then. Zhu agrees with him and says that they shall first find somewhere to hide since they can't leave the island like this. Suddenly, Yuan Xuan summons his poisonous red crown dragon. He suspiciously tells Zhu that he has summoned his dragon to protect them. However, Zhu notices the poisonous red crown dragon about to attack him. The poisonous red crown dragon attacks Zhu as Yuan Xuan orders it to kill him. But Zhu manages to evade its attack. Zhu asks Yuan Xuan what he is doing. Yuan Xuan calls Zhu nosy and exclaims that he brought this upon himself. Zhu says that once he is done with him, they will think that Lin Zhao's death was an accident. Confused, Yuan Xuan asks if he is the one who betrayed him. He laughs, asking Zhu if he is serious. He wonders how someone as stupid as him could actually get to the king level. Xu orders Tian Shilong to tear the poisonous red crown dragon apart. Tian Shilong unleashes purple lightning from above and attacks the poisonous red crown dragon's head, causing blood to spurt out. Blood also begins to pour out of Yuan Xuan's mouth. He falls to his knees, realizing that Zhu's dragon was hiding. Zhu smugly says that this is why they aren't on the same level. He didn't believe Yuan Xuan for a second, but Yuan Xuan thought he could fool him. He says that at first, he wasn't sure if Yuan Xuan or Han Wan was the traitor, but it seems that the bad guy is also really stupid. Yuan Xuan kneels in front of Zhu, begging him for mercy and forgiveness. Zhu suddenly feels someone staring at him. He turns around to see that there is no one. He grabs Yuan Xuan by the head and asks who is the guy outside. Yuan Xuan says that it is Yen Jin, the head of the Yen family which is one of the nine great clans in Nihai. He says that Yen Jin's selfishness got the better of him as he slaughtered all the cursed witches, causing the poisonous gas to be unleashed and leading to various diseases. Letting go of Yin Xuan's head, Xu asks where Han Wan is and if she is alive. Yun Xian tells him that she jumped into the great sea eagle's nest. Hearing this, Zhu eyes Tian Shilong. Realizing what Zhu wants, Tian Shilong unleashes a deadly attack against Yun Xian and kills him. Zhu leaves while saying that Han Wan is more alive than Yun Xian. Meanwhile, Yen Jin and his son Yen Su ride on a dragon as they observe from above. Yen Su says that he didn't think that the Supreme Academy members would get someone at the level of the Great Sea Eagle to help them. He calls Yun Xian a bastard, saying that he didn't even inform them about it. Yen Jin tells his son not to worry, saying that they will wait outside. He tells him not to do anything yet, saying that the eagle will take care of Zhu. Yen Su asks his father if he said that the oceanic seal could control the poisonous gas. Yen Jin confirms it and says that with the oceanic seal, all kingdoms in Nihai will respect their Yen family. He exclaims that those lords and queens will have to kneel before them. 
Zhu arrives at the great sea eagle's nest and hopes that Han Wan is still alive. Suddenly, he hears something chirping. He looks above to see that a great sea eagle has captured Han Wan with its claw. He curses, realizing that the wounds of the great sea eagle from before have healed up. But Tian Chilong hasn't and is still suppressed by the fragrance. As the great sea eagle tries to attack Zhu, Zhu jumps from the cliff. He calls out to Tian Chilong to save him. Tian Chilong saves Zhu and roars, asking how many times he is going to ask it to save him. Zhu asks it to be a bit gentle and requests it to let him sit on its back. Tian Chilong roars in anger, saying that Zhu sure is asking for a lot. Suddenly, the other great sea eagle releases Han Wan from its grip and she begins to fall. Seeing this, Zhu commands Tian Chilong to help her. He tries to grab her as she falls, however, he feels horrified as he misses. Luckily, Han Wan falls on top of a branch and is saved. Zhu sighs in relief, thinking that they are fine, and who would have thought there would be a branch hanging off of the cliff? He thinks what an experience this is. Zhu tells Tian Chilong to give the bird a good beating for him. Tian Chilong angrily roars, saying to Zhu that he can't tell him what to do. It attacks the great sea eagle with its blue flame, but the eagle dodges and squeaks, saying that this land belongs to it. It unleashes spirals of yellow light against Tian Chilong. Tian Chilong roars, saying that he doesn't care, and tells the eagle to look at what it can do. Tian Chilong tries to release another blue flame, but nothing comes out of its mouth. Seeing this, Zhu asks in shock if Tian Chilong is serious, and that where its dignity as a dragon king has gone. The great sea eagle squeaks, asking Tian Chilong if that's all it has got. It squeaks, saying that it has never eaten a dragon king before, and grabs Tian Chilong by the head, saying that it might as well eat it now. Tian Chilong roars and releases an electrifying energy, which injures the eagle and causes it to let go. Tian Chilong roars again, saying that the eagle is the dead one. It unleashes the blue flame attack against the eagle. The eagle asks how could it do that, and tries to escape. Seeing this, Tian Chilong roars, demanding that it dare not run away. It asks the eagle if it has any idea how long it had to pretend that it was weak. It roars again, saying that the eagle shouldn't have messed with the dragon king. Tian Chilong shoots the powerful blue flame at the eagle and finally kills it. Seeing the dead eagle fall, Zhu says that Tian Chilong is such a tough guy and that it must be really mad right now. At the bottom of the fissure, Zhu extracts a 25,000-year-old soul orb from the eagle and exclaims that they are rich. He asks Tian Chilong that the holy blood works wonders for it, doesn't it? Tian Chilong roars, saying that it isn't too bad. Zhu exclaims that he was right. If Tian Chilong had shown its strength too early, its enemy could have scurried away at any time. He says that is the reason it should wait until the enemy lets its guard down and then finish everything off with one strike. Tian Chilong roars, saying that humans are so cunning, and of course it is due to its award-winning performance. Xu tries to defend himself, saying that it isn't cunning but being smart. He tells Tian Chilong that he isn't calling it stupid, but it should learn to fight with tactics. It helps to know strategies and what your enemy is thinking. He says that being a dragon king is one thing, but becoming the world's champion is another. He tells it to look at the great sea eagle, saying that although it wasn't as powerful, it was able to survive for long. Suddenly, Zhu feels that he is forgetting something really important. Tian Chilong roars, saying that the woman is still down there. Zhu exclaims that it is right. Han Wan is still on the branch. Just as they arrive, they see the cape that was stuck on the branch and carrying Han Wan had broken. Han Wan begins to fall but Zhu carries her just in time. He checks her breath and says that it is good, she is still breathing. Tian Chilong reluctantly roars, saying that Zhu is allowed to give it orders today and asks what he wants. Zhu tells it to go down and find a way out. Shortly afterwards, Zhu is seen roasting the sea eagle in a cave with Han Wan laying sleeping beside him. Zhu feels lucky that he pillaged lots of grass beads from Yuan Xuan, otherwise he would have died on this island. He thinks that he should leave this place ASAP since he doesn't know where Yuan Jin is. If Yuan Jin plans to kill everyone on this island, Zhu won't have enough beads to deal with him, 
and chances are that he is going to be dead. He looks at the smoke flowing out of the cave and wonders if there is another way out. He follows the smoke and reaches an underground well. Shu tastes the water and thinks that it is salty. He realizes that this means if they follow the flow of the water, it must lead them to the sea. He shakes Han Wan, trying to wake her up. Han Wan opens her eyes, wondering where she is. As she looks at Shu hovering over him, she mistakes him for a monster and tries to get away. Shu tells her to calm down, saying that it is him. He informs her that the great sea eagle is now dead and it can't harm her anymore. He says that there is someone watching them from outside, so they have to leave while it is still dark. Han Wan asks in confusion whether he killed the great sea eagle and if they are still on the island. Shu says that they will talk about this later. He asks whether she has a dragon that can help them travel underwater. Han Wan says yes she has one and asks what his plan is. Shu points at the water, saying that they are going to follow the current. At the bottom of the Nihai Sea, Han Wan's mermaid dragon shows them the way. Shu says that this path obviously leads to Nihai. He looks at Han Wan's mermaid dragon and says that it is rare. Han Wan says that the mermaid dragon clan isn't evil, but it is considered a menace by the people of Nihai. They say that mermaids cause their ships to sink, call tsunamis to destroy their homes, and even lure men to drown in deep waters. Shu calls the mermaid dragon a poor thing and says that those rumors are just unfair. Han Wan says that it is worse than unfair. Their kind is a rare one, yet they are slaughtered like those innocent witches. Shu says that he got it. He asks whether Yan Jin killed Lin Zhao. Han Wan confirms this, saying that Yuan Xuan and Yan Jin made a deal to steal the Oceanic Seal and kill Lin Zhao. She says that they can't let Yan Jin take the seal. If he gets control of the toxic gas, it would be a disaster for Nihai. Xu tells her not to worry, saying that he won't let that happen. Han Wan asks her if he has an idea. Ju shows her the other Oceanic Seal, saying his idea is to use this seal. He nervously tells her that there were actually two seals on that tree, and since they told him that they only needed one, he decided to keep the other for himself. He thinks that sharing is caring and that is what they always say. Han Wan hugs Zhu in excitement. She calls this amazing and exclaims that with this seal, Yan Jin won't be able to control the toxic gas. Zhu says yes and asks her to let go of him, saying that he can't breathe. Hearing this, Han Wan blushes as she lets go of him. She requests Zhu to borrow his oceanic seal, promising that once she deals with Yan Jin, she will give it back to him. Zhu tells her to take the seal, saying that they can't let ruthless people like Yan Jin run around freely and do whatever they want. They continue their journey and finally arrive. Han Wan says that they are finally out. She tells Zhu to make himself at home at the Supreme Academy and says that she will make Yan Jin pay for what he did. Xu says okay and asks her to tell him if she needs his help. Xu arrives at his residence at the Supreme Dragon Academy. He thinks that something is strange. It looks like the Phoenix Nest doesn't have any special elements. He wonders if there is anything abnormal about this. He sees that there is the breath of an ancient creature. Suddenly, he feels Haya shaking in the spirit domain. He asks Haya if he wants the phoenix nest. He gulps down the drink and feels the nest's power. He gives the power to Haya and says that he has led everything to his cocoon. He says that he needs to wait for a few days and then he can come out it. Meanwhile, back at the island, Yenjin's son says that they should go back, claiming that he can't do this anymore. He says that it has been ages and he doesn't want to eat any more wild fruits since they give him diarrhea. Yan Jin says that he has sent people to look for Zhu. They have to make sure that everyone is dead. Yan Su exclaims that they are dead. Breathing the air on this island will kill everything. He says that their corpses must have become some other beast's meal by now. Yan Jin tells him that keeping his head cool isn't enough. He still needs to always be careful. He says that he needs to finish what he started, claiming that is how he kept his place in Nihai for so many years. He can't let his guard down just because his enemy did. Suddenly, a man arrives on a dragon and tells Yan Jin that Han Wan has gone back to Mengqing. 
He says that she is accusing him of killing the witches and it seems that she also has evidence. Yenjin is baffled by this news. His son tells him to calm down as Yenjin begins to fall with blood coming out of his mouth. Meanwhile, in Nihai, the azure glowing firefly plays in the sea. As it bounces on Zhu's head, he thinks that with the help of this firefly his spirit domain produces much purer energy 140 times faster. If everything goes according to his plan, Qingzhuo will be able to stay still in the middle of a storm. After that, the dexterity and toughness of his wings will increase significantly. He looks at the snake and thinks that its stamina is also better now. He thinks that all is going well, but he doesn't know where his wife and her sister are. Suddenly, Zhu feels movement in the spirit domain. He realizes that Haya is breaking out of his cocoon. Haya breaks out of the cocoon and barks, saying that he is back. Zhu summons Haya out of the spirit domain. Haya barks, saying that he missed Zhu so much. Haya licks Zhu's face, and Zhu congratulates Haya on his rebirth. He says that he has some 25,000-year-old great sea eagle meat for him, and asks him to stop licking his face. As Hei eats the meat, Zhu tells him to slow down, saying that it is big enough to last them a few days. However, Haya proves him wrong as he finishes the whole thing within seconds. He looks at Haya in shock and tells him to forget what he just said. He is shocked to see Haya digesting the meat so fast. He realizes that he is going to mature in just a few days. As Haya hugs him, Zhu asks him to now show him his strength. Haya looks around and barks, saying that he shall see if there is anything for him to hit. Suddenly, Xiaoyan appears on his dragon and greets Zhu. Seeing this, Haya barks, telling Xiaoyan to take his punch. Zhu tries to stop Haya, but he doesn't listen and beats Xiaoyan and his dragon up. Zhu asks Xiaoyan if he is okay. He apologizes saying that he was training his young dragon and that his dragon attacked him because he thought that Xiaoyan was an enemy. Xiaoyan is shocked to learn that Haya is a young dragon. He exclaims, saying that was brutal. Xu pulls Xiaoyan up while asking if he is heading for the academy. Xiaoyan says of course not. He is here to make up for the last time they went gambling. He tells Xu that he is going to take him somewhere even more thrilling. He asks Zhu if he has ever heard of the Yen family in Nihai. Zhu says yes, he has heard of them. Xiaoyan tells him that the Yen family holds a hunting competition every year. He asks him if he is interested. Zhu asks if it is to see who can hunt more beasts. If so, what is so great about it? Xiaoyan clarifies that it is not for hunting beasts, but hunting for people instead. Zhu is shocked by this. Xiaoyan says that of course these people aren't normal civilians. They are either prisoners on death row, guilty of treason, or the most wanted criminals. They are the worst kind of people one can imagine. Xu asks if he has participated before. Xiaoyan nervously says no. He says that he has been talking to a girl and she is really into this kind of stuff. The girl said something like that real men should enjoy these activities. Zhu says that he prefers peace and thanks him as he begins to leave. Xiaoyan says that is Haya a black dragon. He says that he is pretty sure the reward for this competition is some elite dragon blood. Hearing this, Zhu stops in his tracks, saying that they need to bring justice to the world. He exclaims that they shall go. Xiaoyan coughs, thinking that Zhu is definitely tempted by the reward and couldn't care less about justice. Meanwhile, at the ancestral dragon city-state palace, Lingxia asks Yunzi if she is missing that bastard again. She angrily says that when they left Ringyu, she told him to come find them. Now he is in Nihai, and he must be having fun with the loads of rich women over there. Yunzi defends Zhu, saying that he has his own business to take care of. Suddenly, Nian Nian tells Yunzi that there is a problem. A woman named Wan Linfei is at the door, and she is looking for her. Yunzi is confused to hear about Wan Linfei. Ling Sha finds this weird and wonders why she is in Lichuan. As they step out of the palace, Ling Sha asks Linfei why she is here. Linfei says that she is here to tell Yunzi to stop bothering Zhu Ming Lang. Ling Sha asks if she has gone crazy while training with swords. She exclaims that Linfei is the one who isn't supposed to be here, but now she is telling Zhu's wife what to do. 
Yunzi asks her what if she says no. Lingfei says that she can watch her army wipe out the entire Lichuan continent then. The two of them intensely stare at each other as Yunzi says that she will.